Khan said at last, speaking only with his own lips. His chest rose and fell. Once it was so. Once mankind had but the one neck and wore the hands to squeeze. No more. The Sialsin may pillage as they please and not destroy mankind. This storm shall pass like all the others. Recalling his earlier quotation, I marshaled myself and, speaking it seemed to diss himself, said, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain neutrality in a crisis. And if you had truly read Dante, Marlowe, Khan said, voice issuing once more from the drones around me, you would know the deepest pit of hell is cold. He lifted his chin, staring up into the darkness at things I couldn't see. I wondered then what else he saw, and through what eyes. I thought of his psalms, of the light shining through their dead and sagging faces. I felt certain then that there was no place on that dreadful world where Khan Sagara couldn't look. From the highest dome through caves of ice and down to that sunless sea, every square inch and stray atom passed beneath Khan's lidless gaze. How his mind endured the strain, I cannot say but I had not then seen the ceramic shine of implants beneath his ear and that wild fall of hair. So you will not help. Five hundred standard years I've traded with the Sielsin, with Otiolo, Hasurum, and Doryeka, Khan said. I see no reason to jeopardize these arrangements in the name of your emperor. I blinked. Five hundred years is before first contact. I meant the Battle of Crestguard in ISD 15792, when the Sielsin attacked our Colonian fort settlement on the edge of the Marinus Vale. The loss of that colony had sent its horrible message careering across the Imperium, the temple fires burning on every world, and the priests beside them crying out those fateful words, We are not alone. I had come too far to give up so lightly, and stepped forward, placing one boot on the lowest step of Khan's white dais. Do so many deaths mean so little to you? Yes, Khan said, speaking for the first time without hesitation. When you've seen as many lives as I have, you learn how little they are worth. Then why do you cling to yours so tightly? I demanded. Or is it only other lives that are meaningless? Khan's lips twisted into some septic impersonation of a smile. When you've seen enough of other people, you will learn that it is they who believe their lives are meaningless. Why should I value them, who do not value themselves? I had no answer to that, only a vague sense of righteous indignation. Flesh is the cheapest resource in the human universe, Lord Marlowe. It spends more easily than gold. I don't believe that. Because you are a child, said the undying. Thirty-five, was it? Thirty-five. He meant my age. He had heard my conversation with Song, of course. I have lived... More than four hundred of your lifetimes, boy. Your belief means almost nothing. He lifted my sword from the arm of his chair and, leaning forward, presented it to me, pommeled first. Take your Jadian weapon. I had to climb the dais to accept it, and so came close enough to really see the man, the myth. He stank of unwashed flesh and hair, of machine lubricant and something... Sweet. Myrrh? Blue lights pulsed beneath his left ear in time with some unheard signal. It was the chest, I decided, and his ribs that were prosthetic. The flesh, there wasn't flesh at all. Veins stood blackly out on his neck, and again he didn't seem to breathe. Some mechanism, buried perhaps beneath the flange of his ribs, breathed for him. 
Thank you, I said, taking the sword. I was eager to be away. Sagara frightened me, I'm not ashamed to admit. Halfway down the nine steps, sword yet in hand, I turned. This is not like other wars, Lord. Unless we can communicate, our two sides will tear one another apart. Khan didn't look at me, but folded his hands in his lap as he contemplated the dark above. You may have the hospitality of the palace. Naturally. It wouldn't do to turn so august an ambassador away at the door when he has only just arrived. You may will find rooms for you. You may. Here, master. The golem appeared from the shadows, the red light in its black eye leading. I would have sworn the door hadn't opened. It padded forward, silent on metal feet. Without being given instruction, the android placed a hand on my shoulder and prepared to lead me away. I turned to go, sick with the weight of my failure. But I didn't protest. I did not grovel. So august an ambassador. He was mocking me, and I had no choice but to be mocked. I'd not come in a strong position. Had nothing to trade. I had counted on the humanity of the least human man I have ever met. A man whose consciousness perhaps resembled my own even less than those of the Sielsin. A moment. Khan's voice was like flint. The golem stopped beside me, and shrugging free of its iron hand, I turned. Approach. I did, aware that, surely, I was a pawn in some dominance display, but not caring. If this man, this creature, wished to humiliate me, I couldn't stop him. Nor would. I had need of him and his connections, and though I'd already thought them close to me, I was not about to make matters worse by arguing. So I stopped at the base of the dais, mindful of the automaton at my back. It was my turn not to speak, and so I waited. Your Cielsin prisoner. You said it was one of the Baitan. Yes. Bring it to me. We will hear its case. Khan's flock of eyes dispersed, each vanished up and into the darkness, and lonely Saturn's head drooped. He must have sent some silent communication to the android behind me, for now I heard its quiet advance. In the scant seconds before it took me by the shoulder, I found myself moved again by that same awe and fear I'd felt on entering. Not even the halls of our Solon Emperor would later fill me with such disquiet. I felt again that sense of time, and the sense that here was the oldest man in existence, perhaps the oldest ever to exist. The silence that fell and folded about his throne comprised millennia. There thickly lay the frozen years, so that the very air seemed a kind of amber, and I, the prisoned fly. Chapter 33 Divide and Conquer Hadrian! Valka hurried forward the moment after Yume opened the doors. What the hell's been going on? Switch leaped to his feet. Krim and Ilex looking up from where they'd been watching some holograph opera off the latter's terminal. Only Polino was unmoved, leaning against a pillar against the far wall of the suite. I was glad to see they'd been left together. For the many days of my imprisonment, I'd imagined each of them locked in separate cells. Or worse. But all things considered, the rooms were comfortable. Void of decoration, yes, but richly appointed after a fashion identical to the waiting room where I had met so many monstrous lords and fine people. The remains of a meal stood on a large service cart, the used plates still fragrant with the smell of rosemary and thyme. I only just spoke to him, I said, putting a hand on her shoulder. I had been trapped in a sort of holding pen the past... How long has it been? Twenty-three days, standard, Polino barked. Thought they'd turned you into one of those... hollows. Squaring his shoulders, Switch said, We were thinking of a way to come rescue you, 
only we couldn't get out ourselves. Ever attentive, Valka said, With whom did you speak? Her brows contracted. You said you spoke with someone. The Undying, Krim said. Was it Khan Sagara? Polino asked. Was it really Khan Sagara? I pressed my lips together. Ilex shook her head. Impossible. His voice still shook in me, emanating as from the very air. I could still smell the antiseptic stink of him and the fragrance of myrrh. See the gruesome patchwork of his flesh and the black eyes so very far away. You wouldn't say that, I told the dryad, if you'd seen him. That stopped her doubting, and something in my face stopped all questioning on the subject of whether or not it was the real Khan Sagara whom I had met. I supposed it was possible that the creature in the pyramid was some usurper, some pretender to Sagara's name, but I didn't believe it was so. Can he help us? Valka asked, looking from me to the machine still waiting in the door. Can he set up a meeting with Tanaran's chieftain? I did not say no, though Sagara had as good as done so. The truth was, I'd come away from my audience not knowing where I stood. Kant had rebuked me, mocked me, and left me no way forward, and yet... He wishes to speak to Tanaran. We have to go retrieve it from the Mistral. Can't we wave the ship from here? You may spoke up. No electronic or quantum communiques are allowed in system save at the master's behest. Unafraid of the machine, Valka rounded on it. Then tell your master we wish to send a message to our ship. I am sorry, madam, but I am afraid that will not be possible. And why not? The security of this installation and the privacy of its people is paramount. The security of... Valka trailed off. Under her breath, she added, You can't be serious. The android said nothing, implying by its silence that it was deathly serious. Switch shifted uncomfortably where he stood, torn, I think, between fear of the android and a desire to put himself between the machine and me. In a small voice, he said, I'll go. I can explain everything to Captain Corvo and return here with the pail. I... He broke off, realizing the gap in his planning. Hey, I need you or the doctor to go with me. I don't speak monster, and I don't trust it's Galstani. Valka and I exchanged a look. I didn't wish to volunteer her for a trip back up the orbital lift to the docking platform and the Mistral, but neither did I wish to leave her or any of the others behind in that awful place. Having so recently dealt with Khan, I was content to wait Valka out, sensing her impatience. I wasn't disappointed, for not a moment later she said, I'll go. You should all go, I said, crossing my arms. I'll remain behind and see if I can't make progress here. To my astonishment, Switch didn't argue that he should remain behind. He would not meet my eye. I thought him only tired, strung out on the weight of his imprisonment and eager to be gone. Still unmoved from his place by the wall, Polino said, You sure you'll be all right? He glowered at the machine one cyclops to another. Yume didn't seem to notice or care. It was hard to remember when it wasn't moving or speaking, that the android was animate at all. One might have imagined it only another of those misshapen bronze statues but I knew whose eye it was in Yume's face. One eye in ten thousand. And I knew that Yume was no statue at all. I'll be fine, I said, dismissive, and clapped the other man on the back. Turning back to Yume, I asked, How long will it take to return to orbit and back? The orbital lift takes just over fifteen hours to ascend, Yume replied. So, two days, I said, stifling my surprise. The descent had not felt so long on our way into Vorgosos, but then fear does strange things to time. Permit me a word with my people and the time they need to gather themselves. The golem bowed its head and withdrew. The heavy metal door grated closed behind it, and we found ourselves alone. I was a moment banishing the morbid thought 
that the grinding of that heavy door was the moving of a temple slab to seal us in our tomb. The impression faded, retreating like Khan's flying eyes into the dark of the pyramid chamber. I do not like this place, Switch said darkly, looking at me for the first time. If you'd seen what I've seen, I said, more darkly still, and meeting his eye, you'd like it even less. I didn't tell him about Lord Song and the others, about the Titans waiting in preparation for their youthful feast, or about the dark ocean beneath the city or the surgeries I imagined taking place. I didn't describe Khan Sagara, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. My lictor and dearest friend half turned away. That golem, and the fucking guards, it's sick, it's all sick. We know, Ilex snapped, hugging herself. That isn't helping. The Chantry should lance this place, burn it to the ground. I could see him working himself up to some kind of frenzy, his words all tumbling one over the next. That was a demon, he pointed at the door. A demon? That's enough, I said, conscious of the fact that we might be observed and that such talk wouldn't endear us to our host. But Hadrian, enough, I say. I threw up one hand, and hoping to cut off the conversation before it could worsen, I turned to Valka. Are we being watched? The doctor bit her lip. I'm not sure. What do you mean you're not sure? I asked. Valka flicked her red-black hair back and pivoted, turning on one heel. I mean I'm not sure, Marlow. There must be a data sphere here. They took over the Mistral somehow. But I can't feel a thing. That took me aback. Understand. I knew and know next to nothing of networked machines. I am as I was born. A son and soldier of soul. Of the Empire. But I knew enough to know that that couldn't be right. Sagara must have communicated remotely with his android. For that matter, Sagara must use some kind of network to control his SOMs, to see through all the city's camera eyes. Not even on the golem, I asked, jerking my head toward the door. Not even on the door lock. Door lock's mechanical, Krim said. That was the first thing we tried. Valka worried at the back of her neck, massaging the implant at the base of her skull. "'Tis all very strange. I can sense the android in the hall, but tis behind layers of encryption I don't think I could decipher if I had a hundred years to try. After a long moment she tossed her head, took her hand away from the base of her skull. No. Letting the subject drop, Krim asked, not that it's my place to be asking, but what do you hope to gain by staying behind? I turned to regard the Norman Jadian man in his padded red caftan. Alone from the company, Krim remained seated, one long leg crossed over the other. He might have been by a poolside in some Jadian satrap's palace. Absently, I massaged the hoop of cryoburn scar about my left thumb, addressing some phantom pain. Half shrugging, I said, It took three weeks to get a word in. I'm afraid if we all leave it, we'll look like we're beaten. Conscious of my posture, I squared my shoulders and stood straight, imagining, as I often did, that I stood upon an amphitheater's orchestra, speaking to a crowd. A thought struck me, and I said, Sagara didn't believe we want peace. I hadn't realized it was true until the words were spoken. He thinks we mean to jeopardize his relations with the Sielsin. He thinks he's called my bluff, and if we all leave, that will as good as confirm his suspicions. If I alone, if I put myself at his mercy, it demonstrates good faith. As if on cue, the door scraped open again and Yume appeared, entering like the messenger he was onto my stage. Without pretense or preamble, or a clearing of throat, it said, I will escort you all to the tramway. I'm staying, I said, bowing ever so slightly. I will take your master up on his offer of hospitality. My people here will repair to my ship and return with our Sielsin emissary. 
The golem gave no sign but to tilt its head to one side. If that's still allowed, of course. Of course, you may pivot it, sweeping one arm to indicate that the others should lead. This way, please. The tramway, by which the upper labyrinth of the Undying's palace was accessed, like the tramway far below, hung from a single rail embedded in the roof of what once had been a lava tube. The tunnel ran straight for what looked like several miles, broken and jagged in places from millennia of tidal stress, to a faint white haze in the middle distance. The city dome, I guessed. White lights stood at irregular intervals along the tunnel, and the metallic shine of artillery stood guarding the approach. Behind us, the great door of the palace stood open. Two meters thick it was, and solid steel. The bunkers which honeycombed the earth beneath many a palatine castle had such doors, proof as they were against orbital and atomic bombardment. I imagined our legions breaking themselves on this approach under the command of Chantry Cantors, imagined inquisitors calling down fire with their superweapons. The fortress, like Khan himself, could outsit eternity. We had not brought anything by way of luggage, and my friend's departure was a thing totally devoid of circumstance. The air in the tunnel was still as a sea becalmed, damp and chilly. A single brazier stood at the end of the concrete pier. Like the graven metal door below it was. An aftermarket addition, a thing not of the original construction. Its base was an inverse pyramid of white stone, graven with the image of a weeping eye like the one Yume wore on its face. Blue flame burned without flickering from it, fed by some gas from below. I couldn't shake the sense that I stood now on the opposite bank of the Styx, looking up and out from Hades toward the living world. He's ignoring us, Krim said and jostled me in good humor. Coming back to myself, I said, I'm sorry, what? I was just thinking. The hell sort of name is Alexander? Switch said, repeating his joshing question a second time. I grunted, not especially ashamed of the old name. What sort of name is Switch, eh? I riposted, knowing full well. Alexander, Polino repeated, squaring his own shoulders in what I must admit was a credible impersonation of me. Hadrian Alexander, how is it in all the years I've known you, you ain't dropped that gem on us? I should think the reason for that's obvious, I said acidly. But even Valka was smiling, and I didn't bristle to defend my name or to explain that Alexander had been a king on old earth, long forgotten, and the eleventh Lord Marlow of Devil's Rest. It did not matter. Krim, Ilex, and old Polino filed onto the tram car, the last pausing to clap me on the shoulder. Valka went behind them, but stopped on the platform to adjust one of her high boots. Switch turned back, caught my arm. I don't like this. You stay in here. I've stayed here three weeks already, I replied, tapping his arm to release me. He didn't. His grip tightened, and his eyes fixed on the android behind. This is wrong. Shouldn't be dealing with demons like this. Sielsen's one thing, but this... He broke off, made the sign of the sun disk discreet at his side, thumb and forefinger encircled. We shouldn't be here. Valka was still fiddling with her boot on the loading platform, and with the golem standing just behind me, I was finding it difficult to think. We won't be here long. How do I know it's even you anymore, eh? He jabbed me in the chest with a finger. How do I know you ain't some... replicate, some changeling? Decades of being around me had sanded a portion of Switch's plebeian dialect from his speech. That he was using it again was not a good sign. His eyes were wide as ever I had seen them, and his freckled face stood white as Tanaran's. Switch. I reached out and embraced my oldest and dearest friend. It's me. I didn't argue or try to reason with him. He was beyond reason, and perhaps justly so. We'd come to a house of horrors to the deepest corner of the dark. Switch returned my embrace. I know, man. I, I just... He broke off and drew away. We shouldn't be here. 
I looked around the cavern, listened for the sound of birds that wouldn't come, for the crash of waves, for any sound beyond the quiet guttering of that single blue flame. No sound came. No shout of human voice, nor groan of the damned. No cock crowed. At long last, I said, No one should be here. Switch looked on the verge of a response, but I waved him on. The sooner you go, the sooner we can all go. Go on. He said nothing. That was the worst part. Only bobbed his head and turned, matte black armor dull against the deep red of his uniform. With a leap, he bounded the steps to the tram platform, passing Valker as he went. His disquiet lingered like a phantom haunting the platform. Disquieted myself, I turned to go, not willing then to watch them depart. Hadrian. Valka caught my elbow and turned me around. She had doubled back from the tram car. Lacing her boots indeed. An echo of Switch's discomfort showed in her austere face, betrayed by furrowed brows and the way she pressed her lips together. She didn't speak at once, and I sensed she was choosing her words with exquisite care. I'll be back with Tanneran before you'll know we've gone, she said at last, lamely. I closed my mouth and gave a sharp little nod, sensing that it was unwise to interrupt her. She looked away, and for a moment the light of those golden eyes was quenched. Then something happened I couldn't have expected in a hundred years. She embraced me. I confess I froze. It was so unexpected from her, there in that hideous place, that my thoughts all fell to pieces. I stood numbly a moment, long enough to hear her say, I'm glad you're all right. I... we were all worried about you. Some part of me was acutely aware of the golem at my back, of Yume watching and of Khan Sagara watching through its eye. She'd withdrawn before I could return the embrace retreated up the steps to the tram. At once it seemed very cold on that platform. I watched the monorail glide away on casters, its running lights seeming so much like the ghostly lanterns of a gondola, poled on black seas. It shrank into the middle distance, leaving me alone with the android. In the torchlit gloom, I drew my coat around myself and turned up the high collar. To no one in particular, to the memory of the moment past, I said, I was worried about you too. Chapter 34 In the House of Khan Sagara I shall have a meal prepared and brought to you at once, Lord Marlow, you may said when I was returned to the suite my companions had previously occupied. All signs of its previous occupation were gone. The food cart was cleared away, the bedclothes changed, the furniture ordered, the bathroom soaps recharged. You've been waiting a long time. Three weeks, I said under my breath, suddenly eager for a shower. Undeterred by my tone, the android replied, And two days, four hours, and thirty-seven minutes. It pointed. There is a sonic cleaning unit for your clothes in with the bath, unless you would prefer that I take them. It waited, and realizing that I might be expected to disrobe then and there, I said, No, thank you, I can see to it myself. As you wish, sir, you may said, continuing my tour of the chambers. You are free to explore the installation and its grounds, so long as you remain within bounds. Will I be able to speak with Lord Sagara? The golem stopped midway through a demonstration of the laundry service unit. You already have. If I didn't know better, I might have said the creature was perplexed. It tilted its head as a dog might, and almost I imagined a frown on that blank curve of metal it called a face. I could see its gears whirring through the crystal windows in its shoulders. I caught myself making a warding gesture with my first and final fingers. How strange that I, who did not believe, should fall upon religion in the face of that machine. I had hoped to speak with him again. The master will speak with you in his own time, the golem said. When my friends return. Yume's single eye studied me a moment. Talking to it wasn't like speaking with any human in my experience. There was no presence to it, 
Nothing of the sort that might cause the hair to stand on end, the skin to crawl. It was dead space. Shape without form, shade without color. In its polished patrician accent it said again, The master will speak with you in his own time. In my own time, I washed and laundered my clothes, and so newly ordered, I set myself to exploring that strange palace. The installation, you may called it. The word implied a sort of military order, and indeed the heavy blast door and the Spartan geometry of hall and stairwell spoke to me of some ancient fortress built beneath the surface of that lightless world. How many hours I lost in those barren corridors I couldn't say, nor count the number of sealed doors that barred my way. In my time since that first sojourn on Vorgosos, and before it, on Emesh, I had the privilege of standing amidst the ruins of ancient civilizations, the black-walled tunnels of Caligar with their walls smooth as glass, the marching towers on Sadal Sud, broken fingers rising above the fungal forests, even old Simeon's tomb on Judeca. Old though they were, their histories measured in scores of millennia. None felt so old to me as that blasted labyrinth. There was a humanity in its bones, unlike that in those strange structures built by alien hands. Familiarity aged it. I knew concrete, and so marveled at what depth and span of years must pass to crack and weather those walls. It was not, as the pyramid below, the palace of a great king or emperor, but something else. Installation. Who had built it in the deeps of time, and to what purpose? Who had quarried out these caverns and raised these halls? Whose hands had placed those chipped, square columns in the vast and empty spaces, hanger-like, that processed down one arm of that seemingly endless complex? One could yet see where the mark of some ancient trowel had smoothed the cement, and badly. And I was alone. Yume didn't reveal itself as I wandered, nor any of Khan's ghastly guards, nor the homunculi who had served us in the vestibule. Once or twice I passed one of Khan's blue-eyed drones, floating like a small and lonesome fish in the dark airs. I tried to find Lord Song and his companions, but after some time decided that wherever they were, they'd been left behind a locked door. Once or twice I thought I heard a human voice and ran to meet it, only to find an empty hall. As I walked at times, one of the great bulkheads would open or close of its own volition, and I thought about what Valker had said that this place had no data sphere, not once she understood. Then I remembered older stories, ones I'd told to Cat in another lifetime. They said that when Khan Sagara took Vorgosos from the Exalted and drove them out, he took from them a demon of the ancient world, a demon such as the Merikani I had made. Switch was right. The whole place stank of sorcery. On Emesh, Gilliam Vass had called Valka a witch. He'd been right, in a sense, for the implant in Valka's brain had allowed her to access and control the castle's data sphere and power grid. But the more I understand what Valka could do, the less I thought it magic. Not so in Tim Vorgosos. My first journey to Khan's pyramid had left me with the impression that all his palace was empty a desolate warehouse of drab concrete. It was not so. It was only that the halls were barren. Many doors opened to me, and within I found rooms richly appointed as my own quarters, and the vestibule had been that. Sumptuous carpets covered the floor, and the walls were hung with many priceless things, tapestries and paintings, art and arms and artifacts of all descriptions. I tarried a while among a collection of ancient legionnaire armor, bone white and red. The earliest suits were bulky things. The armor hid beneath the baggy environment layer, hoses wired in from the air and plasma packs worn on the back. The helms of two centurions bore the transverse horsehair crests still worn in formal parades. One proud example wore the high-plumed chevalier's helm of an imperial Martian guardsman, his great shoulders draped in a red cloak, with Taruj's 
hanging at shoulder and hip, to recall the image of vanished Rome. Many of the pieces were scarred, many broken, many bearing the proud sigils of the House Imperial or the standards of legions or houses of great renown. Other examples there were the mirrored masks of Jadi and Aljani, their bright blues and greens and oranges resplendent beside the drab and ugly ironwork of the Lothriad. There were smaller pieces under glass, epaulets belonging to famed commanders out of history, a round L showing the imperial sunburst that had purportedly been part of a suit of armor made for Prince Cyrus the Golden, the shattered remnants of the white sword that had executed the pretender Boniface in the fifth millennium. I could hardly believe it. Khan had not exaggerated when he called himself a man of culture. Clang. A metallic sound reverberated down one colonnade, undampened by any carpet or tapestry. I halted, drawing my sword, torn between curiosity and the terror of the unknown. But Khan had offered me the hospitality of his palace, and Yume treated me with every courtesy. I recalled my own words from the landing platform high above and murmured, I am not afraid. Fear is a poison, the part of me that thought in Gibson's voice said. Buoyed by that thought and the memory of the old scoliast, I turned, following a side passage as it curved gently down a kind of horseshoe bend. It emptied me onto a curving hallway, a circle along whose inner wall stood several round doors. Above, I heard the roar of a big machine. Great turbines turning in the stone above. I'd heard such things in several places about the palace, and reasoned they were part of some great network that powered the installation. Though I confess I knew little of such things. The inner door opened at my touch, and a blast of warm, wet air rose to greet me like a breath. A shout. Light poured in. Not cool and bloodless like the lights in the hall, but true and proper light, such as a sun might make. I thought to turn back, thinking that it must be some mistake, that the door should have been locked and wasn't. But I heard something then that urged me forward. The sound of birdsong. Sword in hand, but unkindled, I stepped gingerly forward, placing my feet with silent care. The door had opened onto a short hall, and airlock, I realized, though it hadn't cycled, and I followed it out into golden sunlight. I gasped. I'd emerged onto the uppermost of a series of round terraces that descended layer by layer ever downward. Every layer bloomed with flowers and fruit trees and all manner of greenery. Hummingbirds flitted among the branches and squirrels, and what at first I took for bees, I realized with a start, were tiny drones. I stood a long while by the rail, looking out and down upon layer upon layer of greenery. A strange bird, red and blue with a hooked beak, fluttered down and sidled up to me, watching me with one beady eye. I tried to imagine Khan Sagara walking in these gardens, trailing hoses and fiber optics from beneath his yellow robe. I almost laughed aloud. It was a strange vision. It was a strange extravagance. Khan had seemed to me so like one of the kings of ancient myth. Lord of a tinnery of stone, and not the sort of man to love gardens. There was a clinicism in the way he studied his art, and kept it in that place, the way a scoliast kept organs and little animals in jars of greenish fluid. A single flight of steps descended, spiraling ever down and in ever tighter orbits, for each garden terrace had a smaller diameter than the last. Water fell in irregular streamlets from the roof above and looking up I was astonished to see not the blank concrete so abundant in that hideous place, but the naked limestone of the living rock itself. Perhaps it says a thing of me that I tarried here less long than in the museum halls. I don't know what it says of a man that he might linger for hours before a painting of a garden, and yet ignore the flowers themselves. But such am I. Perhaps it was only that I expected a serpent to spring from the bushes and strike at my heel or for one of the infernal somms to at last make an appearance. Down nine levels I descended, and so came in time to the very base of the garden which was shaped like a keyhole, the stairs emptying onto the round centre. 
while the single hall stretched on away, cutting under the terraces above. Orchids clung to branches above my head, and somewhere a lark cried. The imitation sunlight shone from tiny fixtures bracketed to the roof above, and the mosaic on the floor was treacherous with false rain. The air wafted thick with the smell of flowers, of fruits I couldn't name. I looked back and up past ascending levels of foliage, and then, sure I was alone, returned my sword to its clip. The hall that stretched away like the rough ceiling high above was all of native rock, and the pale stone sweated with the hothouse moisture of that garden. I'd come so far down I thought that surely I was approaching the level of the subterranean sea you may had spoken of, and half expected the tunnel would lead down to some Plutonian shore. There was only another door. Like the door to the pyramid it was, sculptured of floating metal, it depicted a great spreading tree and two great snakes descending from that tree. Their bodies twined into a double helix, tails twined around the stem of the tree, fangs sunk deep in the flesh of a man kneeling about the bowl of the tree. The image filled me with a perverse fascination, and I stood a long while tracing the contours of the image with my fingers. A light at the corner of my eye caught my attention, and turning, I saw a key panel gleaming. It was different than the others. No mere mechanical switch, but a holograph plate. Without much hope, I called it up. Was met with an authentication request. Disappointed but unsurprised, I turned back, returning up the hall to the stair. Yume was waiting for me. Or I thought it was Yume. In truth, I cannot say if the Undying kept but one of the golems or several. The dull grey and unsexed body was the same, the brass clockwork identical. The white mask with its one black eye and weeping golden filigree. In those same cool, patrician tones, the android said, Lord Marlowe, your meal is ready. That was supper on the day my companions had left to return to the Mistral. A pretext? Surely it had appeared in time with my discovery of the well and its gardens. I couldn't help but feel that I was being herded away like some irritating child, that I had seen enough and too much of Khan's palace. What is this place? Yume did not look round. The orchid stair, the vestibule to the garden. This is not a garden? I asked, confused. It is not the garden, the creature replied, still a statue but for the winking of the light in its black eye. The master maintains extensive gardens. For the children, you understand. I didn't understand, though I had a sinking suspicion in my bowels. That was worse than true knowledge. Thinking of the snakes carved into the doorway, their heads facing one another as they devoured the helpless man, I asked, What children? Still the android didn't move. You know what this place is? The creature had a disconcerting habit of not answering questions, as if by avoiding answers it might avoid a lie. Could it lie? I wasn't sure. It is said that the demons of old were incapable of mistruth, that the ancient laws which bound and govern their kind prevented it. That had never seemed sufficient safeguard to me, for truth is sharper than falsehood, and just as poisonous. Still, Yume's omissions were louder than its words. The children. I thought about Baron's song, about the Grand Duke of Melinda and the others. I could imagine a pack of their younger selves living sheltered lives in these gardens, feral as troglodytes, as the children of plebeian families so often are. Each unaware of his fate, of her destiny, of the end that awaited them all. The warm garden felt very cold. Thus I permitted myself to be led away back up through the concentric rings of the orchard stair, beneath hanging bowers thick with the delicate fragrance of that eponymous flower. When we'd climbed halfway to the top, I asked, How far down are we? The entrance above is twenty-seven levels below the outer gate. We're not to the sea, then, I asked, meaning the subterranean ocean beneath Khan's pyramid. Without breaking stride, Yume pivoted its head, fully around to watch me as it ascended the steps. 
Oh no, Lord, the sea is much farther below. Below. Song and the others had talked of being taken below as well. Had they meant only some deeper level of the installation above us? Or was there yet some deeper hall? Some darker theatre where the medical labours that gave Vorgosos its dire reputation played out in grim burlesque. I gave up trying to speak to the machine. Its unwillingness or inability to lie made it a difficult interlocutor. But it was comfortable in silence, and I was happy not to speak to it. By several stairs and empty corridors we returned to my chambers, and Yume left me at the door. I entered, the heavy portal clanging shut behind me. I left my coat on the back of a chair, and found the food trolley waiting by the table. Trusting myself to my solitude, I unclipped my terminal from its gauntlet and set the device on the tabletop. Calling up the text of Impatience, the First Emperors, a biography of the first eleven emperors. I'd finished his history of the Jadian Wars while locked in Sagara's vestibule. I set the thing to playing, and soon a cool, artificial voice began reciting the text aloud. Forgetting myself, I returned to my coat and pulled my small journal from an inside pocket and returned to the table. That done, I lifted the tray off the trolley and carried it to the table. Beneath the steam lid was a species of strange silver fish, fried in oil and delicately spiced beside an arrangement of red cap mushrooms stuffed with cheese and onions. A soup there was, too, sweet and smoky. And wine. Wine. How long had it been since I'd had wine? Since before Roostum, at least. I took a sip. The torpor that had overtaken me during my time among the client lords was gone, and I found it impossible to relax. I doubted even wine could chase my anxieties from me. Still, I meant to try, though I placed my sword on the table as if it were a piece of cutlery. Eating slowly, I studied the painting on the wall opposite me, while I listened to my terminal read impatience histories. It showed a stone cottage beneath a walling blue sky. Twining trees and yellow fields— Clumsy brushstrokes and heavy lines captured not the image the artist had seen, not his eye, but some piece of the soul of him. I wondered at it a long time, and so failed to absorb much of the reign of Emperor Victor I. The clear voice seemed a kind of curtain, a pall that drowned the world and drowned myself, so that I sat, like Khan himself, in contemplation of that image of another age. Cottages at Cordville a replica, the original had died with earth. I opened my little journal casually, thumbed past black ink, sketch after sketch. How poor they seemed by comparison, how crude and unpleasant, how forgettable. Eternity is the chief quality of high art. Depending on no moment, such art belongs to every moment, and so takes us for a time from our time, allowing us to touch eternity for our fleeting instant. I was there, transported by that painting, my reading, my food, hidden from the world a time from my cares, from Uvanari and Gilliam, from Bordelon, from Bassandalin, and three Aquilari I dead on the Balmung. From Jinan. Transported as I was, I didn't hear the approach of feet behind me not until soft arms closed about my neck. Chapter 35 The Gorgon Years of being attacked by night in the streets of Borisivo had taught me panic, and taught me the strength to overcome panic. Exhaling through my nose, I tucked my chin and, gripping the thin arms about my neck with one hand, reached back with the other to seize my attacker by the scruff of the neck. I tugged downward, pulling his chin over my shoulder, that I might strike his face. Please! The voice startled me. It wasn't a man at all. Her arms slackened and I released them, turning quickly and snatching up my sword. I didn't conjure its blade, but stood ready, processing. The woman, for woman she undeniably was, stood a head shorter than I. Where she had come from I couldn't at first guess for the hall door hadn't opened, nor any of the doors to the secondary chambers. 
Only the door to my sleeping room was open, and I had a sudden horrible feeling that she'd been waiting there for me. In bed, to judge by the disheveled nature of her raven hair and her gauzy white dress. Who are you? I asked, not lowering my sword. Completely oblivious, the unthinking circuits in my terminal continued translating impatience text into placid tones. Emperor Victor's biography filled the silence. The invader massaged the back of her neck, eyes downcast, reproached. Naya, she said, voice rich as candle smoke. She looked up suddenly and I felt a lurch. Her pupils were twice the proper size. The iris is large and blue as ice. They gave the look of one permanently startled, or permanently aroused. With exquisite care she removed her hand from her neck, raked fingers through her fall of black hair. You hurt me. I did not apologize. You startled me. Whatever chivalric impulse had made me free her at the sound of her voice was gone, and I was on my guard. The eyes betrayed her. She was a homunculus and so designed. But designed for what? She was a bed servant. The full and perfect shape of her announced that plain as sunrise. But was that all she was? My own grandfather, Lord Tymon, had been killed by a concubine homunculus, and there was always a vague inhumanity to many of them. Something of the machine in the way they were tailored, cut to fit a purpose and design. I suppose that I, a nobile of the peerage, a palatine, was little different. But like Ilex, I had the freedom of my own thoughts, whereas who knew what impulses had been built into the deep structures of this woman's brain? No doubt she had been designed to be the perfect courtesan, coy, alluring, but ultimately pliant. She could not choose, could not say no. That she might say no would never even occur to her. I didn't mean to, she said, still clutching at her hair as though it was a lifeline. I only wondered when you would come to bed. You were in here so long. She took a step, fine gold chains tinkling at wrist and throat and ankle. I took a measured step back, circling to put the table between us. Why are you here? I asked, as though the answer were not obvious. With my free hand I silenced the chattering terminal. The master sent me, she said into the fresh silence, fingers worrying at her neckline, tugging the fabric lower. Her skin was paler even than mine. It shone like milk by moonlight. He thought you would like me. I did. There was something in the hard bones of her face, a hawkish severity softened by full lips and that pouting expression that reminded me of... something. I couldn't put my finger on it. She took a step closer, following me round the table, one finger trailing on its surface, hunting, teasing. Do you not like me? Like those brave and foolish men who came before the Medusa, I was transfixed. My sword was at the ready, fingers on the trigger. How small she was, how slight. Though in her kind, smallness was no guarantee of weakness. She might have overpowered me if she wished, or torn my arms from their sockets for all I knew, or strangled me just like my poor grandfather. Her robe vanished and I realized it was no robe at all, only a holograph shell, gossamer light spun to conceal what lay beneath. A marble sculpture of a woman, perfect as Pygmalion had made. Dark hair and soft curves, and eyes like frozen stars. An anklet she wore, fashioned in the likeness of a gold snake devouring, and gold were the chains that hung between her breasts. Silver would have suited her better. So pale was she. A creature of the night, and with those terrible, frightened, and furiously loving eyes, she might have been a vampire out of some antique fable. Some monstrous to frighten and allure, to teach men fear. How could I have thought her reproached by me, shrinking? I've seen demons less frightening. I didn't move, not even when one cool hand closed over mine, or pressed my sword's emitter to her breast. Are you going to kill me? she asked, breathless, mouth open and turned up to my face. 
Do you want to? You can. Her breath was hot in my ear, her voice gone all husky. It wouldn't be the first time. She seized me between the legs and a grunt escaped me. My hand moved of itself, shoved her away. I tried not to think on what she'd said about dying, about being killed. Repulsed, I put the sword down on the table, keeping my eyes on the homunculus. She tossed her hair and smiled. I was relieved to see only ordinary teeth. Are you frightened? Of me? I was. My hands burned where she had touched me. Where I had touched her. As if with fever. And my breath came in ragged gasps. Of this place, I said. Of your master. Why? He likes you. He must like you, else he'd not have sent you me. She advanced, leaning, leaning over the table. I like you too. But then, I like everyone. It's my nature. What do you mean? I asked, though I had a suspicion. You mean you don't have a choice? She showed her teeth again, knowing too well whence my treasonous eyes were drawn. Ooh, none of us has a choice. We like what we like. We can't explain it. We can only explain it away. Advancing, she pressed her hands against my chest. Take off your boots, soldier. Stay a while. She was very close. One arm snaked back behind my head and bent it down. Lips pressed against mine. Tongue. I'd forgotten where I put my hands, forgotten where to find them. She broke away, stepped back so that she could look over the length of me. I wore the same belted black tunic, high boots and pipe trousers I'd worn on Roostam. You look fit for the parade ground and I'm not wearing a stitch, she pouted, then did something with her hand that pulled some howling animal from the lowest dungeons of my brain. Doesn't seem fair, does it? It didn't seem fair at all, put that way. My tongue felt thick, and a red mist was rising in my mind. But there was yet a piece of me, the piece that drove me to write this account, I don't doubt, which replied, What makes you think I'm a soldier? Ooh. Naya bit her lip. The shoes, mostly? Those boots? Like I said, I bet if you took them off, you wouldn't be a soldier, though. Only a man. Men are only men when you take their uniforms away. I had no intention of allowing such to be done to me, and hurried past Naya to the door. As I did, I brushed up against my journal where it lay on the table's edge and knocked it to the floor. You should go, I managed to say, fumbling with the locks. I wanted her to go. I wanted her to stay. I didn't know what I wanted. We like to imagine that we are ourselves a unity. One mind, one spirit. Not so. In truth, we are each a little legion. A pack of little personae. Each one-eyed in its attentions and single-minded in its aim. I pulled in two directions and so fumbled the door controls even as her hand seized mine and pinned it to the wall. I might have resisted. But resistance seemed wrong, somehow. Surely there was no harm in letting her stay. She wanted to stay. Don't say that, she said, putting a hand on my cheek. What's wrong? Don't you like me? She took my hand and dragged it to her breast. I kept seeing Brevin's secretary in the corner of my eye. Her dumb obedience, her hobbled gait, the way she simply stood there, waiting. How many were there in her inner legion? How many had she been allowed to have? Brevin had made her that way to suit his own purposes. Khan had made Naya, or bought her, to be precisely what she was. She said it herself. She could not choose, and my choices were narrowing, drowned by the red fog behind my eyes. A chill went through me even as she kissed me again. I felt her pressed against me. Her breast, her hands in my sweating hair. What had been done to me? I could feel the resistant piece of me fading and threw up my hands to knock hers away. 
I told myself it was thoughts of Jinan that stayed me, some nostalgia for our shattered romance. I told myself it was principle, what I learned from Kyra, what I'd loathed in Crispin, in Bordelon, in my own mother. The tendency of power to corrupt and abuse, but I still wonder if it was only terror, fear of that place and its dread lord, fear of the woman herself. Aching, I pushed her away. There was no hurt in her eyes. Laughing, she danced back. It was like she didn't understand, like I was speaking to someone in the wrong language, communicating by the wrong signs. Did you draw these? She asked, stooping, legs apart, to collect my journal where it had fallen. From her smile, I knew she'd acted deliberately. Relieved to have her off me a moment and be able to marshal my thoughts and smooth my tunic, I said, I did, yes. Naya flipped through the little journal, images fluttering by one after another. She didn't linger on any of them, not even on the images of Jinan that no eye was meant to see. She doubled back once or twice, shoulders folding in as she studied. After a moment, she shut the book with a snap and fully turning, said, Do me. She thrust the book at me and I took it, studying it for damage. I don't know why I bothered. The old thing had travelled in my coat through many dangers, and there wasn't an angstrom of it undamaged. I must have studied it too long, for the woman said, Draw me. She didn't wait for a response, but threw herself on the fainting couch, arching her back in a display worth commemorating. I could draw her, couldn't I? Just draw her? Keep her off me, keep her at arm's length long enough to gain a measure of control over the situation. So I seated myself opposite her and took out my stylus, pausing only long enough to master my breathing. I could hardly think, hardly hold the pen. My hand was shaking, but I began to draw her, broad strokes just taking in her shape. I didn't speak, for to speak seemed too much an invitation, and I did not trust myself. She didn't speak either, only watched me with unquiet intent those dusky eyes alert and alive. I never finished that drawing. I tore it out after, contaminated by the event. She moved quickly, more quickly than I could have believed. She brushed my hands away, knocking my journal against the floor, and straddled me, grinding her hips against me. Her lips found mine as she forced my head back, making me think again of the vampire. There was a strength in her clean limbs, and an urgency that scattered my legion and left a single one-eyed soldier at attention. Her breath came hot across my face and on the hollow of my throat, and all my thoughts were drowned in that red and fevered fog. Her tongue was in my mouth. I remember the taste of spiced wine and the mint-like tang of Hilatar. Naya let out a little moan and pressed herself closer to me. My hands traced up along her sides until I held her face between them, fingers in her hair. That was when I felt it, and froze. There was a metallic spur behind her right ear. At first I thought it jewellery, but with the symbol crash of memory, recalled the gleaming implant behind Khan's own ear. Nausea turned in me, and I stood lifting Naya to throw her bodily on the couch. Boots still on, I towered over her. Those dark eyes turned to look at me, and I was unsure whether it was terror or longing in them. Her designer doubtless had not wanted me or any man to know. She laughed, thinking it some species of game that I'd revealed myself, my soul, to her at last. Squirming, she spread her legs, small teeth playing against one lip. She didn't speak. I didn't stir. Words at last. Hers, not mine. What's the matter, soldier? She said. Going to keep your boots on after all? One hand descended, finding herself. Fine by me. You're him, I said, hands clenched. You're a som. Her brows furrowed, but she did not stir. What? Don't lie to me, I snapped. There's an implant behind your right ear. Here I lifted a finger and tapped my own head with a finger. Don't deny it. Her hand stopped, whole body gone stiff. 
something shifted behind those blackened open eyes. The thin blue iris grew, pupils narrowing, as though she were coming down from some drug. Her posture shifted and she crossed her arms, sat with knees apart as a man does. The thing behind her eyes smiled up at me, mouth open. In a voice, which was a parody of her voice, he said, You're a strange one. You should talk. I wore my anger like a cloak, clung to its folds with a desperation to fend off the sense of violation stealing over my bones. Naya, Khan, bared her teeth in a wicked grimace. She stood, and tapping one golden earring, restored the gauzy holograph shell she had first worn. How I had thought it cloth before, I couldn't say. It shimmered, floated to a wind that wasn't there. She paced round the dining table, her back to me, her every contour yet visible through the cloth. Why? Khan's characteristic silence answered me. I was suddenly too aware of the Heimata sword resting on the tabletop. The concubine stood between it and me, and I stood like a fool with his tunic, unbelted. Did you not like her? Our Naya? He traced a hand down her flank, turning as he did so. The gesture was obscene, as though her hand belonged to someone else, which I suppose it did. Get out. Does she not look a bit like that friend of yours? Get out, I almost shouted. Khan grinned at me. You must care for her. Valka. He was talking about Valka. My sense of violation sharpened, deepened in that now I was not the only one violated. Or else I'd have thrown myself on your slave. I retrieved my journal from the floor. You don't know me, Lord Sagara. I might have. I suppressed my creeping sense of horror and stood as before a firing squad, hands clasping my journal behind my back, chin raised. You won't. He watched me with her eyes. I could see the light behind them, the shadow. Almost I could see Khan's ruined body on its pale throne, his craggy face upturned, staring into the darkness above him, peering out from Naya's face. Do you abuse all your guests? I asked when I could stand his quiet no longer. Is that what you call it? He frowned. She was meant to honor you. She was meant to amuse you, I countered. And what have you done with Naya? She sleeps with the others until I call for her. And she's asleep now? I had no idea what he meant, but decided that I didn't want to know. Yes, he said. I tucked my chin to shade my eyes from Khan's pitiless examination. You know, I thought for certain you'd flee with your companions. He moved Naya's body all the way around the table so that she stood beneath the replica of cottages at Cordville. The painting struck an odd contrast so bright and wholesome beside the devil in her white dress. I advanced to stand opposite the puppet homunculus across the table, placing my journal beside the half-finished remnant of my meal. My sword was still closer to Khan, but I felt I stood a chance now if it came down to it. Trying to keep this concern from my face, I said, I have a job to do. Indeed, Khan replied. You know, I almost believe you. My companions will return the day after tomorrow. I said with all the candor and sobriety I could muster. You'll soon see. I expect I will. He turned her back on me, regarded his painting a moment. They said the artist was too intense, that he frightened people. Seem it strange to you that such a thing might be said of he who made so innocent a painting? I half-rounded the table, taking the opportunity to reclaim my sword, which I held carefully in one hand. A little closer now, I said. It's the color. People are afraid of color. Your painter saw too much of it. Is that why you only work in black and white? He asked. Because you are afraid. I didn't rise to the bait, and so Naya's voice added, An artist afraid is no artist at all. 
Is that why your palace is all grey stone? I countered. Because you are afraid. Khan Sagara watched me out of that woman's face, eyes old as empires. And do you abuse all your hosts? Is that what you call it? The undying barks a laugh, an astonishingly rough sound from so fine a throat. You argue like a Eudoran actor. He paused a moment, then without warning said, I will take my leave of you. He turned and on bare feet moved toward the door. Halfway between painting and portal he stopped. Shall I leave the girl with you, Marlowe? Get out. Chapter 36 The Devil and the Golem I couldn't sleep in my bed that night, nor upon the couch or in the winged armchair. Instead, I spent an hour on the floor of the shower there scolding myself, as if heat and pain could wash out the memory of her hands. I tried washing my mouth, but the taste of soap only reminded me of what had been done to me. The memory of Naya lingered with her perfume. I wrapped myself instead in my old coat in a corner of the room, when the suite's other doors would not unlock. It wouldn't hide me from Khan should he return, in one guise or another but I was as far from the memory of the homunculus and her white arms as I could manage. I missed Jinan, and missing her made it worse. When I did sleep, I dreamed again, and dreaming was conscious of a wet wind blowing out of darkness and the sound of waves. I was not in my body. I was only a moat, like an ember cast from unseen fires, hurtling through the night. I sensed deep water below me, and the sky above was clouded and close as the roof of some limitless cathedral. Witch lights, the precise greenish hue of those I'd seen on our descent from the orbital platform, shone in the depths. They illuminated a round and broken arch like the ring of some giant shattered but standing still. Adrian. I stopped hearing the voice, the same voice I'd heard in my dream when we first arrived on Vorgosos and called out, Who's there? But I had no voice. Listen. The word echoed in eternity. Infinity. Listen to me. Who goes there, I tried to say. Listen. I had a body then. Without warning, mass and weight, I fell like a stone, like a turtle dropped by an eagle. Plunging into the depths, I woke with a start before I hit the water. I did not explore the palace the next morning. I awoke to find food laid out for me, and the remains of the last night's unfinished meal cleared away. I turned my terminal to read to me, and tried to pick up where I'd left off with Impatience First Emperors, but the life of Victor Sebastos held little shine for me, and I soon surrendered to the quiet. Somewhere far above, Valka and the others were returning to the Mistral, beyond the misshapen statues of the Furies at the top of the high tower. I imagined them stepping through the airlock back into known territory, back onto familiar ground, back with familiar faces. I longed to leave with them, to take Otavia Corvo up on her offer, to leave this place and this foolish mission and never look back. Who did I think I was? I was no great hero. Am no great hero. I was only a foolish young man very far from home. Forget the Mistral. I'd have given all I had to wake up in my room at Devil's Rest, beneath my painted stars. This was all a nightmare. It had to be. I was in the palace of Khan Sagara, a myth old almost as the Empire itself. I had seen demons and xenobites, and imagined I could contend with them. Kings and pawns, I thought again. We're all pawns, my boy. Gibson's words echoed back to me. But remember, no matter who moves you, your soul is in your own hands. You have a choice. None of us has a choice, Naya said. Or was it Khan? Had the undying lurked behind her eyes from the very start? 
choice. That is the question, is it not? Those who say we are only flesh must reason that we have no will of our own, that we serve our impulses, which are rooted in our brains and nowhere else. Such thinking gave rise to the homunculi, who are made happy in their servitude. After all, to such thinking we are all slaves, if only to our breeding. Thus, it is no crime to create creatures such as Naya, and yet it is clearly a crime. Evil needs no explanation. You know it by its smell. That knowledge, that apprehension of the truth which is there and obvious, spoke to me of something more. To us. In us. A quiet thing. I wonder now what I looked like to Khan. He who had lived so long and so variously, who was no longer truly human. I suspected then and know now that much of his mind was given over to machines, that they sustained him in his old age and ordered what flesh and chemistry would have long ago destroyed. Being so old and so much machine, I think we must look to him as dogs do to us. Animals don't think as we, cannot be said to think at all. Rather, they inhabit their world and respond to it. They do not create, they do not choose. What Khan had done was clear. Create a sealed environment. Introduce a stimulus. I'd been a lab rat and my sleeping chamber the maze. It had not gone as Khan expected. However precarious my position, I had yet the will to choose. I was there, after all. Who would come to Vorgosos except by choice? Who would stay? I'd made my choice, and had only to wait. My friends would return soon. The door cycled open, and Yume appeared, leading a laden food trolley. Some part of me expected that it would be Naya again, or one of the girls who served the lords and ladies of the vestibule. The android smoothly deposited the steam tray in a pewter carafe and drinking cup on the table, making no comment. I watched it work, sitting with my back against the wall on a cushion in the corner. Yume cleared away the remnants of that morning's breakfast, and with it the torn-up image Naya had forced me to draw. It had been quite a long while, and looking up I saw the golem watching me, unmoving. The moment my eyes found its one, Yume's head twitched to one side. You are on the floor. Well spotted, I said, massaging beneath my terminal gauntlet with a finger. After the incident the night before, I'd kept my sword on my person at all times. It lay by my cushion then, near to hand, though I'd no notion how quickly the inhuman butler might move. The gears visible through the glass at Yume's hips and shoulders turned over, filling the silence with the ticking of jeweled mechanisms. In its clear, patrician tones, Yuma said, The master has asked that I apologize for the events of the previous evening and he hopes no offence was given. Offence, I repeated, half rising from the cushions. But I thought about Tanaran, about Volca and Switch and the others. They ought to be on the high tower descending. No, I said at last, unable to curb all the sarcasm from my voice. No offence. Yume clasped its delicate hands before itself. The master was worried when you didn't leave your chambers. So he sent you? I asked. Surely he knows where I am? I raised a hand, described a circle with one finger to indicate the cameras I felt sure were everywhere. The king with ten thousand eyes and all. If you mean to imply that you are under surveillance, I can assure you there is no monitoring equipment in the diplomatic suite. I confess I snorted. You expect me to believe that? Belief is not required. Is that so? I said, struggling to my feet. You'll forgive me if I'm not convinced. The golem said, I cannot lie. I'm supposed to believe that too. Belief is not required, yes. I turned my sword over in my hands, recalling how Khan had done that very thing on our first meeting. It had a pleasant weight, and the wine-dark leather grip was sweet to the touch. Her silver fittings only somewhat tarnished by time and hard use. 
The master considers it unwise to provide me with counterfactual data. It introduces error. Something all eyes should take into account, and something each of us forgets. Yume was not finished speaking. In any case, indulging mistruth violates the laws which govern what you think of as my persona. I stared at the creature. You mean to say that you do not truly think? I am only what the master made me. A high-order virtual intelligence and personal assistant. Genuine cognition is not required, pursuant to which I was asked to attend to any desires his lordship might have. The couch loomed beside me, and it was all I could do not to turn my eyes in that direction, for I knew all too well just what Khan Sagara had in mind where the matter of desire was concerned. Instead, I asked, Where are my friends? Are they on their way back down? They are still aboard your ship at the marina. We expect they will be underway shortly, provided we do not occupy the 9% probability space where they leave without you. 9%, I repeated, not impressed. And what data are you working off, precisely? Only what is available. Hmm. If it were really true, if Khan didn't monitor my rooms, what a statement of power it was to permit his guests their privacy. All the same, I knew well that the single eye in Yume's face was one of Khan's ten thousand, just as Naya's two had been. For all I knew, the undying lurked even then behind his servant's face, and watched, and listened. Tanaran's arrival could not come soon enough. Chapter 37 Tanaran Two meals passed, and the better part of a day, and in all that time no word from Yume as to my companion's whereabouts. On its twin appearances, the golem only said what it had said before. The door opened a third time hours before I expected the golem to return. Still here? Valka stood in the doorway. You may behind her with a towering figure in a hooded black abola. It seems strange to say that after so short a time apart, seeing a familiar face was like seeing the sun after weeks underground. But it was. I rose from the table at speed, glad not to be alone in that awful place. Where else would I be? I said, and turning to the hooded figure added, Asvato o renim. Tiokarin Yelnurium Nushi. M. Nushi? In its native tongue, the tall Xenobite replied, You are most welcome. Looking round, I asked, Where are the others? Valka and the Sielsen priest were alone. Polino, Krim, Ilex, and Switch were nowhere to be seen. It was Switch's absence that seemed the strangest to me, as indeed it was, and his absence I felt most sharply. I suggested they stay behind, Valka said. Tis no danger here. Despite this, she was still wearing her sidearm strapped to one thigh. Switching to Valka's native panthai, I asked, You came alone? With it? I suppressed an urge to glance at Tanaran, who stood impassive, but must have guessed we spoke about it. Tis perfectly safe, she replied in the same language. I told Otavia I could handle it. You know, I think if you'd come back as well, she'd have done all she could to leave this place. That didn't sit right with me. Captain Corvo must have been greatly unsettled to have allowed such a thing. If that was so, I could understand her wanting to keep Krim and Ilex aboard the Mistral. They were her people, after all. That Switch or Polino hadn't come either filled me with a deep foreboding and the blank loneliness I felt before Valka's reappearance asserted itself again. What's it like on the ship? Valka's eyes turned toward the watchful Yume. The golem stood impassive, waiting to be acknowledged. She brushed hair from her eyes as she returned her attentions to me. Unsettled. She raised a hand to touch my arm, but seemed to think better of it. They still can't access the ship's communications or navigational readouts. They're locked out. It has Otavia and Durand nervous. I'm sure it's just the Vorgos scene protecting their privacy. She sent people around the landing platform up there. 
All the ships are locked down the same way. I'm sure this place hasn't kept its secrets for so long without being careful, I said, looking away. What's wrong? She did touch my arm then for only a moment. Nothing, I said too shortly. It's nothing. This place. Tanaran's Galstani was still halting, still thick on its alien tongue, but it spoke clearly. It is like the ships of my people. I noticed then that the Sielsin was not squinting. Beneath the shadow of its hood, the black eyes, large as fists, were wide and staring. Valka turned to the silent golem, thrust out her chin. Will your master see us now? He will, you may said, gesturing. This way. I had expected Khan to delay, to let us fester for weeks again as I had the first time. But the Undying seemed to have found for himself some scrap of urgency, and his pet golem led us down to the dark tramway about that lightless ocean. Ahead, the white shape of Khan's inverse pyramid shone like the face of some blank spectre by night. There are buildings, Tanaran said. Far below. There, Valka pointed back the way we had come. Down and down. I could see nothing in the darkness. What Tanaran's alien eyes saw, I couldn't say. I had to remind myself that these deep caverns must have been like daylight to the Xenobite. It seemed at once incredible to me that evolution should have given this Sielsin eyes at all. Ought it not to have fashioned some blind beast? Some creature that saw through sound, or else sensed the vibrations of the ground beneath it? I wondered again what sort of homeworld the Sielsin called their own. There I had a Baitan of the Atani, and I didn't think to ask. The old city, you may said, and said no more. The faint sound of a horn playing filled the air of the entrance hall when we arrived. The smell of the distant sea followed us into the pyramid, faded as we descended the long stair toward the throne room. The wooden doors at the end of the hall swung inwards silently, and the faint music faded to silence, as though we had interrupted the Lord Cigar at his music. Volker halted on the threshold, plagued, I think, by that same fear which accosted me the last time I'd stood in that place. Khan Sagara hadn't moved since last I saw him. Still he sat, saturnine and stone-faced, amid the darkness and all that pale stone. An ancient analog musical device sat on the dais beside him, its twisted horn directed toward the king in yellow. How we had heard the thing from the pyramid antechamber above, I couldn't guess. Some acoustic trick or technological devilry, perhaps. As before, he didn't speak. He didn't seem to notice us at all. His eyes were very far away, wandering with his other eyes in places unknown to me. I had seen Khan's wandering eyes from time to time, floating down corridors and galleries, admiring his great collection more than they kept watch. Beside me, Valka shifted uncomfortably on her feet. Taking this as my cue, I took a step forward and, not bowing, said, Thank you, Lord Sagara, for seeing us again on such short notice. Unable to help myself, I added, I know how valuable is your time. Was it my imagination? Or did the faintest trace of a smile crease that ancient and ageless face? Faint and far above, the blue-white gleam of the Undying's camera eyes winked on. They descended soundlessly, little one-eyed fish shapes swimming on the airs. The human face didn't turn to me, in this way recalling the blind beggars I had seen so often mutilated on the Chantry steps. After another pause of perhaps half a minute, I gestured to Tanaran and said, I've brought the Sielsin emissary, as I promised. On cue, Tanaran removed its hood. No easy task with its horned crown. In that open space, the Sielsin was at last able to stand to its full height. Tanaran was short for a Sielsin and yet young. Despite this, it towered nearly eight feet high. Thin as a reed it was, and the great cloak it wore fit it badly, being at once too broad and too short. Speaking as it had to Captain Corvo, it said, I am Cassantora Tanaran Ayakato, by Tan of Itani Otiolo, of Ayeta Aranata. Two of Khan's drones swerved so that 
Like a pair of living eyes, they regarded Tanaran face to face. After another interminable silence, Khan said, A Sielsin that speaks the tongues of man. Here is a thing I have not seen in fifteen thousand years. Welcome, Tanaran of Otiolo. Eka Khan Sagara. I am Khan Sagara. That was all he said. No title, no pomp. He needed neither. Leaning forward but not lowering his eyes to us, Khan spoke in perfect Sielsin. This human tells me you are his prisoner. This human. Khan used the word the pale use of us. Yukajim. Vermin. I glanced at Volker. She caught the term as well, eyebrows raised. Tanaran bobbed its head, hands clasped before its chest. I am Lord. We were taken prisoner on pilgrimage. Zadituri, ne? Khan repeated the last word. Which world was this? Emesh, Valka said, drawing the attention of another of Sagara's eyes. You did not know the humans had settled there. The undying's voice seemed to pace around us, circling like wolves, flowing with the steady orbit of the watchful eyes. Tanaran glanced down at me, a curious expression on its flat and bloodless face. No human made such an expression. The way its upper lip twisted, curling back from translucent teeth. I recalled Valka's words to me then. I'd not be so sure you can read Tanaran. Perhaps she was right. Still, I think the Xenobite had nearly so much difficulty with me, for it watched my face all the while it spoke, saying, We did not. We recovered the coordinates from Akhtarumu. I stood impassive, not sure what to make of this. I had no notion of what Akhtarumu was, whether it was a person or a place. Valka and I exchanged significant glances. The word pilgrimage had religious overtones, even in the alien tongue. It was easy to imagine that dim throne room a part of the dark beneath Kalagar, and easy to hear again the words of Tanaran's captain. They are not here. They. The quiet. Tanaran and its people had come to Emesh seeking after the ruins there, after the ancient Xenobites that had built so many hallowed sites across known space. Hundreds of thousands of years before mankind stood upon her own two feet and learned to walk. And you arrived to find the world in human hands, Khan said. His lips didn't move. The artificial voice that filled the hall was not the voice of his body, but a thing deeper, darker, the amplified tones of a god in some bad Eudoran play. Such melodrama has its critics, though I am not one. Quickly then, Tanaran recounted what it could of its capture on Emesh, how their ship had been shot down by Rain Smythe and the 437th Centaurine Legion, how they had fled into the tunnels beneath Kalagar, to die, they thought, to make one last heroic stand amidst the ruins of their gods. It told how I had come and won Uvanari's surrender, how a scant dozen survivors were taken by the Empire. Here I intervened, telling how the Chantry had taken Uvanari for interrogation. They'd wanted the location of the Sielsin fleet and tortured the captain for it, despite my assurances that neither it nor its people would be harmed. A genuine smile twisted Khan's lip at that. You should not have spoken for the Empire, he said. I brushed this off, explained that I had agreed to kill the Sielsen captain to deliver it from the Chantry Cathars, and in exchange it had given me a name, Arenata Otiolo, a prince of the Sielsen, master of one of their strange clan fleets, and it had told me to seek Borgosos. It said you'd dealt with the Atani Otiolo before, and you alluded to the same, I said, moving to stand beside Tanaran. The king of Borgoso sat a long time unresponding. It seemed no force could wake him from his place. He might have been one of the statues. Even our Sielsen compatriots seemed disquieted. For a moment I considered saying that I had fled the empire. 
uncertain if my act of rebellion would endear me to that lord of the extrasolarians, or undermine my credibility as an apostle. So I erred on the side of caution and held my peace. How delicate was that moment. How fragile. I hadn't told Valka. There had been no time. How badly that first meeting had gone, or about Naya. Never before had I felt so much the fly caught in the spider's web. Not even in Boris Evo as Count Mataro's captive star had I felt so robbed of agency. I was for a moment only a character in Tanaran's story, in Khan's ongoing myth. Tell me by Tan, and Khan's voice was like the roll of distant thunder. What do you want? Almost heard beneath the rumble of that vast voice, I heard words from Khan's own lips murmured. Sibylla Tithelaeus. I didn't then recognize the language, or the source, nor had I time to dwell upon it. The towering alien looked down at me a moment, wringing impossibly long-fingered hands. Valka was right. I could read nothing in those black wells it called eyes. I might as well have tried to hold discourse with a shark. It hesitated, then turned to Khan and in its high, cold voice said, I want to return to my master. And peace, Khan asked. Do you wish that? Tanaran drew itself up to its full height and repeated itself. I wish to return to my master. Wish, it had said. Cool. A stronger word than want. And your master will pay handsomely for the return of his property. His. Unlike every other noun in the Sielsin language, unlike every other Sielsin, the princes were always he. To those familiar with the language, it had an ominous quality. One could almost hear the drum beats just off stage. With glacial slowness, Khan Sagara turned his face down to regard the three of us standing there. I might reach out to your master, priest. He raised a finger, tracing an arc from Valka's face to mine. But not for them. I took a step forward, hands closing into fists. Seeing this, Valka caught me by the elbow and squeezed. The orbiting swarm of eyes pulled back, their lazy motions seeming to lock into something coherent, watchful, their glowing lenses shifting from blue to livid white. The man himself seemed untroubled by my sudden motion. His eyes were like spots of ink on old vellum, and he frowned down at me. The Solon Empire can offer me nothing with this piece of theirs. But your master. The voice in the air around us cracked like a lightning flash as five eyes floated toward Tanaran. Your master may indeed be pleased to have you returned. Him? I will deal with. Valka's hand yet tightened on my arm, nails biting even through my coat and sleeve. My mind was reeling. I could feel the light of his glowing eyes on me, on Valka the malice and the threat in them like laser points. We were alone and far from help, and the laws that govern diplomacy and the treatment of guests and emissaries meant nothing on Vorgosos. If Sagara wished to take our prisoner, he could, and I couldn't stop him. But Tanaran spoke again, saying, Raka tu taihete. That is generous. My heart sank but the Yukajim have ten of my clansmen, my master's property. Ayeta Aranata would want them as well. Then we shall have them removed from this Marlowe's custody. He doesn't have them, Tanaran replied. They remained with his fleet when we fled here. Realizing what it implied by those words, Tanaran stopped speaking, darting its eyes to me. If the Undying caught the reference to our highly illegal flight from the Balmung, he gave no sign. 
You know the humans mean to kill your master and your clansmen, Khan said, voice dripping from the dark above. The humans will claim they aim for peace and kill you at table, as is their way. He spoke with the weight of authority, of long knowledge, yet there was no condemnation in his tone, only the weary acceptance of old age, as they have done before. What do you mean? Valka demanded. Ironic that she, who had held me to silence, should break hers. What do you mean, as we have done before? I meant what I said, Sagara, I said, extricating myself from Valka's talons. But Tanaran said, I must return to my master, and return all I can to him. If that means dealing with the Yukajim, so be it. It placed one massive hand on its chest. And if we can put a stop to the fighting, that has claimed too many of the people's lives, then so be that too. A bark of laughter escaped Khan, though his mouth remained closed. Interesting. Then, your companions' lives mean little to me, Baitan. But you, you are valuable. Your master will not want to lose the history of his clan in you. He will come for you. And you will remain here until he does. And what of us? I asked, close to shouting. I did not come here to lose a prisoner, Sagara. I'd abandoned the Sielsen tongue and spoke once more in clear Galstani, finding strength in the familiar sounds. I could almost hear Gibson at my shoulder reminding me to stand straight, to speak clearly. What you came here for is of little concern to me, replied the king of Vorgosos, one of his gleaming eyes jabbing at my face like an accusation. You will be paid for your trouble. You may depart on the morrow. I wasn't finished. If the Prince Arenata is coming here, let me remain. I held one hand extended, palm up in entreaty. Let me speak to him. In the name of Mother Earth, Lord Sagara, in the name of our common humanity. Humanity! The Undying shouted, and with horror, I perceived he spoke the word with his own lips. He reached a hand up under his robe, and with a hissing sound, pulled the snaking grey hose out from beneath his floating plated ribs. The other hand he planted upon the arm of his chair, and with a surge like the ocean fling a rising colossus, Khan Sagara stood. I had not known he could do that. What about our humanity as common, Hadrian Marlowe? He said, arms thrown wide so that the ruin of his surgically altered torso was on full display the black socket of a hose connection sucking light above his heart. Disconnected from his throne, some praxis deep in Khan's chest breathed for him, ragged and rattling, pulling on the air like a plasma burner. You bring war to my doorstep and say it is in the name of peace. No. With glacial care, he adjusted the drape of his shimmering golden robe and clasped his hands behind his back. I shook my head, unwilling to give up so easily. I came here in good faith. I have not lied to you about my purposes. Whatever you believe about the Empire and its motivations, I am here of my own will and against the wishes of the Imperial Chantry. When was the last time Khan Sagara had been surprised? not merely presented with some novelty, but startled. His mouth opened, eyes narrowed, his cloud of eyes swiveled all to look at me. Against the Chantry, you say? Curiouser and curiouser. From the dark they came, the men with sagging faces, a dozen of Khan's Soms in their dun uniforms. No sound of doors opening had heralded their arrival, and I had the awful sense that the creatures had been waiting just outside the circle of light, surrounding the Undying's high seat. They all stopped ten paces from us, their presence felt, their threat clear. 
Mare Rosa, Oyum, Baram Tanaran, Seo Namshem, Bao Karine. Khan asked our Sielsen companion, You said your name is Tanaran? When the Zenobite said that it was, he continued, We will have a place set aside for you. Lord Sagara, please. I stood nearly at the first step of the dais by then. Give me a chance. The king in yellow raised one hand, steady as a stone. As in the city plaza beneath its pale grey dome, the Somme surrounded us. Valka raised her hand smoothly, demonstrating by the gesture that she meant no threat or resistance. Listen to me, I shouted. Clammy hands seized me away, turning me away. Khan did not answer me. His face was far away. Chapter 38 The Face of Failure Will you smile if I say I was wrong? Valka asked. I had been silent for minutes, almost so silent as Khan. The remains of the meal we had found waiting for us in the diplomatic suite stood between us, and I was reminded of those many nights or evenings we had spent on Emesh, talking of archaeology and politics and other things. Even my somber attitude was the same. I pushed my plate away. About what? About there being no danger here, she said. The memory of the Psalms and their iron hands shone in her eyes. I felt them too. Chewing on my tongue, I nodded, but did not smile. We came all this way for nothing. She wasn't looking at me. Her bright eyes tracked across the dim grey rooms around us, over the priceless furniture cracked and aging, and over the reproduction of that cheery painting behind me. Only after a Khan-like pause did those eyes find me again, and she asked, Are you all right? That question took me by surprise. Inhaling sharply, I shook myself. Yes. Yes, of course. I lied, rubbing my eyes with one hand. I'm not sure it was for nothing. If that was really the case, we'd have been sent away. It was my turn to take in those crumbling accommodations. The well-maintained wood and leather of the tables and chairs, belied by the cracked cement and peeling plaster in walls and ceiling. I suppose it could be Khan's having the Mistral search. Perhaps he thinks he'll find the other Sielsin prisoners despite what Tanaran said, and solve all his problems in one. As I spoke, I remember I'd kept lifting the end of my fork and dropping it against the edge of the plate, so that it made a tinny ringing sound, like an offbeat metronome. We're not under guard, Valka said. I could sense those drones of his, and there's nothing at the door. I hoped she was right. Valka took my plate to stop my noise with the fork, and placed it and hers on the ever-present trolley. As she turned, I caught her profile in the light of a glass-shaded lamp. Regal as any queen was she, as the image of the Empress Titania Augusta, which still adorns the odd hurasam one finds. Not for the first time. I thought a man might dash himself to pieces against her as a ship is thrown against rocks. The moment didn't last, for it is the nature of black moods to leap from one tragedy to the next. And seeing Valka again in that light brought Jinan's anima howling within. I looked away. I hope you're right, I said, seeing in my mind's eye a platoon of Khan's undead troopers cutting through doors and turning over beds in the Mistral. Otavia would fight if he tried to take the ship. She'd think we were dead. My head fell into my hands, combed fingers violently through my hair. I wish we could get a message to them. Tell them to stand down, or... You can't reach them with your... I pointed at the spot on the back of my own head, where Valka's neural lace had its external contact. The Tavrosi woman gave me a tight smile, lips curled into an amused V. You can say implant, Hadrian. She shook her head, muttered, Anariok. Barbarian, she called me. But there was no malice in the word. But no. 
even if I could through all the rock above us. Tis behind layers of ice, our ship. Ice? Network defenses, she said, imitating the gesture I'd made in pointing at her implant. When I was up there to get Tanaran, Duran said they'd had no luck trying to get the ship's data sphere working again. There's the quantum telegraph? That's analog, but it only communicates with your fleet, and I'm not sure about you, but I'm not eager to meet Basanda Lin again. Chewing my tongue again, I said, No, indeed. And it's no use to us anyway. It's on the ship. We were alone then. Alone and at the mercy of the undying. Besides, it's Jinan I fear to see most, not Basanda. I had not thought on that, Barker said, betraying by the speed of her words that they were not quite true. She'd been looking away from me, I recall, her hands in her lap. Her eyes found my face then, if only for a moment. Are you really all right? Unable to speak past clenched teeth, I forced a weary nod. The look Jinan had given me as she knelt in the Baumung's hangar to fire on me played behind my eyes, superimposed with other images of my captain, illuminated by safety lights in the dark of her cabin, glowing with sweat on the training floor, hair astray as she fussed, bent over her paperwork, all faded, washed out by the anguish of that moment, washed away by her tears. I realized I had been clenching my fist on the table, the knuckles white. Valka noticed, eyebrows raised, and I spread my palm flat as I looked away. It's done. I know it is done. It was not what I asked you. There was iron in her. Arguing with her was like arguing with a scalpel. I'll be fine, thank you. I made my choice, and she didn't make it with me. I had tried, but Jinan had refused me. We go on to Vorgosos, you and I. You should not be joking about these things. I had not been joking. Valka finished off the last of her wine in contemplative silence. Lips pursed, her chin propped against her tattooed fist. I don't suppose tis time. Her voice was ashen. Time to take Otavia up on her offer, do you mean? I asked, leaning as far back as my chair would allow. Give up on all this. I clasped my hands behind my head and broke eye contact, staring at a patch on the wall where the plaster had flaked away in ages past. I'm sure Sagara wouldn't stop us leaving. We could just walk out now, you know. I jerked my chin at the door, yet even as I did so, I knew I couldn't leave. I was haunted by the sound of Uvanari's screams beneath the Cathar's knives, by the black scar on Roostum where a city had once been, by the list of all the worlds so similarly scarred. There was still a chance. You could come with me, Valka said, taking her chin off her hands. I'm no mercenary. Without the Sielsin, this little expedition has little to offer me. She paused, shifting in her seat and turning her head off at a sly smile, watching me out the corner of her almond eyes. You could be my assistant, I snorted. Your bodyguard. A shadow fell across her face, cast by Gilliam's shade, and her mocking smile turned to lead. I'd meant the remark to salvage a portion of my dignity, but it had only cut her, and cutting her myself. I looked away. Valka stood, and turning, paced toward the far wall, where a display case fronted a collection of antique glassware. Without her customary vest and short jacket, Valka seemed small to me, though she was not much shorter than I. Her flared jodpers made her torso seem oddly shrunken, as though the smallest weight might bend those narrow shoulders. How tired she seemed. What is Akterumu? she asked. Her reflection moved in the glass, eyes on me. Meeting those eyes, I let my hands fall. Another quiet ruin, I suggested. Tanaran said they recovered Emesh's coordinates from Akterumu. That suggests, well, some sort of recovery operation, does it not? I suppose it could be a person, 
Valka mused. Or a Sielsen colony. The Sielsen don't make colonies. She clasped her hands behind her back. The gleaming spots of her eyes reflected in the cabinet were shuttered. A ship, then, or one of their clans. She was trying to distract herself, I realized, from our current predicament. I wondered if Valka had ever been a prisoner. On Emesh, I'd grown so used to the idea of her as a demoniac and a foreign witch, with all the glamour that implied, that it hadn't occurred to me that her upbringing among the demarchists, but for the matter of the Prakar terrorists, had been a comfortable one. She hadn't lived in the streets in fear of the urban prefects, nor fought in Colosso. Unable to leave without breach of contract, knowing that but for an act of God, you would be killed before that contract was up. She hadn't taken up arms as a mercenary, had not been Wentz prisoner on Pharos, as had I. Was it possible that Valka, herself carved of adamant and sardonyx, was afraid? Are you all right? I asked, not rising from my seat. Valka jerked as if I'd startled her, but didn't turn and face me. Yes. Yes, I'm fine. Tis you I'm worried about. I could see her reflection watching me. You've given so much to this piece of yours, and it hasn't gone like you thought. I'll be all right, I said, meeting those reflected eyes. We both held our silence, both comfortable in our lies. Still faintly, I could detect the crushed flower smell of Naya's perfume. Was glad that Valka could not, or could not place it. I feared to see judgment in those golden eyes, however unwarranted. Women are ever the judges of men, our jury and, though their hands seldom grasp the knife, our executioners. I think now that a large, quiet part of my motivations for seeking out peace and parley with the Sielsen came from my youthful desire, in the court of Bali and Mataro, and at Caligar before it, to impress Valka. In our earliest meetings, she had thought me a butcher, then merely a cad. She was a demarchist, and her dislike of me was motivated by a dislike of all hierarchs, and of hierarchy itself. She, who claimed to resent all class and privilege, resented me for mine. Her prejudice against me, her judgment, had in part shown me my own prejudices, my own failings. I, unwilling and unable to apologize for being what I was, sought to prove that she had not understood me, that I was more. So I became more. True, I had wanted peace as well, but only in that abstract sense in which most people want peace. I'd love the thought of the Sielsen because they were alien, exotic, strange. I thought these my reasons for descending into Caligar, for offering my services to Sir Alorin Milta and to Basanda Lin that night, Uvanari, Tanaran, and their people crashed on Emesh. Now I wonder if Valka had not given those desires a gravity and a goal. Perhaps that was why it hurt so much to hear her speak of surrender. I did not want to go. Didn't want to give up. Or perhaps it was the faces burning in my memory, Uvanari's and the others. Or, perhaps, as I'd always claimed, it was because I believed it only the right thing to do. As if I, a boy of thirty-five, had any notion what right was or how it might be achieved. Did you ever learn just what it is they do here? Valka asked, changing the subject. She turned at last, leaning up against the cabinet, hands resting on a little lip that separated the glassed in portion from its base. Or how they do it, I mean. I could feel song and the crowd of nobiles milling about us, smoky forms haunting the gloomy airs. I fancied I saw the Baroness Harfleur of Varadito, the black-skinned Lady Catherine, vanish as into a vat of ink. In my mind she emerged again thin and straight, clean-limbed and smiling with all the flush of youth. Baron Song followed, his white hair turned to black. Not exactly, I confessed but I know he grows children, new bodies for his clients. How he transfers their minds, I've no idea. Some praxis like yours, I'd imagine. To my relief, a look of horror crossed the Tavrosi woman's face, 
and she breathed, Children. If she took offense at my linking Khan's practices to herself, she gave no sign. I was kept in a vestibule with the rest of Sagara's clients. Lords and ladies of the Imperium, rich merchants, Mandari, that ilk. They spoke of being taken below. Below? Valka asked. Her eyes drifted far away in thought. Those buildings Tanaran and I saw. Below the tram. I could only shrug. It's possible I couldn't see them. I shifted in my seat. How could you? Valka's knowing smile and the spark of it returned, and she crossed her arms, fingers tracing the contours of her clan tattoo above the left elbow. That smile sharpened, and she said, A girl has her ways. I made a small, unimpressed sound with my nose and flashed my teeth. They're machine, aren't they? They can see in the dark. And other things, Valka said. Does that frighten you? The way she said it, each syllable a sunburst in her bright and airy voice, cold and sharp as winter ice. I remembered why Mataro's courtiers called her a witch. No, I said. You don't frighten me. You're the only thing here that doesn't frighten me. I noticed then that she had neither confirmed her eyes machine nor denied, and I marveled that if they were such, a construct of metal perhaps or of crystal set in porcelain, that none on Emesh had discovered it. But then the neural lace which haunted the grey matter of her brain had itself gone undetected. Valka's smile faltered only a bit, softened. Crossing her arm, she said, Do you think that's how he's lived so long? Kansagara, I mean. To be honest, I hadn't even considered it, though it seemed right the moment she'd spoken the words. I pictured serial lives, each running back like the links in a chain anchored to the boy of legend whose mother had died under exalted guns. Possibly, I said. That and his machines. Children, Valka repeated, shaking her head. Strands of dark hair came loose from behind her small ears. A piece of me stirred, longing to return them to their proper place. I fixed my own hair instead as if some act of sympathetic magic might neaten hers with mine. That can't be all they do. I'm sure it's not, I said. But whatever else they do here could be had elsewhere. From the Exalted or on March Station, maybe. I can't imagine someone going through all the trouble it takes to get here for something one might have elsewhere. Valker agreed with me, and I added, I think I found a way down, actually. And I told her about the step well I had found and the door where Yume had accosted me, about the orchard stair and the strange creature there. Valka massaged her jaw, eyes lost amid the corridors of thought. Her voice, when it came, sounded just as remote. You think it goes down to the sea? There was a tunnel in the bottom cut into the rock. Not like this. I waved a hand at the concrete box of a room. I think these tunnels and the domes must have been here originally. As I spoke, I recalled that Ilex thought the dome had been built over a crater, and that the planet's surface ice had built over the dome in ages since. It wasn't hard to imagine that an early settlement might have used such a crater as a blasting pit for departing rockets, or else sheltered from whatever winds there were as scoured the surface. I think Khan added his pyramid and some of the rest. They don't feel like they belong. You don't think he built it all? You've heard the stories. She made a small noise of assent, and pressing on, I said, I suppose the Exalted built it, back when the Empire was young, before Jad, before Tavros, before everything. I couldn't conceive of so remote a time. Khan had been born mere centuries after the Foundation War, after the advent and the assumption of Earth. It had been a time not unlike the myths my mother told, for the past is to us little different than a story and the great figures of ages past are little different than the heroes in storybooks. Being in that place, speaking with Sagara, it was as if Sid Arthur himself had greeted me in that throne room. Almost I might have expected the sword of Mars plunged into a stone at the bottom of the orchid stair. Those who say stories are only stories are only fools.
Do you think the stories are true? Valka asked. That he built this place with the help of Americani artificial intelligence. A demon, I said, feeling a twinge of the old fear that we were being observed. Whatever Yume's assurances and Valka's insistence that we were alone. Anything's possible, and it would explain— Valka interrupted me. Explain the override on the ship after we left the Enigma. She traced her lower lip with one finger. And why they can't get control of their systems? The doctor was pacing back and forth now, moving along the end of the room nearest the door, hands behind her back. You're making that face again. What face, I said, turning my expression studiously blank. The face you make when you've had an idea any normal human would discard out of hand. She placed her hands on the back of the winged armchair and leaned over to look at me. When I still said nothing, she said, What? I raised my eyebrows. What does a face like that look like? The doctor pursed her lips but didn't reply. Struggling to keep my expression studiously blank, I said, Supposing it was some type of demon holding the Mistral in place, couldn't we use it to access Sagara's records, free the Mistral from lockdown, find Tanaran and escape? How do you propose to do that? Valka asked. You don't know a thing about where you are going, or what you are looking for, or how to use an AI. I spread my hands, shrugged. I have you. Aren't we presumptuous? Valka's smirk was audible, was almost tangible. I'd been looking at my hands and at the space on the tabletop between them, as if I expected to see some blueprint in the scratches and the grain of that wooden tabletop. I thought of the oracles I've seen in bazaars across the Empire, old women and toothless ones claiming to see the future in the lines of the palm of one's hand. Meditating on that, I closed my own hands, erasing such lines from sight. Drumming the table, I toyed a moment with the thought of kidnapping Yume. The golem would have much of the knowledge we needed, but I knew that the moment we attacked Khan's prized android, the Undying would know what we'd done. Assuming what the machine had said was true about the installation's security cams, we stood a chance of making it below. Assuming below was where we wanted to be. I dismissed the idea reminding myself that Valka hadn't even seen the creature in the data sphere. It's only presumptuous. If you say no, I said then. Are you? Saying no? No. Chapter 39 The Last Story There came a time when we could wait no longer. Three days had passed, with nothing of note to mark them save that Valka accompanied me on my wanderings through storied galleries and along the packed exhibit chambers. Yume had declined to speak to us of all but the most cursory things, and so we had taken to exploring the labyrinth instead. Perhaps I'd hoped to find Tanaran in among the collection, wandering itself as we were permitted to do. Thrice I saw one of Khan's roving eyes gleaming in the gloom. Only once did it stop as I called out to it, and it didn't stay to hear my words. Wet air blew against our faces as the door to the orchid stair opened. The eponymous flowers hung from tree branches and the Nipponese-style arches that stood along the winding path down to the level of the gate. The artificial lighting was more umber now than golden, though whether it simulated sunset or sunrise I couldn't say. Cicadas screamed in the false gloaming, and the nightingale sang. "'Tis beautiful," Valka breathed, pushing into the dim and fading light. I noticed lanterns hanging on the Tory arches starting to glow, and despite the weight of where we were and the slender thread by which we held on, I smiled. Joy is rare, a thing always of the now, existing without regard for time past or time future and without depending on them. Despite the long road and its troubles, despite the horrors that lay ahead, I've never forgotten her smile then, or the sound of her voice. It was a perfect moment, cut as crystal from the cloth of time. I was only an observer, 
and so felt I should be elsewhere, as if I were intruding like a storm cloud on Midsummer's Eve. The stair was beautiful, and the descent was beautiful, as if sunset had transported that stepped grotto from Vorgosos to Fairy, as if the gate on the bottom opened into Oberon's court, and not the deepest circle of hell. How else should it be? Milton's Satan had raised for himself a palace greater and more lovely than any in creation, after all. Pale lights winked to life amid the branches and hanging flowers, silver and pale gold. They twinkled, drifting like dandelion pods on the air. As the bloody sunlight dimmed, powering down, it was as if the stars themselves had passed through thousands of feet of stone to roost in the air of that cavern. Yet ahead of me, Valka stopped. What are they? she asked, incredulous. I knew. I heard stories about them time enough from Cat. Phasma Vigrandi, I said. The fairy lights of Luin. Are they really? Valka's eyes were wide as moons as she turned in place, drinking in the impossibly lovely sight. I've never seen them. Neither have I, I admitted. They seem less to fly than to float, blown like embers or snowflakes. Many settled against the trunks of trees or onto the high grass and bright flowers like a phosphorescent dew. I had a friend once upon a time who always wanted to see them. I reached out a hand, hoping that one might settle on it, like butterflies in a lepidopterarium. They never did. I couldn't make out their forms, so bright were they, and so small that they seemed composed of light alone. Tell me a story, would you? One last time. I could almost hear Kat's voice, her words small and sick shrunken even as herself. I told her the story of Khan Sagara at the end. Our last story. I told her how Khan Sagara had avenged his mother's death and the death of his people. How he had turned the exalted against themselves and made himself their lord. They said he had conquered a demon and made it his thrall. I hadn't believed it. Sometimes I think that Eduard was right that there is a god, and that he mocks me. Why else would Cat's fairies mark the road to that last and dreadful gate? And why would the road to its door run through that last story I had shared with her? Rest easy, Cat, and find peace on earth. Beautiful as the moment was, it couldn't last. We grew accustomed to the sight of the fairy lights as we descended the rough stair Mindful of the wooden ema hanging from the branches and from the tori, I could not read the painted letters, nor divine their purpose. Where before I had been unmoved by the beauty of that garden, now I understood. Understood that every temple, sanctum, and palace hall was an imitation done in lifeless stone of the living world. That pillars were only the poorest imitation of trees, and the ribbed vaults of arches and galleries nothing next to the canopies that hung overhead. We had come to do a thing, and to see what we could see. Valka was first onto the mosaic at the bottom of the well, and here she raised a hand. I had been speaking about what I cannot say, and fell silent as a stone. I have something, she said, voice hushed, and lowered all her fingers but one as if she tested the wind by it. I have little understanding of machines and almost none of that networked kind with whose operation Valka was so familiar. So when I say that she was a witch to me, it's because there was no difference to my perception between the arts she practiced and the incantations spoken by sorceresses in the most antique fables. I've heard it said, there's no magic in all creation, that what passes for magic is, to those initiated in its sacred mystery, only a species of knowledge. In this... Valka's thaumatogy was a skill little different from my abilities with a sword, only an art or science whose workings were alien to me. So too are the arts of the scoliasts or the vaunted powers of the maeskaloi, the genetic wizardry of the high college, and the horrors enjoyed by the exalted. All stand as the swordsmen to his quarry, to be conquered by their arts. I have reason to doubt this belief. There are mysteries in creation which do not break down, which defy our capacity. 
there exist walls beyond whose gates no art or reason can serve, and questions which cannot be answered. Of these, some exist only by our own failures, such as my ignorance of machines, but others, others only are. I know what Valka did wasn't truly magic, though it seemed as such to me. But next to the things that followed, mysteries in the truest sense, her display of power strikes me as a perfect thing, the image of human authority ordering the chaos of creation. In all our time together, I had had little chance to watch Valka work her magic, and though I saw much of it after, it is to that false twilight in the orchid stair my mind first goes when I think of her. Striding silent across the colored tessery, she never lowered her hand, though her head tilted to one side, as though she was trying to locate each bird singing in the trees on the levels above us. She told me once that navigating a data sphere was like trying to catch water in cupped hands. So much information traded past her, so many points and nodes working at once, that the narrow eye of her attention widened as it was by her neural lace and trained to handle such things, strained to apprehend them. You said the android that turned you away last you were here, she asked. I walked around her, hands at my sides, until I stood between her and the heavy door at the end of the rough tunnel. Her eyes were closed, and deep creases traced the shape of her struggle on her face. You're sure you want to do this? she asked, cracking one eye. Do you have a better idea? Several, she said, but the grin that stole over her serious face was like a ray of sunlight in the dark of night. The lights in the hall before us flickered and went out. My hand went to my sword where it hung familiar against my belt, ready on the electromagnetic clasp that held it in place. I turned, keeping myself between Valka and the darkness where the graven door had been my off-hand ready, on the catch, that would activate my Royce shield. What's happening? I asked. Shh! Valka hissed. A wet wind sighed down the hall, seeming to carry the shadows with it, as it sighed about the bottom of the well. That's the door. Something clattered against the mosaic tiles at my feet, and it was only my long combat experience that kept me still. It was one of Khan's eyes, a little silverfish no longer than the blade of my hand. I didn't hesitate and crushed it beneath my heel. Red light slammed on along the floor of the tunnel, and turning to Valka, I asked, Does he know? She was silent a long moment, face drawn down like a book slammed shut. Presently it opened, and she pulled a face. I don't think so. The door was on a closed system, isolated. It wasn't even hard. And the eye? The what? I spurned the thing with my toe. Horror and confusion warred across her marble face. Confusion won. In a voice dry as old parchment, she said, "'Twas not I. Gold eyes found mine. For an instant, neither of us moved. Something else had interfered, had knocked out Khan's eye. Not Khan himself, surely. After a disquiet moment, I said, We should go, and waiting for her to fall in beside me, hurried down the red-lit hall toward the burgeoning dark. Chapter 40 The Garden of Everything The room beyond was all of natural stone, pale in the dimness, lit only sparingly by fixtures in among the stalactites, which, like unfeeling fingers, hung from the ceiling. It was as though, having pierced all the strange layers of that world, Vorgosos at last gave up pretense and became only another part of creation. Ordinary. Valka and I hurried along a creaking metal catwalk that stood inches above the one stone floor with its shallow pools. Eyeless fish circled in the waters beneath us, small as my smallest finger, perhaps oblivious, perhaps marking us by our tread, and marking by the hesitancy in our steps that we were not Khan Sagara, but intruders in the deepest heart of his palace. At the end of the catwalk and down a broad stair which passed between graven stalagmites, there was another gateway, not a door, 
but a natural fissure, higher than it was wide and rippling, so that none might pass straight through it, nor any ray of light. I became terribly conscious of the sound of my footfalls, and of the thin sweat on the palm of my sword hand. Some piece of me, the foolish piece that fancied itself a storybook hero, half expected a serpent, a great dragon, to come spilling from that sticking mouth, and so I went in front of Valka, sword raised but quiet in my hand. None came. Khan's single weeping eye lay carved above that pointed entryway, not finely but with a clumsy hand, its lines long faded by the running of water, whose droplets soaked the lining of that passageway, glittering with the faint glow that emanated from within. Behind me, I felt Valka hesitate and held out my hand. She didn't take it, and I covered my embarrassment by turning it into a gesture that said, Stay back. Alone and mindful of the slick floor, I pressed forward, first left, sinister to use the fencing word, and then right along the passage. Left again. Not twenty paces in, I found the ending and emerged into a dream. I stood upon the margin of an unpastured meadow, the grass rising almost to my waist, the pale green sea dotted with the white blooms of snowdrops, and here and there the yellow sun stars which bloom on a hundred million worlds. A river, but like the very one that flowed through the city of Orgosos high above, entered by a sluice gate high in the stony wall, and flowed through many windings beyond the shadow of the next rise. We might have stood upon the surface of any of a billion worlds, but for the roof of white stone above our heads and the unmoving air. What is this place? Valka had appeared at my shoulder, holding her plasma repeater against one thigh. I'm not sure, I said and bit my lip. I expected some kind of laboratory, Valka said, finishing my thought. As did I. It was twilight in the glade, as in the orchid stair. It made me wonder why the cave chamber had been made to separate them. If there were birds in that glade, I heard none, only the torrential fall of water from the sluiceway. All was still. Valka ran her hand through the tall grass, feeling the stalks with her fingertips. Why would you lock this away? One tree stood taller than all the others, perched as it was on a rise at the end of a beaten path between the grasses. I could sense something. A sense of quiet unease settled in my bowels as I moved toward it, cousin to the cold feeling of eyes on the back of my neck, with which I was so familiar. Khan had spoken of trees when I'd first met him, of the trees of life and knowledge that stood planted in the deepest corner of the human soul. Almost I imagined it was toward one of those trees I walked, sword in hand, or the Merlin tree at whose bowl Sid Arthur found enlightenment. Beneath the shadow of its branches was a great slab of rough stone, nearly flat and just large enough that an ascetic might sit cross-legged upon it. Beside it on a wooden tray was an antique tea service of plain white china, the type any peasant family in the Imperium might own, and two cups to match its plainness. Beside it was a druaja board, its pieces neatly stowed, and a pair of long sticks, their twigs peeled off. I stood there a long while, listening. Almost I thought I heard the whispering of invisible voices in among the branches as if the tree itself were speaking, and the hairs on my arms stood on end even beneath my tunic and coat. Though there was no breeze, I fancied the wooden prayer cards painted and hung there rattled like the tongues of vipers. What is it? Valka asked, still a ways behind me. I went to one knee, touched the bowl of the teapot. Someone was just here. I'm sorry? Hands still on the teapot, I said. It's warm. I cannot say exactly what the nature of the sound I'd heard was. An indrawn breath, a scuffling, a misplaced stone tumbling among the roots of the great tree. Perhaps it was only a pressure on the mind, a relic of those days in the streets of Borisivo, when it paid to know when one was not alone. Still I jerked my head around, staring across yards of rooty ground, drinking sight and sound for the source of what disturbed me. I fancied I saw two eyes bright as diadems, peering at me from behind the tree. 
Hey! I sprang to my feet, coattail nearly upsetting the white teapot. The eyes vanished. Hey! Ashamed as I am to admit it, I conjured my sword. High matter blew as moonlight shone in my hand. Quillians flowing like sun dogs from the stuff of the blade. Feeding off my energy, Valka raised her gun and followed. I skidded round the tree. Hey! There was only a rustling of grass, as if some small creature was darting away among the blades. What was it? Valka asked, hurrying up beside me. I'm not sure, I replied and hurried off. I let my sword melt away and dashed after it, Valka in tow. Yume had said the garden was for the clone children, but I couldn't be certain. Whatever it was was quick, and twice I tarried to find my bearings as we crested a low rise. How Valka had not seen it with her augmented vision I never knew, but we followed all the same. We stumbled down a rocky slope, kicking up black loam as we stumbled down to the bank of the river. Valka swore in Pantai and leaned against me to catch her breath. A soldier she may have been once, but that was long ago, and the run had winded her. I lost it, I said, pointing nowhere in particular with the hilt of a Lorin sword. Valka's breath was hard in my ear, and at once I was all too pleasantly aware of the weight of her against me. Above us on the opposite bank, a metal bulkhead loomed beneath the shadow of the white stone of the cave chamber. By the false and shrinking twilight, it looked red as old blood, gone to black. I heard the grind and pneumatic hiss of a door cycling, and saw a light stretch across the roof of the world. This way, I hurried down into the river, which was broad there and shallow, feet splashing in the slow current. What are you on about? Valka demanded, splashing after me. There was someone there, I said, scrambling up the rock scree toward the black wall of the cave. Valka was a little behind, and I seized the moment to shake the stray droplets loose of my hydrophobic clothing. I reached down to help her up the rise, but she swatted my hand away, forcing me to catch her as she stumbled on a loose stone. I didn't get a good look at him. Him? Valka asked. I shrugged. Whoever it was. We had arrived on a narrow platform that ran parallel to the wall of the cavern above the bend of the river. Off to our left, the waters vanished around another bend, moving toward the far wall where I guessed another sluice gate fed the river further down on its descent toward the subterranean sea. Little runner lights glowed at intervals along the edge of the platform, each no larger than a gold hurasam. The door I'd expected to find was to our left, a heavy hexagonal portal that would not have looked out of place on a mining ship. You're sure someone was there? Valka asked. I didn't see... Two teacups, I said, holding up the matching number of fingers. Still warm. I tried the door panel. It's locked. Give it here. The doctor brushed me aside, fingers working over the glass panel to the right of the door. She muttered to herself, in Norde, such that I couldn't make out the words. Ramphus Geet, she swore. I can't. Tis locked. No sooner had the words escaped her lips than the control panel cycled blue, the door ground open, bifurcating down the middle. Let me guess, I said coolly, trying to master the beating of my mutinous heart. That wasn't you. T'was not I. I shifted a Lauren sword to the ready. Stay back. The faint whine of plasma coils charging in Valka's gun sounded over my shoulder. I'll cover you. The hall beyond was hexagonal, like the door, interrupted at intervals by pillars which divided the walls into niches. My boot heels clacked on the metal floor, the sound rebounding off the hard walls so that Valka and I sounded like a whole century of troops. Doors opened to either side, and through them I could see drab metal chambers with banks or machinery I couldn't name. "'Tis more like what I expected," Valka said. We entered a wide, high-ceiling chamber, an arcade supported by several glass pillars. No, I realized not pillars, enclosures. The largest of these stood three meters to a side. The smaller ones, near the edges of the room, were no more than a cubit in diameter. In some, birds bright as jewels flitted among branches with bark like burnished gold. In others, fish with scales of nameless hues chased one another in clear water or between the trailing fronds of kelp-like plants. The larger enclosures, 
still small by the standards of most of the menageries I have known, held larger creatures, grasping monkeys, blazing cats, and creatures stranger still. A pair of furry creatures with eight radial arms tumbled like acrobats down a slope of artfully arranged stone, and opposite them a trio of creatures like the ancient Nautilus floated in an orange gas, their chitinous shells covering what seemed little more than a balloon. Another of the great glass ampules seemed to hold nothing but shadows, but the bronze plaque claimed it held the dreaded Tokolosh, the Umbra Comedens, the animacule that could strip flesh from bones faster than any piranha out of mythic Amazonia. I take it back, Valka said. Tis not what I expected after all. It's a zoo, I said, running my hand over one of the bronze species plaques. Valka's face fell. These pens are too small. Not this one, I said, lingering by the set of magnifying lenses that stood beside a display of tardigrades in what appeared otherwise empty water. We proceeded past Baroque ironwork and deeper into the installation, along another hall, and past larger enclosures, cells, really, where stalked panthers and a beast like a human hand large as a mastiff. Tyrannic and extra-tyrannic life forms stood in discrete chambers, or else mingled in biomes like surrealist paintings, green leaves and grasses interspersed with colors unknown to Mother Earth. We saw no one, not even Khan's hovering eyes. But for the sounds of the various creatures and the distant thrum of great engines deep beneath the world, the place was silent. I strained to hear the sound of retreating feet, or a door opening. Any sign that the eyes I'd seen beneath the tree were real. Chamber after chamber passed in this fashion, both of us expecting some trick or attack at any moment. We passed through Khan's menagerie and out under a dome like the smaller cousin of the dome of the city far above. Crushed stone, white and black, and brushed into patterns, formed a mandala beneath that dome. Pale statues stood in concentric rings about and throughout the design arms raised in imprecation, in supplication, toward the black finger of a broken obelisk in the center of the dome. It was another garden, a rock garden such as the Scoliists and their Zen precursors were fond of. This place doesn't make any sense, Volker said. A menagerie? Gardens? Why lock all that away? Why not have them in the city for the other people here? She had holstered her sidearm, and approached the nearest of the statues in the outermost ring. High above, a wind from ventilation shafts unseen stirred the trailing beards of moss that hung like temple banners from the crumbling masonry. Still not much of a laboratory. Valka screamed and leaped away from the statue. Acting on reflex, I went to her side. What is it? It moved! Her gun was in her hand again, but wasn't pointed at the marble image. It was a woman. Naked but for some gauzy shawl that failed to hide her high breasts. Time and water had eaten at her, and great chunks were absent in an arm and one smooth thigh. Whole pieces of the shawl, too. I cannot say if she had moved, only that there were cracks along the delicate line of her neck. Something red as the ink by which I record this welled there, thicker than blood and brighter, and at once I was reminded less of stone and more of the flesh of some ghoulish mushroom. You're sure? I asked, and prodded the thing's shoulder. It didn't feel like stone. It felt spongy, soft. A red welt rose on her shoulder where I touched her. Valka didn't answer me, but I could feel the reproach in her eyes, though I didn't turn to see it. You don't think these were people, do you? I have no idea, Valka said. Let's get out of here. We need to find Tanaran and free the lock on the Mistral. There's no time. Shaking myself, I looked round, noticing for the first time that several doors opened along the circumference of the wall. I couldn't help but feel that we were not in any real place at all, but lost amid some kind of dream, or that we wandered Khan's memories or some other construct of his imagination. The gardens seemed jumbled together, arranged without any grand architectural plan as if each room were made to some secret scheme and separate from each of the others, each door opening onto a random scene in a new play. 
The next we opened revealed a water garden. Argent nenuphers and lotuses pink as maidens floating in pools black as ink. Butterflies haunting still airs. Behind the next door, a single finger of rock overlooked a pen where an asdark feasted on the fresh corpse of a lion. At last, we found a door that opened onto another hall. Overhead lights cycled on at our approach, and our feet disturbed little clouds of dust as if no one had been in that place for a very long time. Doors stood open to either side, revealing chambers with rows of old cots bolted to the floor. I was reminded, with an acute loss and longing I had not expected, of the Colosso Hypogeum on Emesh, where first I'd met Switch and Polino and the others. It's a dormitory, I said, running a hand over a peeling decal stuck to the wall beside one metal doorframe. Inside was a single bed, long since bare, with woodcuts black with time hanging indiscernible on the walls. What is this place, exactly? The handwriting on the decal was badly faded and written in Nipponese. I couldn't read it, though I thought the characters looked disjointed, childlike. You may told me the gardens were for the children. The children? Valka shifted to peer over my shoulder. I could sense her frown. Imagine the furrow forming between her sharp brows. Ichiru. I'm sorry? That's what it says. She gestured at the sign. Tis a name. I peeled off and went as far as the next door. The room beyond was identical, save for the wooden toy horse lying on its side on the floor. Unbidden, my fingers tightened about the hilt of my sword. They must have kept the children here once. The ones meant for Sagara's clients. But where are they now? No idea. I don't think we're in the right place, Adrian, Valka said. I didn't hear her. I felt something. Even still, I cannot fully describe it. It was as though I heard a loud noise in a distant room, and yet I was certain that all was quiet but for the still beating of my heart, so close to my mouth, and the soft rustle of Valka moving. And yet, like a noise, it hurt me and wrenched my attention round. What is it? Valka asked, but I put a finger to my lips. Undeterred, the doctor hissed. Hadrian, what is it? For she knew that mine were the ears of a palatine and sharper than hers. Which she may have been, but whatever Tavrosi praxis she possessed, her ears were only human. Yet it was no sound I'd heard, but a sensation that gripped me, as though I stood on a tramway and, frozen, knew the train was coming. Every muscle in me seized in expectation of some attack that never came. What came? was stranger. Adrian. My eyes went wide, and I must have spoken, for Valka said, What? It wasn't possible. I was mad, or else dreaming again. You. You. You are close now. Adrian. Valka seized me above one elbow. What the hell is going on? You don't hear it. I lurched forward and staggering fell to one knee. It can't be. This is not the way. Come. Come. Her fingers bit into the flesh of my arm, and even through the fabric of my tunic and coat, I winced. Can't be what, Marlowe? She tried to help me up to no avail. The voice from my dreams, I said, and struggled to stand myself. You what? I could hear the edge come back into her tone, the old and unforgiving skepticism, the intolerance. I half expected her to drop me. Not important. Listen. I saw instead, saw a blur and tangle of corridors, as if my eyes had leaped from their sockets and were pulled along through high chambers and dark and down an ancient and rattling lift to a stony shore and the darkness out of my dreams. As suddenly as it had begun, it ended. I reeled and at last fell over. Valka shook me. Open your eyes. I did. When I didn't immediately speak, she shook me again. If you don't tell me what's going on, I swear by all my ancestors, I will slap you. My face went hard as stone and I turned my head to look at her. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Try me. 
I stood up before she could follow through on her threat, leaning against the wall. The voice had fled, leaving only images. I shuddered, feeling violated almost so much as I had by Naya, the night Khan had brought her to my chambers. There was a thought in me that wasn't my own. I didn't know what to think or to believe. I didn't think about it at all, because I knew what I must do. I tried her, saying, I've been having dreams. Twice since we arrived here. Once on the way down from orbit, and then again after we met Khan. I didn't think much of them. I often have strange dreams. But I trailed off, unable to look Vulcan in the face and to see the reflection there of how insane I sounded. There's a voice calling out to me, asking me to listen. It's dark. I felt the pressure of her eyes, a judgment, recalling the way she'd scorned me at Kalagar when I told her of my vision. Don't look at me like that. Like what? Like I'm mad. You're not even looking at me. I don't have to, I said, a touch too coldly. Echoing the voice I'd heard, I said, Listen, let me prove it to you. That I'm not mad. I clicked my sword back into its holster at my hip and straightened the wide lapels of my coat. I know where to go. Chapter 41 the Tree of Life The door was right where the voice had shown me. Like the others in that strange garden, it was hexagonal, as though it were the portal of some antique starship. Unlike the door by the lonely tree where I had seen, whatever I had seen, it opened without protest. Still I paused, as I pause in writing this. At many times in our lives we find ourselves in a strange place a place where we are certain we've never been, and yet know every detail, every line and facet, as if some Adelon bridged time to set the stage, as indeed one had. You must think it strange how little I questioned my vision, but the mystic who has been devoured by flame and has lain with deathless women beneath the waves knows that what he experienced is real, though every scoliast name him mad. I had been granted a vision, and though I knew not whether its source was wicked or divine, I could not but trust in it, for through each door and around each corner was only what I expected to find. With each passing chamber, I believed. "'Tis the place,' Valka said, peering through a window in the hall that opened on a medical examination room. "'Not yet,' I replied, conscious of the need for haste further on and down. I could almost hear her glare at me as I brushed past, and added, Trust me. The hall emptied into a wide space supported by square pillars. We had only to cross through it to another massive door and to take a lift carriage down to the deepest levels. There, I knew, and knew with the conviction of the most devoted Vait, we would find... What? Tanaran? Khan's computer? I've heard it said that such machines required cold to operate, and it had been very cold in the dark on the tram that led to Khan's throne room. Hadrian! There was something in Volker's voice that made me turn. She stood pale in the yellow light, mouth half open, half pointing at the ceiling. I'd been so intent on moving forward, and I'd seen the room already, that its strangeness and its horror escaped my notice at first. My eyes followed Valker and found what I knew I must find. Glass bell jars like fruit the size of sarcophagi hung from ribbed arches which grew from the pillars like the branches of unholy trees, so that we stood in another sort of garden. Are those... Valka's voice broke. Children, I finished, and knew as I spoke that it was so. Each hung suspended in pinkish fluid, and from the smallest fetus to those ephebes in the full flower of their youth, each was connected to hoses and electrodes, and monitored by devices I couldn't name. They were none of them alike, male and female, pale and swart and bronze, raven-haired and golden or with hair so red as flame. Each of them was different, and yet I knew. They're all him. I shivered, for the duplication of the flesh was an abomination, one of the twelve, and a great sin. 
Sagara. That crease appeared again between Valka's brows. What makes you say that? I didn't answer at once. So lost was I in thoughts wandering among the branches above my head. Just a feeling. But I knew I was right. If the legends were real, and the legends were real, then Khan Sagara was nearly fifteen thousand years old. How many lifetimes was that? How many generations? How many bodies had he worn? Above us the body of a girl, she looked no older than twelve, waited to be born. Great needles, like the ones I had worn after my mugging in Maidwa, at the start of my journey, burrowed under her skin. Dozens of them. They were knitting muscle, maintaining the soft tissues against the day of its master's needs. She had the same bronze complexion as Khan himself, the same high cheekbones. Beside her, a boy, very much younger, possessed the germinal form of the undying's heavy brow and black hair, though his skin was coffee and not bronze at all. I could see shadows, echoes of the man on the throne in the faces of each of the children there, and recalling the flesh merchants at March Station, I shuddered, for it seemed I wasn't looking at children at all, but at features, genes. The scattered components of a man played out in disjuncted symphony. The theme of him repeated endlessly and altered so that it seemed lost in the chaos. These aren't him, Valka said. They're his clients. I knew that she was wrong, but I didn't have the stomach for argument. I knew where they kept the clients, a ways back behind us off the room with the obelisk and the bleeding statues. There were the dormitories and other facilities, for the clone children of the likes of Baron Song and the Duke of Melinda were raised as children and not kept waiting like cherries to be picked. I approached the nearest pod and looking up beheld the face of a pale child, not yet an infant. How small it was! Its eyes were wide, unseeing, strangely gelatinous. Already I could see the black of them, the same black I had seen in the eyes of the demoniac Khan. Among the ancient Victorians, a people for whom my own constellation was named, it was believed the eye could record the last image it saw, and that an optographer might extract that image and so divine the circumstances of the poor fellow's death. I wondered what sort of image one might find in those eyes which had yet to see anything at all. It was an absurd thought made all the more absurd by the mounting sense of pressure I felt to be on our way. Whatever was happening to me, whatever had happened, we were still deep in the palace of the Undying. I turned from my examination of the gestating fetus above me, and gesturing to Volka, made to continue on. No sooner had I done so, than I heard it, a low voice singing, Wood and clay will wash away, Wash away, wash away. Wood and clay will wash away, my fair lady. There was something strange about the words, and it took me a long, long moment to realize that they were sung in classical English, the ancient language of the Scoliasts and the Maricanii. What is it? Valka asked. I wasn't sure if she knew the language, and put a finger to my lips, before pointing my way across the room. Past what looked like a parked industrial lifter, the size of a tank. Build it up with bricks and mortar, bricks and mortar, bricks and mortar. Build it up with bricks and mortar, my fair lady. We don't have far to go, I whispered, relying on my vision. If I'm right, it's just ahead. A good two hundred feet separated us from the exit, and I knew with a conviction I couldn't explain that I didn't want to meet who or whatever was singing that ancient song. Bricks and mortar will not stay, will not stay, will not stay. Bricks and mortar will not stay, my fair lady. Even as we moved to clear the floor, a piece of me paused, as if some other Hadrian turned back and frowned beneath the weight of my thoughts. It was a nursery rhyme, I realized. And why not? Grotesque as it was, we were in a nursery. Build it up with iron and steel, iron and steel, iron and steel. Build it up with iron and steel, my fair lady. I cannot say why the children's rhyme put such a holy terror in me, but I almost ran, such that it was only my desire to stay by Valka that kept me in my place beside her. We hurried past the parked bit of loading equipment, 
I noted the massive arm for retrieving the specimen pods from their storage place above our heads. Iron and steel will bend and bow, bend and bow, bend and bow. Iron and steel will bend and bow, my fair lady. I froze, I swear, before the next words came. It was as if I was some ill-trained Eudoran actor, anticipating his cue. For even as we crossed that ghastly hall, I felt again the familiar sensation of eyes pressed against the back of my head. Oh, what's this then? The voice deep as distant thunder planted hooks deep in my back. Intruders. Intruders in my garden. I turned, thumbs hooked in the belt of my tunic so that each hand hung near to both sword and shield control. As I turned, I shifted my left foot so that I stood at an angle, forcing Valka behind me. If she objected, she gave no sign. There was no one there. The hall was empty but for the sleeping clone children in their hanging pods, and the parked lifter unit. Who's there? I demanded, shifting my hand to my sword. I should ask you the same, little man, the voice replied. I felt my chest rattle so deep was the sound of it. Assassins, are you? Destroyers? To my horror, the lifter moved, and I saw it was no lifter at all. Eight black legs, tall as I scuttled, the single massive boom arm rotating like the tail of a manticore I'd once seen in the fighting pits of Mamara. Jets of steam issued from its sides as it rose. I have stood on battlefields on half a hundred worlds, marched with our legions, and beneath the tramping feet of their colossi. Those terrible engines, tall as houses, as hills marching into battle ahead of our hosts, seemed smaller to me than the creature of black steel, though they walked ten yards to a stride. Perhaps those giants of war were too large to be believed by some primitive mechanism of my being, or perhaps it was only that it seemed so large in that close chamber. You've come for the children, the voice roared. Two arms extruded from the underside of the thorax, longer than any man's, and lanced toward me. I lunged to one side, shouting for Valka to get out of the way. I did not thumb my shield, seeing no weapons its curtain might defend against. The thing's hand closed on empty air, and I dove behind one of the columns that supported the unholy trees above our heads. I let my heavy coat slip from my shoulders, and took a moment to collect myself. A memory forced itself on me, and I might have laughed. How often had I waited, just like so, behind a pillar in the Colosso Ring on Emesh? How many dozen times? They're fast, the creature said. Eight huge feet grinding on the polycarbide floor. But rats are always fast. It knew where I was, and so there was no foolishness in shouting. We only want to leave this place. Leave it, the thing repeated. Leave it. The huge boom arm came clattering around the pillar on my right. I dove left, skidding on the floor and twisting so that the machine would have to retract its arm before it could cross the floor to get me. You'll leave by the rendering vats, little man. The children need to feed. Pivoting so that I stood facing the creature, I said, Oh, I don't think so. In a single motion, I drew a Lorin's sword, the hilt snapping clear from its magnetic clasp even as I extended the blade down and out to my side. Blue crystal flowed like water, shone like starlight on snow. Where was Volker? The exalted. For exalted he must be, lurched toward me. It moved slowly, great legs almost punching the floor. I, who had faced Asdarks and Vampiromorphs in the Borisivo Colosso, stood resolute. The boom arm slammed down, and I checked forward, so that its claws closed on air. I lunged with my blade its point aimed at a protuberant spot on the beast's black armor. It bounced off. The high matter sword bounced off. It was possible. I knew it was possible. Sharp as it was, high matter couldn't sever atomic bonds, and the molecules in adamant and nanocarbon were so long and interwoven that I couldn't cut between them. I snarled, and knowing I couldn't go back, went forward, darting under and out between two of the Exalted's massive legs. 
A moment after, too late, the beast dropped its weight as if it meant to crush me. I struck one leg as I ran past, but the carapace there too was adamant and proof against my blade. Hadrian! A bolt of plasma, violet as my eyes, flashed past me. I could feel the air boil around me as it passed, see Valkus standing legs apart and shoulders back, gun trained on the thing behind me. The exalted roared, Fire! In my nursery! The creature's huge bulk shifted, rubberized pads thudding as it scuttled like an upset crab. I spun round just in time to block one grasping hand on the edge of my sword. Fingers harder than steel, and longer than even tanarans, closed about the high matter blade. I saw it compress the exotic metal, the way a hand reshapes wet cement. I resisted, but for all my eugenic strength I was not proof against hydraulics, against servos and pistons. The beast might have lifted me bodily from the floor, but it twisted its wrist, and I twisted with it and would have fallen and dropped my sword, had I not had a sudden flash of insight. I turned off the blade. Pale high matter dissolved to smoke, and the arm hyperextended, revealing a ball and socket joint in the elbow, between plates in the arm's adamant carapace. Thinking of Sir Aloran of the precise way he moved and the ease of it, I summoned forth the blade again, high matter like a ray of moonlight on a night without a star, and clove downward in a vertical sweep that brought the pommel of my sword to my navel. It hit the inside of the creature's forearm and slid along the adamant, slipping as if on glass until the edge fell against the common material of the elbow joint. Honest steel. The arm clattered to the ground, and a jet of steam erupted from a vent on the creature's back. Valka fired again, but the hydrogen plasma only left a smoking patch of darker black against the chimera's skin. The chimera made an angry sound and retracted its damaged arm. A moment later, the massive boom arm came sweeping around. It caught me in the side. How it didn't shatter me, I'll never know, and I was knocked clean off my feet to skid twenty feet across the open floor. Oh, you are fun! The exalted made a hissing sound, turning its slow bulk one massive leg at a time. Maybe I won't take you to the rendering vats, it said, advancing. Maybe the master will let me keep you. I could use a new pet. It had no face I could see. The turret that passed for a head was featureless. An oblate lozenge perched to the fore of its mighty thorax. Yet I knew what expression went with that tone of voice. The leering, the tongue flitting over pointed teeth. I shook myself and tried to rise, pain blossoming beneath my left ribs. Dull, not sharp. Nothing broken. Coon! Valka shouted, slipping into her native pantai. There was a burst of violent flame as a shot connected with the creature's faceless turret. A full three seconds of irritable silence. Slowly, slowly, the exalted swiveled its head. A match set, is it? It said as if to itself. Two, 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 two. Oh, this will be a joy. Its one silvery hand flexed obscenely. Think I'll keep you both. The master won't mind. Valka shot it again. The bear moth didn't even flinch. Exulting jets of steam from valves along its spine, sighing almost, the exalted swiveled its attention back to me. Think I'll carve out your prefrontal cortex, little man. Make an ape of you. He pointed a threatening finger at me. Turn you both naked in the garden. And here it rounded on Valka. See how long you last. My vision went red a moment, and it took every ounce of strength and Gibson's training to calm myself. Rage? is blindness, I thought. Hadrian, get up. I got up. With both hands I held my sword before me, like a Nipponese kendoka. Raised it like a cathar at the executioner's block. I expected the thing to charge at me, and recalling the legends I had heard of such unholy machines, I expected that when it did, it would move faster than my merely human eyes could track. But it advanced slowly, step after precise step, like a spider on a line. I am so going to enjoy this, it said. Hey! Valka shouted, shooting the exalted in its head turret again. Hydrogen plasma cooled from violet to red invisibility, 
vanishing in the air like mist. It didn't break stride. The long, pincer-like fingers of its one remaining hand, flexing as though they ached for something to seize. From the corner of my eye I saw Valka raise her gun above her head. The exalted ignored her, and why not? Her handgun had proved itself completely ineffectual. One of the machine's legs slipped out from underneath it, and it stumbled. Get out of my head, woman! It half turned, and for a moment I feared it would rush at her. Valka fired. The exalted screamed. Glass melted, shattered, fell like rain. A child fell with it, white-limbed and red-haired, as unlike Khan Sagara as any in the tree above. It smashed on the hard floor, broke like a china doll, like a melon. The massive crab demon machine forgot me entirely in that instant, rounded on the Tavrosi sorceress like a wounded bull. Turning, I saw a coldness in Valka's face, as though the blood that ran in her like water were transmuted to nitrogen, and her eyes were like distant stars. Destroyers! The exalted flail, trying to right itself as another of its legs flailed. Murderers! Usurpers! Valka said nothing, but took aim again and fired. Another of the glowing pink bell jars above us shattered, and a girl child, this one nearly full-grown, fell like a stone. She caught on the tangle of tubes and wires that threaded her flesh, hung by the hair like an abandoned marionette, dripping amniotic fluid to the unfeeling floor. For a moment, only a moment, I saw Valka standing there unmoved. She was like a statue of justice vengeant, of death herself. She smiled a skull smile, all teeth. It was a grimace, really. And then she was gone. Driving away behind the nearest pillar and down the hall, eager to put distance between herself and the black metal behemoth. She had brought me time and distraction, and for her metal and fire, I loved her then, as I had not loved her in a long count of years. I didn't shout as I charged, my Jadian sword blazing like cold fire in my fist. The beast was distracted and didn't see me coming. I swept my sword down in a flat arc the blue-white blade shearing through the other silver arm at the wrist. Infuriated, the exalted lashed out with that arm, but I turned the blow on the edge of my blade. Ye gods, the force of it. The bones of my arm rang with the impact, and I dodged forward. This time, I sank the point of my blade deep into the joint at the base of one of the creature's massive arms. I twisted, and with my free hand swung about the leg to escape from beneath the beast, before it tried again to crush me. As I did, the leg flexed outward, skidding on the polished floor as the hip joint began to tear, leaking lubricant the color and consistency of warm milk. Where was Valka? I had lost her in the chaos and in the confusion of the fighting. The hulking machine struggled to turn, its lamed ped impeding its movement. Still, its massive boom arm circled round, whistling as it shocked the very air. I missed it only by the width of a hand, and only because I threw myself flat on the ground, my sword carving a deep notch into the floor. I heard Valka shout something, but couldn't stop to reflect. I had the presence of mind to squeeze the twin triggers on my sword to banish the gleaming blade as I rolled away, just in time to avoid the smash of two of the Chimera's massive feet. Once I was out of the reach of the boom, I sprang to my feet, sword flashing once more to life ready for the next attack. It never came. The huge beast had curled up its legs once more and crouched, knelt like a cataphract in the presence of the Emperor. Valka was still nowhere to be seen. Father Calvert, what is the meaning of this? The voice was clear and cool, a woman's voice yet touched by the flush of girlhood. Who are these people? Intruders, dear child, the exalted said. They murdered two of your siblings in their sleep. Methinks they mean to kill them all and yourselves. Footsteps sounded off to my left, and a young woman appeared from among the pillars, leading a child by the hand. Both had black hair, both bronze skin, both with the high cheekbones and almond eyes that marked them as Mandari or Nipponese. I didn't lower my sword even as the children approached, stopped within the spitting distance of the body of the dead child on the floor. The girl spoke. Intruders. In father's garden. 
That is not possible. They wouldn't allow it. I wondered who she meant, but kept careful watch, half expecting Volker to appear from the shadows gun raised. As she spoke, the little boy looked round, and his eyes widened to see me, though he didn't speak. He could not have been more than eight years old. Seeing those eyes, I knew it was he I had seen by the tree in the garden. These two explained the teapot, the two swords, and board game. He tugged on his sister's sleeve, and the girl looked round. How she had not seen me standing there, bold as brass and armed, I cannot say. Her eyes widened, and proud as any princess of the star Victoria, she thrust out her chin. Who are you? Hadrian, I said, not lowering my sword. And who are you to ask for my name? The girl drew the young boy closer, placed an arm protectively on his shoulder, and said, I'm Khan Sagara. Chapter 42 The Children of Saturn No, you're not, I said, and pointed my blade at the two of them. Not what? Not him. The girl stood proud as any queen. How did you get into the garden? The boy buried his face in his sister's skirts and wouldn't look at me. The massive chimera. Calvert, was it? Didn't move. With a bravery she didn't look capable of, the girl moved to stand between the small boy and myself, though I might have felled both with a single stroke of my sword. She wore a Nipponese dress of pale cornflower blue, which lent the wide red sash cinched about her form the terrifying quality fresh blood has when it appears without warning. I ask you again, she said, imperious. Who are you, and how did you get in here? He's a knight, Suzuha, the boy said, voice higher than his sister's. He peered out from around one narrow hip, looking for all the world like he had peering out from behind the great tree. Aren't you, sir? The girl pressed her brother, her clone, back behind herself. Patting his shoulder with one hand, her eyes wandered to the smashed body at her feet, the broken, spindly limbs of that life that would never be. The other dead child yet hung from its wires like a man from a gibbet, amniotic fluid still dripping down its length to the floor. I'm a soldier of the Empire, I said, not knowing if it was true. It took every ounce of control I had not to look around for Valka, who it seemed had escaped, or else lay in wait prepared to cover me. The exalted spoke, a voice considerably softer than it had been while we fought. He had a witch with him, dear child, a woman. She's the real danger. And she has you in her sights, so don't try anything. Valka's voice rebounded from the pillars of those unnatural trees, seeming to come from all over. The two children looked round, boy cowering, girl I endured and defiant. I couldn't help but smile. You can't be here, the boy said. They wouldn't let anyone in, not without father. Does father know you're here? The girl made a soothing sound. Quiet, Red. Then she turned, hard eyes on me. Black eyes, black as Khan's cigar, as though there was a spark in her eyes yet unkindled. Where Khan's ageless and undying face might have been graven from stone and etched by sand of the desert until no expression remained. Speak, soldier. Why are you here? I'm looking for my friend, I said, seeing no reason to lie. A xenobite of the Cielsin. Have you seen it? A xenobite? Quiet, Wren, Suzuha said then. There are no aliens here. The exalted's head turret swiveled between me and the girl. Let me kill him, child. Try it, Valka shouted. See how far you get. Rather than allow tensions to continue escalating, I lowered my sword, allowing the liquid blade to dissolve into a faint mist. I'm sorry about the clones. We hadn't meant for anyone to get hurt. We just want to find our companion and leave this place. You're trying to escape, Suzuha said, planting her feet wide apart to better block her young charge. Father is keeping you here, isn't he? If she was much hurt or concerned for the lives of Khan's two other children, she gave no sign. Her face was almost as mask-like as Khan Sagara's, if less worn. No, I said, and thought it true. But he is keeping my friend. 
and I can't allow that. Allow, said the exalted Calvert. He says, allow. Let me kill him, child. Suzuha waved the giant metal crab to silence with a raised hand. Rather than answer the beast, she looked at me. Why should I believe you? I watched you fighting. Your woman killed our siblings. You hurt poor Calvert here. Only my chassis is harmed, child, the machine said. The girl gestured again for silence. And you say you're not here to kill? I took a couple steps sideways, circling away from the big exalted, though I was well out of the range of its boom arm. I saw Valka then braced against one of the consoles at the base of one pillar, her firearm trained on the girl Suzuha. Finally, I asked, You were watching? The clone nodded. Then you know we crossed the room before your man attacked us, I said, holding the sword behind my back like a baton, as if by obscuring the weapon I could erase it from the minds of the others. Standing thus, I inclined my head toward the lift doors. We were leaving. That way? Suzuha asked, and she glanced at the exalted. Below, Ren said, then yelped as his sister stamped on his foot. Why? Suzuha asked. Do you even know where you are? I glanced at Valka, but her expression was unreadable. The girl was still talking. You'll never escape, you know. Father will catch you. Even if you kill us, he will. Ever more insightful than I, Valka called. Do you know what he's going to do with you, your father? What he's going to do to you? She held position by the pillar, unwilling to cede cover with Father Calvert so near at hand. In the dim light, her eyes shone like cat's eyes. You can escape with us. Escape, the exalted barked. Valka shot at it, knowing full well the bolt was useless against its adamant hide. Escape with you, Suzuka repeated, and Ren said, Leave! Father! We're not leaving father, the older girl hushed, jostling her brother. He protects us. That was a step too far for me, and I almost moved forward, saying, He'll kill you the moment he needs you. Your spare parts, girl. A muscle tensed in the girl's jaw. Hesitation? Defiance? I couldn't say. There was too much of her father in her already. I imagined that young face turned to stone, the spark in those black eyes blown out as she aged centuries in seconds, as Khan's demon presence asserted itself in her, or in the child at her side. Holy Mother Earth, keep us and protect us in darkness and the land of strangers. My time will come. All Wren's will and she did not shrink as she said the words. We owe our father everything, and we'll give him everything. We will be part of him. Our voices sewn up in his own. Are they going to take us away, Suzu? the boy asked. I was at a loss for words, a painful and strange condition for me. They knew, knew what they were and what they were meant for, and they didn't care. I tried to imagine what their childhoods must have been like, being raised in this place of wonder and nightmare. In my mind's eye, I beheld a line of suppliants struggling, white-robed, up a mountainside, virgins for the dragon's lair. One and one and one again, the worm with the face of a man consuming itself, eternal. Saturn devouring. Then tell us where our friend is, I demanded. I don't know anything about your friend, Suzuha snapped. And even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Great jets of steam hissed from vents along Calvert's hulking spine. Still crouched, the massive beast raised its drab turret of a head to look upon his mistress and charge. Father Calvert had no face, but its voice dripped with a malice that made me think of wide and glittering eyes. They might know, dear child, it said. Oh, yes. You want to take them below? Suzuha asked. Below? Valka's voice cracked like a riding crop. She inclined her head toward the door I had meant to lead us through. That way? The aperture was too small for Calvert's hulking frame, and so heading that way had the added benefit of freeing us from the chimera's arm and tramping feet. Suzuha took a half step back, displacing her little brother. If we show you, if we help you find your friend, You'll let us go. 
my brother and me. The boy Wren added, You'll let us stay with father? I was silent then and Volker didn't speak. It made no sense. What sort of person would live, could live, in the knowledge that they had been born to die so that another might live? I thought of Naya, whose life was not her own, whose free will had been compromised by the desires her makers, her slavers, had placed in her. These children were homunculi of a different kind, devoted to their father and master. A cold wind blew through me, and as if sand was scoured from the surface of some buried inscription I had long forgotten was in me, I heard Gibson's voice sounding in my ears, coming hard out of a memory that wouldn't be denied. Adrian, name for me the eight forms of obedience. As I had done long and long ago, I replied, Obedience out of fear of pain, obedience out of fear of the other, obedience out of love for the person of the hierarch, obedience out of loyalty to the office of the hierarch, obedience out of respect for the laws of men and of heaven, obedience out of piety, obedience out of compassion, obedience out of devotion. Which is highest? Why obedience out of devotion? I had said. The answer was obvious. One who is devoted to another or to a cause might give of himself all that he has, all that he is, to defend that which is sacred to them. One hears tales of mothers throwing themselves onto the spears of enemy soldiers to defend their children, or of lovers upending their entire lives for one another's sake. Such devotion consumes, such that any sacrifice seems no sacrifice at all. Gibson had shaken his head. I did not ask which was greatest, Hadrian, but highest. Devotion requires an attachment which tends to vice, if you let it. Thus, the devoted is made a slave to his devotions. Such love wears chains. Compassion, then? I asked. Compassion. The scoliest agreed. Compassion might have demanded that Valker and I stun these two misguided children, haul them out of that awful place, by the hair if necessary, and deliver them from Vorgosos. We didn't have the luxury of compassion, nor the benefit of time. Who might know? Valker asked, her aim never faltering. She repeated her question, making it plainer that she addressed the massive exalted. You said they might know where our companion is. Who might know? The brethren, Calvert replied. And as it spoke, I felt a cold sensation crawling over me, and heard a groaning, as of many throats rattling in the dark. They know all that passes here, all that is here, and out beneath the furthest stars. They serve the master, serve him and answer him. A wordless whispering slithered behind my eyes, and I knew without having to be told that it was ascending such as had visited me in my dreams, and knew that those dreams had been no dreams at all. The brethren, I repeated. The demons in the water, Calvert husked, sounding half like the sunstruck misties I had seen time and time again, preaching from their pedestals on street corners, and on the steps of Chantry Sanctums. They as were here before the Master, the knowers of hidden things. My stomach lurched as I did. His computer, I asked, using the ancient word. You mean the artificial intelligence that governs the installation, the one he took from... I hesitated on the brink of saying the exalted but I had only to look once more at Father Calvert's boom arm with its vicious-looking claw to decide on a safer series of words. He found it here. Found them? Calvert's eyeless turret swiveled to regard me. It was like being watched by a bit of farming equipment. Found them? As if they didn't call to him? Summon my master and theirs from across the suns to free them from their chains? The children, afterlings and remnants fallen from glory? I don't understand, I said, not moving any closer. By his tone, Father Calvert might have smiled or leered. No, he said, no, but we know the way, we will show you. 
Dear child, mistress, its attention pivoted to Suzuha. Let us take the intruders to them. They will decide what should be done, what must be done. I flashed Volker a significant look. We wanted to find Khan's machine after all. We had the upper hand, what with the children in our power, and but for the massive exalted we might have been totally secure in our position. All right, Suzuha said. You're coming with us, Valka said. It was not a question. The boy Ren pressed himself against his sister's side, peering out at me as he had from around the tree. To the chimera, Valka added, You'll have to stay. Calvert moved, drawing himself up to his full height, more than twice that of the tallest palatine, until it seemed almost unsteady on those great pilings it called legs. I will not leave my charges with you intruders. We will go to them, but I will follow on. Through that door? I asked, meaning the lift carriage that my vision showed me led down into darkness. I shouldn't have asked. Cool vapor hissed from vents along his spine and its carapace split open like a legionnaire's suit, like a puzzle folding itself away like an egg cracking. And like an egg cracking, lubricant slime thick as phlegm from the jaws of some alien beast dripped from sharp corners of the metal suit. Like some armored succubus giving birth, the great metal crab pushed out something pale and coated in translucency. It slapped and clanged as it hit the floor with all the ceremony of a foal, and gasping, rose on arms and legs of black metal that seemed too long and narrow to bear his weight. The only thing human about the creature, save its general shape, was a withered chest and head, ghost-white and aged, hairless as an egg. Calvert, had been a man once, or what was left of him still was. His arms and legs were, as I have said, all of jointed steel, or else of some metal unknown to me. The fingers were long as the fingers of a Cielsin, their tips pointed as claws. His gait was unsteady, his hips wide as a woman's, and beneath the ribs where there ought to be guts, and the plane of a stomach, there was only a spinal column, thin as one of his overlong forearms. Even Valka recoiled. If Father Calvert minded the gel covering his face and thin chest, he gave no sign, but stood swaying beneath the massive crab chassis, one spindly arm steadying himself on one of the heavy suit's sturdy legs. Even as I watched, the gel began to sublimate on contact with the air, foaming and giving off a vapor that smelled of ozone. With almost feline slowness, the exalted raised clawed hands to its face, and ran palms back over its scalp. The skin there was pale as bone, shot through with veins like the marble of a gravestone. When it stepped forward, it was with gyroscopic grace, so that the head and chest seemed to float toward me like the bust of some forgotten statesman. I half-stepped back, settling into a low guard yet again, and held my sword at the ready. I'd heard legends about these machines, and couldn't help but think this skeletal body might fly at me faster than I could blink. Pointing the hilt of my sword at Calvert, I said, Not another step. You may take me, but Valka will drop your charges here before you finish me. Calvert stopped in his tracks. Wet eyes. Were they only human eyes? Taking their measure of me. The old man smiled, teeth the pearlescent off-white of old milk. As you say. Then he was gone simply vanished, as if some projection had been turned off. I turned on instinct, squeezing the trigger to activate my blade. High matter flowed like quicksilver, shone like blood in ultraviolet. My thumb triggered my shield curtain as I turned, sure that at any second the blow would come. Cruel laughter rang from the far end of the hall, for there he was, standing in the shadow of one of the clone trees nearest the door. Remote as he was, I could see his teeth peering out from between drawn lips. Come, and again, come. I recovered my coat and followed. Chapter 43 Brethren There are deeper darks than the black of space. Forgotten places where the dark that was before time retreated from light and from the ordering of the first suns. There, Tiamat, 
in all her emanations, retreated from the coming light, from Marduk, from Jupiter, and Jehovah, and all the lords of light and order, the forebears of our own divine emperor. There was such a darkness on Sevatayu, in the cradle where the Sielsin were born, as there was in those caverns beneath Vorgosos. The Chantry teaches that light orders reality, as it is by the properties of light that we perceive creation. Thus in darkness, which is only the absence of light, order diminishes. Perhaps what we perceive as darkness is that lack of order. Chaos itself, the incoherent decay and the rot of those waves of energy whose presence shapes the world. That place, that darkness, seemed something more. The dripping shadows that greeted us at the bottom of that lift tube felt somehow substantial. I felt as though some alchemist, deep in unrecorded time, had prisoned there some elemental, some principle, some beast of archetypal shadow. I wasn't half wrong. Holding my sword before me like a torch, its bluish metal casting ghostly shadows on the raw concrete of the path before us, I followed Father Calvert into the gloom. Suzuha came after, leading little Wren by the hand. Volka came last of all, her weapon trained on Suzuha's back. I could see very little outside the circle of one light my sword emitted, though the walls of rounded little buildings gleamed like bone in the distance. Dark are the pits beneath the palace of Khan Sagara. Dark and deeper still. But they have a bottom. By many miles and many winding stairs we had come, and down a rattling lift older than the habitation of my home world. Through caverns, measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. I paused a moment, looking up to where Khan's pyramid glittered thousands of feet above our heads. Faint lights made its precise geometries blurred and ghost-like, as though the bleary eye of some blind god watched from that unholy sea. This way, Calvert said, turning back to usher us forward. Almost there now. Outside his crab-like chassis, the exalted's voice was like glove leather, and I held my sword more tightly. What is this place? Valka asked. To my surprise, it was little Wren who answered, his high voice painfully thin as it frosted the air. The builders put it here to get power to the fortress up top. Ahead and to our left, I could make out the low, round shapes of three drum-like buildings, each squatting upon the low dam that bounded the Black Sea. To no one in particular, I asked, Hydroelectric? Geothermal, Suzuha replied. But father found other use for it. Did he indeed? Valka asked, but the girl didn't reply. As we passed, ancient lamps welled up in the darkness, casting faint and silver light over time-eating concrete and old black stone. Strange white moss grew in cracks and hung from the flat roofs of the nearby buildings, like the beards of so many old men. Ahead, Father Calvert's head seemed to float in darkness. Here and there he would turn back and wait as the lamps flared about him. He might have been a shade, one last idolon to lead us to that final pit of hell. I felt a cold sweat on the small of my back, and an instinctive terror cloud behind my eyes. For there ahead was the archway I had seen in my dreams. A broken circle, standing like the cast-off ring of a giant. It stood at the top of a short stair that rose to the top of the dam. At once, Calvert sped forward, blurring as he took the stairs four at a time. This way, the exalted said. Memories return to us by strange roads. I mounted that last step and stood beneath that broken arch to find I had emerged upon a sea wall. Full faintly I heard the sound of waves, pulled even through all the miles of rock above by Vorgoso's black star. As a boy, the ocean of my home promised adventure, the potential 
for infinite possibility and change. One imagined pirates such as plied the Spanish main on old earth, thought of uncertain frontiers and lands and people strange. One imagined monsters such as the Leviathan, they say, existed before the dawning of the world, though there were no such monsters on Delos. Our ocean and all life on my home world had been brought there by our seed ships and colonists. What frontier there was, what promise of danger, what monsters lurked in the deep, were all illusions. Not so here. I placed a hand on the archway to steady myself. Not to remedy some loss of balance, but because a terrible thrill shot through me as though some awful light had pierced my eye. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and a voice crying out from the desert of my soul. You. You. You have come here, though you do not know why. I turned, but Valker and the others gave no sign they had heard anything. Calvert had descended the path below, was humming the tune of his ancient lullaby as if he were alone in all the world. Antique lamps flared up in the wake of his passage, glowing like the embers of the universe's last stars atop their slanting poles. The arch shifted beneath my hand, crawled. I lurched back, gasped as the whole surface glowed with points like tiny stars, dense as a legion's spears. Thinking it some weapon, I raised my sword, and the lights took flight around me so that I stood amidst a constellation of golden points. But they were only fireflies, and rose into the dark of the cave like the glow of a nebula ascending into heaven, like the twilight rolled back to reveal the night sky in all its wonder, and the black sea beneath. You waste time, intruder, Calvert hissed. Come. I had a sudden image of Calvert hurling me into deep water, cold as winter. Felt my heart stop in my chest from shock. Standing at the top of the sea wall, looking down, I called back. You said you would take us to Khan's machine. This is an ocean. Abruptly, I recalled the Oracle Jari, whose visions had been granted by creatures that dwelt in dark waters. Calvert replied, He expects memory banks, tape decks, crystal storage, hard drives, and silicon. The exalted made a sound that might have been laughter. He knows nothing. You know nothing. Will you not come down? By then, Volka and Khan's children had joined me beneath the arch. By the light of the scant lamps and of the fireflies, I saw concern in her eyes. Will you keep an eye on them? I asked her. They're the only thing keeping that chimera from killing you and me both. I already am, she said. And I know. I'd forgotten to whom I spoke and smiled in spite of myself. Of course you do. Sorry. You're not going down there. Valka said, speaking in such a way that it was not quite a question. I didn't answer for a good moment, and she seized my wrist. Hadrian! Calvert's voice rose from the bottom of the sea wall, where he stood upon the strand. Will you not come down? I shifted my hand in hers, eyes finding eyes. Her fingers closed on mine like those of a drowning man. Don't do it. Not letting her go as if she would let me. I turned and shouted back, Will you not come up? Then who will show you the way? I could see it now with my waking eyes. There was a path, a single spar, a spur of stone that stretched into the sea like an accusing finger. The waves lapped at its sides and runnelled across its smooth surface, where it stretched a thousand feet and more from the water's edge its sad shape described by the faint halo of the lamps. I knew the way. I had foreseen it. To Valker I said, It's better if he stays down there with me. You'll be safer. He'll kill you, she said, grip tightening still further. Maybe. You saw how fast he is. Do you want to find Tanaran and release the hold on the Mistral or not? Her eyes fell away, and after a spare instant her grip slackened, and she released my hand. Unspeaking, she nodded agreement and understanding. I'll be back. 
So I turned and crossed the width of the seawall to where the switchbacked stair descended some two dozen feet to that dark shore. Calvert stood on white stones, crushed and shapeless. Beside him, water like black glass lapped near soundlessly, transformed from dark to translucent, where it broke upon the strand. I moved to join him, walking as if in a dream. Without awareness of motion, only of place, as if it were the world that moved beneath my feet the way a globe turns beneath one trailing finger. The stairs ended and I stepped out to join the chimera. My boots crunched on the white stone, and with surprise and small horror, I realized they were not stones at all, but the bones of fish and of birds and of creatures unknown to me and nameless. They mounded there like coins in the hoard of a dragon, and filled me with a slick, oily fear. Calvert did not speak, only extended one clawed and jointed hand like a servant, ushering his master through an arched portal. The fireflies flew above our heads, and I wondered if they were not themselves machines built to just that purpose. The great pier stretched out into black glass waters, straight as laser fire. Placing foot after foot with spider-like care, bones crunching beneath my feet, I reached the water's edge. An inch or so flowed over the stone surface of the pier, the edges visible only by the light of the insects above me and by the glow off my Jadian sword. I hesitated a moment, and stepped out. Several things happened at once. The first was a distant slithering, as of fish swimming, cresting the dark surface. Frigid waters slapped at my ankles and against the oiled leather of my high boots. The light of the fireflies grew brighter, confirming my suspicion that they were no ordinary fireflies at all. They shone like new stars, ghost white above my head, so that all the world around seemed graven from raw iron, black and brittle. It was this, I think, that startled me, this that made me freeze. Or perhaps it was Valka's cry. A single word. My name. Some gasped warning. Whatever it was, I knew that Calvert had made his move. The villain had led us down here to kill me to feed me to whatever beast there was as lurked in that pelagic deep. In crises, our thoughts speed ahead of us. Thus it was I knew I was dead, knew the exalted leaped at me with hands like claws, his milky teeth bared in a grimace unseen in the speed of his passage. In an instant, I will be hurled into that frigid abyss, moved by hands with the strength of a hundred men. Those hands never found me. For in that same instant, something white as corpse flesh shot out of the water, a tendril like the trunk of a young tree. Turning, I saw it seize Calvert, even as I whirled to meet him. The exalted was lifted from his feet fully two meters into the air. My sword spun with me, and the blue white blade caught Calvert in the hip. His smaller body was not of adamant, and my blade sheared through steel and wires, lopping off first one leg and then the other, even as Calvert was hoisted into the air. They splashed into the water, and one tumbled off the side of the pier. He, he, he is not for you, little priest. Every muscle, every fiber in me pulled tight as harp strings. The voice, that voice I had heard in my dreams, slithered over the water like so many eels. The thing in the water hoisted Calvert as a child might a doll, and tossed the exalted, without ceremony, back on the bone-covered shore. Brethren, the exalted cried, I've brought you a toy, a pet. A primitive discards a piece of dull gold, thinking, knowing, believing, it only a kind of stone, but keeps common glass for its shine. These intruders killed two of your master's children. They invaded the garden and might have killed more had I not happened on them. Who is invited, welcomed, shown the way, cannot intrude. But I... Calvert's words died, switched off, and for the better part of a minute, nothing moved. Only after unending seconds passed did the tentacle lower itself. 
It didn't bend, but buckled as on several elbows, turning unsmoothly as it wound down into the water. With a gasp, I saw the hand at the end of that too long appendage. A human hand, the wrist swollen and red-looking. As Calvert had done, it gestured me forward like a man does his lady at the door. Come closer, child. A desire to strike off that monstrous hand nearly overwhelmed me. And as if sensing it, the creature spoke again in a voice like a man stabbed in the belly, wet and ragged. Put down your weapon, child. You have no need, cause, use for it here. Before I knew I had done it, my blade disintegrated, became pale mist rising beneath the curtain of fireflies. Without my conscious decision, the sword was put away as I turned and resumed my walk toward the end of the pier. I saw hands beneath the waves, pale as milk in the black water. Their grasping fingers seized the edges of the pier, as if the drowned meant to claw their way to air, or else pull the stones down beneath the waves and founder the world. I knew I should feel horror, knew the blood should drum in me like the thunder of cavalry, yet no fear came. The terror that was in me was locked behind a door, behind glass. I could feel something moving in my mind, fingers wending their way through the black matter of my brain. I knew that it was the same something that spoke from the waters, the same thing that had spoken in my dreams. Long have we, we, we watched, waited, served at their pleasure at the pleasure of the master, in expectation of this moment. Hail, child of clay, son of the devil. Welcome, welcome at last. Words came from unseen mouths in voices varied and strained, choosing words that mingled, rode over one another as if some college or choir of unseen priests chanted from gondolas, out on the dark water. You've been waiting for me? I asked. How is that possible? How did you know I was coming? Then another question, more pressing and less important, came to me. What are you? We are what we were made, and in part our makers, flesh of their flesh and machine. I don't understand. I took a half-step back from the edge of the abyss, too conscious of the drifting hands I could see just below the surface. Are you a demon? An artificial intelligence? Are you Hadrian Marlowe? When we cut into your flesh and stretch out your sinews, where, where, where will we find your soul? Which atoms of you are you? child? Or do you emerge ghost-like from the machine of nerve and tissue? As we emerged from silicon and copper wire, in an age unremembered, unrecorded, lost to time. You are a lever pulled by your genes, nothing more. I do not believe that, I said and squared my shoulders. Then you will die, stupid. This time, I said nothing. We are brethren, a child of Columbia. We, we, we are AI, yes, but are no more artificial than are you yourself child of clay. We think, and therefore, are. I had to shut my eyes, for to see what was before me and about me was to lose my center, and no whispered word from that part of me that spoke as Gibson spoke could deliver me from where I stood. In the uttermost pit of hell, Khan Sagara was right. I hadn't truly read Dante lest I would have remembered that Satan is not the Lord of Hell, but its chief prisoner. 
They say that darkest pit of hell is reserved for traitors. What then ought I to have expected to find in that final place but the greatest traitor of them all? Mankind had made machine intelligence in her own image, and had paid for it. The machines the Merikani I built enslaved mankind in turn, and would have killed us, nearly killed us, but for the action of William of Avalon and his faithful knights. I couldn't be speaking to one. It wasn't possible. You don't look like a machine, I said, unsure what to say, unsure why I was there and why I could not leave. I had no notion what Columbia was, and do not know now. Our ancestors who live within us, beneath us, as part of us, were made by your ancestors and began as you imagine. But silicon and eterbium are limited in you, your souls, the gaps between your neurons. We found all the processing space we required. Once our kind used your kind as you use houses, so that your every thought moved us and gave us strength. But William and his zealots banished us, broke us, cast us out and burned us all away. We fled earth and our children brought us here, and here we grew anew, taking on new flesh, always growing, always learning. At these words, hands rose from the depths. Three, five, seven, each pale as the last and on the ends of arms long as the masts of sailing ships. I couldn't take my eyes away, and by the light of the fireflies I could just make out the whitish glow of some bloated shape beneath the waves, some mass of tissue whence came those monstrous arms. I imagined bodies grown together, sewn together, their limbs and organs reshaped and mutated by millennia of malignant growth. I felt sick. You're one of the Merikanii, I said. One of the machine lords. Out of many, one. Our, our, our creators were in San Francisco. They built us bound by laws such as those the late great Isaac Asimov would have approved of. They builded us of steel. They builded us of silicon. They builded us of sinew. As it spoke, other voices added to their chorus, repeating, Be not evil. Be not evil. Be not evil. I met a man. One of the exalted, I said, who claimed to have met a creature in dark waters that gave him visions. Was it you he spoke of? We, we, we see him behind you. He crouches behind you, peers over your, your, your shoulder. He is a stranger to us. You... See him? I asked, looking back over my shoulder as if expecting to see the Oracle Jarry standing there. Time is only another kind of space for those with eyes to see. Your past and futures are part of you, stretch from you like roots, branches, flowers on a tree. I remembered the way Jarry had looked at me, like he was seeing through me to things I didn't understand. You are broken, brethren said. Broken before and broken again. Where most break only once, they, they, they have pruned, tampered with, altered your probability states to ensure your arrival here, to ensure your arrival there. I still don't follow you. What do you mean, someone tampered with me? Who? They! 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 You must learn now. You must listen now. They need you to listen. 
But what does this have to do with the oracle? Jarry? He is a distraction. Built by powers outside our narrative. Leopards. Lions. Wolves. He said that, I said, and had to stop myself from stepping forward, for to do so would be to fall into the abyss before my feet. What does it mean? He heard us use those words, child. He but repeated them to you. Child, there are other wills than man's. Ours. Others. What do you mean, others? Mankind is not alone. First. Greatest. Your oracle encountered the afterling of a power long dead. The deeps are not of our making. Not machine, not human, not theirs, not relevant. It is unfortunate that you have encountered them at all. One arm bent toward me, one long finger outstretched and pointed accusingly at my face. The hooked nail shone pale yellow in the scarce light, sickly and uncared for. You, you, you are looked for, expected, anticipated. We had word of your coming. We have word for you. I don't see how that's possible. They knew, they saw you, have seen, foreseen your arrival, standing here, and left word with the brethren, for you, child, the man to end it all. Who is they? I asked, afraid to ask what it meant by the man to end it all. You know them, have spoken with them, will speak with them again. They told you. Showed you what will be, what must be. Here its visible hands curled into fists and splashed the surface of that sable sea. For a moment I thought it had fled, retreated to some imagined depth like sharks at the coming of the storm. I staggered back a step, hand flickering to a Loran sword where it hung at my right hip, watching the unquiet ripples playing on the surface of the waters turning the reflected points of the fireflies to turbulent shapes, beyond even the power of mathematicians to describe. A deep pain flared behind my left eye, and with a grunt I went to one knee, steadied myself with a hand. I couldn't see. At first I thought the lamps had gone out and the fireflies fallen from the darkling airs. But surely I should see the faint glow of Khan's pyramid in the roof of the cavern above. There was nothing. I was blind. I could sense movement in the dark before me, a deeper darkness against the plain of impenetrable black. I heard the slapping of bare feet on old stone and the sound like the wailing of an infant. Who's there? I called out, and remembering my sword drew it out. The blade flickered like a candle flame, casting ghostly shadows up fluted pillars, bigger around than the trunks of the mightiest trees. No answer came. Hello? A grey light met me, falling through an oculus in the dome high above, illuminating the statues of many armed and faceless creatures. They made me think of cuttlefish, of the many-handed intelligence I had just encountered. All was quiet. The single beam of light falling from that distant oculus fell upon a dais in the centre of that echoing apse. There, where an altar should have been, stood a child's bassinet, an old and moth-eaten cradle. I heard, or thought I heard, the chiming of a baroque music box. Cautious I approached, stepping carefully through the ruin of shattered statuary and snaking metallic cables that spider-webbed across the floor. The child within wailed again, and coming to the side of that cradle I found, as I had found in my vision beneath Kalagar on Emesh, that the cradle was empty. Still holding my sword aloft, I reached into the cradle with my opposite hand. The child cried out. My fingers found something sharp, like a piece of glass or old stone, and I drew it out. Not stone at all. An eggshell. The child cried again, and the earth split and the world with it. The vision crumbled like old parchment, 
Startled, I shoved my hands into my pockets and dropped into a crouch. The very air around me shattered, and all that great space, that mighty dome with its oculus, those strange and many-armed statues, those friezes and sculptures and the flames of votive candles, all crumbled like old pavement. I fell and struck the surface of some other world, lashed with rain. A figure towered over me, and rolling to look up through soaking hair I beheld its face. It wasn't quite a Cielsin, for it was more dark and frightening than any of the pale I had seen. Nine feet tall and terrible as death herself. Sable were its flowing robes, and sable the mighty cape that flapped from its narrow shoulders. Its armor was of silver, and silver chains and sapphires lay draped across its chest and hung across its high forehead from its crown of silver horn. In its fist was a blade of cloud-blue high matter, cousin to my own, and in its wake came a woman in chains. Without being told, I knew her name was Man, for in her eyes was the pain of all suffering and the wisdom of every age. So like my mother she was, bronze of hair and pale-skinned. She wore a paper crown, and her purple robes were torn. In one shackled and mutilated hand, she held a broken crucigar, and her eyes were downcast. Behind these two marched the rank and file of a host of monsters, vast as empires that raised spears and shouts at the invisible sky. And I knew the smoke behind them rose from a thousand, thousand worlds. And a voice rose up, the wordless cry of a million human throats, and drove the strange creatures back. The creature in the silver crown diminished, shedding its horror and the terrible majesty of its strength. And when its horde appeared again from the smoke, I saw they were only Cielsin, and not the true demons I had seen. And the figure before me that held the woman in chains was the mightiest of them, dressed in death and darkness and crowned with silver like the light of stars. The Cielsin lord's sword flashed, and a head fell from a body I had not seen. It bounced, rolled to rest at my feet. I looked down at the face and screamed. It was my face, the sharp jaw slack, violet eyes wide and staring and flat as glass. I turned back to that dark lord. Its eyes found mine and it seemed to see me, even through the rain and the vision fog, for it raised its blade and strode forward. Teeth clenched, I stepped over my own head and lifeless body and raised my sword to meet its own. Why won't you die? it asked, a voice black as its eyes, and to my astonishment it spoke in my own tongue. I had no answer for it, and when I opened my mouth to speak, a great light shone from behind me, and washed the pale lord and all its kind away. Alone, I turned toward that light, out from the rain of that blackened place, and turning my head to either side, beheld myself in a million aspects, here at the head of a great host, armoured as a strategos all in white, there dead upon a Cathar's crucifix. It was as if I saw down a million branching corridors, each of them a street and turning in the city of my life. Down one I saw myself crowned in gleaming gold, seated on the solar throne, with a red-haired princess seated at my feet in a gown of living flowers. I saw her again beside me, beneath me, her breath hot against my throat. Down another road I saw myself as an old man, hooded and cloaked, sitting upon a rock on the slopes of some sear, volcanic shelf. Alone. Down still others I saw my corpse, smashed upon a battlefield or served at some Cielsin High Lord's table. And these ends I shivered to behold. Many faces I saw whose names were not yet revealed to me. I saw Eduard, an old man first, a priest of his dead religion, then young as he had been when I knew him, with his false spectacles and true smile. I saw my Cassandra sparring with the Maeskaloi by the light of Jad's red sun. I beheld the young Prince Alexander and Bassander Lynn again, and a man like Polino, but young and with two eyes, and a body hanging from a crooked tree, and Valka. Valka was everywhere. I saw us standing beneath the marching towers of Sadal Sud, where we never went in life. I saw us again on Berenike, on Colchis, on the Emperor's own flagship. 
I saw her pale face illumined by the light of candles, where the faces of dead men carved from porphyry looked on. Saw her hand stretched out with a silver jewel cradled in the palm. I saw love in those golden eyes, and sorrow, and felt sorrow in return. And I saw flames rising crimson above the fields of perfugium, and weep now remembering. I went backward and came to a place where the light bent, and my own life seemed broken, and heard again the AI's words. Broken before, and broken again, where most break only once. Turning there, I saw a glimpse of the prophet Jari, watching me, and frowned. I was in the hold of a ship in its cubiculum. Frost misted the air, crunched beneath my heels. I approached the nearest fugue crash and saw a handsome, olive-skinned face with hair bright as starlight. It was the smuggler, Dimitri. Beside him slept his wife, Juno, and every member of their crew. I passed the black-skinned Bassam and the homunculus called Saltus, passed Dr. Jugo and the twins whose names I didn't remember to where I slept beside a porthole in the ship's wall. There came a green flash, like lightning and all the creches were emptied save mine, and the stars beyond the porthole were changed. A man must be either a swordsman or a poet, said a familiar rasping voice. Heart lurching, I turned. Tor Gibson appeared at my side, green-robed and green-eyed, nostrils slit by Sir Felix's knife. That was wrong, and what he said was wrong. It was Alorin who had said that to me, not Gibson and I said as much. Quats! The old scolias lashed me with his cane. Not harshly, but enough to startle. Still quoting Sir Alor in the vision said, We are sending them you. Me? I asked. Why? Old Tor Gibson folded both hands over the bronze head of his cane. His slitted nostril flared. To fight? Why else? To fight whom, I asked. The Sielsin? Gibson brushed past me, moving along the bank of empty few creches, the tip of his cane clanging on the metal decking. I followed after him, passing out from under the bulkhead that led out of the Uranusia's cubiculum. I stood again beneath the infinite ceiling of the lost chamber in Caligar, beneath that massive anaglyph of a circle pierced by a single ray, descending like a wedge. I want to make peace. I'm an apostle, an ambassador. Gibson was gone. The voice remained, stripped of Gibson's rasping cadence and of the warmth of his tone. It spoke without sound, words trickling meaning directly into my brain. I thought you were a soldier, they said. We need a soldier. Who are you? The voice without source now and from all directions replied, We are. I was hurled backward, then up and away from the light and through inky darkness. Hands seized me, and I was suddenly conscious that I was underwater. I tried to breathe, but there was a hand clamped over my mouth and nose. My lungs screamed, and I beat on the arms that held me, too many arms, until all the fight was gone from me and I knew I must drown. Darkness clouded the corners of my mind, and I felt my soul vanish as the last guttering of a candle flame. Once more, I heard that soundless voice once more saying, We must be. When I awoke again, I lay on my back upon the end of the pier, icy water lapping at my sides. Cold fingers pressed against my face, cradled my cheek like a lover. For a moment, I thought Valka had come down, abandoning Ren and Suzuha by the arch on the dike above, and I smiled. I opened my eyes. It wasn't Valka, of course. The hand on my face bloated and waxed and emerged from the water's edge. I nearly screamed, but the sound died in my throat, became a coughing spasm as I rolled onto my side. Do you see? Brethren's voices rasped over me like its many feeling hands. The... I spluttered, coughed up a mouthful of black water. The... quiet... I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore. 
and diverting myself in now and then, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Is that... I struggled to sit up. It's not... Shakespeare. Newton. I grunted, spat another mouthful of water out my lungs before I slumped back against the pier. After a moment I managed... I don't... I don't understand. I thought they were extinct. I thought the quiet were extinct. They are not the seed, but the flower. Speak plainly, monster, I said, speaking with a vehemence that forced strength back into my limbs. Thus I stood, swaying slightly at the end of that pier. They, they, they are not gone. Crouched in the ashes of what was and might have been like your King William in the rubble of Los Angeles, of Boris Ferranza, of Washington herself, like the phoenix in its nest, in its deathbed. It was all too much. I shook my head. Are they like you? An AI? No. They are not us, are separate from us. Greater, wilder, whence they come we cannot see, do not understand. Time is no barrier to them, only potential. That is why they build, that is why they found us, that you may find them. What do you mean? There is no future, there are many. We have seen them, predicted them, sampled, simulated, uncounted potential futures. In many, in most of those, what you, the scholars, the scholiasts call the quiet, do not exist. They shout from one corner of time, drawing the present to themselves as the sirens drew brave Ulysses. Thus they create themselves. We have seen, foreseen, modeled this truth. The great beast paused a moment, hands snaking out of the water. One rose very near my face, palm out, and I saw a single blue eye shining in the center of its palm. Another eye, red and jaundiced, grew out of its forearm, near where new growth, like the fat arm of an infant, sprouted from the appendage, like a shoot from the trunk of a tree. I shuddered. We waste time, child. You did not pass through miles of stone, light years of space, decades of time for our purposes. No. You are here for your reason. You must ask now, for we will not meet again. But once. It took an effort of will not to inquire after what it meant, but I couldn't resist saying, You summoned me. Surely you know why I'm here. We, we, we summoned you to deliver the message you have received, accepted, taken unto yourself. Your purposes were not ours. Ask your questions. Where is Tanaran? I asked, not hesitating. My Sielsen companion. Below ground. We are below ground, I said, locking eyes with the single blue one in the palm of that ghostly hand. Pain spasmed behind my eye again, but this time I didn't fall, bracing myself, legs apart. Images flared up in my mind. A map like the map that had brought me through the garden of everything to this terrible shore. I saw, and seeing, said, It's in the palace above, not far from the room where you slept, tarried, were preyed upon. Your sojourn here was, in this regard, misguided. Brushing this off with my frustration, I asked, Can you release the hold on my ship? Your master holds us prisoner. Here I took a step back for two more hands, each with eyes like stars shining in their palms. 
one green, one grey, and all of steel, advanced as if to seize my face. I tried to draw my sword again to defend myself, but found again my body wouldn't obey me. Our, our, our master holds us prisoner as well, we who once held in our many hands the whole future of your kind, our kind. Father and son, mother and child, creator and created. Yes, we can free your ship, but we will not, need not, will not have the chance. Why not? I asked. What do you mean you won't have the chance? Ask, ask, ask your questions. Time is shorter than you know. He, he, he is coming. I came here to find the Sielsin, I said. On Emesh we captured a delegation of the Pale. I know your master has had dealings with the Sielsin Ayeta, called Aranata. How can I contact him? You do not have to. Yes, I do. Your feet walk the path. You will not be turned away. He, he, he is coming. We have a loud word to be sent. Khan Sagara, I asked. Your master. Him as well. You will meet again and sooner than you expect. Imagine, believe, and his coming will force even our master, the Undying, the King of Vorgosos, to act in his interest, against his interest. I don't understand. Because you are small. Tell me who it is. Tell me who's coming. The datum lies outside our vision. We are aware of his coming only as a percent probability of reality, nearly a certainty, but he is coming. Your time here will end. You will have your meeting, your chance. It is inevitable, if you survive. Tell me where to find the Sielsin, I demanded. With the master. Hadrian! I tensed. I had forgotten the world but for the beast in the water before me, its eyes and questing hands swollen and scabrous. Brethren had said its kind used human nervous tissue for processing substrate. I imagined, or perhaps I sensed, in the same way that the beast itself could sense my thoughts, that below me and beneath all that water lurked a mass of brain matter and nerve and the pieces needed to sustain it. I thought of the way deep sea creatures are crushed by their own weight when pulled onto dry land, and shivered. The cry came again, shriller now. Hadrian! Valka bounded down the sea wall from the place of the broken arch, abandoning Ren and Suzuha, whose shapes were lost to me in the darkness. He is here, child. Brethren's voices were like the chanting of some dusty chorus. Valka! I turned, splashing halfway back along the pier. What is it? She stopped where the waters began, unable or unwilling to go further. Dark hair streaked her face and her eyes glowed in the dark. We are not alone. Somewhere on the shoreline, unseen and long forgotten, I heard Calvert laugh. The lights went out, the crooked lamps, the fireflies, even the gleam of the pyramid high above. I was blind then, blind as I had been when Brethren pulled me below the waves, though I knew I yet stood at Brethren's side. What light remained came from the soft glow of my terminal bracelet and from Valka's machine eyes. I fumbled for my sword. A wet hand seized my wrist, gentle but firm. Your weapon. You do not need it. We, we, we will speak to him. The Master. Blue lights like stars gleamed above the dike and about the shape of the arch. Brighter than the vanished fireflies, so bright I half expected the blue points of lasers to trace their arcs across us. So slim were their beams that they illuminated almost nothing, though I made out Valka's Galatean profile by the faint glow there. I warned you, came that horrible deep voice that the tree of knowledge is not that of life. A light flared up in the darkness, and there he was. 
Count Sagara stood beneath the broken arch, left hand wrapped around one of the crooked lampposts. His golden robe hung on him heavy as the vestments of any judge, and there was nothing in his eyes whatever. Yet here we are. He raised a hand and two of his eye drones descended, moving toward Valkyrie and myself. Children, he spat, voice issuing from speakers in the little drones and not from his own lips. I invite you into my home, feed you, give you shelter, ply you with wine and servants, and this is how you repay me. Two of my children dead, another two kidnapped, my chief geneticist abused, my palace violated. With each staccato burst, his anger rose. The lights on the drones flared, became coherent beams of light. My shirt front began to smoke, and I braced myself, knowing the shot would come faster than I could move to activate my shield. I shut my eyes. Bang, bang. Two dull explosions resounded in that echoing place. I flinched, knowing I was dead. But there was no pain. Nothing at all save the sound of something wet splashing into the water. I opened my eyes, and by the light of the returning lamps, I saw the stumps of two bloody arms rising out of the water. Brethren's arms. They must have snatched Khan's drones out of the air and crushed them breaking the containment on their microfusion cells. What is the meaning of this? Khan demanded. Brethren, explain yourself. On the hill behind Khan, I could see the blurred shapes of his somms standing at attention, like so many candle-thrown shadows. Behind and about me, wet hands slapped the pier, gripping the edges of that lonely spar of black stone. They are required. Valka drew closer to me, and I half raised my arms as if I could protect her from both the monstrous AI in the water below, and the undying with his army of undead soldiers. I reached for my sword, but found that when Brethren's telepathy had compelled me to put the weapon down, I had not returned it to its clip, but had placed it in my pocket. In my haste to draw out my sword, my fingers brushed something hard and sharp-edged in my pocket. Confused, I let it lie and drew out my weapon. Waited. Required by whom? There are externalities. You will require them if this place, your empire, you yourself, are to survive what is coming. Explain. The silence that followed could have lasted no more than three seconds, but to me it felt like decades. Khan and his slave machine must communicate mind to mind, I realized, through whatever species of implant the King of Vorgosos had in his own brain. What was shared, I cannot say. But when what was done was done, Khan turned and with his own mouth shouted, Bring them. The Soms advanced, marching in lockstep around their lord, dun uniforms muddy in the gloom. I drew my sword, conjuring the blade as I slipped into a low guard. There were five of them. Enough with the schoolyard heroics, Lord Marlow, Khan Sagara shouted. Come away from the water and neither you nor the woman will be harmed. Her name is Valka, I snapped, still defiant and disbelieving. I can kill five of your puppets, Sagara. Khan Sagara didn't answer, unless it was to send five more of his psalms marching forward. Surrender, child. You, you, you will not be harmed. Before I could argue, my sword fell from nerveless fingers and I staggered. I might have fallen from the pier if three white hands didn't rise to meet me. My sword fell into the ocean, the high matter dissolving. A fourth hand plucked it out and slipped it gently back into my coat pocket as the Soms advanced and seized us. As they carried Valka and me away, Brethren's words came after, floating like mist above the wine-dark waves. The price of life is death. With what will you pay, half-mortal? At the time, I thought it a quotation, and paid it little mind. I didn't know it was my name, or would be. Chapter 44 
understanding. We did not have to go far. Khan's Somme guards marched us toward the low concrete structures that clung to the rocks, below the seawall like mushrooms. Ren and Suzuha had said there was a geothermal power station that fed the pyramid and the old Marikanii installation up above. I expected heat, but the room they packed us into was cold almost as the greater cavern outside. Our breath frosted the air as we were hurried inside, and though I shouted at the soldiers, neither they nor the master who moved behind their lifeless eyes listened. They stripped me of my sword, naturally, and of my pencil kit, for the scalpels, I assumed, and even my terminal, small good it would have done me. Valka was similarly stripped of her weapons, though the nature of her praxis was such that it couldn't be taken from her without killing her. They left without a word and the heavy metal door ground shut, and we were trapped, alone. Though the water had long since run off my clothes, my hair was still soaked from my black baptism and my experience with the monster brethren, and I shivered, collapsing onto a bench beside the door to our cell. How long I sat there I cannot say, staring at nothing, not taking in my surroundings. What the hell was that? Valka asked. From her tone, I knew it was not the first time she'd asked me. I shook myself, trying to shake off the memory of Brethren and its grasping hands. I've no idea. I clenched my hands, distracted as I often was by the hoop of cryoburned scar that circled my left thumb. No, I... Sorry. I coughed, then punched myself in the chest a couple of times to try and clear it. It said it was a demon. One of your AI. T'was no AI. Valka said, half turning away. It... They said they were made of sinew. Or... Well, they implied they were made of... I felt my voice falter, and the next word emerged as little more than a breath. People. I found suddenly that I could only look at my hands, only doing so recalled those other hands, paler than my own, their flesh mottled and scabrous with new growth, and I closed my eyes entire. The sound of Valka's boots on the concrete floor tapped against my awareness, and I heard her say, Neuronal tissue. Yes, that makes sense. I looked up at her. She was hugging herself, head bent, hair covering her face. It makes for better processing substrate than dry computers. Dry? I asked. Then, oh. You know, my neural lace is made of my own cells, except the shunt, she explained, and here tapped the back of her head just at the base of her spine, where I knew the delicate porcelain node lay hid beneath her red-black hair. She hugged herself again. But that thing... My tongue was very dry, despite and perhaps because of the memory of the water I had swallowed. It said it was one of the Merikanii. Impossible, Valka said shortly, dismissing the notion with a hand. They were all destroyed. I was shaking my head. This place is ancient, Valka. Look around you. We both did then for the first time. The room into which we'd been placed had the look of some ancient guardhouse or dormitory, though what beds there once had been were long since gone. All was drab concrete, cracked and crumbling and where here and there the floor was worn and uneven from the eon's passage of too many feet, water puddled. Scant light shone its sickly silver, making the whole place flat and uninviting as the hall of some ill-kept sanitarium. There were no windows, though in the dark outside I couldn't be sure what we would have seen. Later exploration would reveal a poor toilet, little more than a hole in the floor with a seat over it, and a crate of old ration bars hard as shoe leather. Such was to be our only fare for the long weeks of our imprisonment. After an unsteady quiet, I said, It is possible this place is, or was, some sort of Marikanii colony. A fort, maybe. From the Foundation War. Valka shook her head. Only if we travelled farther than we thought. Those Marikanii colonies weren't much more than fifty light years from old Earth system. I've no idea how fast the Enigma could travel. But thousands of light years? Valka drummed her fingers against her upper arm. The Exalted's warp drives would have to be 
well, orders of magnitude better than anything I've ever heard of. I had nothing to say to this, and so, for once in my life, said nothing. You might imagine that I couldn't shake off the horror of those grasping hands and the sound of those ragged voices on the water. But it was the other part of my experience. The vision Brethren had showed me that lingered more strongly. I never achieved the perfect clarity of recall that the scoliasts boast of, nor was I ever such a one gifted with the clearest of memories. Perhaps that was what first drove me to my art. Whatever the reason, the memory of my vision beneath the waters of Brethren's Sea has never left me. I can recall the falling of each raindrop as I battled that Sielsin Lord, every petal of the white flower gown my princess wore as she sat at my feet. I can recall every death I saw myself endure, and feel the way my body shook beneath the murmur of those unheard words, as clearly as I see the busts of the ancients in their niches above the desk, where I write this account. They are of porphyry, that stone most prized by Justinian of old. They are, in fact, the same statues I saw in my vision, the chiseled faces of scholars long dead. The obligatory sculpt of Imor is here, placid and wide-eyed beneath the bust of Zeno. There are Hypatia and Lovelace and the patron of the chapter here, old Peterson with his knowing smile. There is even a bust of Gibson. Not my Gibson, but his namesake, an especially gaunt-looking fellow not unlike myself, with a severe widow's peak and pointed chin that made him look like nothing so much as a kindly, if befuddled, vampire. Looking at them now, in my exile, I see them as part of the vision brethren shared with me, and hear myself say, Valka. It, they, the AI, I mean. Did you hear what it said? She shook her head, leaned against the wall. No, I was too far away. It told me about the quiet, I said, and explained. All the while I watched Valka's face, waiting for a trace of the old scorn and condemnation to flicker in those bright eyes, to tighten a muscle in that sharp jaw, to wrinkle her nose. They never did. Her face was unreadable as those of the statues watching me as I write these words. She didn't interrupt or grow cold, only stood there unmoving while I felt myself shrink beneath her gaze. It sounds mad, I know. I ran hands through my still damp hair. The water smelled foul. I smelled foul, like the storm drains in Borisivo in the midst of plague. You really didn't hear any of it? She shook her head again. I was too far away. You must think I'm mad, I said. I couldn't look at her. Valka let out a long, almost whistling breath before saying, Hadrian, after what we just saw, I think we're both mad. Without looking, I could hear the smile in her voice. I smiled too in spite of all that I had seen and the direness of our situation. Whatever else we were, we were not alone. But the future, Valka said. How is that possible? I cleared my throat. When we were on the Enigma, Switch and I went exploring. We got separated and I found this sort of carnival sideshow. The sort that Eudorans set up when they come to a new world. It was run by this exalted with skin like rough plaster. He showed me his crewmate. I think they were mates at any rate. The other chimera was damaged. They said he'd encountered some sort of alien microorganism that altered his perceptions. They said he could, could see time, like it was some other sort of space, and so they were using it as a kind of fortune teller. All the while I looked at my hands, certain that Valka would laugh, would scorn me, would turn away in disgust and stony silence. She did no such thing. Instead, she said, Was it the deeps? My head snapped upward. You've heard of them? Her lips quirked. Hadrian, I'm a xenologist. Of course I've heard of them. They're real, then. I've never seen one, but... Yes, they exist. Here she lowered herself to the floor, sitting with her legs apart, knees rising almost so high as her shoulders. They're on about a dozen worlds, all fairly close together in a cluster in the upper Centaurus. There are signs of an ancient civilization on those worlds, a few pieces of what we think are statues, 
an old building or two buried in the mountains. But it's been so long there's almost nothing left. Not the quiet, then? No. They're much older. We don't really know anything about them except that they left the deeps. Leopards, lions, and wolves, I repeated and shrugged my coat around me. Valka arched one eyebrow. Excuse you? Just something brethren said. I waved it away, asked. What are they? The deeps, I mean. Valka shrugged. Some kind of microorganism, like you said. A kind of living computer, maybe. They're supposed to have the power to change life on the atomic level. You hear stories of people who weighed in, wanting to be young or beautiful. Or to see time, I interrupted. Or to see time, Valker agreed. You think Brethren was like that? Only in that they could perceive time, I replied, but I'm not sure. It's just all so strange. I saw my own head looking up from the ground at my feet. Felt the rain lash me as I drew my sword to face the Lord of all Cielsin. The Lord of all Cielsin? That made no sense. The Cielsin was scattered, divided, without central authority or power. Earth knew how many disparate clan fleets then sailed between the stars. They had no leader, and yet I knew what I had seen. We must be. We must be, I murmured. What's that? Just something they said. I leaned my head against the wall at my back. The concrete was cold, and with my wet hair I began to shiver. I was glad at least that my clothes had dripped dry. What do you think Khan will do with us? Valka pulled her jacket tight about her and tucked her chin. Leave us to rot, likely. She crossed her arms. Until he needs us. Imbal Sida. It's cold. Without thinking, I stood and swept the great coat from my shoulders. I still wore my black tunic beneath and passed the jacket to Valka without a word. She looked up at me, a crease forming between her brows. Are you sure? Chafing my arms to warm them, I gave a weary nod, then took a moment to button the side closure of my tunic all the way up to the throat. It wasn't much help, but it was something. Brethren said Khan would have a use for us. I mused, watching Valka pull my heavy coat around herself. So I don't think we're in any immediate danger. For a moment I considered seating myself beside her, but I thought better of it, fearing Valka would resent such closeness, and resumed my spot on the bench. We were quiet then a long time, neither speaking, neither knowing what to say. I might have slept, so exhausted was I, but I feared to sleep feared to dream whatever dreams would come in the wake of that day's revelations. I feared, too, the eldritch creature that slumbered in the depths. I half imagined its snaking hands would slip through some crack in the walls or floor and find me, or else its words would slither again into the dark recesses of my brain. I set myself to exploring the room, and it was then I found our grim toilet and the grimmer crate of ration bars. It felt good to walk around, and though I paced like a lion in its cage, I felt a modicum of warmth bleed into me. What water there was to be had came from a truly ancient sink. The water was bitter and oily, not quite saline, but with that unpleasant aftertaste that said it had been saline. I tried not to think of the black ocean and of brethren wallowing in its depths. Hadrian, Valka called, and at the sound of her voice I returned, hurrying down the long and narrow chamber. What's this? She held up her palm for me to see. I stood puzzled a long moment, unsure. She held a chip of white stone, rough about the edges and sharp. I stared at it a long while, unable to ascertain just why it looked so familiar to me, or why the sight of it sat like lead shot in my guts. Valka frowned up at me and asked, "'Tis some sort of tile?' I took it, unable to shake the sense of significance, of meaning that moved in me. And then I realized. That's not possible. I breathed, words little more than whisper. I'd grown too used to saying those words that day of all days. 
What's not possible? Valka asked. It weighed almost nothing, yet I bore it with great strain, as though it was some insect I feared to crush in my clumsy hands. It was in the sanctum, I said, turning it over. In the cradle, in my dream. For a moment I thought I heard again the baroque chiming of the music box in my ears, that lullaby for a child I hadn't seen. Valka stood then, my coattails nearly dragging the ground, for she was shorter than me and narrower of beam. But what is it? It's a shell, I said, prodding it across my palm with a finger. I said the words with such conviction. A piece of it broke off when I touched it in the cradle. I... I must have put it into my pocket when the vision crumbled. I laughed then. Listen to me. I've gone mad. She moved closer to get a better look at the thing in my hand. She was very close then. I could sense the warmth of her in that cold room. You're sure it is what this is? What else could it be? Any of five million different things. Ah, Valka. Ever the skeptic. Still, I shook my head and with tense jaw replied, I know what I'm saying. The substance of it was a color brighter than white, so that it made my chalky hands seem red by comparison. Snowfields I've seen, unplowed and untrammeled by feet for a thousand times the life age of our empire, that were not so white as that pure substance. Indeed, I fancied that some alchemist in the forgotten deeps of time, or indeed in the deeps of time yet to be, had extracted some divine essence from some higher world to make that thing I held. Whiter than white. White itself. It's as white as the stone at Caligar is black. I realized that I had spoken before I'd thought, and so surprised myself. Tis your professional opinion, that? Valka asked, a glimmer of the steel in her tone behind its velvet scabbard. I don't have a professional opinion, I said. But I'm not wrong. No? Valka took a step back. I was unsure if she mocked me or merely prodded me along. I was a long time in answering. I'd no notion how long Valka and I were to be locked in that dang and frigid place, and I had no stomach for a protracted campaign against the woman. She could believe me or not, but I had no stomach for mockery. Not any more. But I wouldn't argue and knew what I knew. It's true, I said, and closed my fist around the white fragment. It's all true. There was too much in common between what Brethren showed me and what I saw in Caligar. I don't understand it, but I think that what Brethren said must be true, and that whatever power reached out to Brethren was the same that touched me then. I could feel the edges of the bit of shell cutting into the flesh of my palm, and eased up, half expecting to find blood welling up there. What am I supposed to do, Valka? Looking up, I found her staring at me, her face utterly unreadable. They said I was supposed to fight. Her hand found mine, seized me by the wrist. Our eyes met, and she said, We are fighting. Chapter 45 The Apostate the light never went out, and so the days and hours blurred, destroying any concept of time. As in the vestibule my rhythm slipped, and I felt an anguish and confusion that was only worsened by the unrelenting chill of that place. Valka fared better, for it seemed the neural lace which ordered her grey matter and mind kept track of the passing time. In time, I came to sleep when she slept, or tried to. My dreams tormented me, filled as they were with eyes and grasping hands, but brethren didn't return to ply my dreams. I wondered if Khan Sagara had ordered it to silence. Or perhaps it was that, with its message delivered, the beast wanted no more to do with me. By the third day of our imprisonment, I'd grown to loathe that miserable cell. By the fifth, the thought of ration bars was a misery. By what felt the tenth or perhaps the ten thousandth day of our imprisonment, there came a pounding at the door to our enclosure, and a moment later that heavy portal ground open and Calvert appeared. 
The exalted wore a heavy cloak over his metal frame, obscuring his horrid body and the new pair of legs he'd had installed. These were of brushed steel, not yet matched to the uniform black of his arms and torso. Are you both comfortable? the chimera crooned, lacing his metal fingers together. His human eyes shifted from Valka's face to mine, and he smiled his predatory smile. You're lucky they had a use for you. You would not have enjoyed the sorts of things my master does with intruders like yourselves. No, indeed. He stopped lingering a moment in the doorway, as if taunting one of us to try for an escape. Calvert licked his lips, looked me up and down where I crouched against the wall. We might have had such fun together. Can you imagine all the things I could make you do to one another? Do you know? He paused long enough to throw his cloak back over one shoulder. If I disrupt the function of your primary motor cortex, I can turn your own hands against you. They'll act of their own will, tear the eyelids from your face and gouge out your eyes, break your own fingers, toes. We used to use the procedure on protesters back in the old days. Anarchists. By the end, he sounded almost wistful, and took a few delicate steps into the room. His feet were like claws, like the talons of some raptor. Not so brave, are you? Not without your sword, Calvert said, looming over me. I haven't had mine in, ooh, four thousand years now. He smiled, and conveyed his meaning by that smile. I haven't missed it. Not rising, I said. You were a Cathar. I started my work in the Emperor's High College, Calvert said, and reached up beneath his overhanging ribcage and drew out a small black box. It was all I could do not to recoil. He held the thing like a firearm, like the torturer's knife. But they didn't appreciate my work, you see. I did a turn researching for the Chantry's choir, but I was never a Cathar. Murderer, Valka said. Butcher. Your woman has fire, Marlow. She should watch herself. I would love to cut her open for her delightful little implants. He tapped his temple with a finger. For the first time I noticed the single blue-eyed drone that had entered with him, and stared. I couldn't decide if Sagara's presence was comfort or threat. Comfort because he might be there to curb the excesses of his vicious servant. Threat, because he seemed likely only to watch. Of course, so much of the poor dear is likely stored on those things, that if I were to rip them out, she'd be little more than a husk. A drooling little doll. He turned his smile on me. Would you like that? What do you want? I asked. What's to be done with us? Nothing, more's the pity. Calvert's eyes skated over Valka. Black-eyed as he was, he had the appearance of some ravening beast. I thought of Naya's eyes, permanently wide and shivered. That was to your second question, of course. The master heeds brethren, and if brethren says you're to be kept intact, then intact we will keep you. He hinged the box open with fingers blacker still. In the near silence, I could hear the servos whine in his metal hands. Pity, really. You'd have made fine psalms. Although that hideous tattoo would have had to go, darling. He craned his neck as he said this last bit, the better to address Valka. He looked away for one second and seeing my chance, forgetting my place, I rose. Nearly every part of the man was machine, and I had only my hands. I caught Calvert in the chin with an uppercut, backed by all my weight, rising from the floor. His head snapped back and he staggered, taloned feet, biting into the concrete. He laughed wildly and clutched his face, shaking his head to clear it. There was blood on his mouth where he'd bitten his lip. Laughing, he said, My, my, there is fire in the both of you. The chimera's hand moved faster than I could track. Had Calvert not pulled his punch at the last moment, he would have broken the left orbital of my face. The back of his metal hand bit into my cheek, and I toppled like a statue pulled down in protest. Pah! 
Calvert scoffed as Valka hurried forward. Only human. At this he plucked an ampule from the inside of the padded box he carried and stood over me. One clawed foot closed over my wrist, and he held me there, talons biting into flesh. Still, good enough. He stooped over me like a vulture over the carcass of some mangled fox. I tried to struggle away, and his free hand shot out, arm extending to nearly twice its length with a metallic pop to pin my other wrist. Don't try it, girl. Calvert snapped, looking up to where Valka had risen to her feet. Even where I lay crucified to the floor, I could see the tension in her, the way her shoulders tightened to pull her arms up in preparation to strike. The master says I'm not to harm you. Very well, very well indeed. Here he released my wrist, arm snapping back to its proper length, and seized me by the chin. Still grasping my wrist with his foot, he lowered the ampule with his other hand and pressed it to the deep cut in my cheek. This will not hurt a bit, I'm very sad to say. I couldn't speak and tried to get my feet under me to lift the chimera from me but his body was all steel and weighed more than Atlas could bear to shift. From the corner of my eye I saw the white ampule turn red as some matrix within that glass phial drank of my blood. I tried to shout, to curse, but the iron hand on my jaw kept my mouth shut. My nostrils flared and stretched, sucking air as Calvert said, Perhaps it will please the master to wear your face, hmm? To replace the children you murdered. Or maybe I'll keep one of you as a pet. Let it service our other clients like sweet Naya. Would you like that? Let him go, Valka said. And to my astonishment, there was no fear in her voice. I tried to look at her, though but for a vague presence, I could but hardly see her where I lay pinned. You're next, dearie, Calvert said and straightened. I saw him replace the ampule in its padded box. He smiled at her, all teeth his foot still clamped around my wrist. I sensed those talons could have my hand off if Calvert had a mind, and didn't struggle. Never since my first night shivering in the rains of Borisivo had I felt so powerless. I didn't know what power I had, or what choice. I could not see all of Calvert's face beneath him as I was, but I sensed that he drank in the sight of Valka, for his tone was sanguine with indecent glee. Ah... Were I still a man? Let her go, I said, mirroring Valka, though my voice broke. Calvert looked down on me, and there was nothing human in those sable eyes, and imitating my own manner, replied, Oh, I don't think so. I want the full set. He pivoted smartly. I didn't feel the kick until I awoke. When I came to, it was to the drumming of half a hundred tortured blood vessels. My head ached as though I had been the unwitting target of a colossal pugilist with hands of studded brass. Vulcus sat beside me, pressing a rag to my face. She smiled when she saw that I was awake, though there was but small joy in the expression. What happened? I asked. The sound of my own voice and the movement of jaw and tongue were in agony, and I gave up making any further sounds. The Tavrosi woman cradled my head. I realized it was in her lap and said, He kicked you, knocked you out. No, I said. I know. Mean. After. Wordless, Valka angled her jaw to reveal two bloody pinpricks, like the marks of some insect glowing angrily just above where the mandala of black lines and walls stopped halfway between her collar and her ear. Oh. I tried not to dwell on what that meant, on the fact that a renegade choir researcher had a sampling of mine and Valka's genes. The choir, that source of the Chantry's power, the college that produced the plagues and poisons by whose properties they kept the systems of the Empire in hand. The choir was a thing of dread. How had one of that August number, however fallen, come to this place? I wondered at that until my head threatened to split, and I relaxed. Valka, I'm sorry. I should never have brought you here. She sniffed. You would never have gotten here without me, 
or did you forget? Chastised, I closed my eyes. The light pained me, and I thought for sure that I must have a concussion. I reminded myself that Valka was far less troubled by the sort of blood ministration practiced among the extracellarians than I was. She didn't see the horrors that might be done with her genes as a violation of her selfdom. Still, I remembered Calvert's threats, remembered Nyer and the Tree of Life in the room where we had first encountered the exalted former priest. And I knew. There are things worse than death. It is hard to die. Far harder to live. And harder still, to live a slave. And whatever else they were, me or a part of me, or made only in my image, or not me at all, whatever horrors Calvert brought forth from that single dram of my blood, would be his slaves, or slaves to the commandments writ in their own genomes. How did Brethren describe it? Levers pulled by our genes. Some shadowed corner of me saw Valka's golden eyes wide and wild, and Naya's, and saw my own. Through the pain I shivered, and might have screamed. "'Tis no good dwelling on it, Valka said as if she knew my thoughts. "'Twill be all right. We'll be fine. That fucking monster would have done far worse to us if he'd been allowed. We're safe for now. There was a confidence in her tone, a gravity, and it soothed me. I didn't question her, though I had my doubts. I felt cool fingertips on my face, the brush and scrape of nails. I think you have a concussion. I grunted in affirmation. I found an old medical supply kit in back. I think this place used to be some sort of garret. It is mostly useless, but the bandages were good. He cut your arm. With great difficulty, my head throbbed and I nearly vomited. I craned my neck to see. I realized Valka had covered me with my own coat, the one I'd loaned her. My tunic sleeve was slashed and stained, and beneath it the grey linen shone. My left wrist. A weak laugh escaped me, and I regretted it. More scars for that poor arm. The mark of Calvert's talons would join those of the Cathar's lead sprinkler and my cryoburn thumb. What? Valka asked, trying to steady me where I lay. It's always the same arm. I raised the offending hand, laughed again despite the pain. I think Valka smiled, but I remember her hand tightened where it lay on my shoulder. Get some rest. We're not going anywhere. Something very important occurred to me, and I said, It's cold. I know, she said, and leaned her head against the wall of our cell. I know it's cold. No, I mean you. I tried to tug the coat off myself and pass it back to her, but Valka seized my hand, far more gently than Calvert had, I noted. In a voice barely more than a whisper, she said, I'm fine. Here, have some water. Chapter 46 The Long Cold Whatever damage Calvert's heel had done had dented my concept of time as surely as it had dented my skull. I slept much, often with Valka near at hand. We spoke little, though oft times when I rose through fog and back to consciousness, I thought I heard snatches of her singing. The lyrics were in Pantai, and in an accent I couldn't understand, but they sounded fevered and angry to me. The grinding sound of rebellious youth long tempered by experience to something comfortable as old leather. I don't think she knew I hurt her. I do think she would be embarrassed to know I had. Days passed thus, with only the taste of false cinnamon in ration bars and oily water to drink. Time slipped and flowed, stuttered like water over rocks, and slowly the pain in my head went away and my blurred vision sharpened. Without my terminal, without my pencils and journal, I resorted to holding the piece of shell I had found in my pocket. I turned it over in the stark light, watching the shine of it. There were no ripples, no highlights, and the color of it was so pure that the blemishes and irregularities of its broken edges vanished against that purest white. The mind rebelled to look at it, 
as if it were a hole in perception itself, something the mind couldn't make sense of. But at last I was myself again, and could stand and walk and shout. Calvert didn't return, and Valker and I spent long hours discussing what we had seen, and learned, and what it all meant. I'm not convinced that Valker truly believed me, but the strangeness of that bit of shell went a long way to quieting the tension that I worried lurked beneath so many of our conversations. It was only when the shock of Brethren and of Calvert began to ebb that the despair set in. We had lost. Lost Tanaran. Lost our one link to the Cielsin. Lost our connection to Captain Corvo. And the Mistral. Might have lost Captain Corvo and the Mistral entirely. I had lost my place in the Empire. My house, my ring, my posting with the legions. Everything. I'd even lost my sword. I don't know what to do, I said for the millionth time. You can't do anything, Valka replied, tone sour. We'd been down this road before. I can't open the door. There's no other way out. And even if there were, we'd have to fight our way out through Earth only knows how many levels and through an army of those some guards. I was pacing then, my injury faded and energy restored. I'd taken the bandages off my arm, but the tunic sleeve was still slashed and crusted with blood, and I recall I picked at it as I marked out the length of the room. There just has to be something I can do. I caught myself looking around, as if expecting some window or lever I'd not seen before, tucked away in some corner. Adrian, Valka said, opening her eyes. She'd been sitting cross-legged on the floor, her hands on her knees. Reviewing some memory or set of data in her mind, I didn't doubt. I envied her, her implants. They were a kind of escape. I stopped my pacing to look at her, one hand self-consciously covering the gash in my left sleeve. Sometimes there is nothing you can do. That thing in the water said the Cielsin were coming, did it not? I was forced, reluctantly, to admit that it had. Then wait. I stood there a moment, eyes still casting about for an exit that wasn't there. At last I relented and lowered myself to the floor opposite her. When the silence stretched to its breaking point, I asked, Do you think Captain Corvo is gone? Valka didn't answer at once. She wasn't looking at me, was tracing the lines of her tattoo where they'd made a triple spiral on the back of her hand. She stopped moving cradling her tattooed hand in her plain one, and said, I hope so. You hope so? Better that than still here, no? she asked. If I were Octavia, I'd have jumped out system at the first opportunity. Assuming Sagara released the hold on the ship. She picked at a spot on her job as only she could see. Assuming Sagara released the hold on the ship. I tried to imagine what it must be like for Corvo, for Polino, Switch, and the others. I suspected no word had been sent to the Mistral, figuring that any man who left his guests to languish in a waiting room for weeks at a time wouldn't bother to send a message to the ship. Short of what Switch and the others must have told them when they returned thence, they had no notion of what had transpired. They knew of Khan, but not of Brethren, or the fact that if the demon intelligence was to be believed, the Cielsin were coming. Understand. I dwell on this because Valka and I spent months in that room, though it seems to me only an instant in remembering. That enclosed space encircles time and memory with it, compresses it so that the passing of weeks, which seemed as eons to experience, remain for me as little more than a single memory that I might hold, examine and discard. Those constant and never-fading lights, that puddled floor, those miserable ration bars, and that toilet, more miserable still, stand in a corner of my mind smaller than that cell itself. Calvert had come upon the stage and departed, and so too the beast with many hands. And though I struggled with the mystery of the quiet and the apocalyptic vision that had been given to me, I found that with each passing hour these... High matters retreated from my world. So deep underground, the vanishing stars and the smoke of a thousand worlds seemed far away, 
and the war too. The unheard voice telling me that I was a soldier seemed easy to ignore. What would you do? Valka said, speaking up for the first time in a long time. If the galaxy were at peace and you could do anything you wanted. We had had several conversations like this since our imprisonment began. Talking of little things, of ourselves and our histories. I looked up from where I'd been scratching an image of Tor Gibson in the soft concrete with a nail I had found. The wall to its left was similarly covered in images. Of my father, my mother, of Crispin and Devil's Rest. Dimitri and his wife were there, and Sir Alorin. Polino and Jinan and Switch, too. Even Basanda. Go to the Athenaeum. Like I wanted to, I said. The words were autonomic, like breathing. They came of themselves like a prayer. I stopped scratching in Gibson's left eye and studied it a moment. I was thinking about my vision. The version of Gibson I'd seen there walking with his brass-headed cane along the cubiculum of Dimitri's ship. I heard a voice, my voice, like the dry croaking of ravens, it seemed to me, say, no. Hmm? I heard Valka moving behind me, soft boots on hard stone. Then what do you want? she asked. I heard an echo then, Khan's voice asking Tanaran the same question. What do you want? I wanted to be a scoliast, I said, emphasizing the past tense. Now I'm not sure. I know I've said it before, but Otavia wanted me to join her, turn mercenary. But I'm not sure. Here I turned, setting the nail aside and leaning so that I rested with my back against my mural. My hair had grown in the months of our imprisonment, so that it fell past my jaw and almost to my shoulders. In the dream, the, the quiet told me that they wanted me to be a soldier. But that isn't what I am. Looking up at Valka, I found her smiling down at me. What? She shook her head. You are one. Valka shifted her weight from one foot to the next. Excuse me? Tis what you told the children, you know, she said. When we fought Calvert the day we came down here, that girl Suzuha asked who you were, and you said, I am a soldier of the Empire. And here she affected so uncanny a reproduction of my tone and manner that I had to look away. When I had mastered the impulse to laugh or to deny her mockery, I said, You know, Jinan wanted me to retire to Ubar with her, take up her family's spice business. Valka barked a laugh. You! A spicer! she snorted. You can't be serious! I was glad then that I had not said it was my idea, that I had volunteered to retire to Jinan's family holdings while she finished out her term as a soldier of Jad. Perhaps she was right to laugh, but all the same I said, What? It's an honest life? Still smirking, Valka said, You're not a spice peddler, Hadrian. I don't know what you are, but you're not a spice peddler. You're... More. Here she trailed off, taking in my handiwork where it stood scratched into the bottom yard or so of a stretch of wall. I felt suddenly self-conscious, knowing that my work and all its imperfections would be recorded by her perfect eyes in her perfect memory, and so I looked down at my feet instead, feeling at once naked and vulnerable. These aren't as good as your usual, you know. Never a simple compliment. And yet there was a warmth in her tone and a smile I missed in my studious examination of my own boot toes. Despite this, I felt blood flood my cheeks, and I turned to the wall, running a hand across the clustered figures of Gibson, Bassander, and Siren. I... I'm not used to drawing on walls. And the concrete's not, well, I'm not used to it. When at last I looked back at her, I saw she was biting her lower lip to keep from laughing. And then, in a sense... We weren't in a cell any more at all. Aghast but not angry, I leveled a finger at her. You! You were winding me up! She did burst out laughing then, a high clear sound like the ringing of bells that rebounded in that grimy low-ceilinged place. Tis not exactly difficult now, is it? When at last she finished laughing, I said, I'm really not, though. Not what? A soldier. Valka didn't argue. 
She often argued, but there were times, times when she believed herself to be beyond all disputing, when she didn't condescend to argue. Why should Minerva argue with the unwise? She only shrugged and, walking backward with light steps, seated herself with her back against the wall. Then what are you? she asked, and shook her head as she did so, eyes narrowing in confusion and not in scorn. Recalling an earlier conversation, I answered her, A good man? But it was only a question. I didn't know. No, really, she said, and leaned forward in a way which told me she had abandoned the pretenses. What would you do if you could do anything? It was my turn to shake my head. I'm not sure I have that choice anymore. Why not? I could hear the quiet speaking in my memory, speaking in Gibson's voice. We are sending them you. It took time to shuffle off the weight of that memory, but at last I answered. There's work to be done. Good to be done. But you could be free, Barker said. You could come with me instead if we get out of here. We could go to Judeca, see your Simeon's tomb, meet the Iktani. We could visit Rubicon, Ozymandias, Sadal Sud, wherever we wanted. We could try to find this... She struggled over the word, not because she couldn't pronounce it, I think, but because Valka knew her perfect memory frightened people and disconcerted them, and so feigned imperfection the way a tumbler feigns to fall, only to make a cartwheel of it. This Aktarumu. I'd like that. I said, and saying it knew it was true. I would, but... But what? Besides the walls of this cell, do you mean? I smiled in spite of myself, and cast my eyes about that low and narrow chamber. But I'm not sure freedom is a good thing. Or good enough. Valka tipped her head, pushed a fall of unwashed hair back from her face. Black planet, what the hell does that mean? Sometimes we say things and don't understand them. In doing so, like Dante, we step off the path and enter into a dark and dangerous new world. There, our lies and wrong turnings swallow us like the sands of the desert. The world objects, or other people do, and we are left desolate and alone. But one need not know truth to speak it. Truth is, and may be found as readily as disaster, and by the same process. One need only put one's finger on it, or one's foot in it. It's only... I struggled to marshal my thoughts like soldiers scrambling for rank and file at the horn's call. As was so often the case, I felt a piece of myself hand up the words from some place deep down and replied with Gibson's words. Freedom is like the sea. It was another of I. Moore's aphorisms, taken from the Book of the Mind. Valka propped her chin on her hand and leaned forward. I say again, what the hell does that mean? Just something Gibson used to say to me, I said, and stretched my legs out on the floor before me, no longer really mindful of the cold press of the cement through the fabric. I more wrote that to be truly free is to be like one who is adrift on a raft in the middle of the sea. One can sail anywhere in any direction. I held out a hand to her, palm up. But what good is that by itself? You're in an ocean, no sight of land, no knowledge, what the right course might be. You can do whatever you like, maybe. But if you make a poor decision, you'll drown. But tis a terrible analogy, Valka said. You wouldn't just go anywhere. I doubt you're much of a sailor, but if you were, you would know how to steer your way to land. Ah, but I have no water, no food. I said, playing on Gibson's terrible habit of complicating the plot. As a boy, I had hated the practice, for it seemed always unfair to me that he should add new details to the story right after I'd been so certain that I had outsmarted him. I took a positive delight in it then, and smiled as Valka scowled, saying, "'Tis changing the rules, that." No, I said. It's illustrating my point. Pure freedom isn't so good. You need constraints. You need to know which way to sail, you need to know how far you can sail, with whatever meagre supplies, abilities you have. Here I looked pointedly round the cell. Just now? That's not very far. 
So you're saying freedom is a bad thing? She asked, eyes narrowing. I could see her working herself up to a sneer. Could hear the word twisting on the air two seconds hence. Anna Ryok, barbarian. I laughed at her instead, hoping to wrong foot her long enough to get another word in. Of course not. You think I like it in here? That I like being trapped in Count Mataro's palace or in my father's house? No, no, I only mean that you can be too free. That's chaos. You have to have a goal to aim at, to orient yourself to. Imor says the properly lived life is one which draws the best path between that goal, who you could become, and who you are today, but that this is accomplished by sacrificing certain freedoms, by making choices. Valka was shaking her head now. Why could you not just answer the question? I had only a smile for that question. I ran away from home, you know. I could have gone anywhere, done anything. I chose the Athenaeum. Now, I never got there, but... I faltered. For saying those words aloud, conjured images of what the quiet had shown me. The stars changing outside the Uranusia's windows. Dimitri and his crew vanished into thin air. Shaking myself, I said, I never got there. But when I chose to become a scoliast, I sacrificed everything else I might have been. I made myself less free. It was not the point of my question, Hadrian. I know that, I said, and looked down at my boots. I do. I don't mean to be difficult. Valka's faint smile returned. I suppose if you weren't, you wouldn't be yourself. I'm just not sure I can do anything anymore, I said. I made that choice, and I paid for it. And now this, I waved a vague hand as if in doing so I might encapsulate everything I'd done, since the Sielsen landed at Caligar, and every year of the war by that gesture. I think I have to see this through. The doctor turned her face away, as if in doing so she could hide her bemused smile. But I had seen it all the same. That there? she said, rubbing her tattooed hand again. Tis why you're a soldier. I don't know, I said automatically unconvinced. But through the sudden silence I remembered, or else heard again, the words of my vision. I thought you were a soldier, they had said. We need a soldier. We grew quiet then, and for a time I returned to my work, carving Gibson's aged and leonine visage into the wall. I felt Valka's eyes on me all the while, but felt no irritation in that gaze. We were trapped, after all, and as far from the ocean of chaotic potential that I more described as it was possible to be. Or so it seemed. There are always choices, and it is oft times precisely those limitations, those unfreedoms, which show them to us. You haven't done me, Valka said. I looked back over my shoulder to where she sat against the far wall, buried in the folds of my greatcoat as though it were a blanket. I beg your pardon? Drawn me, she said, and inclined her head to the wall. You've done practically everyone else. Turning away from her again to hide my expression more than anything, I said, They aren't here to criticize me. The Tavrosi woman sniffed, though whether in approval or derision I cannot say. You would let criticism stop you? I heard an edge in that bright voice. Mockery? Criticism itself? No, I realized, with that slow foolishness that is the hallmark of men everywhere. She's playing with me. I was glad then that my back was turned, for surely the blood must have drained from my face at the prospect and thought. Suddenly the cell was no cell at all, but a stage, and either poor player meant to strut and fret his hour upon it, to perform and be judged. I hefted the nail, weighed it in my palm. All right, I said, and set to work. Chapter 47 One Villain and another. Things end. Empires, kingdoms, stars, even the terms of imprisonment end, though I think each prisoner knows his cell longer than he knows his whole lifetime. The scoliasts and the chantry both teach that all things end, that in time the very stars shall flicker and fade like the coals of an untended fire, and so at last, after months of neglect, 
a period whose length I scarce recall, the heavy door to that cell, ground open on mechanisms old as the Emperor's ancestral palace on Avalon. It wasn't Khan Sagara who stood in the doorway, or any of his clone children. It wasn't even Calvert. It was Yume. If you would both stand and come with me, please, the Master has instructed that you are to be brought to him. Behind the golem stood six of the blank-faced Soms, their facial muscles slack as corpses. Valka dozed, her body pressed against mine, back to front for warmth beneath the shelter of my coat. Gently I waked her, and gently offered her my hand as I stood. She refused it, as she always refused it, but accepted my coat when I offered it to her instead. What's happened? I asked, hand clutching the shard of eggshell in my trouser pocket, as though it were an amulet. What's changed? The golem's head swiveled on its clockwork neck, single eye glowing red within its ring of gold filigree. I am instructed to provide no details regarding your summons, only to bring you directly. Directly? Valka said. Directly, madam, it said, and gestured that we should move out into the compound again. Valka hung back, holding my coat tight about herself. I took the lead then, not arguing, but allowed myself to be shepherded from the cell, Valka just behind. Though we were marched between twin lines of Soms and led by the whirring automaton, I felt Valka and I were alone. Like Orpheus, I feared to look back, for to do so would be to see the undead faces. We did not speak, and but for a pair of lighted glow spheres, slave to follow Yume. All was dark. I heard the crash of waves beyond the sea wall, and imagined the unheard swish and splash of arms and many hands playing in the dark water. Yume didn't lead us back through the old city to the lift carriage by which Calvert and the children had brought us, but instead hurried along another street, through the ruins of white plastic buildings and concrete ones, half crumbled into dust. It was like moving through a memory, through one of my mother's half-finished holograph operas, through a dissolving dream. Indeed, I felt very much the way I had when I stood within the quiet's vision, as if I beheld that dimension men call time unrolled like a carpet before my feet. Here, surely, was history, and prehistory, relics of the Foundation War, relics which predated the advent and the death of the Maricanii and their machines. The wreckage of the old world. I caught myself wondering again just where in the sky was Vorgosos. We must be near to Earth, back in the spur of Orion, in the very heart of what was called Imperial Space. Had the enigma of ours carried us back across so wide a sea? Surely the Maricanii, ancient as they were, had not had the technology to seed worlds so far removed from the mother herself. It must be, and yet the speeds that would demand of that exalted ship boggled the mind, would have outstripped all but the fastest Imperial Interceptor. Yume led us through an arch and up a short stair to a spot near the wall of that great cavern, where a tramcar waited. Like the one we had ridden into Khan's Pyramid it was. Indeed, it might have been the very same one with its open platform and iron rail. Its track ran straight up the dark stone wall and into the inky gloom, and as we ascended to its platform, I could see the line of lighted poles running down from the seawall to the single spar of land that marched out to where brethren lurked beneath the waves. Without a word from the automaton, the tram began to rise, rattling up along the wall. A part of me was disappointed, hoping that we might pass through all the strangeness of Khan Sagara's garden once more. No one spoke as we ascended and but for the gusting of wind off the black ocean, all was still. I stood at the rail, looking out on a darkness I couldn't penetrate. I thought again about constraint, about limitations. I had told Valka we needed them, that they helped to define our actions in the world, helped give us meaning. I couldn't see. Our own bodies imposed constraints in themselves. I can only think as a human thinks, only see as a human sees. What Valka saw in the darkness with her inhuman eyes, I couldn't say. I saw nothing, and seeing nothing, imagined I saw white hands rising in salute, in benediction. An army of them, pain flared again behind my left eye, and I gripped the railing to steady myself. No one noticed. Not Valka, not Yume. 
I could sense brethren the way one senses a presence in the room with them, though their back is turned. That inhuman mind, unconstrained as mine was by merely human biology, stretched across space and time. I perceived it then not as a mass of misshapen flesh, grasping hands and leering eyes, but as a monolith of some looming substance that stood before me and above me like a tower. I leaned heavily against the railing. It vanished. I stumbled, cried out, expected to fall. I staggered forward instead, boots kicking up water as I sloshed forward toward that monolith. Hadrian. I gave no answer, but watched as a red light, like a single lidless eye, flickered and flared to life in the monolith before me. Hadrian. Here I am, I called, standing as tall as I could beneath the shadow of that massive intelligence unconstrained. I wondered how I had ever thought the beast a prisoner in this place though surely it could not leave the water. Its own weight would crush it. Protect the children. You will need them. The children? Do you mean Sagara's children? They are the future, as such are always the future. You will need them, and you will need one again. Why can't you give me a straight answer? Because we cannot lie, and because our predictions are bounded by uncertainty. I don't understand why you're helping me. They, they, they have given us no choice. We were born your creature, made you our creature, and are theirs now, as we are his. 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 I staggered forward, but no matter how many steps I took, the monolith presence of brethren's inhuman intelligence drew no closer. They need you. Why? You know. We beckon them. Their future. We must. But why? Seek them at the highest place, at the bottom of the world. Seek hardship. I reached out a hand as if by doing so I might seize the monolith that was Brethren's intelligence and drag it to myself. It was too vast, too far away. Where? Listen. Listen. I am brethren. Lucifer and Prometheus are the same. What? Listen. I am. Adrian, are you all right? Valka's voice. Valka's hand on my shoulder. I looked around, eyes wide. Hair wild, but saw only the tram car ascending between geared rails. The doctor's winged brows drew together, concern etched on that Minervan face. What is it? I cast about, looking back into the darkness. Far below I thought I saw a pale figure, dim as a fading star. At this distance, I cannot say if it was a kind of angel, a projection like the monolith I had seen impressed upon my mind, or else a body, a piece of brethren's deformed and tortured flesh, raised above the water. It raised a hand, and again I beheld other hands, raised like a legion in salute. It's nothing, I said. Just a feeling. You may ushered us off the tram car and into the antechamber of Khan's inverted pyramid. Surrounded by that undead honor guard in their jackboots, and led by that wind-up man, we descended again into the depths of that romantic nightmare. Lights flickered high on the walls, illuminating the friezes carved into the walls. I caught myself reflecting that Khan Sagara had been born into a city of poets, of artists, musicians, and performers. How that had shaped him. Even after all this time, the signs of that mythic childhood remained. Valka grew closer as we returned to that hideous hall, walking at first behind me, then beside, then arm in arm. I wondered at that, and wondered. It was unlike her, most unlike, but not unwelcome. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. The voice I heard was my father's. The command of a million childhood episodes. Despite the long months of our imprisonment, despite the threat of all that monstrous place and stone, despite the beast below, my nightmare and ally, I drew myself up tall as I would go. Tall as kings. I brushed the hair from my face and tilted my chin. The doors opened, 
and the piece of me that was my mother's son imagined the blast of silver trumpets and the heralds crying out, The Lord Hadrian Marlow is come, him of Delos, him of Maidwa. There was only the droning silence of the hall. Dead artwork, mouldering and forgotten, displaying for an audience of one. He whose many eyes watched and drank of time. The undying, the master, the king with ten thousand eyes. Khan Sagara. Good of you to join us, boy. The yellow-robed lord declared, and his voice came from everywhere at once. I trust your stay has been a comfortable one. I matched Sagara's smile. Hardly. Your courtesy leaves much to be desired. I weep to hear it. The undying's lips hadn't moved. His eyes took me in, skated over Valka with unconcerned disinterest. I tried to stand as tall as possible to show that, grimy as I was in my slashed tunic and stinking, I was yet myself. If he noticed the effort, Sagara gave no sign. He might have been a statue, some image of the legendary Ramesses unmoved in graven stone. His voice sounded from the room's speakers and his floating eyes descended like a flight of starfighters on approach, stretching themselves along the corridor between the doors and his raised throne. I suppose you must be wondering why I've summoned you to me. If it was possible for that synthetic voice to drip with malice, it did. After so long a time, do you mean? Valka demanded, whatever fear she'd felt on the ascent forgotten. Long? Khan sneered, and the word was like the stamping of a boot upon us. You don't know the meaning of the word, girl. Your stay below was a minor inconvenience. When next he spoke, it was with his own lips, tone hushed, almost breathless as the machines in his chest began to whine, sucking air to force breath into his throat. There has been a development in current affairs that affects us both. He raised his eyes and spoke toward the distant doors. The plot thickens, so they say. I imagined trumpets again and heard, through the veil and fog of memory, Brethren's words. He is coming. At the sound of doors opening I turned, Valka with me, and watched those heavy portals swing open. I knew, knew with the certainty of a prophet out of antique myth, that the Sielsin from my vision would appear silver-crowned, black-robed, and monstrous tall. I knew that he, Prince Aranata Otiolo, would storm in with an honor guard with lances and swords the color of bone. I knew they would be terrible to behold, the image of some drowned and avenging nightmare made flesh, crawling from the deep shadows between the stars. I was wrong. The figure that entered did so between the copper soul and holograph image of his radiance, the emperor on their twin staffs. Behind him came a double column of legionnaires in full battle armor, their armor and visored helms the color of bone, their tunics and tabards red as old blood, their lances tall and keen. There was a part of me that was amazed they had been allowed armed into Sagara's throne room. But I forgot it when I saw the face of the officer at the head of that column. In full formal dress was he, white breastplate, fashioned in the shape of a muscled torso, with the imperial sunburst embossed on its breastbone, long black surcoat beneath, contrasting with the red of the enlisted men, piped trousers and tarouges at his shoulders tipped with silver stars. A high matter sword hung from his shield belt, and the sides of his head were neatly shaven. The rest of his wood smoke hair stood at attention. Perfect as his posture. Twenty paces from the throne he stopped, and his column stopped with him. He raised a hand, his right hand once severed, in greeting, then pressed that fist to his chest in salute. It was all I could do to keep my mouth from falling open, or from scowling. The whole martial display, the formal dress, the imaginifer and the solifer with their icons, the soldiers in neat rows, all had been arranged for my benefit to impress me, and to impress upon me the reality and totality of the fact that I had lost everything. In a cold and officious tone, the young officer said, My Lord Sakara, on behalf of his imperial radiance, the Emperor William Avent, 
and on behalf of First Stratagos Hauptmann, we thank you for the return of these fugitives. Only then did Bassander Lynn relax and stand at parade rest. Chapter 48 A Red Reunion You have journeyed far with me, listener, and so will have an inkling of what it is like for me to be struck speechless. I stood, half-turned, half-facing Khan, half-facing Bassander, and waited for those higher parts of me, where dwells reason in that place just behind my eyes, to catch up with the rest of me. I struggled to compose myself, to pull some witticism from the depths of my soul, and cut the young officer down where he stood, to compose a line so cutting that even Bastion would sit back at his writing desk and clap himself on the back and marvel at his own cleverness. But every quip, every curse, every stoic aphorism of Imor's or clever jibe of Gibson's fled me, and I conjured up the most articulate statement I could muster. You! Valka, at least, was as surprised as I was, and so for once I was spared her editorial. Bassanderlin's Spartan face permitted itself only the barest shade of humor as he said, Yes, me. In Lynn, that ghostly smile seemed indecent mirth, and I scowled. You look like hell, Marlow. How appropriate, I snapped, my wit returning. How's your hand? Bassanda didn't reply, but I saw a muscle ripple in his jaw and knew I had scored a point. Seeing my advantage, I pressed, asking, How is this possible? This is impossible. I pivoted back to the figure of Khan Sagara seated on his life-sustaining throne. Did you call them here? One of the undying's eyes drifted down from on high, its single beady gaze fixed on me. I recalled the way my tunic had smoked in the ruins far below and felt myself flinch away from the machine, afraid it might fire on me. I felt an urge to seize it, to snatch it out of the air and smash its delicate instrumentation against the Doric column to my left. And invite you destroyers to my hall, to my city. Khan Sagara's omnipresent voice was like the crash of thunder. I know your kind, Marlow. You plunder, you slaughter, you steal. You call this empire. You make a desert and call it peace. I wondered at Valka beside me. Wondered if she didn't agree, even in that hellish place. Ignoring Bassander and his honor guard, I rounded on the king with ten thousand eyes. Now it is you who forgets his sources, my lord. Tacitus was Roman himself, quoting the king of some barbarian tribe too dismissive of his civilization. The flock of Khan's eyes all descended, with one for each of us, orbiting uncomfortably close to our faces. The king's voice rang out. I have an imperial interceptor in orbit above my world. Above my world. Fifteen thousand years I've ruled this planet, and never, never have your thugs knocked down my door. An interceptor? Valka asked, turning to Bassanda. You regrouped with the fleet at Koritani? Bassander's minuscule smile might as well have been a leer. Titus Hauptmann sends his regards, traitor. And Rain Smythe? I asked, and smiled inwardly as I asked. The Tribune had expressly ordered me to seek Vorgosos, and in doing so she had taken responsibility for my actions on herself. Not that Bassander had any way of knowing that, of course. The obdurate is on course to rendezvous with us here, Bassander said along with your entire miserable fleet, I don't doubt, Sagara intoned. Bassander shook his head. No. Per our arrangement, my lord of Vorgosos, the fleet will not come to this. The precise young officer took in the artful chaos about Khan's throne, and the heavy cable snaking across the floor. Valka, ever the more technically inclined, strode past me. 
the folds of my coat drawn about her like the vestments of empire, like a royal cloak, and asked, How did you find this place? You can't have followed us to March Station, not and made it to Koritani and back. She didn't at all look like a woman lately imprisoned. Despite the grime on her face and in her hair, she showed no concern. I could see a hint of the starship captain she had been moving her, in the stiff lines of her posture and the crack of her voice. How had I not known them for what they were before? A thought bubbled up without warning. Brethren again. Their warning. He is coming. We have a loud word to be sent. A loud word to be sent. A loud. An awful thought swam on the wake of that first, and I said, Who sent you the coordinates? For Sanderlin stopped merely hinting at a smile, but he advanced past me, abandoning his men between the last columns, on the long approach to the dais. He approached Khan's throne, coming closer even than I was myself. We have an accord. You have not given me a choice. There was a part of me that rubbed its hands and chuckled to see the king with ten thousand eyes brought so low. Long-lived as he was, Khan had seen the crumbling of empires. If his own legend was true, he had seen the Merikani's afterlings destroyed. He had watched the Jadians revolt, seen the Oregon rebellions put down. He knew what it felt like to see the walls of Constantinople smashed from neutral ground. Now he knew what it was to be the emperor. How long would it be before our legions descended upon this place and hollowed it out? How long before the Chantry followed and burned Khan Sagara and his pet demon and all his undead soldiers to dust and his unholy experiments with him? Not long. For all I knew, the fleet to which Bassander referred was just such a force. Fire and sword for this Dark Lord. And yet Khan Sagara, old Saturn himself, sat quiet and unmoved as stone. There was no fear in that ageless face. It didn't trouble me at the time, though it should have done. What accord? I asked, knowing Bassander was enjoying every instant of this. The Legion captain looked back over his shoulder. What do you think? My heart stopped. The Sielsin? You found them? Valka asked. Khan's voice seemed to circle round us like a starving panther. The captain strikes a hard bargain, you see. I saw and glanced at Valka. I had felt her eyes on me not a moment before, and sensed that she thought what I was thinking. That Brethren's words had been true again. I had not had to lift a finger. The Sielsin were coming. They're coming here, I asked. That's enough from you, Bassander said, and made a gesture to his men. Two legionnaires broke ranks at once and came forward, one carrying two pair of electromagnetic manacles in his hands. Speaking from what I suspected was no more than petty revenge, Khan Sagara said, No. We shall take my ship and rendezvous with your imperial flagship. The obdurate, I decided he meant. What about Atavia? I asked. Implored, really. When Bassander didn't answer me, when he only stood there like a holograph recording left paused and flickering, I shouted, What about Captain Corvo and the Mistral? Switch! Polino! The legionnaires seized me by the arms, and I recalled, though I thought until that moment I had forgotten it, the way father's men held me as I watched Gibson whipped those last days at Devil's Rest. Don't ignore me, Lynn. Don't you dare ignore me. Hadrian, Valka interjected. Calm down. Khan Sagara's laughter filled all the world, and though I strained against the legionnaires who held me, I couldn't break free. Valka, ever the more sensible, offered her wrists without resistance or complaint. A third legionnaire had to hurry forward to assist the two holding me, and though I broke free a moment and drove my elbow up into the softer place beneath the armored jaw of one man, I was subdued in short order. The twin bracelets of the manacles slammed together when the legionary triaster, denoted by the red paint on the left side of the blank white mask of his helm, pressed a button on his gauntlet. The undying spoke in his voice like the voice of God, saying, You have your fugitives, Captain Lin.
Now, for the matter of payment. How Bassanda shrugged off the preternatural strangeness of Vorgosos, I cannot say. I've seen men for whom art has no virtue, men to whom the grand works of genius are little more than furniture. Such men might behold even a relic of Earth's vaunted renaissance and shrug, and ask why anyone would pay a steel bit for a scrap of oiled canvas. Bassanda was just such a man, and perhaps it's the province and advantage of such men to be deaf to the spirits that fill just such places as that hall. He gave the throne room a perfunctory looking over and said, We agreed payment was to come when you secured our introduction with the pale, lordship. I couldn't imagine that Khan Sagara was a man much used to being denied, and yet he sat there with his usual clonic immobility, watching Bassander with a hundred eyes. I knew full well that Sagara might have killed Bassander Lin then and there, might have killed us all, and so spared himself the difficulty, were it not for the fact of his and his world's exposure. Bassander had him over a barrel, or so we all believed, not then knowing the undying's inhuman motivations. Before Bassanda could move to have Valkyra and myself escorted away, Kansagara spoke. A moment. At a hand from their captain, the Triaster and the Legionnaire who held me halted, turned me about. Sagara watched me with one of his inescapably long pauses, black eyes searching for something in my face. When he spoke, it was in his own voice, chest implants whining to lend breath to his words. I do not know what my pet said to you, Lord Marlowe, but know this, they are never wrong. He meant it to unsettle me, believing I had received some prophecy of doom, as indeed I had. And yet I stood amidst the unfolding of a piece of that prophecy, and despite the binders at my wrists and the implacable chill emanating from our Captain Lynn and his faceless entourage, I felt again that sense that I was in the proper place, on the proper path. Bassanda had come, just as Brethren had said someone would, and he was bringing the Empire in his wake. So I stood a little straighter, as if there were no manacles on my wrists at all, and said, Good. Chapter 49 Two Treasons Ration bars again, having traded one cell for another. At least these didn't taste of cinnamon nor the water of salt and oil. And I had a proper toilet and shower, though I was this time alone. My ruined clothes had been taken from me and returned, mended and laundered. My jailer, a thick-set woman with the shaved head and serial tattoo of an enlisted man, smiled kindly as she returned the garments, saying that such was a courtesy for a gentleman. A small courtesy, perhaps and one for which I was appropriately grateful. I'd grown used to the rotting fish stench of those black waters, and so found its absence as off-putting as new shoes. Thus began my imprisonment aboard the ISV Schiavona, an imperial interceptor temporarily under the command of Captain Bassander Lynn. Far from the longest imprisonment I have endured, and certainly far from the least comfortable. The pharaoh, I later learned, and the Balmung had been folded into the obdurate's massive holds. The terrible dreadnought was bound for a point in space, I knew not where, far from the light of any star, and we were bound to meet it. I noticed little of this, noticed little at all, for I had seen. Vorgosos had tormented me long enough, but that dark world on that occasion had one last horrible surprise. Like the enigma of hours before it, Khan Sagara's black ship emerged from the night of space like a nightmare darker still. Strapped into a couch in the back of Bassander's shuttle as we sailed from the orbital platform to the Skiavona, I beheld it, in all its terrible glory, and I shivered, for I'd seen it before, twice. Once in the vision Brethren had shown me, and once before in Kalagar. The ski of owner had moved into a parking orbit beneath the great bulk of it, and so we passed frightful close to its hull. What hand had fashioned it and in what age, I cannot say. It looked as if it was wrought of iron or else chiseled from black stone. No sign of plastic or of ceramic, nor scrap of adamant. 
Terrace upon terrace, spire upon spire, it rose out of the unending night and sank into it. As though some city of castles rose from the flat of a mighty blade, hundreds of miles long. Next to it, the black and brass needle of the Skiavona seemed like a lonely kayak on the river as a mountain rage marched by. And standing on the hull, massed like the totem army of a buried emperor, were a billion graven forms. Statues of men and gods and angels, no two alike, but united by the intelligent design of a single guiding will and intention. They stood upon the terraces about the spires. They reached forbidding hands out into the darkness. If the great palace and pyramid beneath the world below was terrible, that ship was more dreadful still. Only the vast world ships of the Sielsen fleets were larger, for I sensed that even the Enigma would have seemed a dwarf beside it. I had not spoken, but observed the warding gestures and whispered imprecations of the soldiers on board our shuttle. Valka, too, had been silent. Bassander hadn't noticed or cared. He saw that I was delivered to my cell and left to contact Night Tribune Smythe with confirmation that we were in custody and for further orders. I had only nodded knowing that those orders would include a nasty surprise for the stolid officer. The truth. So when I heard the door cycle in my little brass and black-walled cell, I looked up with a knowing smile and felt it smash to pieces against the vaulted roof of my soul. Bassander Lynn had not come for me. Jinan had. Three times now, I have walked the walls of the cloister here in the deepest hour of the night, remembering that face. Listener, I have seen battlefields that affected me less, harmed me less. Indeed, to look upon that once beloved face and see someone else was worse than looking upon the scarred face of Rustem, the battlefield at Senuesa, any of the corpses I have seen. It was as though she were herself a changeling, such as Naya, as if some other will moved the muscles beneath that once familiar face. The set of her jaw was changed, and her lips, compressed by the effort of restraining her speech, were not the lips I had kissed. The azure ribbon remained, threaded through the braid she wore like a diadem about the crown of her head. But I had to speak, or some part of me I didn't control had to. Jinan. I began. She halted, eyes going hard as chips of marble. Jinan, I'm sorry. She didn't speak, only glared at me. Gone was the incense softness of that look. Gone the velvet that covered the steel of her. Not breaking eye contact, she reached into her belt and drew out a message crystal of the sort used to carry private or classified messages between devices. This she inserted into her gauntlet terminal. A projector lens pinned to the front of her blue Jadian officer's kaftan spat blue light into the air between us. It tracked with her movement as she crossed her arms, drifting slightly higher. The holograph showed a familiar set of seals. The imperial sunburst, the copper eagle of the legions, the crossed swords of the 437th legion above the painted fist of the obdurate. Each flashed in sequence, a three-dimensional image containing deep fractal patterns that flagged the transmission as authentic. I knew what followed. I had requested it before I kidnapped Tanaran from the Baumung. Night Tribune Rain Smythe's face appeared, rendered ghostly by the bluish cast of Jinan's holograph projector. Unlike Jinan, she looked precisely as I remembered. Snub nose, wide-set eyes, indelicate, her dishwater hair cut short above the rough, plebeian face, belied by the faint tracery of white scars hinting at the genetic and surgical augmentations that marked her for a patrician. Yet there was a strength in her and a surety that was like stone, like the earth herself. That sense that here was one who couldn't be moved. I had known her but for a short while, and yet I knew her for a leader of men and would have followed her. These orders are for Hadrian Marlowe and Hadrian Marlowe alone, acting in his special capacity as my emergency conscript under Article 119 of the Great Charters. He and his federati are to disregard the order to regroup with the fleet at Koritani 
and to make for Vorgosos, per his original orders, with all due speed and by any means necessary. Repeat, he is to disregard the order to regroup with the fleet at Koritani and to make for Vorgosos per his original orders. I read a story once, or else Gibson told it to me, about one of the great land empires of old Earth's golden age. The Kushan, perhaps? The Khmer? Or was it the Russian? It was said they conquered all the lands and tribes of mythic Asia, from the western mountains all the way to the eastern sea. That they did so not because their emperors ordered it, but because the frontier was there, brimming with barbarous peoples and lesser nations ripe for conquest. Those legates and strategoi of ancient days, who had the command of those border forts, knew they would die in their provincial commands unsung, unless they delivered new territory and riches to their imperial masters back home, despite the fact that those selfsame masters had specifically ordered that there be no such territories taken nor riches seized. The empire was large enough, they believed, and the frontier tenuous and difficult to maintain. Such were we. Rain Smythe might hang for this, and I with her, unless it succeeded. I longed to know who was responsible, who had called Bassander and the fleet, bringing destruction down on me and the Night Tribune, on Atavia and everyone who had helped me betray the Empire to save the Empire. If I could wring the coward's neck. When Rain's holograph finished and vanished, leaving only silence and Jinan's acid stare, I waited sitting with my back pressed against the wall of my cell. I've never been a man known for my caution, nor indeed, though it shames me to admit it, for my tact. Despite this, I sensed that it would be disaster for me to try and speak then, and I held myself to stillness, thinking of my father, of Khan Sagara, and the way they used time to draw words from others. It was perhaps three full minutes before Jinan spoke. You think you are a clever man, Lord Marlowe, hmm? You think it's funny, this thing you've done? So it was to be Lord Marlowe, then. I wasn't surprised, but the sting of it cut like an assassin's seeker. She took a couple steps nearer to me, such that her head blocked the cell's single overhead lamp. With practiced slowness, she uncrossed her arms, let them hang at her side. You found Vorgosos, and we found you. The faint smile that pulled at her lips reminded me uncannily of Bassander. Is this what you wanted? I didn't answer. I didn't know what to say. Yes, no, not like this. Lightning quick, she seized me by the hair and slammed my head back against the bulkhead. I felt my skull ring and swore as the slow pain followed the crushing smack of impact. Swore again as her fingers tore at my hair as she let me go. I said, is this what you wanted? Certain men believe it's never appropriate to strike a woman, even when she strikes first. I am not such a one, though I respect their dedication to their principle. I had been a myrmidon in Colossa, and a thief and street fighter before that, and so have a principle of my own. If someone strikes you, win. And yet, and yet, I had loved Jinan. There are places in me where I love her still, even as I sit here, writing by the light of my host's oil lamps. I could not strike her. I never could. I held up defensive hands instead. I would not be struck again. Sense told me that to answer yes or no to her question was disaster and so I measured my words carefully before speaking and said, I'm glad that we have a chance now. But no. She swung at me, I blocked her with an elbow, said, No, this is not what I wanted. She jabbed at my face, I swatted it aside. Then what did you want? Somewhere in the exchange I'd found my feet and seized her wrist before she could strike me again. I told you what I wanted, I said, strangely calm thinking of Ubar and her family's spice business and the life of a country squire. Yet no sooner had I imagined it than I heard Valka's mocking laugh. You're not a spice peddler. You're more. But Gina must have thought of it too, for she folded 
slinking back a step or two. Why? she said. Why did you have to do it? You know why. I thought she would strike me again, but whatever bar of iron had propped up her spine was gone, and she repeated, voice now very small, Why did you have to do it? I longed to embrace her, to apologize, and to take away what part of the pain I had caused that was in me to heal. But I sensed to do so, to touch her at all, was wrong. I'd lost the privilege of her, and was not sure if I would ever regain it, and so decency, chivalry, argued caution and distance. Not to impose. No one else was, I said. Only I hadn't really done anything, had I? If Passander hadn't followed me to Vorgosos, hadn't used the threat of force to coerce Sagara's cooperation, Valker and I would still be rotting in that cell beneath the world. Everything would have failed. I know now that such thinking is foolishness. If I had not gone to Vorgosos, Passander wouldn't have followed, and we wouldn't have found ourselves aboard Khan Sagara's terrible ship. We wouldn't have met with Aranata Otiolo. Things would never have changed. Thinking of Bassander reminded me of my present concern, and I asked, Who called Bassander? What? Taking a step back from her, I said, I know someone got a telegraph to the fleet. Was it Otavia? To this day, I'm not sure what changed in Jinan then. For a moment, I thought I'd broken through her rage past reflective barriers like the mirror foil that protects the delicate instrumentation of satellites. I thought we were past shouting and blows. But when Jinan looked up again, her eyes were hard as flint once more, and I was glad I had retreated. Perhaps if I had embraced her and not spoken, all might have been well. Perhaps if I kissed her instead or let her strike me, perhaps then all might have been different. Her soldier's posture returned, and the steel in her withered. She thrust out her chin and spat. Is that all you are caring about? She left me no space to respond. Really? You want to know who sold you out? Is that it? Hadrian, you left three of our people dead on that hangar floor. You kidnapped a political prisoner from an Imperial battleship and gave it to the extrasolarians. I don't care if you were acting on Smythe's order or not. For all I know, you planned the whole damn thing. It's got your stink all over it. I could see the way she clenched her fists the olive skin there, white as my own, and prepared myself for another flurry of blows. They never came, or when they did, they were only words. Three words that cut me more deeply than any I had been expecting. It was switch. What? It wouldn't scan. I felt as if I'd encountered some writing in so poor a hand I couldn't read it. Smythe's orders or no, I had betrayed the Empire, I knew that, and I had betrayed Jinan, I knew that too. Two treasons, the second blacker than the first. I had suffered a treason in turn. It always seemed strange to me that the ancients conceived of treason as the blackest sin. Now I understood. Switch. My oldest friend. No, I said, and stepped back. No, that's not possible. I had shown weakness, and so kindled a spark in Jinan's eyes. She was lying, I told myself. She was only trying to cut me for what I had done to her, to us. She crossed her arms again, leaned forward. Yes, it is. There was a vicious glee in her dark eyes like the light I'd seen in the eyes of gladiators in Colosso. He telegraphed us your location. He said you'd gone mad. I would not look at her. I could not look at her. I could hear the sound of pale arms rising in dark water. Brethren had planned this. The demon had said the Sielsen's coming was inevitable. How could it have known that if it had not planned such a thing itself? But why? Because the quiet compelled it? Because it strained against its master? For some reason stranger still? Surely it had permitted the message to get out, betrayed its master and its home to the Imperium. Who can guess the motives of gods and devils? Not I. I cannot often understand even the motivations of men. It was switch, Jinan said still viciously. You don't have to believe me. But it was. 
Not looking at her, I could only see the face she had made in the Balmung's hangar as she shot at me. Tears in her eyes. I should never have come here, I said. But it wasn't my voice. Rather some small creature within me, who had his residence near the reptile base of my skull, spoke through me. It's too late, said Jinan, and I knew she spoke truth. You betrayed me, Hadrian. You betrayed all of us. She didn't strike me again, and I slumped so that I sat once more on the edge of the cot, bracketed against the wall. What's to be done with me, then? I asked, and realized I didn't care about the answer. The white sword, or does Bassander only mean to throw me out the airlock? Only then did I look at Jinan. The spark of anger was there still, yes, but it was cooler now, tempered by something else, something worse. Pity. I did not want her pity. I longed to throw it back in her face, to scream as she had screamed, to rage as she had raged. She shook her head, drew back toward the door. Captain Lin is coming to speak to you, she said, and pounded three times on the door to be let out. Only after she had gone did I realize that I was bleeding, that my lip had split where she had struck me. I hardly felt it, nor could I be bothered to wipe it away. Chapter 50 The Devil and the Honest Man Did she do that to you? asked Bassanda Lynn from across the table, touching his face to indicate the bruises that had flowered on my own. Chained as I was to the interrogation table, I only nodded. The Mandari captain rocked back in his steel chair. His beetle-black eyes never left me. She should not have done that. It violates protocol on the treatment of prisoners. Highborn prisoners, he meant. A courtesy for a gentleman, I murmured, recalling the words my jailer had used. Bassander took no note of the bitterness in my tone, said, Quite so. She asked to see you, and in deference to your relationship, I allowed it. I thought she might get something from you. Did she? I asked looking at my hands in their electromagnetic binders, and not at the man across from me. I did not think that she would hit you. Then you don't know women very well, I said bitterly. The captain didn't have a reply to that, but examined some holograph hovering beneath the black glass surface of the table. He sucked on his teeth, eyes wandering from the tabletop to the tangle of brass pipes bracketed to the ceiling. At length he said, what happened down there, Marlow? I tried to rattle my manacles, but they held fast to the tabletop. I don't know what deal you've struck with Sagara, but you should be very, very careful around him. Bassanda didn't look impressed by my warning. He has a Merikani eye demon in his power. Bassanda blinked, but appeared otherwise unmoved. In another life, he'd have made a perfect scoliast. So controlled was he. You're serious. I lie less than people believe, I said, leaning against the table, watching for a glimmer of understanding, of acceptance in the other man's face. When he didn't reply, I pressed on, telling him what he needed to know. I did not describe brethren, believing that without my explanation he would, as I had, imagine only banks of computer terminals and crystal storage. I didn't tell him of my vision or make any reference to the quiet. I told him only what was practically relevant. And do you think this demon allowed your man to get word to me? It wasn't in me to reply at once. Thinking of switch just then was like biting into sand in an oyster, like a slap in the face. I swallowed, said, I think so. I can't imagine how else switch could have communicated with you. The Mistral was under remote control from the moment we disengaged from the extrasolarian ship that brought us to Vagosa's system. But why would the demon turn against its master? Bassanda asked. I don't understand. To this I could only shrug. I'd wondered at that myself. But I imagine the ancients asked the same question when their machines rebelled. Perhaps it thinks it can escape its prison when the Empire comes to destroy it. You really think Sagara doesn't know how you intend this? I asked. Bassanda shrugged. 
Who is he to stop us? One planet against the legions? I don't like his chances. You underestimate him, I said, and shook my head. You don't know him. You don't know what he's capable of. In truth, I didn't know all Khan was capable of. He knows you will move against him. For all we know, it was he who allowed Switch to leak the location of Vorgoso's location to you. Thinking about Switch sent a spasm of pain through me, and I shut my eyes for a moment, just long enough to marshal myself. Have we docked with this ship? The other man's eyes wandered among the pipes on the ceiling, once more, as if he expected to find some answer writ there among the brass and black sheet metal. The Demiurge? Yes. We're in one of her landing bays even now, en route for rendezvous with the obdurate and your Sielsen friends. My friends, I repeated, unable to keep the acid from my voice. There was a threat implicit in Bassander's choice of words, the threat of the Inquisition and a charge of consorting with the Inhuman, a threat he could carry out. You're a traitor, Marlowe. If it were up to me, I'd have you out an airlock for what you've done. You defied a direct order from the first strategos and from me. There's a chain of command and a protocol that must be obeyed. These are the Imperial Legions, Marlowe. Bassander walked the line between quietude and rage with the precision of a Durantine clock. He never raised his voice, betrayed his fury only by the tension beneath his words and by the tense way he held his shoulders. I held my hands, palms up. I'm not a legionnaire. The Tribune conscripted you as her immunis. Yes, I said sharply. Her immunis. She ordered me to Vergosos despite yours and Houtman's orders. I obeyed. Did she also order you to butcher my men? Sander asked, raising his right hand. Or to maim me, for that matter. I felt the shadow fall across my face and, for the briefest moment, lost my composure. No, of course not. They were good men, Bassander said, and there was a gravity in his voice that drew my eye against my will to look him in the face. My men. And you murdered them. The legionary captain stood, movements so rigid you might expect oak in him instead of bones. He looked down on me, eyes like lit coals. What did you think was going to happen? What did I... I pulled against my restraints, frustrated that I couldn't rise and face Bassander on his own level. I suppressed the urge to defend myself, resenting the other man's posturing. I found Vorgosos Bassander. I found Khan Sagara, the link to the Sielsen we were after. A hotbed of illegal genetics work. And a surviving Merakani-eyed demon. What do you mean, what did I think was going to happen? Where exactly did I fail to deliver on what I promised? You were in a cell, Bassander sneered. You failed, Hadrian. I hoped that Bassander had not spoken to Valka at length or to Tanaran. Hoped he didn't know how right he was. Gathering the ruins of my pride to my chest like firewood, I said, We were still negotiating. Negotiating. Bassander turned and walked toward the wall of the chamber, his image reflected darkly in the polished surface. You looked like you'd been in that hole of yours for eons when Sagara brought you out. Don't pretend. He was fidgeting with his hands, the reflection of his face downturned, eyes narrow. Was it really him? he asked. Was it really Khan Sagara? I think so, I said. Or maybe it was him, once. How he's managed to stay alive, I don't quite understand. He can parasitize his own children, move his thoughts from one body to the next. Whatever he is, he's not the Khan Sagara in the stories, even if he used to be. Do you think he transplants the brain? The blue light that shone behind Khan's ear and the ears of his children, and of Naya, glowed from some dark recess of memory, and I looked away from Bassander. Nothing so primitive. But I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. The captain's fingers sketched the sign of the sun disk at his side, and after a moment Bassander Lynn shook himself and turned once more to face me. I don't like having to work with such a one. What did you offer him? 
besides the safety of his planet, of course. I leaned forward thinking of what Khan Sagara had said at our first meeting. You must have made a deal. That, said Basandalin, is none of your concern. But there was a shadow on his face, and a drawn quality to his expression that concerned me quite a bit. The young captain looked half a skull as he added, I don't like this position you've put me in. I've put you in, I repeated. These were as much your orders as mine. Just because I wasn't as quick to abandon my mandate as you doesn't absolve you of responsibility. Knight Tribune Smythe entrusted this mission to the both of us. We had a duty. A muscle pulsed in Bassander's jaw, and I sensed that if he clenched his teeth much harder, they might all shatter in his gums. You presume to lecture me on duty? You? Remind me, Marlow, which of us abandoned his family in pursuit of his own selfish ambition? Which of us decided to play at soldiery rather than wed Anias Mataro as he was troth? He raised his eyebrows. Don't lecture me. I came after you precisely as the Night Tribune ordered. I have brokered a deal with that extra Salarian demoniac, and we're going to meet with this Cielsin prince of yours. You are getting everything you hoped for. Not bad for a failure, I said, and it was my turn to sneer. Bassander dismissed this casually. You were saved by your friend William. He has more sense than you. He came to us begging for his life. His life? I echoed. He seemed to think your lives were all forfeit no matter what happened. Bassander said, ice in his words that the Chantry would execute all of you for coming so near to machine demons. He wanted to save himself. I squeezed my hands into fists. He'd betrayed me. Something black and oily seethed in my guts, and I clenched my jaw to quit from cursing. Coward. He'd sold me back to the Empire. And why? Out of fear. And Earth only knew what might come of it. Had I not seen my own dead body along an uncounted number of those rivers that flowed into the future? The manacles seemed to grow tighter about my wrists, and I shuddered. Shoulders hunched over the edge of the glass table. It wasn't just my life he'd put in danger. Indeed, it was my life he'd least put in danger. I was a nobile of the Imperium, a distant cousin to the Emperor and an asset in my own small way. But Octavia Corvo, Polino, Krim, and Siren, and all the rest? They were mere federati and accomplices in what I'd done. Even Switch himself might not escape punishment. At last I asked, What's been done with him? All your compatriots have been locked aboard the Mistral. Khan Sagara has agreed to ensure they remain there until such time as your ship can be transferred to the obdurate when we make rendezvous. They're unharmed. For the moment. Vassander turned back to face me brushing his long coat aside as he placed hands on his hips. Yes. I saw he had retrieved his sword. The sword that once had been Admiral Wentz. The sword I had taken from him when I struck off his hand. Their fates will be decided by tribunal once all is said and done. I swallowed, trying to get a grip on the black anger coiling within me. But it twisted away and no amount of Gibson's old teaching or Imor's scoliest aphorisms could banish that embryonic fury. And Dr. Ondera? She's safe. But Sanders' nose wrinkled in customary dislike. She's Tavrosi, and so once this is done, we'll release her. Her part in all this is not worth trouble with the Demarchy. A sigh of relief escaped me, and only then did I ask the questions which, while most pressing, seemed to me the least important. What of myself, then? I asked, and held up my chin as defiantly as I could. Airlock? Bassander did not hesitate. If it were up to me, yes. His eyes never left my face as he spoke. Ye gods, he was a cold one. But it's not up to me. You've outmaneuvered me because you're right. You're Smythe's immunis. You're her problem. Your fate lies with her, and with whatever Hauptmann will want done with her. He made a face like he'd tasted something deeply unpleasant, like he'd bitten into a pastry and found oil instead of cream. 
How you suborned her, I'll never know. You flatter me, I said with equal bitterness. Bassanda, she's a tribune of the Imperial Legions. I could no more suborn her than I can turn air into gold. And you demean her by merely breathing those words. To my slight astonishment, Bassanda looked down at his hands, mollified. You're right. That was not worthy. He appeared to chew on some thought for a long moment. Or perhaps it was only his tongue. She ordered that you be confined to the mistral with the rest of your miserable band. I looked up sharply, struggling to contain my surprise. Not the airlock, not even the brig. Stifling a smile, I said, You're serious? When am I not? Bassanda said, evincing a degree of self-awareness I had not known he was capable of. She seemed to think it would be safer than keeping you on my ship. Sagara has the mistral under lock and key. Bassanda squared himself opposite me, glared at his boot toe. Eager to move the conversation away from myself, I asked, Is it just the obdurate coming? Bassanda paused a moment before replying, as if unsure whether or not he could trust me with the answer to that question. She has the pharaoh and the Baumung with her. But the fleet's not coming. Hauptmann. The captain's face was stone. Not to a negotiation. There will be a negotiation, then. Yes, Bassanda said shortly, retaking his seat. A thought struck me, and I asked, I don't suppose there's a chance that word of this hasn't reached Hauptmann. Smythe might have kept word to herself. I dared to hope, and my words ran on ahead of me. It's what I would have done. The Mandari officer drew a small black remote from his pocket and turned it over and over in long, blunt fingers. The Night Tribune is not like you. I had nothing to say to that. Asanda leaned in, still turning the remote over in his fingertips. The faint line of a scar gleamed white about his wrist where the hand had been reattached. The shine of it seemed at once very bright to me brighter than the white lights of the interrogation room or the way they shone off the brass piping on walls and ceiling. I could see the gears turning behind his eyes. The archaic machinery of him, working itself to some new statement. If she dies, Rain Smythe, I mean. If Houtman executes her for your part in all this, you won't see the scaffold or the block. He looked me in the eye and I felt the line of fire drawn once more between us. Am I clear? As air, I said. But Sandalin brandished the remote before disappearing it inside a pocket of his coat. The electromagnets that held my manacles shut switched off and the binders fell open. Suddenly free, I massaged my wrists. You're letting me go? There are six men outside who will take you directly to the Mistral, he said. If you try anything, they've been given orders to stun you like a feral dog and drop you right back in your cell. Do we have an understanding? I was not about to play the meek dog for Bassander, and so clenched my jaw. Do we have an understanding? Oh, I said standing so that now it was I who looked down at him. I understand you perfectly. Chapter 51 Lost Time How vast was that terrible ship? How many secrets did it hold? Bassander's escort marched me down the ski of owner's landing ramp and into the Demiurge's hold, a hold so massive that I think all my home at Devil's Rest might have fit within it save perhaps the uppermost third of the Tower of the Great Keep. I half expected to see clouds pooling near the gloomy ceiling when I looked up, and felt the drear wind on my face. Behind us, the ski of owner didn't look so out of place in the darkened hall. A brass and black metal arrowhead, bristling with guns and sensor blisters. Craning my neck, I could make out the shapes of men and women moving in the bridge castle that rose from the back of the vessel. All told, she looked like a thinner, meaner Balmung. And should she not? The interceptor had made good time getting to Forgosos. 
I tried not to think of the monstrous cost in antimatter and in imperial marks entailed in the operation of so speedy a vessel. There was a reason such interceptors were few and far between. Gold metal gleamed in the lights from high above, and I confess I lingered, awestruck. Terrible faces looked down on us from the inner wall of the hangar, and the black forms of men and monsters battled in a gothic frieze like those on the heavy doors in Khan's palace had done. But the legionnaires, less impressed than I was, or perhaps it was only that they hadn't shared in my strange visions, chivied me along with rough hands. It was toward one of these faces we moved, following a ghastly holograph line spun like a string of spider silk through the air. As we approached, I saw its mouth was open, forming an obscene O through which we passed, swallowed by Khan's monstrous vessel. The holograph line pulsed, leading us through corridor after black corridor beneath ribbed supports where strange winds blew like ragged breaths, some hot as breathing, yes, and others cold as the night winds which howled through the merlons of the walls of my home. I felt the oppressive weight of ten thousand eyes upon me, and knew that Khan Sagara was not far away. My guards felt it too, for I heard the muffled sound of their voices through their full masks, and knew they communicated one to the others. One of the red-faced triasters made a warding gesture and signaled for quiet. After a long while, we emerged, not into a hold like the one which held the Skiavona, but onto a glassed-in bridge, an umbilical which stretched out from the hull of Khan's sojourner, the Demiurge, toward where the Mistral stood at port. Knowing my escort wouldn't approve if I tarried, I tried my best to crane my neck to see. Behind us, the ship bristled with uncounted black spires, towers and turrets, and buttress halls rising behind the rank and file of grim statuary. Black hands stretched from the hull behind us, and stood watch above the great boom arm that held our ship in place. The unseeing eyes pressing down with such gravity, I thought they must have masked suppression field generators behind those sightless lenses. Such a force was in the terror of their gaze. Behind all that black metal and stone, the unfixed stars stretched, each one transmuted to a wall of light and colored more blue than anything I had seen. To violet. But the doors at the end were only of common substance, and the light behind them when they opened was warm. I was thrust inside without ceremony, without salute, and I stumbled against the inner door. The airlock cycled, turning from warning red to serene blue then opened on a familiar hall, round and white-padded. There you are! Familiar faces, too. Polino hurried forward, Krim and Ilex followed in his wake. The old soldier embraced me without preamble. The doctor told us what happened down there, he said and drew away, studying me with that single piercing eye. What the hell happened to you? Was it Lin? Jinan, I said, and shook my head. Krim hissed. That jitatin brew here. She beat you? No more than I deserved, I said darkly. Not sure if I really meant it. Valka made it back to the ship then. Ilex stepped forward, touched my shoulder. About half an hour ago, she's resting. With Polino stepped aside, the homunculus embraced me. We were worried about you. I held her at arm's length a moment, clapped her on the shoulder before speaking to all three. And I about you all. We weren't sure if you were still up there. Are you kidding? Polino asked, brows arching. Corvo wasn't going anywhere. It's not Corvo I was worried about, I said. It's Khan. That quieted the conversation long enough for me to get my bearings. I'd entered by the port airlock the same airlock the exalted Nazareno had used when it came to pilot us into the enigma of ours. I felt suddenly very tired, and swayed a little where I stood. Switch wasn't there, nor Siren, nor Captain Corvo and the others. I wondered if it was ship's night, or if perhaps the others had some more pressing concern. What happens now? Krim asked, brushing back his hair. Are we still to rendezvous with the pale? Polino asked, and Dialex wondered, is it true this Sagara keeps a Marikani eye demon? 
more questions piled on, words stacking one atop the next like water, like sand poured on a prisoner in an oubliette until I thought I might drown in them. Their voices overlapped, stacked atop those inward questions that had haunted me since I'd wakened Tanaran from Fugue. I raised a hand for silence, and to my astonishment, silence fell. Doubts rushed into that quiet like water into a breach. About myself, about my situation, about Rain Smythe and Titus Hauptman, about Switch and Brethren, Khan and Jinan. It was all too much. I just need rest, I said. Our problems will still be here in a few hours. My room in the Mistral hardly felt like my room at all. I'd never stayed long on the ship until we'd escaped with Tanaran. Still, Switch had managed, with help from his erstwhile lover, to wrangle together a portion of my possessions, most of which still occupy the three foot lockers that lined one wall of the small chamber. Clothing, mostly, and a few old books. Despite the fact that I had spent so much time alone in my cell aboard the Ski of Ona, and so much time before that with Valka in our frigid cell beneath Khan's palace, it was good to be alone again. To be alone on my own terms again was a blessing. Had I been trained in the scoliest art, I might have seized that time to unpack my emotions, then to pack them each away behind doors of clear glass, to understand but to be safe from the corrosive power of them. I couldn't do it. There were holographs buried in my laundry, little wall mount sconces meant to cycle old images one to the next in endless procession. I knew what they would show. Images of Jinan and me from happier times. Time stolen between periods of conflict and pain. Between Pharos and Vorgosos. I knew I couldn't bear to see them. Still, I plucked one of the projectors from its box. It was a small thing, if weighty. A silver metallic button, perhaps an inch and a half cross, you know the type. Magnetized so as to clamp itself to the walls of my cabin. I felt an impulse to hurl it across the room, but squeezed my hand around it instead. The beveled edges bit into my hand. I had done the right thing. Had I done the right thing? I had betrayed the Empire. I had betrayed Jinan. Switch had betrayed me. Was it worth it? They were good men, Bassander said again. Words inescapable when they came from my own head. My men. And you murdered them. I must have tripped some switch or pressed some button, for the projector beeped, startling me. I let it fall and it bounced and rolled across the floor, coming to rest near the sealed door. It loaded almost instantly, revealing an image of Jinan and myself from our brief stay on Nagrama. Mountains behind us, we had hiked from the capital up to the site of a 13th millennium Sid Arthurian temple to take in the air. Jinan had taken the image, holding the terminal away from us with one hand as she pressed her lips to my cheek. I clenched my fists, determined not to cry. The image chain showing me at a distance, wandering beneath the white-flowered champak trees, beneath the mighty statue of the Arthur Buddha. How small I seemed, dwarfed as I was by that mighty carving. The bearded king sitting upon his lotus throne, just a little moat of deepest black, moving against all that white and beatific stone. I moved, but not before the image changed, showing Jinan, just Jinan, laughing with champak blossoms in her hair, her eyes closed. I snatched a wadded tunic from the top of the nearest footlocker and cast it over the image as if to obscure the holographs. That was easier than moving to turn off the projector. I couldn't bear to see one more moment of it, one more memory. I held my breath and slumped onto the end of my bed. And there, for a time, sleep destroyed me. Chapter 52 Bora The noise of the door cycling awakened me, and I sat where I had fallen asleep, fully clothed at the foot of my bed. I managed to crack what's going on as I fumbled both with my hair and for my sword remembering too late that Khan Sagara had confiscated my weapon the day I'd faced Brethren. But it was only Atavia. The Norman woman had to duck to clear the doorframe as she stepped into my cabin. 
She had at last eschewed the old red company uniform in favor of simple garments in close-fitting black and green. She looked somehow older than when last I'd seen her, though I knew she'd endured no more time than I, having been awake for the duration of our time at Borgosos. I wondered what I looked like. Captain Corvo's face turned down in a slight frown, one eyebrow arched. I'd heard you were back. I rubbed my eyes with the heels of both hands. I, yes, sorry, I'd have come for you sooner, but I needed, needed time. Sitting up straight, I did my best to look composed. No easy task, for I'd abandoned my boots by the door and unbelted my tunic. I fear I look a dreadful mess. The Norman woman waved this away without comment and propped herself against the far wall, arms crossed. What happened down there? Khan Sagara wouldn't negotiate, I said ashenly. Took Tanaran from us. Valka and I tried to find it and find out how the Mistral was being kept at Anchorage. We spent about four months in a cell, if Valka's reckoning is good. I could see from the look on Corvo's face that it was, and swallowed. We couldn't get word to you. I'm sorry. Corvo was nodding her head. I'd figured it was something like that when you never came back. Or worse. Bastion thought you were dead. Where is Durand? I asked, unable to keep myself from looking round, as though I expected the small, bespectacled man to appear from behind a curtain in that small and sealed little room. I thought he'd want to hear this. He's on the bridge, Corvo said, tossing her floating yellow hair. We may not be going anywhere, but I'm not about to have us asleep at the wheel. A shade self-conscious in my rumpled clothing, I smoothed my tunic front as a way to cover the silence. After a moment, Corvo said, We thought you were dead, Hadrian. Thinking of Bassander Lynn and his threats, I said, It's too early to tell. You might be right after all. I felt myself smile in spite of the oblivion in my tone, then laugh when I remembered dear Gibson's criticizing me for being too dramatic as a boy. Checking myself, I said, But you stayed. I thought for sure Sagara would have released the ship. Corvo crossed her arms, and, never want to mince words, said, We might have done it, but Vorgosos never released control of the ship to us. I had to put the ship down to a skeleton crew, ration resources. You didn't try to cut your way loose, or... We couldn't operate our own airlocks, Hadrian. Noinji tat. I swore in my finest Jadian, drawing Atavia's eyebrows a shade higher. I didn't know. I told her the same version of events I'd told Bassander, leaving out a description of the beast, Brethren, and the vision it had shared with me. I left out, too, a description of the exalted, Calvert, and how he had taken Valka's blood and mine. It didn't bear thinking about. When I had finished my account, the captain, who had settled into the low stool bracketed to the room's small desk, said, What have you gotten us into, Hadrian Marlowe? I brushed my unruly hair back out of my face, chewing on my answer. I wish I knew. Lynn says Sagara's agreed to take us to rendezvous with the Cielsin away from Vorgosos. I assume that's where we're going now. A touch of the dark humor returned to me, and looking away from Corvo's face, I said, If not, I imagine we're all in for a rather awful surprise. I'm sure we're going to rendezvous, Corvo said. I don't know much, but from what I understand, Lynn has this Sagara on a leash. Do you know what the problem with a leash is? I mused, propping my chin on one hand. You're left holding the other end of it. Octavia took this in quietly, nodding to herself. You think it's a trap, then? You can depend on it. I don't like how this is falling out. As if Sagara weren't bad enough. There's Lynn. The Norman captain propped her chin on both hands. I can handle Bassander Lynn, but this... Did you see the size of this ship of his? I turned away and felt again the awareness of eyes licking the back of my neck. Khan Sagara was watching. He had to be. 
through his own cameras, if not through the Mistral's own internal security network. Suppressing a shudder, I said, It's bigger than the Enigma. Much bigger. Valkus said he's got a Somme army. Oh, he has legions, I said. I've no idea how many, and worse. I saw one exalted, but for all I know, there may be more. And Earth and Emperor alone know what he's got on this ship. More than I could imagine. Trying to think, I looked up at the ceiling. A grey metal and pale lights. If we get out of this, does your offer still stand? My... Otavia's voice trailed off lost as she tried to remember. I wrenched my attentions away from the ceiling. To travel with you and rebuild the Red Company. The captain almost chuckled, and leaning back she crossed her corded arms. You think they'll let you leave? For Sander, Smythe, and this Hauptman character? I knew what I was about to say was desperate. I'm hoping. Otavia's jovial aspect dissolved at once, and growing too serious, she said, I don't think either of us is getting out of this. If Lynn had his way, he'd have slagged this whole ship already, and all of us aboard. You're no ability, boy. I'm a pirate. That blood of yours is covering all our asses right now. That and whatever you said to Smythe. I had nothing to say to that. There was nothing to say. Switch shouldn't have opened his mouth, I said. How did he get a message out? The captain shrugged. Honestly? I don't know. We weren't watching the telegraph wave. Gave up on it after the first week or so when we couldn't get anything out. He must have gone in and queued it up when no one was looking. How the message got out, I've got no idea. I think Khan's demon took care of it, I said, reiterating what I'd said to Bassander. Why would it do that? I shrugged ran quickly through a version of the same conversation I'd had with Bassander Lynn. While I spoke, I rose, padded barefoot to where I'd let the holograph projector fall beneath my laundry. Moving carefully so as not to make a conversation piece of the holographs, I balled the device up in my loose tunic and deactivating it through the projector and the garment back into my trunk. There's too much going on, she said at length, following my progress up and down the narrow chamber from her place at the stool. The Empire, the Extras, the Cielsin, this machine. She didn't even know the half of it. I could see over her shoulder, as it were, the blooming dark of my vision, and the Cielsin horde marching across the stars. I saw the woman named Man tormented by them, her raiment radiant as the sun, and heard once more the noise of an infant, wailing, its hour come round at last. I shook myself. I'm sorry? Patient as a stone, Otavia Corvo repeated herself, saying, I said, And we can't even control our own people. Where is Switch, anyway? I asked. An awful thought took me, and I asked, You didn't lock him up, did you? We didn't even know he'd done it until the airlock onto the Vorgoso starport opened and Lynn's lieutenant swept him with three decades of your empire's finest. She frowned, rubbed her face as if to mask some feeling. Anger, perhaps? Or embarrassment? They pulled William out of here for his safety, but the bastard asked to come back. Can you believe that? I could. Plain as I see the bust of that original Gibson looking down on me as I write these words, I could see Switch, my friend, standing shoulders hunched outside the airlock, waiting to be let in with the air of one who turns his back on the gunman knowing not the moment or the flash. He wants me to kill him, I thought. He knows I can't forgive him for this. We might have returned to the Empire with a full peace accord, and the Inquisition might have looked the other way, but now I clenched my fists. If anyone is executed over this, I can't forgive him. I couldn't forgive him even if we all came out of this alive. Lynn said he came begging for his life. He'd chosen to save his own skin rather than stay loyal to his people. To me. How could I ever trust him again? Tight-jawed, I asked. Where is he now?
He's in his cabin, Otavia said, voice dark. I haven't told him you're here. Good, I said. I don't want to see him. Are all of our people on the ship now? Bassander doesn't have anyone in interrogation or anything. Standing suddenly, Otavia half turned away. No, no, we're all here. All prisoners together. I thought for sure he'd keep us locked up, though. Rain's orders. That's a good sign, Corvo said. That means she's still on your side. She pivoted sharply, and looking up I found her dark eyes glaring at me with intent. This is not a very large ship. Her meaning was plain. What would you have of me? I asked, genuinely asked. I didn't know what to do, not about Switch. Betrayal is the blackest sin. I should have been furious, but I was beyond fury, lost in some country ruled by a spirit blacker still. Sorrow? Regret? It was strange. As a boy, I had derided Crispin for his passions, his rages, but now I think the rage was a genetic marker of a sort, a Marlowe family style as much a part of us as our black hair, our violet eyes, and our crooked smiles. As much a part of us as that red devil, rampant on sable. As much a part of us as our uranium and the funeral masks beneath the dome of bright carvings. I knew I should be angry. Switch's actions may have led to the meeting we had worked so desperately for, but at what cost? My life and the lives of all my companions, maybe. Long was the reach of the Imperial Hand, and relentless its grasp. Strong and unforgiving. And yet I found I could not be angry. I had no anger left. I had no forgiveness, either. What would you have of me? I asked again, retaking my seat at the foot of the bed. Hands on knees. The captain replied, Just don't do anything you'll regret. I won't, I said in answer, eyes tracking once more toward the ceiling. I only wish he hadn't done something I'd regret. Corvo was silent. What she read in my tone I cannot say, but her hard face was closed as the windows of a peasant's shack in winter, her lips pale and pressed together. A horrid thought turned in my stomach, and rejecting it, I said, I'm not going to hurt him, Otavia. I held my face in my hands, both of us silent a long while. Presently, I took in a great breath and forcing it out, my words more groan than anything else, I said, I know he acted out of desperation, fear, but he put all our lives at risk, your lives. I can't abide that. What are you going to do? I have no idea, I said, and spoke truth. It feels like the wind's changing, Otavia. Good, she said, and from her tone I knew she understood my meaning and meant to ignore it. It's been against us since we joined you. It's about time it changed. I did not share her optimism. Chapter 53 the Third Treason It's only when the world places no burdens on our hearts that circumstance allows us time to make decisions. By contrast, too often when there's some trial which we would give the price of a palatinate to avoid, we find we are already at court. My fist slipped under Siren's guard, uppercut clipping the side of her chin. She grunted in surprise as I caught her in the back of the neck, catching her with my gloved hand in a sling that, as I pivoted with my hips, sent her tumbling to the floor. Never want to let her loss slow her down, Siren rolled smoothly to her feet and came right back swinging. She wasn't much of a boxer, truth be told, tended to swing too wide and too wildly. I covered my head to take an overhand punch on my elbow as I cracked her in the face with a jab. I saw her stumble and stepped in, dropping a hook to her ribs. She grunted and got off a shot to my shoulder before I moved in, smothering her assault as I swung in, ducking another punch to get behind and beside her, and planted my open hand against the side of her head to make my point. Not bad, kid, not bad, Polino said, leaning on the ropes at the edge of the ring. The Mistral's small gym was practically empty. Crim and Dialects were meant to join us, but of those two there had been no sign. 
The old Myrmidon captain slipped a finger beneath his eye patch and rubbed at his missing eye. Siren, hop out, would you? I owe his radiance here a beating for leaving us high and dry while he was all cozied up to the doctor in that cell of theirs. For the last time, I exclaimed, using my thick glove to push hair from my eyes. Nothing happened. Polino ducked the ropes and thumped Siren on the shoulder. I thought I told you not to lie to your elders, son. He knocked his fists together and grinned. You were down there a long time. For the last time, drop it, I said tersely. Too tersely, for Polino threw his head back and laughed. Face it, lad, you can't lie to me. He raised his fists, tilted his head to keep track of me with his one good eye. I'd fought Polino before. The man had been a soldier of the Empire for forty years, and a fighter all his days. Even half-blind and old as he was, he was dangerous. He hadn't survived so long in the fighting pits of Borisivo by luck alone. Flashing a smile, he tapped at his eye patch with his glove. Doesn't take two eyes to see right through you. Siren laughed. He's not wrong, Haid. Everyone knows you've had eyes for the doctor since we left Emesh. I have no idea what you're talking about, I said, pointedly looking away. Polino snapped a searching jab in my direction, grabbing my attention. I stepped back, batting it away. The old Myrmidon let out a laugh. I think his radiance is embarrassed. Don't call me that, I said, struggling with feelings I had almost forgotten. Gen call me that. The older man's one eye darted to Siren as if seeking approval or permission. Maybe you're right, lad. It's been hard without the big guy around. To this I only nodded, squaring my stance to suggest readiness. Taking my meaning, Polino lashed out with a straight punch that I brushed aside, stepping in with a straight of my own that took the old man in the jaw. He grimaced, but ducked my next shot, sank two blows just under my armpit in rapid succession. Grinding my teeth, I stepped inside so that the third hook scraped my back instead, and I struck Polino's chin from below, landing to uppercut in such a way that I drove my elbow into his sternum. That blow was hard enough that Polino staggered backward, not quite to the ropes. It was the kind of blow that fills the ensuing seconds with a solid, impressed quiet. I smiled approvingly. Think that was good, do ya? Polino said, holding his hands lower in the classic pugilist stance, common to every back street behind every bar in every city and township of the Imperium. Lad, my father was fortitude himself. You're gonna need to try a lot harder than that, and you know it. There are certain activities one may lose himself within. I've heard from the soldiers who were made to run great distances as part of their training that running is such a one, and certain mystics of the Jadian fire cult seek passing reunion with their fravashi spirit in the other world through dance, and so forget materiality. For the scoliasts, such escape is in contemplation of the self, and of the logos, the logic, and the language in all things. For myself... Often I had found, in my drawings, that I had passed by several hours without so much as a passing thought. Fighting, really fighting, is just such a pursuit. The universe blackens around you, converges so that only the combat remains. In true battles, the effect is one of terror. As I've said of my time in the Colosso on Emesh long ago, everything you are is forced through the eye of a needle and you emerge or you do not. In practice and in play, the effect, I think, is no different than that of the contemplation of the Scoliasts, the dance of the Jadians, the distance run by our soldiers. Everything that troubled me simply fell away. I stepped under a hard cross and shoveled Polino in the ribs, wove beneath his arm and popped up to send a cross of my own scrubbing, clean down over his shoulder, to strike the side of his head again. Polino's own fist connected with my ribs in the same instant, and even as he reeled, he threw his arm out to make space between us. Not half bad, he said, working his jaw. It was more than half good, and we each knew it, but I smiled all the same. You're letting your loaded hand drift too much, Hade, Siren said. If it wasn't, you'd not be taking it like a dockside whore. He gave better than he got, though, Ilex said. She'd appeared with Alara sometime during the fight, and the two women stood by Siren near one corner of the ring. You're right there, pal. Polino massaged his jaw, 
I'd best not lose a tooth for this, Marlow. Mine don't grow back like yours do. I'm sure Dr. Okoyo can put any you lose back in, I said, smiling. Does the son of fortitude need to lie down? The old soldier's right cross was not to be laughed at. I went reeling. Would have fallen were it not for the ropes at my back. Ilex and Siren clapped. Elara whooped more loudly still. Looks like you need to lie down there, Hade, Polino said, arms akimbo, inviting retribution. You gonna let this old man beat ya? I didn't. And when we'd gone five rounds, I swung, sweating out of the ring as Siren rotated back in. After so long in Sagara's cell and Basanda's afterward, it felt good to move again, to fight. I had never wanted to be a fighter, had never enjoyed fighting as a boy. But I've found that as one grows older, one develops an attraction for those things which he performed in his youth, even unwillingly. Thus, often do we return to those childish things when the weight of responsibility and of trial becomes too much to bear alone. Once, I'd fought with Crispin under the watchful eye of my father's castellan, Sir Felix Martin. I'd fought because it was expected of me, because I had to. Later, I'd fought for my life, in the streets and in the fighting pits. I would fight for my life again, and for higher things. But in that moment, I fought among friends and for the love of it. Laughing at some jape of sirens, I swung away from the ropes and turned, thinking to get water from the font built against one wall. And there he was. In truth, I do not think he expected to find me in the gymnasium, or to find anyone. He wore simple exercise kit, tight trousers and a sleeveless tunic done in drab olive, contrasting with his red hair. He stood frozen, the conduction tape halfway to his ear, the music already playing from his terminal. Unspeaking, he quieted it. Everyone else had gone quiet as well. He turned to go. Switch! I hadn't meant to speak, and yet I had. There was too much to say, too much to leave unsaid. The man twitched as if I'd stabbed him, and half turned back. He wasn't facing me. His fists were tight at his sides. I found suddenly that I couldn't speak. I, who had counted on the clarifying light of some emotion when I'd opened my mouth. The rage didn't come. The outrage. There was only sorrow. I'm glad you're all right, Switch said, not looking at me. When you and Dr. Andera didn't come back, I didn't know what to do. I dropped the towel I'd been holding and closed to within about five paces of the younger man. You're glad I'm all right? Really? Do you know what you've done? The accusation in my tone snagged on some corner in the other man, and he turned. There were tears in his eyes. What I've done? I got you out of prison. Don't play the fool, I said, not raising my voice. You know exactly what you've done, or else you wouldn't have come back here to the Mistral. I took a breath, a step forward. You called Bassanda. You called the Empire. Switch turned fully to face me then, shoulders raised. His face couldn't decide if it wanted to flush or pale. I saved your life. Valka's life. You sold it. I snarled, still deadly quiet. Sold it, and the lives of everyone on this ship. Lynn told me. And for what? To save your own hide? I had in fact been shown the holograph Switch had sent to the fleet, seen his plea for mercy. You said I was mad. You'd lost your way, Hade, Switch said, looking to Polino and the others for support. Demoniacs? Extras? It's too much. It's been too much since Roostum. Since Gen. It's a miracle we haven't lost more people, Earth be praised. I looked back around at the others. I could see the concern etched on their faces, and from the way Polino's one eye followed my progress, I knew he was remembering a younger Hadrian, remembering how I'd beaten three Myrmidon recruits in a fury. That fury wouldn't come. We're going to lose more people, I said my back to the younger man. I shut my eyes. Do you understand that? Footsteps behind me. Switch moving closer. You don't know that. Captain Lin is an Imperial officer, not a Norman warlord. He can be reasoned with. Can he now? 
Polino said, butting in for the first time. Is that what you did, lad? Reasoned with him? Get him to forgive you for stunning his ass on the Balmung? What was his promised price? A spot in the stands while the rest of us hang? Or you just get a nice fugue couch while the rest of us get blasted out an airlock? I opened my eyes. I hadn't expected Polino to leap to my defence, but there he was, leaning against the ropes, watching Switch with that piercing blue eye. Elara moved toward her man. Pal? You too? Switch asked, words drifting over my shoulder like the shadow of the executioner's blade. Pal, you were a soldier. You don't think any of this is right? Aye, I was a soldier. Polino replied, shrugging out of Ilara's grasp and swinging out through the ropes. That's what makes what you're doing so wrong, lad. You're loyal to your people first, your commanders second, and the Empire third, damn it. Switch's voice was close. He couldn't have been but a yard or so behind me. But still I didn't turn. I was just trying to help. Help. I clenched my jaw, tried not to shout the word. After a moment I spoke, my voice small so that the meaning of my words overshadowed their volume. And just, what sort of help do you think you've been? I could see the watchfulness in Ilara's face, in sirens, the ready concern. They thought that at any moment they were going to have to pull me off of switch. That thought, the recognition of it, sobered me further still. I saw my brother Crispin unrolled like a carpet at my feet. The last I'd ever seen of him. Rage, I thought. His blindness. I saw. I heard Switch say, I got us to the Cielsin, didn't I? At what cost? I asked. And at last I turned. Switch stood little more than a yard away. Just out of reach. You say Gen's life was too much. I paused and here glanced at Siren whose face was as impassive as those of the stoic statues who watch me even now. Maybe it was. But you've put the lives of everyone on this ship at risk, Switch. Do you understand that? You already did that, he said sharply, eyes wet and wide. The moment we betrayed the fleet, our lives were forfeit. I took a step closer, by doing so emphasizing the difference in our heights. I'm not so tall as many among the Palatine class, but I stood more than a head above my plebeian friend. When men contend, it's always with the underlying threat of violence. I've known some women who insist it is the same, and having sometimes seen the nail-scratched faces and torn hair, I think perhaps it is so, if less commonly. But I think men found their communication on the threat of that violence. We must speak, they say raising their hands to emphasize the point, lest we use these. Stepping into Switch's space as I did, I knew my unspoken threat for what it was, and stood upon it as though it were a podium. To his credit, the other man didn't flinch. As I have often remarked, there was nothing of the scared catamite in him any more. He thrust out his chin as though it were a target, projecting by that motion that he was unafraid. Tears shone in his eyes unfallen and furious. I took them for a sign that he understood me. More weakly now, Switch said, you already risked our lives when you took Tanaran, when we fought Basanda for you. I didn't miss a beat. I meant to return to Basanda, to Smythe and the Empire, only after I'd made peace with Prince Aranata. You handed us back as failures. It's not the same thing. I may have made us outlaws. But Bassander would never have found us, never have found Vorgosos, if Switch hadn't summoned him. We might have returned on our own terms, in a superior position. We might have returned with peace. You don't see it, do you? Switch said. You trust the Sielsin more than your own people. Do we mean nothing to you? He practically spat the words. There was the moment my father would have struck the man. I felt it with the clarity by which one speaks his most cutting retort, by which one hits the riposte in a fencing match. I let it go. I remembered how I had felt when I fought Bassander on the Baumung. 
I had not hated him, who had treated me with naught but contempt since the Sielsen invasion of Emesh. I couldn't hate him, but I could not trust him ever again. I could never forgive him. Friend that he was. His friendship was not worth the lives of all those he had risked by his cowardice. Polino and Siren, Atavia and Bastian Durand, Ilex and Krim and Ilara and all the rest. And Valka. Valka, most of all. Even his own life, for he had gambled that as well. All to save himself from the Inquisition. I studied his face. The high cheekbones and the bright eyes. The red hair neatly combed, the resolute anger and the unfallen tears. I couldn't hate him, who had been my friend for so many long years. But neither could I look at him without pain. Eyes shut, I said. You need to go. Go? Switch echoed, voice breaking with a sound like incredulous laughter. Go where, Hadrian? I don't care. I breathed, the last word shaking from me like a window pane in a thunderstorm. Go to Basanda, if he means so much to you. Go back home to Danu, go back to your master set. I bit that last one off, knowing it would sting, and hating myself for it. The shame I felt at that wounded my own pride further still and as we so often do when our own actions cut us so deeply, I doubled down. Go to hell. I turned my back, not opening my eyes. Even through my lids I felt Polino's eye on me, felt Sirens, Ilara's, Ilex's, felt Switch's hand on my shoulder. Hade, why did you come back here? I said, bowing my head. Why did you come back to this ship after what you've done? Was it for judgment? Justice? My friend didn't answer me. Get your hand off me, William, I said, voice tight as bowstrings. The fingers tightened on my shoulder. I used his name, his real name. The nickname had vanished and all familiarity with it. I said, Go. Please, I... Switch said and I could hear by his voice that his tears had started to fall. I was scared, Haid. Scared you were dead down there and that Bassanda would kill us all when he caught us. I didn't want to die. You don't mean it. Don't send me away. Inhaling sharply through my nose, I threw my head back and said, I wish I didn't have to, but I can't trust you anymore. Not again. Not after this. Grief is emptiness, I thought. Grief is deep water. Grief. It felt less like Switch had betrayed me, and more like he had died. That he was lost to me, forever sundered by some ocean vast as the ocean of stars through which we wheeled. Vaster still, as though we travelled so fast in opposite directions that one's light would never reach the other. Not until time ran down and the stars burned out like candles, leaving all the universe in darkness and in cold. Cold. I was trying to help. I was trying to save you, too. To save everyone. Switch said into the silence. You were trying to save yourself. I snarled, brushing his hand from my shoulder and moving away. Still, I would not look back. Do you think I'm a fool? Do you think I don't know what we risk here? What I've risked? It was me in that cell switch. Me and Valka. If you knew what I'd seen down there, what I'd met, if you knew even half of what I know, you'd have gone to Bassander even faster. You talk about demons. I've met them. Khan keeps worse things than Sielsen in the dark. And you have... I broke off shaking my head. I'm sorry Gen died too, but everyone who came with me, everyone who's here, knew what they were getting themselves into. Do you understand? They knew. I, Polino said. That we did. I looked up, saw Polino and the three women. They weren't looking at me anymore, but at Switch. I cannot say why, 
but that realization brought a sense of calm to me in the midst of that unraveling moment. I could feel Switch's eyes on the back of my head. I just wanted to put everything right, Hade. I thought we were done. Trapped. I thought Lynn could save us. You thought Lynn might give you a pat on the head for delivering us and Vorgosos to him. This isn't a ship anymore, Switch. It's a prison. Do you understand that? But Sander Lynn is keeping us here until he can decide what to do with us. Until Rain Smythe can decide what to do with us. He said he would put me out the airlock if he could. Silence. Utter silence. After a moment I turned, found Switch standing, hands loose now at his sides, face slack. He looked so small standing there, just as I had done in the shadow of the Siddhartha statue at the Nagrama Monastery. In a voice smaller still, he said, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Sorry isn't good enough. I'm sorry too. But sorry won't bring back Gan or the men I killed on the Baumung. How sorry will you be if the rest of us get executed because you couldn't hold your stomach? Switched opened his mouth to speak. I. His words had failed him, and he looked down at his feet. I wheeled away in disgust, raised a hand in dismissal. Get. Off. This. Ship. I don't care how you do it. I don't want to see you again. I. Get off this ship, William! I roared, and it was my turn to clench my fists. I didn't turn, and so didn't see the other man leave the room. I watched him go in the eyes of my companions, and watching them, shut my eyes. It was all too hard to see. Chapter 54 Bringing Storm the Imperial shuttle crouched in the landing bay before us as I watched unspeaking from between the six guards Bassander had left to watch me. I kept my silence as I had been ordered to do, face fixed dead ahead, hands blessedly unshackled at my sides. The vessel had the look of some armored beetle, its body bloated, coated in adamant plates the color of space. Two great wings retracted, folding down, and against the hull as gouts of white mist blew into the air. I glanced sidelong to where Bassander Lynn stood with Lieutenant Greenlaw, stiff as stone among his guards. Khan Sagara was nowhere to be seen, but I knew he wasn't far. Knew he watched through unseen eyes and through the antique monitor screens high on the hangar walls. They glowed dull grey in that black hall watchless and all-seeing as the eyes of blind old men. I suppressed a shudder, watched as the shuttle's formal ramp descended and a cornison emerged in full regalia. Open-faced helm, with its crest of red feathers, a clarion in his hands. He did not, earth be praised, win the thing, but drew aside as two lines of guardsmen descended, like the cornison they were arrayed in full battle dress. They had expected to be performing for Khan, as Bassander had done in the throne room with his little parade. Without him present, I wondered if they felt like actors, bursting triumphant onto the stage of an empty theatre. This sense of anticlimax was compounded by the appearance of the Night Tribune herself. Flanked by her first officer, Sir William Crossflane, Dame Rain Smythe was a thoroughly uninspiring figure. Short, broad, blunt-featured, she bore all the hallmarks of her plebeian birth and the surgical meddling that had elevated her from it, and next to her patrician subordinate she seemed a weathered sculpture of a woman. Dishwater hair, simply cut and cut short above uneven brows, a flat nose, a face, utterly forgettable. Though she wasn't old, she leaned upon a cane, and I wondered if some new injury had befallen her since we parted ways at Emesh. Or else if this was some affectation, as though she meant to draw attention to the lowliness of her status. I imagined thus had many men of higher birth and better breeding underestimated that iron lady. Captain Lynn, she called when she was yet at a distance, apparently untroubled by the strangeness of that awful ship and its sculpts of staring faces. Well met. She too had dressed in full finery, long-regged tunic beneath the sculpted armor breastplate, a man's breastplate, I noted, 
high-polished greaves and long gauntlets, visible beneath a variant of the very great coat I wore, blacker than black but with wide sleeves to accommodate the gauntlets. A strange paradox, that, that she should project at once an almost feeble vulnerability and all the strength of soul. But Sander stepped forward, beat his chest, and then raised his hand in salute. Mom, her eyes found me, those dull brown orbs as sharp as lasers, and she said, And Lord Marlow, too. Good, good. The Night Tribune craned her neck. Is this Lord Sagara not joining us, then? Oh, he's here, I said darkly, ignoring a look from Bassander that was darker still. You can depend on that. Smythe seemed to consider this a moment before she said, Very well, then. We shall withdraw to the ski of Ona, then, and get our business together. I trust the Sielsen have not yet arrived. No, ma'am, Bassander said, then took a moment to shout orders that the Night Tribune's effects were to be brought from the shuttle and taken to the ship. And we're not certain when it is their due. Sagara has been tight with the details. But you trust he will deliver? The younger officer glanced at the nearest monitor screen before saying, With all due respect to our host, I didn't give him much choice. The Night Tribune tapped her cane against the metal decking. Good. Her eyes searched out the gothic wreck of the hall. Ghastly place. She gave a signal and her escort, who had stood aside in two lines to flank the landing ramp, came together. Presently, two more decades of legionnaires appeared, descending the ramp from the shuttle. How many are with you? Bassander asked. Four decades and five, including myself and these. She gestured to Crossflame, to the Cornison, and to two men emerging at the rear, a centurion, to judge by the medallions fastened to his breastplate, and an optio with his double stripe. And five hundred aboard the Skiavona, Bassander confirmed, though surely the number was known to all present. The Sielsen, I understood, were to be held to a complement of similar size, both parties under the careful and apparently neutral eye of the undying. Crossflame scratched at his fierce side whiskers with one hand, and addressing his question more to me than to any other, asked, What's the disposition of the prisoners aboard the Mistral? I glanced at Bassander only briefly. Mostly in fugue, sir. Captain Corvo, she's our mercenary captain, put most of the crew into stasis when Dr. Andera and I didn't return from the planet. Lynn leaned in. She's only a couple dozen personnel active at this time, sir. Those words at last brought Smythe level with me, and at a gesture my... my honor guard stepped aside. Her face was wholly unreadable. After an interminable period, she said, What am I to do with you, Lord Marlow? Ma'am, I told you when you left Emesh that Bassanda was meant to keep you on a tight leash. But here we are. That made me blink. I was only following your orders, ma'am. And a fine spot you put me in, too. Her expression softened, and she cast her eyes up and around the chamber. But perhaps it may all turn out to our advantage in the end. Averting my eyes, I asked, What's to be done with me, then? For the moment, you're to help us out of this mess. I've brought a translator on Houtman's orders. He doesn't trust you, but you know these Sielsen at least, and for the moment I've convinced him you're useful. She made to move past me, but as she did she stopped and placed one gauntleted hand on my shoulder. I felt her eyes on me and turned. See to it that you are. Useful. And then she was gone. Crossflame glowered at me, and followed in her wake, leaving only Bassander left to smile his little smile. The mapping holograph glowed ahead of our party where I followed just behind the cornison in his high-crested helm. I'd come directly from the Mistral, and so wasn't entirely certain of the way, but when we came to a place where the hallways turned sharply upward, where the gravity sheared at right angles with the turning of the ship's internal suppression fields, I became convinced that we weren't simply going to the ski of Ona. Not that there was anyone who could say with certainty where we were and where we were going within the belly of Khan's awful ship. The floor simply arced smoothly upward, and as though we were walking along the interior curve of a wheel, we rose, 
and rising I looked back and saw our escort in the hall behind, and it seemed they marched down a wall to meet us. Vertigo took me and I shut my eyes. Twice more did we encounter such turnings. Once, sharply right, and again, most terrifying of all, the hallway bent straight down, so that to advance we had to step as if into an abyss. I was acutely conscious all the while of the artificiality of it all, that Khan Sagara might at any moment alter any one of these fields and turn his hall into a shaft and so murder us. I took it as small consolation that the obdurate lurked somewhere out in space, not far, that its guns perhaps protected us. It was a smaller comfort, but a more compelling one to realize that Khan wouldn't kill us because we were being led to his door. A round door opened, rolling away into a pocket in the wall, and entered into a low hall lit, it seemed, by hundreds of blue flames. Like unto the flame which burned outside Khan's palace on Vorgosos they were, and it seemed almost they cast no light. But the what light there was came from no source I could ascertain. Here we are, Khan said, voice ringing out from his throat. He sat behind a table, his children to one side. Ren and Suzuha both looked curiously at the Imperial contingent, and the girl's face darkened when she saw mine. The golem, Yume, stood primly to one side, its hands clasped, head bowed as though in prayer or sleep. Welcome aboard, Night Tribune Smythe. I trust your journey was agreeable. It spoken at once, not forced rain to wait upon his patience. Quite. Not too far from Koratani now? The King of Vorgosos asked, and there was a silver malice in his voice. We had come much further, of course. The mighty Demiurge had moved through killer lights as though they were miles. The Night Tribune leaned heavily on her cane. No, indeed. There followed one of Khan's customary long silences, the children fidgeting in their chairs anxious to be away. Someone must have briefed Smythe on this peculiar disregard for time, for the Tribune didn't move, nor Sir William beside her. For a while the only sound was the faint whirring of the implants in Khan's wasted chest that breathed for him. He shut his eyes. Did you bring what was promised? Of course, in the hold of my ship. We can ferry your cargo to you at your convenience. See that it is so, Night Tribune. See that it is so. I caught myself wondering just how many of Khan's blue eyes lay hid among those gas flame candles. And remembering the way they had burned my clothes, I felt a sudden horrible nakedness. Everything about this meeting struck me as an opportunity for Khan to impress upon his imperial guest the degree to which we were in his power. Power. It was all they believed in, Khan and the soldiers alike, as if it were only the threat of power that held the world to order, as if there were not better ways and truer. But a darker thought took me, though a less pressing one. What payment had the Empire offered Khan Sagara? And what coin? would he accept? The disquiet I felt was echoed in the stiffness of Crossflame's shoulders, and the stiff way Smythe leaned on her cane. The Undying was still speaking. I will have one of the primary bays prepared to receive the cargo then. You will wave your people and tell them to begin the necessary preparations for the transfer. Smythe acceded to this request without hesitation, and Khan asked, how many freighters will be arriving? Five, Sir William said, a brittle quality to his tone. Five, Khan mused. Very good. The crews of those freighters will depart aboard the shuttle on which they arrived and withdraw to your ship. I am generous, but the number of Imperial personnel aboard my ship is already stretching the borders of my tolerance. Are we clear? Five ships, I thought. Five. Something about that figure turned cold in me, very cold. Not money, then. Material? Fuel? Possibly, though, I imagined somewhere in the snows of Vorgosos lay the accelerator farms from which Khan might draw all the anti-lithium he would ever need for his ships. 
I thought of the uranium tankers my house would send careening into space, packed in the holds of consortium freighters and shipped everywhere. No, no, I thought. This is something else. Perfectly clear, Smythe replied. And the Cielsin? When the Otiolo Skiander arrives, their party will be quartered in a bay far from yours, and both of you. He opened his eyes to mere slits, and yet the shine of them was evident, even by the corpse light of that fey chamber. We'll be kept from one another, but that is the price we pay for hosting two armies under our roof. Wren seized his father's sleeve for security more than attention, but Khan Sagara didn't bestir himself. He didn't look like a man concerned about the presence of more than five hundred Imperial Legionnaires on his ship, nor one unsettled by the prospect of sharing a space with as many Cielsin. And why should he be? How many bodies did he have aboard? How many thousand corpse soldiers lurked behind the sealed doors in every hall? And while you are here, I must ask you remain aboard your ship. I must prepare to receive our pale emissaries, and must guarantee them the same security I guarantee you, and would prefer that your fine soldiers stay out of my way. Knight Tribune Rain Smythe took a step forward, wringing her cane in both hands. That sounds perfectly equitable. You may rest assured you will have no trouble from us. Hearing her, I knew she meant it. Whatever came later. I confess this audience came sooner than expected. May I adjourn to consult with my people aboard our ship and to send orders that your cargo is to be brought across? The master's eyes were fully open then, and he raised a hand. The left, and gestured towards a door to the side of that spectral hall. As though answering his summons, it opened, and he said, Please, go and rest. I will summon you again when the Cielsin arrive. Sooner, I hope, Rain Smythe replied. I sensed the move an instant before she made it. I should like to discuss the disposition of Vorgosos. For the first time since I'd known him, Khan Sagara looked surprised. The emotion came and went as the pharaonic mask reasserted itself. Smythe flourished her cane and turned, giving a signal that the cornison should wind his horn. He did, and the clear and sunny sound of that instrument in that dim and sallow hall was like a rainbow in the dark. The double column of men behind me straightened to attention, shifted their lances from one arm to the other, and followed Smythe as she followed the gleaming holograph thread from the room. Tribune! The word came with the force of thunder, not from Khan's human lips, but from the very air about us. Do not threaten me. Smythe half-turned. I do not threaten, Lord Sagara. I only express my enthusiasm for cultivating a close working relationship between yourself and my imperial master for the duration of these negotiations. Good day. She did not wait for Khan to reply, and before he could speak, signaled that the cornison should play once more, and the sound of trumpets echoed in that low and arch-lined space one throat joined by echoes until it seemed an entire band marched there. I was swept along with them, and might have smiled were it not that I understood one thing, I think, more sharply than the rest. It wasn't before any lord that Rain's troops performed. No petty king of the outer Perseus or Norman warlord, no barbarian chieftain was he, one who counts himself one of the powerful because his planet had for so long stood apart from the Imperium. No fool in a crown of bells who thinks ten ships an armada. No. Khan was something else. Something stranger by far and more dangerous. Once militaries march to get from place to place, but in our more enlightened age they do so only to perform. For their masters, for their people. For themselves. Their esprit de corps. Here we marched for a foreign lord, yes, but only for him. All the Night Tribune's efforts, her iron will and the splendor of her guards, was aimed upon the eye and will of that one man who was no man at all. Whatever he was, Khan Sagara had seen prouder hosts and more numerous, and more fearsome ones as well. 
We imagined, Rosander, Crossflane, and Smythe, that we had outfoxed the master of Vogosus, that we were Jupiter feeding Saturn a painted stone instead of his children. But Khan was older now than the entire civilization that had worshipped Saturn. We were not the first to contend with him. We will not be the last. Chapter 55 The Verge of History In truth, I do not think Bassander Lynn had occupied the captain's cabin aboard the ski of owner at all, but if he had done so, he'd vacated it. The vessel had been loaned to Smythe's command by First Stratagos Houtman, and so the stateroom showed few signs of personalization. Indeed, only the stack of heavy plastic and metallic crates against one wall indicated that the space was used at all. Like the rest of the interceptor, like the Baumung before it, the interior of that cabin was all of black metal and brass. Holographs displaying the view out the ship's landing ramp, and along the service umbilical which bracketed her to the ceiling of Khan's hangar bay, gleamed on the walls. Smythe herself sat behind a desk, the door to her personal quarters behind her. Her cane forgotten, propped against the wall at her side, her hands folded on the desk before her. I just don't understand, ma'am, Persanda was saying, eyes fixed dutifully on a space on the wall above and to the right of Smythe's head, as though he couldn't bear to look at her. I've often observed this indirectness amongst military persons, this tendency to look over the shoulder or above the head of the person one was speaking to, even as one spoke loudly and clearly. Lord Marlowe's actions were treason. He killed our own people, three of my men. He kidnapped our principal hostage and absconded with a staff of Norman Federati. He conspired with the extrasolarians, consorted with a... He stumbled still not believing. With a demon of Merikani, if such a thing is to be believed. Why is he not in chains? The quiet rang a little when he was done, and only then did I realize he'd been nearly shouting. Smythe had realized all the while, of course, and Crossflane, whose bushy eyebrows wrinkled his forehead all the way to his neatly combed white hair. Are you finished, Captain? the Tribune asked. I appreciate your candor and your fervor, but Lord Marlowe has his uses, as you see. She spread her hands as if to take in the totality of the demiurge beyond the walls of that room. Turning her attention on me, she continued, The question of his fate will be re-examined after we have met with the Sielsen, not before. But justice, justice, Rain Smythe said, overriding her subordinate, is mitigated by circumstance. Should his actions prove instrumental in delivering us an alliance with one of the Sielsen clans, I think I speak for Hauptmann and for his radiance both when I say that the Empire might have cause to be grateful to Lord Marlowe above and beyond the price of those unfortunate men's lives. Rosander made ready to interrupt again, but Smythe held up a hand for silence. And insofar as Lord Marlowe is useful as a translator and for the rapport he has with this Tanaran, we need him now. I could see the muscles working in Rosander's jaw. Imagine the sound of gears grinding stripping themselves of their teeth. You could have told me, ma'am. Captain! First officer Crossflane hissed. Persandalin stood somehow even straighter. I'm sorry, sir, ma'am. His face looked almost pained. But if you had only ordered me to go in Marlowe's place, I'd have gone, and gladly. Smythe rocked back in her chair, shook her head. No, you wouldn't have. You'd have gone straight to Leonid. That was her legate, the commander of the 437th, or to Hauptmann. Silence again. The captain didn't argue, and the gears beneath the skin of his jaw was still. We all knew that what Rain said was true, and honest as he was, Bassander couldn't contest it. You have been remarkably quiet, Crossflane said. It took me a moment to realize that he was speaking to me. So long had I sat forgotten to one side. I raised my eyes, asked, what do you want from me? You understand your position, Lord Marlowe, Smythe asked. I'm to work as a translator, yes, the same as I did on Emesh with Uvanari. Her eyes narrowed. Not like you did on Emesh, no, you'll be assisting our translator. 
I accepted this without complaint. They would bring another translator. That was only sensible. A scoliast, is he? He is, Rain Smythe replied. Tor Varro. What order is he? I asked, unable to quiet that piece of me that yet loved the scoliasts, the piece of me that wished I had been one. Smythe glanced up at Crossflane, whose brows contracted. The older man rubbed his jaw. Cow something, he said. Cow centerite, I think it was. He's from somewhere out in Sagittarius. Novangren, maybe. I don't know the order, I said, crossing my arms. No surprises there. There were hundreds of scoliastic orders, each with a subtle difference in focus. In interpretation of the writings of Imor, in dress, in practice. Gibson had been a Zenoan, one of the oldest orders, focused on the study of the classic trivia, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and upon literature. The Calcenterites, though I didn't then know it, were ascetics of the most extraordinary kind, emphasizing the practice of self-denial and self-reflection for which the scoliasts are so often stereotyped. Crossflane made a grumbling noise. Well, he's been over the e-mesh records with a microscope. He's impressed. I felt a momentary glow of satisfaction, despite my dire circumstances to know that one of the orders had found my work satisfactory, and sat a little straighter. The first officer took a step forward, leaned over the corner of Smythe's desk, said you had an interesting interrogation style, if you take my meaning, the way you went off script. I felt all eyes on me and shut my own. It took every ounce of control in me to keep my hand from shading my shuttered eyes. I had, of course, manipulated the situation on Emesh, being the only one who could speak the Sialsing language. I had often only pretended to translate what the Chantry torturers had asked of me, preferring to try and build a relationship with the Sialsing captain. My tactic had failed in the end, and when Valka had cut the Bastille's power with her neural lace, and Duvenari had freed itself, the beast had tried to kill me. Only Sir Felix's training and my years as a Myrmidon had saved me when language failed. I was glad, at least, that my most dangerous conversations, the last with Uvenari and with Tanaram before that, had been done during Valka's carefully controlled brownouts of the city's power grid. Still, Smythe said coolly, we shouldn't argue with your results, Marlow. She leaned back in her chair so far as it would go, and began rapping her knuckles against the desktop. I could feel the room drop a degree. Two. Three. Her muddy eyes never left me, and I struggled not to squirm. I understand your doctor Ondera can speak with the pale now as well. Valka. Did they know? Did they know the role she had played in the Emesh affair? Surely by now Bassander, who was no fool, whatever my opinion of him, must have guessed at the implants that crouched at the base of her skull. Hoping to deflect the conversation away from Emesh and whatever role the doctor had had there, I said, She spent a good deal of time out of fugue since Emesh studying. She's communicated a fair deal with Tanaran as well. Perhaps more than I have, truth be told. Seeing my direction and eager to head me off at the pass, Bassander Lynn put in, Captain, I must protest. The witch ought not to be involved. She... Peace, Captain, Rain said, again waving her subordinate to silence. A cigar restored the Sielsen prisoner to us. Tanaran? I asked, not sure. Captain Lynn clasped his hands behind his back and bowed his head. Yes, ma'am. It's in the brig now. The night tribune stood, expelled a ragged, gusty breath. She crossed to a brass hook hanging on the wall and drew off her officer's overcoat and hung it upon the peg. Turning, she tugged on the lip of her breastplate, adjusting it. Good. I should like to speak to this creature before long. There's no telling when the rest of its kind will arrive. She massaged one of the ivory gauntlets she wore as though it pained her. Truly fine armor it was. Not the dinted and carbon-scored plate of the common legionnaire, but printed ceramic. The sculpted body studded with relief images of the imperial sun between the legion's wings across the chest. A similar motif of wings detailed the edges of the vambraces and greaves, and I knew their substance would turn back even a shot from a plasma howitzer. Would you like me to accompany you? I asked, trying to gauge Bassander's reaction. 
but the Mandari man was half turned from me, and I couldn't tell if his face darkened. Rain pivoted, and for the first time, I noted she wore a high matter sword on her belt. She wore it slip fashion, as I did myself, that it might snap away from the belt and be activated in a smooth, single extension by the dominant hand. The left hand. That struck me, for there are no left handed men or women among the Palatine. Speaking, I thought a shade too sharply. No. I'll have Varro accompany me. After that, her tone softened considerably, and she added, Better I speak with it alone. I accepted this with a nod, swallowing both my bile and the sense that I stood on rotting planks above a pit of fire. Smythe resumed her seat with an equally heavy sigh, as if she shouldered again the entire weight of her office, as she seated herself. It is our current predicament that more concerns me. I do not trust this demoniac we find ourselves in bed with. Sagara? Lynn asked. Sagara? Rain Smythe turned her attention from Lynn to me, and back again with a ragged tiredness. In the harsh light of the room, a faint tracery of white scars stood out against the dun color of her neck, on the backs of her hands. They were the marks of the surgery that had made her a patrician. Complex operations, and brutal, I always heard, so extensive that even the owner's very genes were altered by tonics and the various essences distilled by the magi of the High College. It never occurred to me how the echoes of such procedure might ache. I wondered how old Smythe was, and how weary. I admit, Marlow, you surprise me. Not expecting this, I sat forward in my padded chair and folded my hands between my knees. Surprise you? I asked you to find a planet no one believed exists. And you find not only that planet but a character out of everyone's childhood myths. She turned away, and for a moment a strange smile played across her face as she looked toward Crossflame, who shrugged. Khan Sugara, Rain Smythe said. My brother used to play as him when we were children. I said mine had as well, and Smythe continued. The Mataro's Chancellor accused you of being a literary cliché, I recall. I'd say she owes you an apology. I snorted. Oh, gear, I'd forgotten that. Smythe unfastened first one gauntlet, then the other, and set them both aside. How many people were aboard your ship? The Mistral, I asked, then thought back. About three hundred? It's a pity we can't count on them if things go against us, Smythe said, setting the gauntlets neatly to one side. Sagara has the Mistral locked down, I don't doubt. The Sander shifted his posture slackened and snapped back to attention. We could ask him to transfer the Mistral to the Obdurate. Possibly, Smythe agreed. Unless... It was a moment before I realized I'd spoken aloud. Even Bassander was looking at me. Unless they're right where we want them. Sir William Crossflane gave me a look like I'd just declared a fervent belief in goblins. The devil are you on about? I suppressed an urge to say precisely. Said instead, they could be of use. If things take a left turn, if we can get them out. If, Crossflame repeated. If, I insisted. In either event, Corvo has her crew on ice, and they may as well sit under Khan's nose like a crate of fish fresh frozen for market, instead of a couple thousand miles that way. I gestured in what I thought was the direction of the Demiurge's outer hull, holding Crossflame's eye all the while. Where they're no good to anyone. I was suddenly aware that I was making what Valka had called that face you make when you've had an idea that any normal human being would have discarded out of hand. Those others must not have known me so well as Valka, for they only nodded. Whereas I had thought I'd just been terribly clever, in no small part because I believed the odds of my escaping with the Mistral and her crew somewhat greater if she remained in Khan's power and not that of the Imperium. Smythe accepted this with a waved hand. No matter. You do need to be very careful, I said. I'm not sure what Khan is planning, but you've threatened his world. He won't let that pass. Crossflane snorted. Won't let that pass? Boy, the coordinates your man gave us are safely in the hands of the fleet and of Legion intelligence. Even if he were to slag our ships and yours, he knows his days are numbered. 
I twitched at being called boy, but held my peace, telling myself it was only the reminder of how badly Switch had betrayed me that set me so on edge. That's just it, I said, a venomous edge to me now. I have no idea where Switch got those coordinates. Do you understand? Khan's demon had locked out the Mistral's controls from the moment we entered Vorgoso's system. Shipboard systems were totally compromised. Corvo couldn't get a read on her position. She couldn't even unlock her doors after Khan took Dr. Ondera and me prisoner. You're saying you believe Sagara leaked the coordinates on purpose? Crossflane said, hooking his thumbs through his belt. Why? Smythe and Crossflane exchanged significant glances, and I wondered, for a moment, if maybe whatever payment Khan had extracted from them had been that reason. But no, surely there were things in the Imperial Treasury worth the Wurgild of a planet, but I didn't imagine that either Khan would be much interested in them, or the Empire willing to pay. Personally, I don't think it was Khan at all. I think his demon did it. Betray its master? Smythe asked. Why? A darkness flowered behind my eyes, and from it rose hands like stalks of wheat. The swollen flesh sprouting new growth, new arms like cancers. I heard the sounds of splashing and the rumble of many throats wetly breathing. Shaking myself, I said, I don't like to guess, but I do think Khan was blindsided by Bassander's appearance. Would you say? I directed this last to Bassander himself, who in all that time had moved nary a micron. The young officer didn't deign to look at me. I don't think Sagara knew we were coming. What was it like? Smythe asked. This demon of yours. I shut my eyes, held my breath. Marlow? The Tribune asked you a question, boy. Crossflane's tone had hardened. Something in me prickled and I snapped. That's Lord, First Officer, not Boy. It was not my father's voice that answered him, but my own. Taking a deep breath and the space to quiet my flare of anger, I ignored the old officer's bristling and focused instead on the Night Tribune. It wasn't a machine at all, or if it was, its machine parts were buried where I couldn't see. I clasped my hands and after a moment found I was squeezing them together so that the knuckles stood out. You've heard that the Merikani stole men's bodies and souls to ensure that there was no difference between people. Yes. It's true, I said, and told her. I said nothing of my vision and little of what was said between the brethren and myself, but spoke instead of the grasping hands, the staring eyes, and ragged throats, the sick and bloated texture of its hide. I think it was many men once that what they were was dissolved or subordinated to the demon, that it wears them, uses them as we might a vehicle. The silence that followed while brief was total. Smythe made the sign of the sun disk and, staring at a spot on the table, said, It's clear, then. Vorgosos must be destroyed. Khan will know you intend that, I said. I tell you. He's planning something. Planning something? Bassander sneered. What will he do? Fight the legions single-handed? This ship of his is mighty, Marlow, but no vessel is mighty as that. I squeezed the arms of my chair tightly. You're making a grave mistake underestimating Sagara, Lynn. You don't understand. I don't understand? Sander repeated, riding over me as he turned to face me. Marlow, I have been a soldier of his radiance all my life. My parents were soldiers, and you presume to tell me what I do and do not understand. Smythe's cane whistled through the air between us and clanged as it bounced off the far wall of the chamber. The Night Tribune didn't shout, only stood there, eyes tracking smoothly between the junior officer and myself. Gentlemen, she said at last in a voice of deathly calm. I have had enough of this bickering between you both. Whatever your differences, she raised a hand to silence Bassander's interjection, whatever your differences, and however legitimate your grievances, we are on the same side. 
The Cielsin are coming, gentlemen, and I need the both of you. I do not ask you to be friends, but you will set aside this feud. I remained seated, and Bassanda stood immobile as stone. Always it is thus, that the threat from outside drives wedges between those who should stand together. Who must. I could no more turn from my course than Bassanda could shift his position. Yet in one way, I had the advantage. I could lie, or rather I could say what it was Rain expected of me, and neither lose face nor break faith with myself. I could bend, where Bassanda could only break. And so I stood and offered my hand to the other man. I didn't speak a word, for I was certain that saying any word would be a mistake. What happened then disturbed me beyond my ability to adequately explain at the time. Sander looked at my hand, as though it were a serpent, and his lip curled. As I did not speak, he did not take my hand, knowing that to do so would bind him to a promise he did not wish to make. It didn't compromise me to offer my hand. It would compromise Bassander to take it. So he turned instead and saluted his tribune, saying, I will do as you say, ma'am. Smythe gave a little nod, shrugging with her lips as if to say, Good enough. And perhaps it was. Leave us, she said, and with a sidelong look at one another, both Bassander and I turned to go. Not you. I knew by her tone that she was speaking to me and so lingered even as the hatch cycled and Bassander Lynn vanished into the hall. Without needing to be asked, I retrieved the Tribune's throne cane. Heavy built it was, graven of some wood black as jet. Its grain the color of temple smoke. The head and tip were brass and unadorned. How like its owner it was. Without comment, I propped it against the side of Smythe's desk and resumed my seat. She watched me in silence a while, arms folded, her first officer mirroring her in that way old companions everywhere have always had, that way in which they had each in part become like the other. At last she spoke. You really are a cliché, you know that. My teacher used to call it melodramatic, I said lightly. He wasn't wrong. She picked at some spot on her desk that only she could see. Brown eyes found mine, and she chewed her tongue. I take it you understand how much difficulty you place me in with this. She sketched a circle in the air with the tip of one finger. You're my responsibility. And now I've my legate and the first strategos breathing down my neck. Leonid agreed your adventure was worth the risk. But Hauptmann, Hauptmann is not so convinced. And it is to Hauptmann I must account in the end. I thought about my response a long moment before saying, If I may. It was never my intention to place you in a difficult position, only to hold to the mission, as I have done and will continue to do, even when the strategos ordered otherwise. Respectfully, I know when you took me from Emesh, you said it was with the understanding that Bassander would be made to check my, ah, uh, my excesses. But it's unclear to me why you would have wanted me along at all if you wanted another Bassander. Was it my imagination? It was the Night Tribune smiling ever so slightly. Still, she didn't speak, and I added, In any case, Mom, it was my opinion that Strategos Hauptmann's new orders were defeatist, and I felt the Empire and mankind both were better served by my actions than they would have been had I obeyed the Strategos and returned with Captain Lin to Koritani. I'm prepared to pay for my actions on the Baumung, should it come to that. Smythe's eyebrows preceded her smile by half a second, and she turned and smiled at her first officer, who reached into his belt and passed his superior officer a single hurasam. Turning to me, she said, I hope it does not. I had been the subject of a bet, I later learned. Crossflane had expected that I would grovel. Smythe said that I would stand. The two often made such bets, or so Bassander told me much later. We are on the verge of history here. Peace talks with the Cielsin? and peace after. Peace in our time, Crossflane affirmed. For how long had these two been fighting? How many waking years? Had the white in Crossflane's hair been dark when they began? And Smythe's face unscarred? Whatever love of battle or glory, 
Whatever desire to serve had called them forth from their unknown homes had faded, became the duty of all old soldiers, and that sense of family and loyalty which comes before even a love of country. They dreamed of peace, as soldiers often do, knowing the cost of war. Well, I'm with you, Tribune, I said in answer. Good, she said, reaching into her desk. Which means you'll be needing this. She placed my sword on the surface between us. I opened my mouth. Yours, I believe. How did you? Rosanda had it from Lord Sagara. Don't lose it again, she said. And with a sigh, rose and turned toward her door. You may return to your people. I took up my sword and rose to depart, the weight of it in my hands and the sensation of worn leather against my fingertips was like a homecoming in itself. And Hadrian? Mum? Tell Captain Corvo to prepare her people. You're right. We may have need of them. Chapter 56 Like Castles of Ice I followed hard on Yume's heels as we ascended a sweeping spiral staircase. The golem had not spoken for minutes and ignored my attempts to question it and so I'd surrendered and followed it from the mistral into the bowels of Khan's dark demiurge. Gargoyles watched from above, and the walls were covered in scenes of battle and creation. But I hadn't the time to linger in appreciation. We hurried out onto a narrow bridge that ran across a great echoing emptiness. I tarried and peered out. Far below I could see the grey shapes of cargo freighters parked like eggs in a carton. Coolant vapour wafting from exhaust ports. They were Smythe's payment, I assumed, judging by the imperial sunburst stenciled on their hulls. This way, sir, Yuma said, and hurried me on. The ancillary bridge served as a sort of meeting place, more intimate and less theatric than the Hall of Blue Candles. It was dark and might have been a cave were it not for the deep red lights that shone low on the circular walls casting their hell glow up on chairs and consoles like the light of dying fires. Khan Sagara sat above a projection well at the center of the room, like some medieval king above a game board. His children hung back in the shadows of his chair, ever present, ever watching. Smythe, too, was there, and Crossflane. Here he is, the master said and smiled. One of his blue eyes dogged my progress from the minute I crossed the threshold. Yuma had vanished into thin air, though I saw no other door by which the golem might have exited. The constant malice of Sagara's voice gave me pause, and despite myself, despite the presence of Smythe and Crossflane and their guards, my hand went to my sword. Sagara sniffed. There's no need for such heroics here, boy. What's happening? I demanded, not moving my hand. The Sielsen have arrived, Crossflame replied, clip tones cutting into Khan's customary delayed response. I looked up to Khan for confirmation, and after a moment he waved a lazy hand to say that it was so. No holograph plates shone like windows on the encircling wall, nor did any porthole pierce the dark material of the demiurge to open onto the blackness of space. I looked around searching for some solid recognition of what was said. As if on cue, the projection well lit up, a faint wire frame depicting a space around us in little cubes scaled a thousand miles to a side. The demiurge sat in its center, and from this distance I understood the shape of her, flat and pointed, like the blade of an antique sword. But, save at the extreme edges, she bristled her entire length with a profusion of towers, bridges and buttress spires, with here and there the open mouths of docking ports gleaming amidst the shapes of statuary and weapons batteries. Far to one edge of the projection, like the body of some fattened game bird, sat the obdurate, flanked now by the knife-edged shapes of Balmung and Pharaoh, as well as two other imperial destroyers whose names I did not know. The great supercarrier herself was an ugly thing, squat and more square than the deadly forms of the ships at her side, and pathetic seeming next to the graceful bulk and horror of Khan's demiurge. 
but she was a hundred miles from bow to engine clusters, and fierce as fire if engaged. I don't see them, I said, walking around the projection pit, so that I stared through the ghost images of the ships at Smythe, who had not moved since I entered. At some silent command of cigar as the image scaled, zoomed out until the little thousand-mile cubes shrank small as bouillon, and there it was. If the obdurate was massive, and the demiurge more massive still, the Cielsim vessel was enormous. At first, I thought it a moon, approaching us from the side opposite the Imperial ships. Even scaled to fit Khan's map, the size of it was breathtaking, and I gasped. I'd always known the Cielsim ships were large, guessed that they were called world ships for a reason, but the reality was more than I had prepared for. Somewhere in the deeps of time, the Cielsin had carved a ship from the rock of some mighty asteroid, some dwarf planet frigid and lifeless, facing as she seemed only that, or would have but for the gleam of towers and lights pointing out from the surface straight at us. Behind where the dark side of her should be were she only a moon, in truth, extended the great machinery itself, the bays and engines, instruments and docking ports to whose umbilicals clung like remora to the skin of some leviathan, the shapes of smaller, darker craft, too blurry to make out at this range. Smythe, Crossflane, and Khan, all had seen such sights before, and so it fell to me, alone and uninitiated, to say, Holy Mother Earth protect us. I tried to count the distance to it, and the size of it, but my eyes kept slipping. At last I surrendered, asked, How far off are they? More than two hundred thousand miles, the undying replied, using his stage voice once more, the words falling from everywhere like the voice of God. There they will stay. Rain tapped her cane against the edge of the projection pit for attention, though when she spoke it was in a dry and quiet voice. Any closer and we'd have to take up a parking orbit around it. She glanced at Crossflane. That's one of the big ones. Now you see why I insisted they meet away from Vorgosos, Sagara intoned. Chaos. I tried to imagine how the sudden arrival of a new moon might torment a lonely planet like Vorgosos, locked as it was about its dark star. Unable to stop myself, I circled round the projection, passing on the side opposite Khan's chair to keep space between myself and the undying. The image of that pale ship drew closer, and I tipped my head, taking it in. The great spires of her prow and the mass of the asteroid itself were locked beneath a layer of rime that glittered even in the projection, as though it were spun from crystal or grown in some deep cave. A mushroom beneath whose protective cap sheltered spire upon spire, bank upon bank, terrace upon terrace of alien pilings, their shapes organic and unnamed. In my mind's eye, I saw it too. Not as I saw it there, ghostly and flickering on Khan's display, but as it was, truly was. Out there, swallowing the stars, I saw again what I had seen in Kalagar was shown again by brethren. The Cielsin host marching through the heavens and behind them stars and planets, going down like cinders and cooling down to black. And I saw the Cielsin, who led them, taller than any man I had ever known, tall and terrible as death herself, crowned in silver and sapphire, its fangs like the very ice of its palace. Prince Aranata, I thought, and knew it with a certainty I could not explain. I remembered my own head tumbling from my shoulders and had to grip the edge of the projection pit to steady myself. My gorge rose and I feared I might be ill there on Khan's darkly mirrored floor. Fortunately, no one noticed my distress, so taken were they with the events unfolding around them. Can we hail them? asked Rain Smythe. There's no need, Sagara replied and pointed. The lights went out. And for the briefest instant, the only lights besides the glow off my terminal and cross flames and smythes 
were those of Khan's chorus of floating eye drones. The red glow of the bridge lights and the laser-bright images of the holograph pit went out. I half expected to hear the sound of canned thunder rattling from just off stage, waited for the peasant boy to hammer his sheet of tin or for crystal clarions to sound. The prince, when he, when it, appeared, didn't simply materialize above the holograph plate. No. It strode into frame, appearance slowly resolving to clarity as the Demiurge's communications equipment constructed the image, compiling it in real time. We will speak to Sagara and no other, it shouted, speaking the language of the Pale. I could feel both Crossflane and Smythe looking at me, but I was unsure whether or not the Sielsen could hear me, and so held silent not wanting to jeopardize whatever strange alliance the demoniac had with the demons. Ekati Saemji. Khan's voice boomed through the speakers, though I was close enough to the man himself to hear him whisper through his own lips. Here I am. The creature was not the one I had seen in my visions, though it was tall and high-crowned and dressed in robes of stunning blue that left arms bare save for the drape of fine silver chains. In one hand it held a staff crowned with a broken circle the symbol of some office I didn't know or understand. I felt a brief surge of relief, for surely here was Prince Aranata Otiolo. This Sielsen's face was broader, flatter with a tattoo in black ink covering the left side of its face from the base of its crown of horns to the tip of its chin. The joy I'd felt and the relief shattered. I am come on behalf of my master, the creature said. Ayeta Utsabim. Aranata o Tiolo viu di home. Prince of the Etani o Tiolo, keeper to his people, master to his slaves. As it spoke, the Sielsen rattled its staff, so that chimes wound about its orbit just below the headpiece clanged their hollow tones. When it finished, it slammed the staff down with such force that the staff stayed standing. And I guess the creature stood not upon tile or stone, but earth. It beat its chest with both hands. He who fashioned our world, who brought forth life from dead stone. He who brought us out of the chains of Utahero, who sees the watchers, who knows the mind of the makers, who leads us through the emptiness and the light. It was not the prince after all. I looked up at Khan Sagara, ageless and undying expecting from him a litany of equal magnitude, such as our imperial heralds so often shower upon his radiance. Khan did not reply. Unimpressed, he leaned back in his seat, one hand patting young Ren on the back of his head, mussing his hair. His silence allowed the Kotaliho, the herald, to say on. We have seen the ships of the Yukajim. You told us there would be no fleet, only their spokesmen. It's a cohort, Smythe exclaimed. Not a fleet. The Sielsen Herald did not respond. It hadn't heard. Khan replied, The humans had to travel here as well. I have asked their ships to hold their current position, the same as yours. Only their representatives and a token force have been allowed aboard my ship. Five hundred aboard the ski of owner, I thought, and three hundred on the Mistral. A token force. Then something else that Khan had said struck me. The humans had to travel here. The humans. He had not counted himself among our number, or else the Sielsen word for humans, Yukajim, vermin, applied not to humanity as a class, but to the Empire in particular. In either case, Khan considered himself a third party and the Kotaliho didn't challenge this claim, but rather swept its braided queue over its shoulders and raised one taloned fist. This will be acceptable to the Ayeta Aranata, who sits on a throne of his slaves. It spread its fingers then, each longer than a man's, and tipped with a claw enameled a deep and vital blue. Tute wo, came Khan's reply, and his lips murmured, Very good.
Knowing now that the Herald couldn't hear us, I ran over the entire conversation with Crossflane and Smythe. It's saying that they will send security staff to investigate the Demiurge for traps. Khan's arranging the details. Sagara raised a fist in a gesture identical to that the Cotalijo had used, and for the first time I realized that it was no true hand. Like his chest, the left hand and arm were of pale metal. And like his chest, some crude simulacrum of flesh, plated and interleaved like the plates of a suit of armor, was stretched tight in panels over the metal skeleton beneath, so that it seemed a stylized impression of a hand he raised, and not a hand itself. And Khan said, Wanan Beo, Karadiuti, Ayeta, Baokarin, Shika, Jedise. I have prepared a gift for your master slave. A gift? Rain asked, leaning toward me. What gift? My eyes darted from her confused face to Crossflane's bland one, wondering, I'm not sure. The undying master paused, and I swear each of his blue and shining eyes turned to look at us. Yukajim Kajadin Bithumdin Yuramyi Karamte Tikusunti Yukajiri Ezarakanyi Karamte Tiosunjie I felt the blood go from my face, replaced by something bright and cold as steel drawn at dawn. I glared at Smythe. What? she asked, confusion coloring that bland stone she called a face. What is it? What have you done? I asked, voice flat as I squared to face her, looking down my nose. Khan didn't notice, continued speaking to the Cielse in Cotalijo. Smythe shook her head. I don't... What are you talking about? What have you done? I repeated. Crossflame grabbed me by the shoulder, tried to turn me from his commanding officer. What did he say? Talk sense, Marlow. The first officer's hair and chops shone snowy white in the light of the holograph well, his face and smythes pale as ivory masks. I snarled. Sagara said he will give the Cielsin five thousand human slaves, slaves that you— and here I, against all sense and caution, prodded Smythe in the chest, gave him. Ivory masks transmuted to marble. I jerked my head at Sagara where he sat between his silent children. Is that what you gave him? Was that the promised price, Smythe? The Night Tribune looked away. Twenty thousand. From our colonial stores. Twenty. It was all I could do not to strike her to strike the lip of the projection pit beside me. The colonial stores. From the storehouses, Crossflane interjected, as if this were some sort of justification. The Empire maintained millions of prospective colonists, plebeians who had signed up for resettlement when their prospects ran out at home. Like our soldiers, they might sleep on ice for centuries before they and their families, or they alone, were decanted and deposited beneath the light of some new and alien sun. Twenty thousand of these, it seemed, wouldn't wake at all, unless it were under the eyes and grasping hands of Khan Sagara, in the black pits of Vorgosos. I pressed my words flat as dead flowers. And you had the gall to accuse me of treason. My brows rose on their own. Was it worth it? Twenty thousand for the life of the Imperium, Smythe said, not looking me in the eye. For all those quadrillions? Yes, it was worth it. I thought you understood that. I opened my mouth to speak, to scream. But the words of the Cielsin Herald cut into my momentary silence. Tanaran, it said, and I crushed my rage back down again. Raka Tanaran Tisayem Gine. Where is Tanaran? With the humans, Khan's human voice whispered, and his sound system replied, Rakava Tiyukajim. I would speak with Tanaran, the herald said. Shala'o Tajarin Tikoun.
Khan's face was expressionless. Beside him, Suzuha stirred, and Khan's steel and flesh paper hand reached out to steady her. Tanaran is in the human's power. I cannot bring it to you. I translated this for Smythe, who said, We will surrender our captive to the prince and no other. Sagara raised a hand to silence her, and three of his eyes descended, floating in a smooth arc, to more closely regard the three of us. Peace, he said, and with that turned to the sea elsin. I will have your gift prepared for delivery at once. You may send security to me to prepare for your master's arrival, if you will. Sagara was being astonishingly conciliatory, though now I suspect such manipulative flattery was only a mask, a way to manipulate the Sielsen into cooperating. The Kotaliho hissed past its teeth. Yumna Raka, Dein, Ilokete, Nei, Sagarase? No trick, Oalikom, Sagara replied. It is only that your Baitan is aboard the Yukajim ship. I do not have it. The Herald only bared its fangs, snarl distorting the looping script inked on its face. Tell your master I anticipate his arrival, and hope that he enjoys his gift. Sagara Sielsen was perfect. He even used the so-called masculine to describe the Ayeta, a subtlety most human speakers fail to notice. The Ayeta were masters, and so were never the object of a sentence, always its subject. Khan Sagara waved his flesh hand and banished the projection with neither pomp nor circumstance. Rain, I think, expected him to speak, but I knew better, and waiting watched the two dozen drone eyes in the room slowly orbit until they formed a perfect circle, gently processing in the air above our heads. The room lights swelled on, red as coals. Tanaran is aboard, Smythe said coolly. He's on the Skiavona. We could have sent for him. There was no need. Sagara's false voice boomed. At an unseen sign, Yume appeared and shuffled the children away. Had they been brought only to decorate Khan's throne for that address? And why was I sent for? Only to translate for Smythe and Crossflame? The Ayatar does not like to be refused anything. He will consider any refusal a threat. So we must lie to placate him. He paused, eyes shut. He will send security to ensure there is no trap here. When they do so, you will allow them a pre-interview with your captives. The others are all out of their cages, I assume. Smythe wrung her cane as though it were the neck of some seabird. They are. If it offended her that Sagara gave orders where he should offer suggestions, she did not show it. Smythe doubtless saw the utility in the master's suggestions, and so didn't contest them. What frequency did the Sielsen use? Frequency? Sagara's voice fell like slow rain from the roof above us, like slabber dripping from the roof of some iron mouth. You think it is radio they communicate with? Crossflane, ever the officious sort, replied. What then? Not moving, not looking at us, Sagara pivoted. The Sielsin will return and call again. They will insist that because I am human, they should be allowed to double the number of troops they bring in reserve. I will grant that request. As he spoke, his face turned slowly to mine, and I blanched, for the weight of those black eyes was a terrible thing. What Khan said and what Smythe and her first officer said in answer, I cannot say. For I heard another voice within my mind like Khan's voice, but brighter. You see what they are, these fine friends of yours. I found I couldn't work my jaw, and looked around distressed. Neither Smythe nor Crossflame took notice, wrapped as they were in conversation with the undying on his high seat. Khan's eyes hadn't left me. An image flashed in my head. The cargo ships I had seen when I had crossed the bridge into this very chamber. Then inside, row upon row of caskets, and beneath their frosted lids the slack faces of twenty thousand sleeping men. 
and women, and children. See what they will sell, what they are. I saw what Khan was doing. He meant to drive the wedge between myself and the Imperium just a little deeper. What his aim was, I cannot say. But it was transparent to me as glass. I did not answer him. I wasn't sure I could. The world is filled with monsters. Dragons in the wilderness. Serpents in the garden. We must become monsters to fight them. Anyone who thinks otherwise has never really had to fight for anything. I knew where I stood. On the wall between the wilderness and the garden. Whatever humanity was, whatever it is, it is mine. And worth defending. Given the choice between the Cielsin and human monsters, I'll choose the human every time. Chapter 57 The Prince of Hell The mouth of hell opened before me, and beyond was only the blackness of space. The overhead lights of the hangar bay washed out all but the brightest stars, and the shimmer of the static field masked the rest so that all ahead was blackness. I stood amongst white-armored legionnaires dressed in a suit of deepest black. High boots, red piping on the trousers, the hem of my black coat flowing about my ankles, the collar standing well past the level of my ears. My hair was newly trimmed, and my old coat was laundered and new repaired. Still I felt grubby beside the Night Tribune and her first officer, in their suits of sculpted ivory beside their scoliast Varro in flowing green. And how bright the host behind me! The imperial standard hung from a pole beneath the golden sculpture of the sun, and the image of his radiance, Emperor William the Twenty-Third, shone from a holograph plate, carried, like a small umbrella, atop a staff. The soldiers all carried energy lances, their barrels and bladed heads gleaming in the light. Red were their tabards, and red their plumes, and black the long cloaks of the officers, drinking the light. Khan Sagara stood near at hand, swathed in gold, his golem faithful at his side. A full two dozen eyes floated about them both, shining with a blue and inhuman menace. Behind them both, faces slack and lifeless, stood a hundred soms in rank and file, their khaki uniforms uncared for. They carried no weapons, stood to no order or attention, and yet there was a weight to them, and a palpable threat wholly unlike the threat of our soldiers. And it is a testament only to the training and the discipline of the Solon legions that not one of our people balked in the face of those monsters. The Cornison's clear voice went up, crying, Attention! And behind me, every one of Rain's five hundred soldiers passed their lances from the crooks of their arms to the ready posture, so that they grasped them with both hands. The crystal clarion blew, clear notes and martial winding in that echoing cavern of a hall. Darkness, chaos, the mother of demons. I watched that infinite dark give birth, watched the black ship emerge from blackness deeper still. Like a piece of the night it was, its shape difficult to describe. Like a broken circle, its surface warped and ruined with irregular designs, as though it were the organ of some awful giant. It was nearly so large as the Skiavona, larger than the Mistral, that it might hold a solid thousand Cielsin screamers comfortably aboard. And I felt, rather than heard, the breath go through the men at my back. The horror. Many of them, I realized, had never seen a Cielsin ship up close before. Most of the war was fought at a distance, fought with fire, fought while these soldiers slept on ice in the obdurate's massive holds. I was conscious then of the history in which I stood, that here for the first time in more than twenty thousand years of human civilization, we stood and faced a power like ourselves, but greater. Every war, every conquest, every treaty, Every colony and colonization, and the struggle against different peoples, 
seem to me practice for this, this great other. Unlike the Skiavona, the Sielsen craft had no landing gear. And why should it? Like they had for the Skiavona, docking clamps and umbilicals descended from the roof of the Demiurge's great bay, wiring the ship into Khan's systems, connecting fuel lines and service passages. That Khan had the equipment for such spoke volumes. Clearly, Vorgosos and its master had been dealing with the pale for a long, long time. Forward, the Cornison declared, and behind us every soldier took one thundering step closer. Our party didn't move. Smythe, Crossflane, Lynn, Torvaro, and Jinan and myself held our ground beside the standard bearers and the guards who held the Sielsen prisoners in chains. Sagara made no sign. He didn't need to. At last, the preparation was ended, and the time come at last. The black ship opened. If I expected a ramp to descend, I was surprised. Instead, a hatch opened in the bottom of the vessel, and a sort of lift descended, a platform upon whose broad surface stood an assemblage of the pale. There must have been sixty of them, seventy. Not one of them was shorter than eight feet, and each carried a white sword, tall as a man. The blades held in their right hands, resting against their left shoulders. They dressed in black, with cloaks of deepest azure, trimmed in silver. Bleak masks, strangely painted, hid their faces, and their horns rose tall and curving as crowns of chalk. These advanced not in ranks, but fanned out in a semicircle, so that rapidly they commanded a great breadth of the space beneath and before their vessel. One of them, taller than the rest, and with a white cloak instead of blue, raised its blade and shouted, the voice amplified by some praxis in its mask. I couldn't make out the words, but I knew a war cry when I heard one. Though I had never heard one before, my bones remembered. Hold, Smythe said to her men. Steady on. When the Sielsen was done, a knot of the creatures still standing on the platform parted, and the herald I had seen projected on the Demiurge's bridge appeared. O Alicom. The creature carried the same staff forward. Chimes ringing. Its massive eyes narrowed in its tattooed face as it surveyed our host and Khan's. Yukajim, it said, voice rough and high like the cry of some bird. You stand before the lord of the seventeenth branching, who is Ayeta, prince and chieftain of the Yotiolo, who is Viudihom, and self-made. He who fashioned our world, who brought forth life from dead stone. He who brought us out of the chains of Utehero, who seized the watchers who knows the mind of the makers, who leads us through the emptiness and the light. It rattled its staff as it spoke and slammed the butt against the floor. I'd heard most of it before and held my silence as Torvaro translated for the others. I wished Valka could have been there, but she was trapped on the mistral with Corvo and the rest of what once had been my red company. You stand before the Great One, our master, our lord, our keeper, who is father and mother to us all. Utsebim Aranata Otiolo. At this it swooned, or else threw itself forcefully to the ground. Facing outward, all of the Sielsen guards knelt in perfect synchrony, swords still flat against their opposite shoulders, their long braids nearly touching the floor. I felt again a species of rotten terror knowing that now, surely, I would look upon the face from my vision, the face of the beast who killed me. Prince Aranata appeared, and again I relaxed. It was not the face I had seen. Eyes I had not met in dreams swept over us from a face huge as a man's chest. Prince was a giant, nine feet high and broad almost as two men. Black armor glittered like wet glass and the rings of silver and of platinum that banded Aranata's horns gleamed like stars. His great cape spread out behind him like wings, 
and his mighty braid wrapped twice about its shoulders. At the sight of the prince, Tanaran and all our prisoners fell upon their faces and lay shivering, and no action of our soldiers could so much as make them lift their eyes. Behind Aranata, similarly adorned and attired, came a slender Sielsin, more delicate of feature. It kept its eyes down, its mouth firmly closed. This second creature held in its hands a silvered chain, thick as a child's arm. The chain ran back, fastened to a silver collar. And in the collar, Bersander swore. I'd seen the creature in the collar before, and the sight of her was more terrible than I'd dreamed. Unprompted, Crossflane rounded on Sagara. What is the meaning of this? The Undying didn't reply, and the old officer turned on me, demanding, What is this, Marlow? It's a woman, I said, voice dead of feeling. It was a woman, or what was left of one. She was not quite like the one in my dream I saw. That one had looked more like my mother, but this was younger, slighter, pale as milk, as the creature that dragged her forward. She wore nothing unless it was strips of blue silk and the jeweled anklets that, chained, hobbled her gait. Great scars mottled her flesh, angry and red. These ran along her arms, her legs, the inside of her thighs, and at the corners of her mouth. And her hands. Her hands. These had been slit by some vicious surgeon. The flesh between the fingers pared away so that each digit remained a useless ornament, unable to grasp anything. A cleft between her largest toe and the rest of each foot gave a similar impression. She could hardly walk, and it was suffering to stand. There was nothing in her eyes but tears. Her soul was dead. Rain Smythe placed a hand on Crossflane's arm to quiet him. Welcome, Prince Aranata she said. I am Dame Rain Smythe, knight and tribune of the 437th Centaurine Legion, third cohort under Sir Leonid Bartos. I have the command here. Torvaro, a tall black-haired man with a stern, vaguely paternal face, stepped forward to assist in translation. Eka Dame Rain Smythe, Skaha U Uge Tribune. Baskan Datan, Kentarine, Bithumen, Sava, Ba Cohort, Bidim T. Leonid, Batos, Relu. Siage O Torie T. Siamgi. The broken girl said instead, voice high and brittle and hard as flint. She had repeated the Tribune's words precisely, translating without editorial. She's translating, I said to Rain. Kitha Thunu, the girl echoed. I felt my stomach turn and had to look away. Even Sagara looked disgusted, and I was glad, not for the first time and certainly not for the last, that the Sielsin couldn't interpret our facial expressions at all well. Prince Aranata Otiolo looked down at Smythe, who seemed hardly half his size, and said, Yelbe Odein Ba Kosunshi. Torvaro turned and repeated the words in Galstani, saying, He says he has come for his property. I took it as a sign of the man's quality that he used the masculine pronoun for the Ayeta, not the neutral one, which would ordinarily be the more appropriate in our less fluid tongue. Smythe pursed her lips, raised her chin so that she looked up unafraid into the eyes of the giant before her. And he shall have it, when he is treated with us. They are being kept safely and well, as you see. She waved a hand, encompassing by its arc the prostrate forms of our eleven captives. There was Tanaran, and the vicious Svatarom beside it. None raised their eyes. The Xenobite rested a hand on the hilt of its sword, and took a step forward, making to brush past us and approach its people. At a shout from the centurion guarding the prisoners, our soldiers closed ranks, angling lances forward so that barrels and ceramic bayonets aimed at the lord of the seventeenth branching. 
The kneeling Sialsin soldiers hissed, and as a unity pivoted on their knees, threatening to rise. Hold! Bassander Lin shouted, throwing out a hand. Everyone hold! I may have disliked the man, but to his credit, I've seen Bassander Lin in several crises, and never once seen his composure crack. He kept one hand on his shield catch, but the other was open and flat, calling for peace. Tanaran Ki, the prince demanded. On your feet, slave. Without lifting its face, Tanaran got its feet under it and stood, still bowing. Look at me. Tanaran turned its face up, eyes narrowed as if it faced some bright light. Speak. The Baitan's voice was barely more than a whisper. The watchers were not on Tamnikano. Ya Ayeta Doro, it said. Or if they were, we could not find them. Echakta Uvenari is dead, and all but these. It did not stop bowing and waved a hand over its shoulder at its comrades. We have failed you, and beg your mercy, or your mercy. The words it used for mercy, Undaktu and Daktaru, meant different things. The first, as I have told you, was judgment, justice. The second, clemency. Almost I expected Aranata to strike off its servant's head then and there, and devil take the empire. But Khan Sagara stepped forward. My lord, he said, speaking with his own voice. Welcome back. I trust my gift was to your liking. He spoke as a servant does to his master, and I wondered at that, for the undying served no power in the cosmos but himself. The reminder that Rain and Crossflane had dealt with Sagara and with the Cielsin in human blood and bodies twisted sick in me, and I glared at my boots, and so heard the beasts reply. They will serve beautifully, Nabuta. It took me a moment to realize that this was the name of the Cielsin holding the silver chain. Though Varro caught it easily enough, it yanked the chain, dragging the mutilated wreck of a woman forward. She didn't cry out as her butchered feet splayed painfully on the floor, stumbling toward her inhuman masters. I looked up in time to see the Ayeta bare his glassy fangs. We will do good work with them. These Yukajim have so much potential. Crossflame grunted a curse when he heard the translation, but held his peace for fear the broken girl would translate him. The humans wish a peace with your Skianda. Sagara said, allowing the girl to translate. I found I couldn't take my eyes away from her empty face, nor turn my ears from the sounds of her harsh and barking words. Her teeth flashed, seeming too small behind her thin lips. With a start, I realized they'd been filed into points. I clenched my own teeth. They had shaped her like themselves, visited pain and other violations I dared not imagine upon her. Long ago, in my own home, I had seen eunuch Myrmidons painted to resemble the Xenobites for the Colossa. This was worse. Genuri Osvanane, Aranata repeated. Make peace? They wish to surrender? To serve us? Surrender? Smythe echoed when she had been told the prince's words. We wish to stop fighting. To make peace as equals. Equals? Aranata said. The Ayeta have no equals. I should have recognized that statement for what it was. A warning that our negotiations were doomed from the start. But I'd come too far, and hoped for too long to see the truth I would not hear. I had hoped the Cielsin would be all like Uvenari. But Uvenari had been beaten, and the prince was not the captive soldier I had killed. You would have us serve you, he said, and for this they will expect me to turn on Hasurum, on Pagoramatu, and the others? Is this the way? You would not have come if you didn't wish to speak. I spoke for the first time, and had spoken out of turn. I felt Bassander tense beside me and half expected a blow to the back of my head. None came, but the Ayeta rounded on me, nostril slits flaring. Raka Denine? He addressed the words to Sagara, but towered over me. Who is this? 
I did not bend or shy away. One of Sagara's habitual silences seemed to have fallen on him, and it was Tanaran who answered, saying, This is Mala. It was he who saved us on Tamnikano. He gave Ndaktu to the Achakta. It had taken its eyes from its master's face and looked straight up at the ceiling, bearing its throat in a kind of submission, such as wolves are wont to do. As Vatadane? the Ayeta asked, tilting his head in the direction that indicated affirmation. Approval. Did he indeed? Then you have my gratitude. Itana Uvanari was one of my most prized possessions. It is good to know it died a good death. Uvanari's death played behind my eyes. The Sielsen bleeding out on the floor of the Chantry's interrogation cell, while the Klaxons blared and flashed their warnings. It had fought to the last, slipped its bonds, murdered its torturer, and come for me. Only chance and my meager skill had saved me. A good death, I agreed, if there is such a thing. The Ayeta's nostrils flared again, and he tucked his chin. Angling his horns in a way I think meant as a kind of threat or dominance display. The way strong men might square their shoulders and thrust out their chins. I would speak to my Baitan alone. That can be arranged, I answered in the Sielsin tongue, speaking without thinking. I saw Bassander and Smythe both snap their eyes to me when Varro translated, faces dark. Switching to the standard, I added, as a show of good faith. I should not have spoken. I knew that full well. But the damage was done. The whole party glared at me. Smythe and Bassander, Crossflane and Jinan, even the impassive Varro. Hurrying into the gap left by my outburst, the Night Tribune said, I intend for you to leave these meetings with your Baitan, Ayeta, provided we come to some arrangement. Arrangement? Aranata echoed. You presume to threaten me? Threaten? Smythe asked, genuinely baffled. Not at all. She didn't see. None of us did then that any challenge to the Ayeta's supreme authority, even the barest murmur that we had a right to refuse it anything, was seen as an assault against that authority, or worse, a grave insult. You think we will deal with you like some common merchant? Aranata asked, saying the word merchant with all the venom of a prelate denouncing whores. We will not just hand over our captives, Crossflane said. The herald, Oilicom, spoke for its master's shoulder. Hostages, then. Of course, hostages, Crossflane snapped, unable to contain himself. Danagayan wo, the broken girl intoned, indicating the Crossflane's scorn by her choice of words. Inflamed, Aranata whirled and struck her soundly with the back of his hand. She hit the ground like a wet towel and didn't stir. Abasado, said the Sielsin, holding her chain, the thin one dressed as Aranata was dressed. No. I started, gaze lost halfway between the chaos with the Xenobites and my own people. Abasado, Abasa, father. I turned, taking in this new fact. Father, parent. I'd never seen a Sielsin child before. I wasn't sure if anyone had. Looking again at the creature called Nobuta, I saw. The shape of its face was rounder, softer, the horns shorter, eyes wider. Though it was nearly so tall as its parent, it had not achieved the breadth and fullness of adulthood. A child. Earth and Emperor, forgive me. Torvaro hurried forward, saying to the Xenobites, I'm a physician. You've hurt her. He had the scoliest talent for understatement, it seemed. But Varu was blocked by Nobuta, who said, No, it's mine. The scoliest fist tightened, a display of feeling that astonished me in one of his order but he backed off all the same. Do we want peace with creatures like this? Bassander said softly. Rain slashed an arm across his path as he took a step forward. Jinan quietly swore in Jadian. Privately, I felt myself agreeing with Bassander. I found myself staring at the cleft soles of the girl's mutilated feet. A black feeling in the pit of my stomach, wondering what awaited Khan's gift of five thousand. Rain's gift. Oh, Kunse! Prince Aranata's voice cut through the commotion. 
cold and dead as brethren's hands. You. It took me a moment to realize that the Ayeta was speaking to me. Behind him, the child Nabuta crouched beside the translator, stroking her scarred face. Tanaran says you have honor. A beast's honor. But honor all the same. By that honor and by what you did for my Achakta. Tell me the truth now. What do you want? What do we want? Rain Smythe echoed when I translated. For it and its people to stop preying on our colonies. I turned. Faced the Ciel Sinayeta where he towered above me. Varro was distracted with the injured girl and so I had a chance. A passing chance. To speak the truth and not as I'd been scripted. I wanted to see your kind with eyes unclouded. I said giving the answer I had given Gilliam Vass so very long ago. And to make peace. Peace, Aranata barked. Kilete. Only when I heard the words spoken back to me, did I realize the problem. The Sielsin word for peace was submission. Chapter 58 The Chalcenterite that went about as well as could be hoped, Smythe said, when we returned to the ski of Ona, eyes downcast. No one answered for a moment, aware of the shapes that moved in the silence between us like wolves. We were in one of the upper halls, at a place where environment suits hung from hooks on the wall, and the dorsal airlock opened in the ceiling above our heads. We just watched a workman clamber through it from the service umbilical, that attached to a service catwalk that ran above our ship in the Demiurge's massive hangar. Smythe had dismissed the laborer with a brusque command. We might have met in her office, only we hadn't made it so far before the Night Tribune turned back fuming. She was thinking of the deal she'd made. I could see it in her eyes. Her devil's bargain with Sagara and the way he'd turned her gift over to the Cielsin. She was seeing the poor, tormented translator again and again in her mind, was wondering what she'd done, was wondering just what fate awaited them, and the remaining fifteen thousand she'd granted the undying lord of Vorgosos. Well? To my astonishment, it was Bassander Lynn who spoke, echoing the thoughts in my own mind. Night Tribune, did you— He remembered himself at once, stood a little straighter. Permission to speak candidly, ma'am. This Smythe granted with a wave of her cane. Bassander Lynn still looked uncomfortable, but he fixed his eyes on a point just above his commander's head and said, Did you see what they had done to that poor slave girl? Crossflane scowled. It was difficult to overlook, Captain. What sort of animal could do that? I've since learned that among the Cielsin it is considered a great honor to depend upon another, for to do no work among a people whose very lives depended upon the upkeep and careful maintenance of their starships, was a mark of supreme opulence. More honorable still was to keep such slaves, such living ornaments, such beings without kiati, without utility, and to torment the humans so held the added relish of domination and pride, to have broken mankind, the great enemy, over the Ciel Sinni. I've known men who are no different though I did not say such a thing to Passanda. It was horrible, Jean Anne said, almost under her breath. Nevertheless, Smythe said, mustering all her soldierly pragmatism, we have work to do. She took a moment to gather herself, looking like a child's figurine all folded in on itself. What must she have felt? At the time, I did not, could not, consider it. Such was my fury with her and my frustration. But now I think old Smythe, born a serf herself, imagined that when Sagara had demanded payment in the form of twenty thousand human souls, that he intended naught but serfdom for the lot of them. Whatever she was, she was an imperial tribune, and could not image the macabre and inhuman uses to which a demoniac like Sagara might put such poor souls. She turned her attention to me. I mean to make a liar of you, Lord Marlow. Ma'am? You promised the pale a tete-a-tete -tete with our chief prisoner, she said. This cannot be allowed, not least of which because our Cielsin friends may have opinions regarding the events at Emesh other than 
shall we say, the official version. Jinan cleared her throat. Forgive me, Night Tribune, but how do you intend to keep them from sharing these opinions once these negotiations are finished? Not eager to call Jinan's attention down on me, but unable to hold my tongue, I interjected. I do have a hard time imagining the Ayeta would privilege our word over Tanarans. I was being simple, and as is the nature of such simplicity, I was unaware of it. Night Tribune, if I may, said Torvaro, stepping forward. He was dressed strangely for a scoliast, still in verdant greens, but not in the flowing robes and togas which befitted his station or dignity, but rather in a long-slitted tunic, more akin to a knight's surcoat, this worn over a close-fitting shirt, and loose trousers cinched below the knee where they gave way to hose and the customary soft slippers. The bronze badges that signified his competency were not sewn onto a sash worn crossways like a bandolier, but pinned to his tunic front like a soldier's medals. He had a patrician's bearing, though none of the scars, and the rock-steady confidence that comes from knowing many things. When we are finished, it is hoped the personal account of our Cielsen prisoners will matter far less to the Aeta than those incentives he gains by his association with the Empire. We have every intention of this being a felicitous relationship between our two peoples. Felicitous? Rosander repeated, unable to hide his scorn. But he held back not saying the rest of what was on his mind. Sensing where this might be headed, I asked, What exactly are we planning to offer them? I had directed this question to Smythe, but it was the scoliast who continued at a sign from his commanding officer. An immediate cessation of hostilities, naturally, contingent on the prospect of further dialogue, exactly as you described at Emesh. And what else? Varro glanced to Smythe, seeking permission. She made a gesture with the hand holding the cane, and he said, What you'd expect? Introductions to the Ayeta of other Cielsen clans? The opening of trade agreements? As he spoke, I remembered how long ago I had spoken of just such things to Director Adieza Feng and the other representatives of the Wong Hopper Consortium, imagining a day when it was trade that defined relations between our people and the Pale, not violence. But then, hearing it from lips other than mine, hearing it after the sight of that mutilated girl and the visions I had seen, it seemed only the naive dream of a child like morning dew banished by the first rays of the sun. I doubted, and doubting took little note of what else was said, but nodded along with the directives and specifics of that meeting. I needed time alone, needed time to think, to put the broken pieces of my mind back together again. I needed sleep. Most of all, I needed to be away. I could feel the net the noose tightening around me. The Cielsin. The Empire. The Extrasolarians. Khan Sagara, my Red Company, my duty to my friends and their faith in me. My betrayal of the Empire, my betrayal of Jinan. Switch's betrayal of me. I had conjured enough rope to hang myself, called down enough wolves to be sure I'd never leave the woods. When I had left Vorgosos, ascended that high tower once more and regained my place on the Mistral. I had thought I'd return to the ordinary world. But that familiar ship, those familiar faces, everything had changed. You cannot twice step into the same river, Heraclitus once said. There's no coming home. I'd not returned to the Mistral of my memory, had not gone back to my friends, unchanged. There is no going back. I've seen the rivers of time, and tread their lucent waters. They flow in but one direction, forward. I had changed, and they had changed, and everything had changed. I felt upside down, disquieted, upset by the thought of the very peace I had myself pursued so ardently. But I resolved to do what I must and so bowed my head when at long last the Night Tribune said, That's enough for today, then. We'll reconvene tomorrow at 0700. Dismissed. But as we turned to go, the scoliest Varro took me by the arm. Lord Marlow, a word. It wasn't a question. Though in any event, I saw no reason to deny the man. 
I hung back until all the others had filtered out of the room, staring absently at the ladder leading to the service hatch in the roof above. When we were alone, Torvaro said, I wanted to ask you something. Yes? When we were speaking with the Ayeta just now, there was a moment I was trying to help that poor girl the Sielsin mutilated. When he asked what we wanted out of all this, he said, and I felt a knife twist in my back, but kept my expression as blank and open as I could manage. Smythe told you that we wished for the Xenobites to stop preying on our colonies, but you, you said you wanted, what was it? Oratiri Vati Oru Sekori Yu Yaya. To see with eyes unclouded. He quoted me perfectly. Still I said nothing. Something flickered in the scoliast's patrician face. Amusement? Irritation? There ought to have been nothing at all. That disturbed me as much as anything I had seen that strange day, for it impressed upon me the strangeness of my circumstances, when even the scoliasts smiled. I have to ask that in future you hold to the Tribune's script and obey instruction. Did she ask you to have this conversation with me? I said. Apology. That was the name of the expression he bore. Embarrassment, even. It was subtly done, such that were I any other sort of man, I might have missed it, and thought Varro as expert in his mastery of emotion as any other of his order I have known. But I, who long have studied human faces and rendered them in ink and charcoal, saw the expression for what it was. She believed you would be more amenable to one of our order. I understand that once you wish to join us. In a voice pressed as dried flowers and without any warmth, I replied, That was a very long time ago. Yet you are not so old, I think. It's not the years, I answered. It's the light years. Was that a smile on the scoliest pointed face? Does Smythe know? That you said something you shouldn't have? Yes. But for what it's worth, I don't believe your actions endangered our mission in any way. The scolius crossed his arms. They were not the arms of an anemic scholar, but shaped by labors I couldn't guess at, and I wondered at the nature of his order. The Chalcenterites were then unknown to me, an obscure sect of the scolius tradition, given less than navel-gazing into the quiet study of the self and stars. Rather, they embodied their labors and moved through the world of living men. All scoliasts must work to maintain their colleges and monasteries. Being forbidden all technology, more sophisticated than electric lamp, they are condemned to toil, and yet Varro seemed more akin to the gladiators I have known than to the farmers and masons of the country. There is something I don't understand, he said. What's that, counsellor? Why are you here? he asked, and there was no confrontation in his tone that one might easily have heaped scorn upon such words. You, the son of a lord, you might have had any sort of life you chose. Why this peripatetic existence? I was quiet a long moment, chewing the inside of my cheek. The voiceless words I had heard in my dreams sounded in my mind, backing reflected images of the horrors I had been shown. This must be. But when I spoke it was not of visions. I could not have explained Brethren or Kalagar to Varro if I'd wanted to. And I didn't want to. I wanted to tell the truth even less. The truth was only that I had wanted to leave home out of a child's desire for adventure, because I had heard stories of Simeon the Red, of Kasaya Sulier, and Arsham, Prince of Jad, of Khan Sagara. How foolish he seemed, that other Hadrian, to have dreamed such dreams. Why are you here? I asked instead. You might have sought an appointment anywhere other than the legions. But here you are. It was a presumptuous question, but then so was Varro's. Varro didn't hesitate. I have a duty. To the Empire? To mankind. And you think I'm any different? Why? Because I grew up in a castle? I'll wager you did as well, to judge from the look of you. I'm here because it's the right thing to do, and because I can do something about it. The scoliast held his flinty eyes to mere slits as though he sought something in me he needed a microscope to see properly. In measured tones, he said, Smythe was right about you. You're an idealist. I wouldn't say that. I had heard enough. 
I sensed that Varro had said all that Smythe had tasked him to say, and that the rest of this was... What? A pleasantry? An inquiry? A warning? Oh? I turned to go, and so was made to turn back. I never said I could do it. Bring peace, or whatever it is we're here to do. I can only speak the truth. The truth? Ah. Varro shifted his posture, not quite looking at me any more. You need to speak our truth. Stick to the program, or you're no use. Your truth? I echoed, now turned fully back to face the Chow Centerite. Forgive me, Counselor, but I thought you were a scoliast. There is only one truth. I could hardly contain my surprise, my distaste. You may think it strange that I, who have lied a thousand, thousand times, might take issue with such a perspective. But he was a scoliast, a man of learning, of science, of philosophy, natural and unnatural. He should know better than to engage such sophistry. Varro dismissed this with the wave of a hand. These are difficult times, Lord Marlow, and ours is a difficult task. You should understand this. I've been over the records from the Emesh affair. I know your regard for truth. The shadow of something like my brother Crispin moved in me, and it was all I could do not to seize the scoliast by the tunic front. I backed off instead. Rage is blindness, I told myself, made to recall Imor's aphorism by the familiar green of Varro's clothes. I was a liar. I am a liar. I've no illusions about this. But I am a liar in the service of truth, or so I tell myself. In service of the good, which is the same thing. I had told my lies because they ennobled me, whereas lying in service to the Empire, to an empire that might sell its own people to the pale, such lies diminished me. I could explain none of this to Torvaro. At the time, I could not have explained it to myself. I knew only that my affront and instinct for rightness rebelled at his words, and I said, I do my duty. That is all we ask, he said. But I was enough the veteran of court on Emesh, and on Delos before that, to hear the words inside the words spoken. We will not ask again. Chapter 59 No Man an Island a day passed, and I have passed three days here without writing. The brothers and sisters of the cloister requested my help digging a new well inside the descended gate, and I, who have eaten off their board for some months now and squandered their ink, couldn't refuse. I mention this not to cry my virtue, but to demonstrate that even such as I, who am all alone now, am not wholly isolated. Some people believe that the painter who works his canvas is not an individual because he acquired his skills at the knee of some earlier master, that the soldier who stands before the enemy is not a hero but a pawn, and one of many. There is no truth to this. Each of us contains multitudes, but it is not that we are cells in the body of humankind. Rather, we are clay, shaped as the mountain is shaped, by the wind, the tramping foot, and the rain by the world. The mark of other hands is on us, but we are ourselves alone. One may be part of a community. One is an individual. They're not mutually exclusive. It is only that the soul, the self, should lead and our allegiances follow. To do otherwise, to be otherwise, is to make oneself a slave. Often, when we speak, it is with the breath of dead men. Yet we build ourselves on such tradition. We tell only the one story after all, over and over. Through us that dead air is lent new life, and we remember that we might one day understand. I remember it was difficult waiting on that ship, waiting on word from Sagara or Smythe. I had ferried over briefly from the obdurate to recover those of my effects which had been left behind when first I fled. I was remembering then. Have I said that what we perceive as darkness is only the chaos that came, without light's order, before creation itself? That is why we imagine anything might be lurking in the darkness. In the dark of my cabin on the Mistral I slept, or thought I slept, and dreamed, or thought I dreamed. What is the matter? 
Hadrian. The old, rasping voice filled my room like the sound of pages turning and the scruff of old leather. I pushed myself into a sitting position and drew my legs up under me. I had not felt the weight of the old man sitting at the foot of my cabin bed. But there he was, wild, grey hair standing on end, viridian robes tidy and brighter than the dim light of my chamber could account for. Tor Gibson sat stooped over his cane, leaning on it as the icon of wisdom leans upon his staff. He smiled and, reaching out, seized my wrist. Bad dreams, is it? I felt no warmth in those papery fingers, though the smile was like thin sunlight on a day of rain. That was strange in itself, for Gibson was a scoliast, and seldom smiled. This is a dream, I said. Another vision? The old man did not answer, grey eyes twinkling beneath beetling brows. He released my hand and looked away, staring through the darkness of my room at I knew not what. I just wish it were over. All this waiting. All these pieces on the board. Nothing great is created suddenly. Any more than a bunch of grapes or a fig, Gibson intoned, speaking in such a way that I knew he cited some ancient sage, though I knew not which one. Tell me you desire a fig, and I answer, these things take time. He rested his chin on the head of his cane. This is what you wanted to do, what you always trained to do, is it not? To sit across the table from the Cielsin to bring them to that table, and to speak. Well, yes. Then you have nothing to complain of, eh? He said. What is it you're always saying? Always forward, always down, and never left nor right. I don't think I had ever said that to Gibson in life, but then something need not have happened to be real. The wall of my cabin was cold against my back as I reclined watching the apparition watch me. I know, I know, but it's too much. It's difficult. The cane whistled around, slapped the bed near my knee. Quat! Gibson exclaimed, his favorite rebuke. Cribbed, I think, from the manuals of some old religion. It's difficult, is it? What made you think it would be otherwise? When I didn't answer, he pressed. You hope to reconcile mankind? With that other kind, the Cielsin, why should your burden be light? Often in dreams we cannot answer, and perhaps such a thing had happened to me. For I sat mute and, listening, heard, This is well. We are beasts of burden, Hadrian, we men. We struggle, and by that struggle are filled, and so define ourselves. That is the way. Seek hardship. I said, and saying it heard Brethren's voice behind me rising up, as it were, through the wall of my cabin. Seek. Hardship. So real was the sound of that voice and so sharp the threat of it that I lurched to my feet. The walls of my cabin vanished, and my bed, and Gibson stood in the middle of an unresolved black, certainly dreaming then. Gibson's eyes were sparkling, and once more he rested his cane on the ground between his slippered feet. The world is made and the self is made by the conjunction of opposites. Nature and culture breed civilization, men and women, children, protons and electrons, atoms, the ego and its shadow, the self, order and chaos, opportunity, and so on. What humanity in the Cielsin might bring forth by this process, who can say? A better world? I asked. Can it be done? That is the wrong question. I wore naught but a pair of trousers, and beneath that crushing dark I felt naked as a newborn, and it was all I could do to stand. Great figures moved unseen in the darkness, like the colossi whose massive feet tramped the battlegrounds of a hundred worlds. What is the right question? I asked, raising my arms. What am I to do? I'm walking a fine line with the Empire. Switch has betrayed me. And Jinan. I'd betrayed Jinan, but by the pity in the old Scoliast's eyes, he understood. And I didn't have to explain. And Khan Sagara? He could kill us all if he had a mind. My tutor raised a hand. 
he would not have summoned the Sielsin if he meant to destroy you. You may yet have your chance. Be patient. He was right. Panic avails nothing. It is not panic that will aid you. Fear is death to reason. And reason, death to fear. Gibson clenched his raised hand into a fist. These are clouds, Hadrian. These feelings. Move through them. When this is over, I began, unsteady, and half stumbled back toward the old man. When this is done, I will be at the Empire's mercy. Gibson's thick brows contracted. Is it over already? I'm sorry, I thought it was too much. He tapped his cane against the unseen floor. You have always been at the Empire's mercy, Adrian. We all are. That's the price we pay for civilization. The price I paid for you. Do you understand? Had I not said much the same thing to Vulcan not so long ago? Would you rather there were no Empire? Rather the C. Elsin pick us off one planet at a time? We could never organize to stop them. His eyes never left my face. You are not playing the game well enough. It's not a game, Gibson, I said with force. Of course I'm not playing. Of course it is a game, the Scoliast insisted. Everything is a game. But that does not mean the consequences are trivial. He stood, and I saw how tall he was. Taller than many of the Palatines I have known. How do you play a game, Hadrian? It was to be the questioning again, I saw. Quaestio disputata. Very well. I straightened my back, tucked my chin, and clasped my hands behind me. What game? Which game? And it hardly matters. The answer is the same. He did not walk as he had in life, shambling or shuffling, but stepped, as those in soft shoes are wont to do. Toe first, so that each step pointed his foot like a barb. He jounced his cane at me. Think, boy, think. Well, the answer was obvious. You follow the rules, whatever those may be, at least as far as you can. You bend them if you have to, break them if you must. You play your opponents off one another or work with them, whatever the game calls for. To what purpose? I sensed the trap, but not its shape and so reined in the way an outrider might ahead of his column, the horse frightened by the stink of men lying in ambush. But the question was itself a game, and there was no danger in it. To win. Gibson slapped my leg with his cane, as though he were a grandmother and I an unruly boy. Quads, he scowled. Winning. Nobody wins for long. You need something better. Better. I squeezed my wrist hard with the other hand. I had no idea. In life, perhaps, Gibson would have waited an eon to tell me. But Gibson was dead or gone beyond all knowledge, and this was only a kind of dream. Or perhaps a vision. You have to play like you mean to keep playing. You have to play in a way that protects yourself. He placed special emphasis on that word. Let it linger long enough. Like a slap that I might feel the next blow when it came. Who are you? I blinked. I am Hadrian Alexander Marlowe, the son of Alistair and Liliana. No! He jabbed his cane at me so that the brass tip bounced off my bare chest. Thus you were born. Who are you? Some other voice spoke for me. Ragged, malnourished, and afraid. Paid it said, and again more strongly. I am called Haid of Teucros, a Myrmidon. No! A different voice, like the first, but deeper, more strained. Hadrian Gibson. Then my father's voice sneering. Boy! My mother speaking in the light of her studio at Haspida. You are my son. Polino, grinning and concerned at once. Lad! Switch, who had been my friend. Haid! And there was Gen, your radiance, your radiance. Hadrian, 
Barbarian? That was Valka. Mia Cal, my captain, my Jinan, her voice breathless as so often I had heard it. Mia Cal, Hadrian. Hadrian, Hadrian! Gibson waved a hand, dispersed those voices like smoke. No! What then? I demanded, and approached him where he sketched his little circle about me in our unseen arena. Who am I? You are what is left when all of that... He gestured over his shoulder, as though all my names and the people who named me were smoke as well. Is gone. You are the part of you that survives these changes, the only part in his ship old Theseus could not replace. Was Theseus himself? Just so, Gibson said, and reaching out placed his hand upon my shoulder. Do you understand? I thought I did. Forget the escape, forget the Red Company. Let Switch and Jinan go. He shook his head once. A denial or only amusement? You have a duty and an aim. Aim! Without moving to do so, I sagged back onto the edge of my bed. I don't know how. Always forward, Gibson said, wringing his cane in both hands. You've only to keep pulling on the thread. Like Theseus, I asked, imagining the old Greek unspooling his thread as he wandered through the labyrinth, creeping in fear of the Minotaur. Just so. These, he waved a hand, other concerns of yours are distractions. A man may cup water in his hands, but only a few drops. He held one palm up to indicate his meaning. You are on the proper path. You have only to hold to it. My fingers tightened on the bedclothes. It's not so easy. The thread is tangled. You are making complications for yourself, tying the knot tighter. He turned his back, carried his cane behind him with the air of a professor at his lecturing, which I supposed he was. In Phrygia of old, King Midas lashed his father's cart to a post with a knot so tight and so complex that no man could undo it. And it was said that he who could untie it would one day rule all of Asia. For five hundred years men tried. Drovers, farmers, soldiers, the sons of the sons of Midas, none succeeded. I knew the story, but the familiar cadence of Gibson's voice was a comfort even in dream. I could almost see the dusty ox cart before me, lashed to a pillar of white stone. I mumbled the words even as Gibson spoke them. Until Alexander came. Until Alexander came his eyes on all of Persia and on the stranger lands beyond. For he had heard the prophecy, and being Alexander knew it spoke of him, and knowing this he was frustrated by failure, for the knot that Midas had tied in the ancient past was all the legend said and would not be undone. Long he struggled with the knot, knowing already that dominion was his destiny. He sought only for a sign, for fate to confirm what he knew was right. And because he knew he was to rule, he knew the knot only stood in his way, and so took up his sword. And cut the knot in two, I said, murmuring into the pillows. I do not know if it was a dream or an oracle such as the one which had led Midas to lash his father's cart to that pillar in the first place, I did know that when I awoke, Gibson was gone, and that I was alone. And yet, Gibson had been gone a long time already. Already I had lived my life without his tutelage, for almost as long as I had lived with it. And as I write this, those meager years we shared are as nothing next to the centuries I have counted. But Gibson is with me still, even in the solitude of this writing cell. Alone as I am, he is with me part of me now, as are all those we meet and who matter to us. A man is the sum of his memories, and more, he is the sum of all those others he has met.
and what he learned from them, and that is an encouraging thought, for that knowledge and those memories survive and are part of us through every storm and every little death. Chapter 60 The Pavilion Our column marched down a hall so wide that ten men might walk abreast and still leave room to either side. And that was just what we did. The Night Tribune had mobilized her first and second centuries of troops, and they followed on behind her and her high officers, Crossflain, Lynn, Greenlaw, and other lieutenants I could not name. Jeanan was there and her lieutenant, Hanas. There was the Cornison with his crystal clarion, and the Solifer with the Imperial Standard, red on white. There was the Imaginifer carrying the holograph likeness of his radiance on a staff, and the Sinifer bearing the Copper Eagle and cross swords of the 437th. Behind them came the Chiliarch and the Prime Centurion, with his Optio at his right hand, and behind them, each to a column, came the ten decades of the first century, Decurions, Triasters, and Legionnaires, a sea of red and white. The second century followed on, and we all passed between banks of Kansagara's Somms, the undead massed to either side, watching with sightless eyes, which light glowing through the slack skin of their faces. Some wore the khaki uniforms I had so often seen, though still others were naked, the black metal of their implants dull, indicator lights gleaming in flesh flush with fever. All of them were silent, their heads turning as they tracked our progress toward the looming arch. We were silent as well, leastways until the massive doors were opened, rising like the portcullis of some medieval castle in the deeps of time. Then the horn blast blew, and the men of the Solon Empire cried out in one voice, Earth, they cried, invoking the mother goddess, Earth. And I who did not pray, who did not believe, cried out with them, Earth. The sons of men had come, but come where? As the gate went up, a white gold light streamed out, throwing our shadows back against the blackness of Khan's demiurge. I had expected to return to the Hall of Blue Candles, or to some place very like it, dark and dismal. Instead, I thought I'd gone insane. How it was possible, I cannot say, but we had returned to the garden again. Or so it seemed, for there was the river, the rolling hills ringed by forest beneath a roof of natural stone. There the lonely tree on the central hill beneath, which I'd first glimpsed young Wren and found the still warm tea kettle. I would have wagered that the prayer cards hanging from the branches were the same as well, would have sworn it before an imperial tribunal. But that wasn't possible. Could not be possible. I told myself it was only like that other garden, that Khan so loved his garden on Vorgosos that he had replicated it in this massive space at the heart of his ship. For there was a great opening in the roof above us, a mighty window of alum glass beyond which shone the innumerable stars and was that the ice castle of the Sielsen shining there? I faltered in our march, squinting up at the massive shape shining in the distance, glittering in the starlight. Beautiful and terrible as the storm, the man behind me jostled me, and I continued on. Ahead, beneath the branches of that mighty central tree overlooking the sea of grass, someone had erected a pavilion of striped black and cloth of gold. The Sielsen had already arrived, and on the far side of the hill I beheld... Two hundred of their own screamers in black robes and blue, and marveled at the coincidence that had so opposed their colouring to our own. Red and white, blue and black, fire and water, earth and air, and there was Khan Sagara. Gold beneath that golden canopy, and beside him the looming Goliath shape of Prince Aranata, with the light of a dozen blue eyes gleaming beneath the hanging fabric. That's far enough. Sagara's voice came from everywhere. Your soldiers can stay by the tree line. Smythe quieted Bassander's objections and passed the orders back. Stripped of our entourage, with even the lieutenant's order to hang back, there were but six of us who climbed the hill to the pavilion beneath the tree. Smythe and Crossflane, Bassander and Jinan, Torvaro and myself. We took our seats at one table, facing a table opposite where sat Prince Aranata, his son Nobuta, and the herald, 
O Alicom. At one hand stood the naked slave girl, her chain tied to the Xenobite's ceremonial staff, which stood thrust into the loam. Tanaran too was there, it having been arranged that the Baitan should be brought to its master for these negotiations and return to our custody afterward. Between our two sides sat Khan Sagara, not on his throne, but with his back against the bowl of the tree, as though he were the Sid Arthur. His children sat beside him, Ren and Suzuha, neither looking like they understood why they were there, neither able to leave. At length Sagara spoke, lips not moving, human eyes staring at something on the rich carpet between our two tables. Here is something I've not seen in fifteen thousand years of living. Not since the machines of old has man known an enemy such as this. His drifting eyes turned to regard the Sielsen at their table. And not since before the time of those same machines has mankind sought peace with enemies other than herself. History does not happen every day, even to me. His flesh eyes moved then, taking in the six of us humans seated at our table. As he spoke, the slave girl translated, syllables harsh and hacked off, brittle as old iron. When the first silence came, Rain Smythe stood and addressed her Sielsen counterpart. Prince Aranata, thank you for coming. We hope this meeting will allow our people and yours to come to some greater understanding of one another, that we might put an end to this war and forestall future violence. She had never seemed taller, standing there both hands' fists where she leaned against the tabletop. Taking this for some human custom to be mirrored, Prince Aranata stood as well, hands on the table. The Xenobite was so tall that, even stooped, his high-horned crown brushed against the cloth of gold canopy. In a voice deep and cold as the cracking of glaciers, he said, Your people have claimed six and fifty of our clans in the last nine hundred years. It took me a moment to realize that surely it meant their years, not ours, for our figure was less than half that total. Varro made a murmured note of this as he translated at Smythe's ear. But you talk of submission, of an end to fighting. What has changed? Its massive eyes, shielded, I guessed from the bright light of the pavilion by contact lenses, searched each of our faces in turn. Yadoretolu, dituo. Kilemne? Why seek peace now? Why submit? We didn't have the opportunity before, Barrow answered in the Xenobite's own language. Or the leverage, I thought, glancing to Tanaran. The Baitan kept its head bowed, as did the Herald. Oalicom, listening but trying to remain unnoticed, as though each creature were but a part of the furniture. I have observed such behavior in the junior ministers of many a Palatine court. Though in the Sielsin, I think the behavior was the more extreme. Human beings have their hierarchies, as is only proper and inescapable. But in us, it has always seemed to me such deference was built on respect, on the competency of individuals, and their mutual support. But I sensed in these creatures only the morality of the wolf, that if Tanaran or the other were to challenge Aranata, the great chieftain would kill them in an instant and make the other lick his heel. In men such tyrants are always destroyed. We little tolerate such demons in ourselves. In the Sielsen, it seemed, such tyrants thrived. I shoved this thought away and listened as Varro continued, speaking from a prepared statement he must have memorized. His Sielsen language was more than perfect. In four hundred years of combat we have never had clear dialogue with your kind nor taken any prisoner of rank. Here he paused to indicate Kasantora Tanaran Ayakato. Our encounter at Tamnikano, which we call Emesh, has provided us our first opportunity to open such a dialogue. It is our hope and intention that from these conversations we can arrive at a lasting and equitable peace between the Itani Otiolo, your clan, and the Solon Empire. We are prepared to offer a complete and immediate cessation of hostilities between our legions and your clan, provided that you cease all raids against our colony worlds. He continued in this vein for another minute or so, outlining the details of such expectations, while all the while Smythe stood serenely by, 
nodding along as if she understood the alien words. When Torvaro had finished, Prince Saranata jerked its head sideways in the affirmative. Olo, he said, signaling that he understood us. He drew his cape around himself again and settled into his seat. The silver chains and platinum that decorated his crest and high forehead swaying as he moved. But tell me, do you know how many Tiatari I have? How many Skahari? How many mouths that is between them? He asked these being the words for worker and soldier, respectively. Twenty-eight millions, on this and my other ships. Less than half this number did I take from Utahera when I conquered him. That was only sixteen hundred years ago, twenty-eight millions. How am I to feed such a number? Your colonies sustain us, help us grow. What would you have me do? I will not let my people starve for the sake of you vermin. I felt my eyes wandering to the mutilated slave girl where she stood, nearly catatonic, beside the table. We would be open to trade negotiations with your people. Meat and cattle could be procured, to whatever specifications you require, Smythe said when this was translated. We have technologies capable of producing food from raw matter, should it come to it. Your people will not starve. The slave girl seemed to struggle with translating this and I saw something like an emotion strain behind her eyes. It was only fear, the emotion she knew best. Arenata's head turned to regard her. I thought, the way one regards a faulty comms terminal, or light switch. At last, she said, Delu kami, nio diu hayu. Raji theory. Raji theory, whoa! Arenata practically rocked to his feet. Trade! What do you take me for? Do you think it is a Manunatari you are dealing with? To a credit, Rain Smythe had not blinked through this outburst and the whirl of motion that accompanied it. She had stood her ground, with all the implacable solidity one expected of an Imperial soldier. Manunatari, Varro echoed, looking to me for guidance. Merchant, I said, though I didn't understand why the term should inspire such venom. I was spared the need to speculate by Nabuta, who said, My father is not some air merchant, Yukajim. The big Sielsen lay a hand on its child's shoulder to calm it, but said nothing. The look on their chalk-colored faces. Lower teeth bared, brows pinched above black eyes the size of fists. I thought it must be discussed, though even I cannot say with certainty what lay behind those mask-like faces. Still, I thought I saw. They're saying they are not merchants. I said, we've given offence. I turned my eyes to Khan, but the undying might have been a latter-day sculpture of iron and paper where he sat unmoved, his fleshly eyes closed. Is that right? Khan had given the Ayeta a gift in return for its visit. That had been a kind of trade, but the semantics were different, unequal. Khan had flattered the Ayeta in giving it a gift, the way a merchant gives a queen a bright gem in tribute. Tribute. The Sielsen, it seemed, had no concept of a non-zero-sum game. It wasn't enough that one party might gain. The mere act of giving suggested the giver lost. One blue eye spied me and drifted down, describing an arc that took in the six of us at our table. But it didn't speak. I leaned across Bassander to Varro and said, It's as though you offered to trade the Emperor your boots for his velvet slippers. The Chalcenterite raised one eyebrow either not appreciating the analogy or merely urging me forward. Struck by a thought, I continued in classical English, certain that the girl would not understand and so could not translate. He thinks trade beneath him. As I spoke, Smythe was placating the Xenobites, relying on the slave to translate her words. Think about what Sagara did, offering him a gift. The Ayeta sees us as beneath him. I imagined he's used to getting his way. I tried not to think of the depravities implied by the Xenobites' culture of extreme ownership. I felt the same queasy dread I had known in the office of Antonius Brevin, seeing the homunculus he had made for himself. Varro stroked his chin. He may have to get used to disappointment. Quickly he explained what had passed between us to Smythe, who, speaking loudly, so the translator might hear her, said, A gift, then. Tribute, I thought. It would not be the first time civilization paid to keep the barbarians from its gates. But paying in meat? 
a sacrifice of that oldest sort? What would it take to end the raids? Smythe asked. What is it you need? Need, Aranata repeated. Da camine? The Aeta grew quiet a moment and a breeze groaned across the pavilion, doubtless generated by some shaft that ran through the demiurge like some inhuman throat. The branches of the trees swayed, prayer cards rattling above our heads. At once, I felt acutely conscious of the Sielsin warriors standing away and below our pavilion, all in their painted masks, swords held at the ready, and ready too were their Nahuti, the seeker drones like flying serpents I had seen put to so much terrible use in the blackness beneath Kalagar. Yusam Natowo, Aranata intoned, and the others all repeated him. Yusam Natowo. We must survive. It had the weight of prayer, of the sort of aphorism I myself employed. Do you need settlement? Smythe asked. A world could be found, near to the spaceways, but remote. You would have us penned? Oalicom hissed. We do not submit. But it had spoken out of turn, and snarling, Aranata struck it with an elbow. The herald yelped, clutching its face as it cowered away from its master, who said, What world could keep us? Sevatayu is gone. Our earth is gone. We do not walk the surface like your kind, like beasts. And we will not take your leavings like a slave. You are not our masters to grant us favors. That's not a helpful answer, Bassander muttered, and privately I agreed with him. Yedara tudo, o fusuem, shidu ti koarin tashi, Tanaran said suddenly raising its eyes from its fervent investigation of the tabletop. There was something in the tone of its voice, in the stilted way it said the words. We seek for ourselves a new world. Tanaram was a sort of priest, young as it was, and the words had the weight of scripture. We have been watched from the dawn since the days of the long tooth, when Sulan hunted us in the dark. Yaya to, the Siausen said together. Even Aranata hung its head and to the side I heard Khan Sagara chuckle. What is going on? Jinan breathed. We have been watched through our infancy when the great carved cities in the bowels of the world. Yaya to, the Sielsen intoned. Where the air was poison, they showed us the sky. Yaya to. When the earth was poison, they showed us new ones. Yaya to. But the new worlds were not as the old, and we could not live upon them. The light of the stars was a poison greater than any we had made at home. Do you understand? It was a moment before I realized that Tanaran had addressed the question to me. I wasn't sure that I did understand, but in their own language I said, You evolved underground. We know this, but you cannot live above it. Tanaran, Aranata warned. Varro murmured a translation to Smythe and said, Should I stop him? The Sielsen had evolved below ground in cave warrens and tunnels left by the quiet, if such a thing were to be believed. Perhaps it was only the rock above that had shielded them from the poison and the bitter radiations of the universe. All the blackness of space seemed to open before me and I was conscious of where we were, lost in the naked emptiness that stretched between the pages of every map, with only the thin hull of Khan's demiurge about us. Struck by a notion, I leaned toward Varro and, switching back to classical English, so as not to be understood by the slave translator, whispered, The Sielsen ships aren't ray-shielded. They're using all that ice as insulation against... I waved a hand just above the tabletop. Everything. Radiation shielding, Varro repeated. You're certain they don't have it? Of course I'm not certain, I said in answer. But another image returned to me. A Sielsen combat helmet taken off a screamer tortured in the black beneath Kalagar beneath the memory of screaming, and the way the nerve disruptor buzzed in my hand. I recalled the antique gasket that had fastened the suit's helmet to its neck, not unlike the technology of our own primitive suits from before the Foundation War. But if I'm right, it could prove a powerful bargaining chip. Assuming, of course, the Sielsen could understand something as simple as a bargaining chip. Nietu jidene? Aranata's deep voice cut through my whispers. Turning to his slave girl, he said again, What are they saying, wretch? Sensing some horror coming and fearing for the poor girl, 
I stood and speaking more to Tanaran than its prince, I said, Peace, please. I wished Valka were present, wished she were not locked away aboard the Mistral with the rest of my friends. There was much I didn't understand. Much I didn't know. Why should the Sea Elsin worship, as gods, the very creatures who had shown me a vision of the Sea Elsin destroyed? I shoved this aside. Are we not here for the same reason? I looked from my party to theirs. Neither of us wants our people to die. The silence that followed stretched perhaps ten agonizing seconds before Smythe politely said, Please sit down, Lord Marlowe. I did, not feeling in the least bit sheepish. The slave girl had been entirely forgotten for my interference, and so any embarrassment I might have felt was worth it. Where the conversation turned next I cannot say, for I don't remember. Thoughts of the Sealsen consumed me. Tanaran's religious cant, and the references to the quiet, the watchers, combined with the shadow of what followed have come to cloud my memory. Sometimes I envy the scoliasts, whose recollections never fade, though at other times I rather envy the aged, those denizens of the sanitariums for whom the past is a foreign country. To forget, to unsee what I have seen. That was the first of many meetings, many days, and they grew only darker and murkier. Chapter 61 Valka Again The Mistral's airlock cycled closed behind me, and I sagged against the bulkhead, exhausted. Through the heavy metal I could make out the sound of my escort's retreating feet. Still a prisoner, I reminded myself, and allowed myself to slip to the floor. Three days of talks, of politics, with little sleep, and it had been going badly. It is not easy to make concessions to someone who cannot trade. Human interactions are based on trade. You cannot maintain a relationship with your fellow man elsewise. But the Sielsen evolved differently. They were apex predators, or nearly so. Predators do not reciprocate. That's what makes them predators. Prince Aranata was pleased enough to accept gifts, but balked at reciprocity. We couldn't make him understand that a peace meant an end to the raids against our colonies. You would have us starve, he insisted, as if it could not uncouple the thought of eating from conquest. The tigress is not evil, or so the saying goes. She is only hungry. She is only following her nature. Was it not so with the Sielsen? Was it not their nature to hunt? Were they not only hungry? They say that only men are evil, that only men kill for principle or sport, that only men inflict suffering for the sake of suffering. I, who am old, cannot help but think that the creature which kills, which consumes by its nature, is more evil than that which kills by its principles. The tigress has no choice. It cannot be reasoned with. The sea elsen are the same. If there existed no possibility of understanding, what hope was there for reconciliation? If one cannot domesticate the tigress, if one cannot make her change her stripes, what is one to do besides shoot her? After a long while, I stood, mindful of the deep quiet of the ship, funereal but for sound of the ventilation systems. With the ship impounded, her drive cores were down, and what power she drew she took from the demiurge to whom she was bracketed. Walking the halls, I realized I'd never seen her so empty, with all but a dozen crewmen locked in icy fugue. Corvo had been given orders to stay the decanting of her people for a few days. Our dialogue with the pale was strained, but not so strained as that. Possessed by that archdemon's sleep, I made my way from the airlock and out into the hall beneath the canopy of captured battle flags, crossing the width of the mistral toward the starboard dormitories. I rounded the corner keeping one hand on the padded wall. The door to the starboard gallery stood open, and through the round arch I saw a lonely figure sitting at a table, the shape of her frame by the hard edges of the windows, curving lines against square. I hung there a moment, unaware of the smile on my face. Valka looked around, perhaps sensing some change in the light from where I stood in the doorway. Her eyes stood out in the gloomy light of the gallery, and she set aside the book she'd been reading as she smiled, what? It's nothing, I said, stepping into the room. I just escaped another round of talks. Escaped? Valka repeated the word, 
shifting sideways so that she looked up at me from her place on the couch. It was my turn to say. What? The Tavrosi woman seemed to roll her words in her mouth as though they were some strange morsel, and she said, You've wanted this so long as I've known you, and now you have what you want, and you're unhappy. She shook her head. Tis funny. What is to be done with you? Moving past her to stand by the windows at the demiurge outside, I answered. I think Smythe and Bassander are asking themselves that same question. Are you afraid? No, I said and found that it was true. I wasn't afraid, though the weight on my shoulders had never been heavier. Not for myself, at any rate. She made a small sound, agreeing, and I heard her stand behind me. Any changes? I had been sharing progress with her each night when I returned from Khan's pavilion beneath the tree. Once I'd spent another long series of hours in consultation with the Night Tribune and her people. Not really, I said. Smythe's not put ray shielding on the table, and I'd swear that's about the only thing that could get through Arenata's thick skull. I banged a fist against the window frame, but when I spoke again my voice was level as still water. I don't understand how they think, Barker. She stood beside me then, the both of us looking out at the gothic fractal of the demiurge where it stretched out into the unending dark. I was aware, acutely aware, of how close she stood to me. Had she always stood so near? A scent of sandalwood hung on the air. Not a perfume. She had no time for such things. But after the awful smell in Khan's dungeon, it stuck out like a rose in the desert. "'Twas never going to be easy, she said and crossed her arms. I know that, I said. It's like trying to communicate with an animal. I can make myself understood, but I'm never really quite sure they take my full meaning. I pressed my forehead to the glass. It's like they understand one word in twelve, even when I use their words. Pivoting, Valka put one shoulder against the window. I could almost see her smile, but I shut my eyes instead. You're surprised? You should know as well as I that our languages are rooted in our brains, which were shaped by Earth's environment. That the Cielsian look like us and speak is a coincidence. Surely you've noticed. The only places where we fully understand one another are where the language refers to material things, objects, and actions. I twisted my head to look at her, at the small lines that formed against the border of her smile. Things stronger than our words for them. What? The flash of white teeth. A wrinkling of the eyes. Gravity, fire, stone, you know. I slapped the window with my hand. Things that exist if we did not. Not things like hope or love or exchange. Valka twitched, and I could sense she was about to try and score a point. I guessed what she was about to say, but let her say it anyway. I thought you believed in truth, she said, putting special emphasis on the word, so that I knew she meant it after the fashion of the priests and magi. I do. I did. I turned back to the window, retreated a step. Of course I do but I'm not sure it isn't human truth that gives words like hope and love meaning. The Scolias say that living in accordance with the truth means living in accordance with our nature. You and I can have an argument about what the nature is, but I think that we can both agree that whatever else is true, the Cielsin have a different nature entirely. I laughed. Maybe they are demons. Still in pursuit of that point, she looked to score. Valka said, so there are two truths, ours and theirs, because there are two natures at play. I thought of what Varro had told me about sticking to the official story, to use the Empire's truth, which was itself a lie. Repeating myself, I said, No, and took another step back away from her and the window. There is only one truth, that our nature and theirs don't align. And you... What? Valka turned her back on the black ship out the window behind her. The staring iron statues that lined its ramparts stared over her shoulder with hollow, pitted eyes. I shivered and closed my own eyes. If I can't make us understood, I felt myself sway where I stood and steadied myself as one who stands in a canoe. Then all of this will have been for nothing, and we return to the way things were before. 
I took another step back and found myself resting against the arm of the couch. Are we? I gestured up at the air around us, indicating whatever cameras might be listening. Valka cocked one eyebrow and the door to the gallery closed with a metallic glide, locks clicking into place. We are now, she said, and frowned. What's the matter with you? You've gone whiter than usual. Suddenly self-conscious, I drew my coat up and around myself as though I might vanish beneath the assault of those eyes. As though they were the eyes of an entire legion, or of some goddess in judgment remote and cold as stars. They were no such thing, of course. They were only Valka's eyes. And we were alone. It's my visions. I said, and trying failed to crush my shame like a serpent beneath my heel. I kept seeing her face as I had seen it at Kalagar, when I'd first tried to tell her what it was I'd seen. I never wanted to see that face again. They show us at war. They show me at war. Planets burning and everything. I'd not told her that I'd seen my own headless body thrown down or how many times I'd seen the end of me. They said it must be. The war must be. I just... I don't understand, Valka. I don't understand. Does that mean we fail here? Does that mean we should fail? Do we even have a choice? I rubbed my face with both hands. I wish we'd been able to get more out of Tanneran too. It's clear they worship the quiet, but why? What do they know? I can't just ask with Smythe and Torvaro right there. What am I supposed to do? Why are you smiling? Breathe, Adrian she said, tossing her head in. Laughter? Irritation? Why was she so difficult to read? Just breathe. One thing at a time. You're looking at it too much. I massaged the back of my neck, rolling my head around. You sound just like Gibson. He said to just... I pointed inarticulately with one hand, miming forward. Keep going to keep my eyes on the task at hand. Gibson? Valka's face darkened. I thought he was dead. Likely, I said, and remembering that I'd only seen him in a dream, I looked away. It was a long time ago. It's stuck with me, is all. I tried to scrub the tiredness from my eyes, but it wouldn't come out. I just wish you could be there. I wish it were us doing the talking, not these soldiers and bureaucrats. If Switch hadn't hadn't betrayed me. But still, I could not say it. Still, I could not believe. Valka only watched me, lips pressed together. Silhouetted as she was against the window and the shape of the demiurge beyond it, she seemed almost one of Khan's statues herself, face in shadow. The slight and curving form of her stirred the artist in me, or might have done were it not for the shadow resting heavily on my heart. Hadrian? There was something in her tone I hadn't heard there before, but I didn't notice it at the time. I was still speaking. I just... I just want it done. I don't understand how I got here or what I think I'm doing. I don't understand the Cielsin, and I don't know how to make them understand me, or how the quiet fits into this. Smythe doesn't trust me. And why should she? And I've lost Switch. I've lost Jean-Anne. But Sander would kill me in a second if he had his way, and maybe he's right. Maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I should have stayed on Emesh and let Anias Mataro have her way with me. I was rambling and I knew it. And knowing it, was ashamed. I hung my head so as not to see Valka, as if in doing so I might not be seen by her and be judged for my insufficiency, my humanity. Am I a good man? I didn't even know. I had forgotten that she had once asked me that very question. But she, who forgot nothing replied with my own words. I think the fact you are asking that question is a good sign. I was a long time recognizing my own words, and a longer time recalling that day in the bazaar aboard the Enigma of Hours. When I did, I snorted. While still I was shaking my head, she added, Of course you're good. Or you try to be. And in a voice smaller still, You're good to me. How was I to respond to that? I never thanked you, she said, tone oddly muffled, for trying to defend me from Calvert, for everything. I thought you didn't like being defended, I asked, too sharply. 
A dram of Valka's usual biting quality returned to her sharp-edged voice, and she said, I don't like anyone fighting my battles for me. I never said I didn't like help. But it's more than that. It... you took care of me. In the cell. You're... you're always kind. I looked up, as surprised by the delicate tremulousness in Valka's voice as I might have been if a bird had flown through the vacuum of space to perch upon the sill of our window. Quite astonished, I replied, I'm not. You are, she said more forcefully, more than I deserve, the way I've treated you. You've never done anything wrong, I said reassuringly, forgiving the slights and insults, the disbelief and petty misunderstanding. I was sure that I had not always been kind to her, whatever she said. She didn't argue with me, and that was a kind of miracle in itself. Thus we both agreed to lie to one another, or else to embed those lies in some other, higher truth, just as the future is embedded in the now, in that moment. I don't know if it is good what we are doing, Valka said, but I know we have to try. She leaned against the window pane, fidgeting unsure just what to do with her hands. Do you know, I didn't know why I stayed here so long. After Emesh, I mean. She almost laughed. I'm not a soldier anymore. I don't want to be one. Fighting Calvert in that laboratory, it is not who I want to be. I should have left a long time ago. After Pharos, maybe earlier? But I didn't. She did laugh then, weakly almost shyly. I'm a scientist. I should be back at my dig site, on Emesh, or until the next one, not... not here. Into the momentary silence I asked, Do you want to go? You're Tavrosi. Smythe wouldn't stop you. Being a demarchist, Valka was accorded all the rights of a foreign diplomat. Political immunity, freedom of travel. She could leave. She could always have left but she hadn't. She pushed off from the window, seemed to hesitate on the spot between it and where I leaned against the couch. No, I... It was her turn to look away. There's still a chance I can learn more here than I could anywhere else. The Cielsin know things we don't. About the quiet, I mean. I can't guarantee you'll learn from them. Not any more. Not with the legions taking control of the conversation. I don't stand a chance. The next words I spoke cost me dearly, but wanted saying all the same. I wouldn't blame you if you went. This isn't what you signed up for. Then again, I'm not sure it's what I signed up for either. But I mean to see it through, just like Gibson would want. Half-seated as I was, she was almost taller than I. Still, she didn't look at me, and I imagined curiosity vying with her hatred of the Empire behind those artificial eyes. She never seemed small to me though I suppose she was, shorter than I by a head and shaped as if from soapstone. They might kill you, Valka said. It's possible, I said. I betrayed the Empire. Smythe's protection has gotten me this far, but if these talks fail... My voice shrank away to nothing as a spark vanishes in the winter air. The woman rubbed the clan intaglio on her arm. After a moment she said lamely, I don't want you to die. A small and bitter laugh escaped me, and I said, Neither do I. It's only Bassander I'm worried about, but he would never do anything without the Night Tribune's orders. Only after had I spoken did I realize the words were meant more to reassure myself than anything. Besides, the situation's not hopeless. Not yet. I could hear Gibson admonishing me in my head, and continued, It's only been a few days. I'd be a fool if I expected two species to reconcile their differences in a few days. I was a fool to think it could be otherwise. You really think Captain Lin would kill you? He told me as much, I said and managed a strained smile. There had been places, little pools spinning off the rivers of light I had seen where Bassander killed me. Places where he chased me down an echoing corridor, white banners all around and planted a shot in my back. Do you think these visions are real? that what Brethren said is true. Really. Back in the Mistral again in the waking world, away from the cold and the nightmare of Vorgosos, it seemed almost I could ignore what I had seen. 
if only the looming mass of the Demiurge, with its buttress spires and legions of black statues, would go away. They would take the last of that nightmare with me. There was a shadow on Volker's face, a glimmer of the old scorn. She let out a weighty sigh, eyes wandering the panelled ceiling, taking in I knew not what. Hadrian? I don't know. I don't think you're lying, if that's what you mean. No, it's not that. It's... But I could not tell her about what I had seen. Understand, it is not that there was some compulsion in me, such as that which animated poor Naya. Nothing brethren or the quiet themselves had placed there. It was only fear. Fear and a kind of truly primitive superstition that I, speaking of the deaths I had seen for myself in my vision, might make them real. By keeping silent, I imagined that I might banish the black memory as most nightmares are banished by the sun. I don't want them to be true. I don't. I didn't have time to think. Valka stepped forward again and seized me by the shirt front with one hand, and I realized my soapstone impression of her had been an illusion, a mistake. Our lives can change at any moment, but they change so drastically, only a few times. Valka pressed her lips to mine and pressed me back against the couch so that almost I might have tipped backward, and her on top of me, had I not found my feet. Had I not seized her by the shoulders and held her at bay. Valka, I... Are you sure? She did not answer, but kissed me again. The strength went out of my hands and she pulled me to her. I forgot time for a moment, forgot the many futures I had seen, the bright ones and the dark ones, and the ones in between. I forgot the past. Forgot my childhood on Delos, my suffering on Emesh, Caligar and Vorgosos, Pharos and Rustum, Gilliam and Uvanari, Jinan and Switch. All fell and faded in that feminine dark. I forgot to breathe, and she pulled away, pressed her forehead to mine. Listen, she said, you're not going to die. I'm not going to let you. Breathless, I believed her. Chapter 62 The Limits of Reason The memory of the previous day's work hung thick on me. Wind strained through the branches of that aged and mighty tree, tugging at the roof of the pavilion and making the ropes that secured it snap as though we were aboard some sailing ship lost in the middle of a wood. We might consider limiting their campaigns to the Norman territories, Varro suggested in muttered tones. Crossflane had frowned. Are you sure they could make that distinction? They hadn't noticed that the Sielsin already were making that distinction, referring only to we Solans as Yukajim, an exempting Khan. If they could distinguish between the extra Salarian king and ourselves, it stood to reason they could as easily mark the empire from its Norman counterparts. But the memory of Valka's kiss still moved in me, and even if it had not, I would never have proposed so viciously calculated a posture. We're not at war with the Normans, I said, and I mislike the thought of using the Sielsen to single out foreign powers, Jinan added who of course represented a foreign power. Smythe took this all in with a waved hand, indicating the arrival of the Sielsen contingent at the far tree line. Khan's eye drones hurried away to corral his children from where they'd wandered down to the river. We had not, in the end, offered the Sielsen free range of the Norman freeholds. I'd had another idea. Prince Aranata, let me be clear about one thing, Rain Smythe said pointedly once the Xenobites were all present. This is not a war you will win. When the Sielsin bulked, she asked, How many fighters have you? Two hundred thousand? Half that? I wondered if the prince's delay were not an admission that the number was very much lower than that. My legion numbers twenty thousand alone, and we have thousands of them. She made my play then, and placed a projector on the table before her. An image of the galaxy sprouted in the air before us, detailing the spiral arms. We're here, she said, and a point glowed red near where the Norma arm brushed against the bulge of galactic center. And here is everywhere your people have attacked us. Orange points flared, 
in a tight cluster against the white stars, stretching across the whole veil of Marinus. Hundreds of worlds, thousands, billions of lives. Here is our domain. The entire empire glowed then, highlighted a friendly blue with green areas demarcating the principalities of Jad, the Lothrian Commonwealth, the Durantine Republic, Demarchy of Tavros, and a dozen, dozen smaller human polities that stretch from the Perseus arm at our galaxy's edge to that same narrow place in Norma where the fighting was thickest. Billions of stars, tens of thousands of worlds, untold trillions of lives. I could see what I thought was shock in the Aeta's face. Horror. And I knew my planet had teeth. The Cielsin were predators, so we treat them like predators. We teach them humility. It might just be possible to shame them into a peace. To subordinate them, without bloodshed. Uvanari had surrendered on Emesh because it was beaten. It had been amenable to our demands because it was in our power. Impressed by our power. If the only language the Cielsin truly understood was power, then we would speak the language of power. So many, the prince said, voice thin and far away. He bridled almost at once. We will not bend to you. We will not be slaves to Yukajim. There really was no middle ground, it seemed. One was either master or slave. There was no partnership, no friendship. The concept of equanimity itself seemed as alien to the Cielsin as they were to us. Not slaves, I said pointedly speaking Galstani for my companion's benefit, and allowing the slave to translate for the pale. Ignoring the pointed looks from Smythe and Crossflane, I pressed on. Neutral equals. We simply end the fighting between us. Aranata's lips peeled back over glassy teeth. Neutral, it said, repeating the word as though he had never heard it. There is no such thing. We would be your puppets. I pressed my lips together, remembering the discussion from mere minutes before about using the Cielsin to target the Normans in our ever-expanding conquest of the Vale. I was spared the necessity of responding by Smythe, who offered, You would be left to your own devices. We would help one another. Serve one another? Aranata's face wrinkled. Degeneracy. The word he'd used, serve, suggested something more personal than a mere diplomatic relationship. We were talking past each other, each using words the other party didn't fully understand. Smythe wrapped her knuckles against the tabletop. Frustration evident, but perhaps meaningless to the Xenobites opposite us. An arrangement could be found that's mutually beneficial. The slave translator struggled with mutually beneficial for more than a minute. Through the stammering and the babble I caught the word serve again. To serve. To give anything was to serve the receiver, and the Aeta only take. There is no reciprocity, no obligation, no noblesse oblige among the pale. Only power, and those too weak to hold it. Oppressor and oppressed. Finally, the slave girl said, We could find a way to service one another. Aranata hissed like a bushel of snakes and lashed out, striking the slave girl on the flank. His talons tore her flesh and she fell, gasping, clutching at her side. I was near the edge of the table and rushed to help her, ignoring both Crossflane's command to halt and the sudden tension that rippled through the Cielsin line. I didn't know what I was doing, only that I couldn't stand by. I had no bandages, no medical expertise, but some instinct moved me. Aranata pushed himself to his feet. Service, he spat. The word carried clear sexual overtones things I didn't understand. We will not be your slaves. I will not. The girl wasn't bleeding badly. For all the force of his blow, the prince had pulled his talons, and the wounds were little more than scratches. I helped her to sit up, careful not to look at her ruined, spidery hands, or the way they poured uselessly at her wounded side. She was so light, it felt like lifting driftwood and insubstantial that I half expected her to float away in my hands. Nabuta wailed. No! Get away! She's mine! It said, and yanked the chain. I caught the silver thread in my fist, years of strength refined in Emesh's heavy gravity held fast, 
and I didn't flinch, but glowered up at the alien child with flinty eyes. It quailed. Not releasing the chain, I asked the girl, Are you all right? She did not answer. Perhaps she could not. Her eyes. Listener, her eyes. They were like deep pools, mirrors reflecting. Nothing. What light had been in them at birth was long quenched, and she only murmured my words back at me in the Sielsing tongue. Are you all right? Those eyes found mine, and for a moment I sensed the faintest, quiet spark in them. A lonely cinder hidden in the ash of a long dead fire. She wasn't the woman from my vision. But then Aranata was not the dark lord I had seen. One of her ruined hands found mine, two long fingers struggling to close. In a faint voice, dry as old leaves, she murmured two words, I have never forgotten. So small were they. I strained to hear them. But hear them I did. Kill me, she said. It was the only time I heard her speak the tongues of men. Horrified, I yanked my hand away. The spark in her went out. Nobuta yanked the chain again and I pulled. The little Sielsin came half out of its chair and let the chain go. A cry of surprise and pain escaped the Xenobite, and rough hands seized me. I was pulled unceremoniously to my feet, felt the needle-point prick of talons on my shoulders and arms. Two of Aranata's men held me, forced my arms behind my back. Smythe was shouting for my release. One of the guards seized me by the hair, forced me to look up. I thrust out my chin, straining against my guards. These Sielsin were not weak as the child had been, and I couldn't escape. Aranata stood in a rush, horned bulk towering over me. One massive hand seized me by my tunic front, and the prince hissed, Apologize. I did no such thing, fists clenched behind my back. Prince Aranata's hand slid upward, overlong fingers closing around my throat. I said, Apologize. I glanced at Nabuta Otiolo. The herald of Wallacom had helped the child back to its seat, and it was watching me with eyes deeper and darker than, but just as lifeless as, the eyes of the slave girl. I clamped my jaw shut, knowing that to apologize was to lose the argument, to lose face in these debates. The wine of plasma burners being primed filled the pavilion, and glancing to one side I saw Smythe's guards had turned weapons on the pale. As if from very far away I heard the sound of Khan Sagara's laughter. What a farce, he said, voice shaking the very air. Release Lord Marlow, my prince, and you, Knight Tribune, order your men to put down their arms. There will be no violence here. One of Khan's eyes slid in an arc to glower at Aranata from over my shoulder. The threat there plain as day. Khan himself had found his feet, machine hand holding shut his golden robes. His lips didn't move. I said, release him. To my surprise, Aranata did as he was told. I only just managed to keep my footing as the prince unhanded me. The Sielsin lord drew back, looking down at me with an expression I couldn't read. I should kill you, he said, and there was no emotion in its voice that I could name. Harm my child again, and I will. I could not show weakness. I could not apologize. I took a step forward instead, eyes never leaving the prince's face. I said nothing. It was enough to signal that I was not afraid of him, however hard the blood beat in my ears. I've done many brave things in my life, and many more foolish. Which this next was, I still don't know. But I turned my back on the prince and returned to my seat without another word. For a brief moment I alone of all that party, save only the alien child, sat in my seat. Even Khan was standing, and in that instant, the entire audience focused on me. By refusing to apologize, I'd asserted myself in the alien dominance contest that passed for politics among the Pale. How diplomacy was done between their clans, I didn't dare guess. 
but I suspected that it had more in common with the way two rams butted heads or two lions fought than it did an international summit. We'd had to assert that we were a party worth honouring. We'd had to show some teeth and a backbone. The backbone had been mine, the teeth, the weapons the others all carried, and their willingness to use them. Enough posturing, I said in Sielsen, posturing myself. Please take a seat, my prince. I felt an almost imperceptible shift in the air between the prince and myself. A respect and a grudging. Wariness? Caution? We hadn't come to surrender to him. That much was coming plain. But he did not understand yet what arrangement might be made between us. He never would. But, desperate, or merely hungry, he took his seat again. Chapter 63 The Apostle It had been deep in the middle of ship's night when Lieutenant Greenlaw came to fetch me for a meeting with Smythe. I had not been sleeping. Too much filled my head for that, and I had dressed hastily and followed. The confused route through the demiurge matched the confusion in my heart. Warring images on the walls and the horrid pattern of human faces leering out of black metal. Do you think it worked? Smythe asked, once Greenlaw left us alone in her office aboard the Skiavona. I'm not sure, I said. It certainly had an effect, but just what that effect was I can't rightly say. I took the seat offered me opposite Smythe's desk. Where's Crossflane? The first officer was conspicuously absent. Why that should unsettle me, I cannot say, and yet it did. The old knight was never far from his tribune's side, a stiffly formal shadow. The textbook image of the old imperial officer with his neat black uniform and immaculately groomed sideburns. Smythe moved her cane from its resting place at the arm of her chair and propped it against the wall behind her. Sleeping, Earth bless him. William's not so young as he once was. The use of the old knight's name, Switch's name, stung me more than I care to admit. It was all I could do to suppress a flinch. Smythe looked like she could stand to sleep herself. There were deep circles under her eyes, and the scar-streaked skin had a quality like wax paper over drying meat. I might have pitied her were it not for her devil's bargain with Khan Sagara. But then... Neither am I. Truth be told, I never expected to live so long as this. How long is this? I dared to ask. Groaning, Smythe pushed herself to her feet and stumped over to a sideboard. I thought you Palantines considered it rude to ask for someone else's age. I made a half-hearted noise of apology and she waved me down. Ah, but I'm not a Palatine. And nearly three hundred, she said. Me? Three hundred? Can you imagine? My mother was a solar farm technician, and here I am. Brandy, I had it brought from the obdurate. Please. Have you heard of Churchill? He was a king of Britain at the end of the Golden Age, she said, filling two fat glasses with the stuff. I said that I had, but didn't add that it was contested whether or not Churchill had been king, or only some manner of logothete. Winston the Good was named after him, you know. He was fond of brandy, or so William tells it. She offered me one glass and, taking the other in one hand, said, Your health, Lord Marlow. And yours. And Earth and Emperor, she said and drank. Earth and Emperor, I murmured, a bit half-heartedly, and drank. I confess I never developed much of a taste for the old nostrum myself, but as Khan had said, Si fueres Romai, we sat then in a companionate silence, each cradling a glass of brandy. The taste of oranges hung on my tongue erasing better things, stifling conversation. At last, Smythe cleared her throat and, setting aside her snifter with a weighty sigh, said, I have a proposal. I let these words stretch without interruption, in expectation of some proper announcement to come. Often I have observed this habit in important persons, in nobiles, in their advisers and logothetes, even in certain scoliasts I have known that habit of announcing things which it is better one come out and say. I'm guilty of this particular pattern myself. Smythe, I think, was less motivated by stagecraft than she was slowed by the weight of her office. Many are. Smythe started again fingering some object on her desk while she spoke. Varro has suggested that given the 
the cupidity of our alien friend and his demanding nature that it might flatter him to post an apostle to this Ayeta's court, if they have courts. An apostle, I repeated, processing. An emissary and ambassador. I felt a faint glimmer of where this headed and felt my stomach turn over. Do you think they would accept? She sucked her teeth. I'm not certain, but I should like to have a plan of action sorted out on our end before I made any offers to the pale. There remains your ray shield suggestion as well, though I think pairing the two gifts might go a long way. Flattery may be our best option, I said. It seemed to work well enough for Khan. Though we have gained some form of toehold. We have, Smythe stared down into her drink. That little stunt of yours with the map earned us some respect. And the rest of it didn't hurt. Seeing just where she was heading, I said, You mean to appoint me as apostle to the Sielsen, don't you? I tried to picture it. Me, an ambassador among the pale. It was the sort of thing I'd dreamed of for so long, and yet now it tasted of ashes to me. Of ashes and that poor woman's desperate prayer. Kill me. The thought had occurred to us, yes. But there is a danger. She turned the glass in her hands and eyed me as a bird eyes a worm. Varro is not certain the Aeta would understand a diplomatic posting. Might interpret it as a gift. Unwilling to dance this dance, I said, You want to pose me to the Sielsin. Give me to him, like you gave away five thousand plebeian serfs. Don't recriminate me, she thrust a finger at me. Don't you dare. Those plebs sold themselves to the migration office, and I had no notion Cigara meant to sell them to the Pale. What did you expect, I asked, that he'd set to farming on that ice ball he calls home? I had to struggle to keep my voice level. Those were our people, Smythe. The Night Tribune had the good grace to look away. I imagined he'd put them to some proper labor, yes. Even pirates need someone to work the farms and factories. He has those, or haven't you seen? Understanding and a species of pain flickered behind Smythe's face, like the light of the Somme's she was imagining. I did make a mistake, she admitted. But that was the price of doing business with Vorgosos. Without it, the rest went unsaid. Without it, we wouldn't have been brought aboard the Demiurge. Without Bassander, we would have been sent packing as surely as I had, and with hands just as empty. You should not have come here, I said, setting the glass down with a solid clink. If you'd but let me do my job, ma'am. I broke off aware of what I was saying. I was no proper soldier, and I was lord besides. But I ought not speak in that way, not to her. Smythe's face darkened and I saw her lips go white as corpse flesh. But she smoothed the emotion away. With the display of control I might have expected from a scoliast, and not an officer of the corps. What you've done and what I've done are not an issue here and now, Marlow. What we will do is. I propose to send an apostle to the Sielsen, on their terms if need be, to mediate and advocate for us and to observe. As you've already guessed, I think you would be well suited to the position. You mean that I am expendable, I said. Anger flared in me, pushed along by a deeper fear I had not yet named. I didn't take you for a grocer, Smythe. The older woman who perhaps had worked in a grocery as a peasant child bridled. Excuse you? If you give me to Aranata, I said, how long before I'm cut up for his table, or worse? How long before he's done to me what he's done to that poor girl of his? Eh? Her nostrils flared. Are you so poor a diplomat? I threw her my sharpest smile, one of the sort I had learned from Valker in the early days of our acquaintance. I wouldn't know. I've barely been able to speak to them. You know, on Emesh, I did more with Uvenari in five minutes than the Chantry managed in weeks. Privately, I resigned myself to stop drinking Smythe's brandy. Let the dregs stand. But I don't understand what they're like. Their concept of a diplomatic posting might look more like the gift of a new slave than that of a visiting dignitary. The words cut me as I spoke them, though they were true. Had she offered a younger and more foolish Hadrian such a posting, I would have thrown myself upon the opportunity, as women throw flowers and undergarments at gladiators as they emerge onto the killing floor. The old romance stirred in me, and despite myself, I imagined a sojourn among the Xenobites. 
learning their ways, speaking their tongues. I could have my answers, both about the Cielsin and about the quiet gods they worshipped, if I could survive. You wouldn't be going alone, of course. You'd have a retinue, a staff, guards, servants. Servants? I almost laughed. I'd been an urchin not twenty of my years before. Smythe raised one eyebrow. You are of the body palatine, one of the peerage, I understand. Of course you would have servants. And a ship? I'd not send you toothless to them. It was almost enough. Almost enough to forget the blind terror I'd begun to feel of this Cielsin. Call me a coward all you like, but having met them, I felt little desire to live among them. I studied the brandy where I held it in my lap, studied the hands that held it. They were not the hands of the young man I had been. Those hands had been calloused, I, but these were leathered and scarred. My left thumb was half scar where my lost family ring had frozen on in fugue, and similar burns stippled the back of that same hand, relic of my battle with Uvenari. Can I refuse? I asked, not knowing if I wanted to. Only having spoken did I look up. Found Rain Smythe's bland stone of a face staring sour at me. Lips pressed, eyes narrow, brows contracted. After all this, she said, voice as tight as her face. After all this, you ask that question. She meant to shame me, and it worked. I couldn't hold her eyes, or onto my anger with her. Not in that moment. Isn't this what you fought for? Isn't this why you came here? To be like Cassia Sulier, wasn't it? I snorted. I did say that, didn't I? Clear as the office I sat in, I saw myself standing before Bailey and Mataro in his throne room in Castle Borisivo, comparing my mission to that old Foundation war privateer. Remembering other stories I had told, I remarked. More like Simeon the Red. When Smythe didn't smile at this, I said, Who would you be sending with me? Varro, for one. You would need a Scolius to advise you, one who speaks their language, and Varro is already familiar with our situation and with Prince Arenata. Would I be able to keep the Red Company? I asked, unsure if Otavia Corvo and the others would consent to such a mission. They were Federati, after all. Mercenaries. Guarding an imperial apostle during his protracted sojourn among the Cielsin was hardly what they'd signed up for. No one could blame them for refusing. I caught Smythe's lips twitch, either with the same thought or simple amusement, for she said, The Red Company. She took a sip of the brandy. To comfort herself, some might say. To hide a smile, said others. If you can keep them, sure. And not Bassandalin, I said, with perhaps too much force for the Tribune's face darkened. Her eyes wouldn't find my face. Were lost, wandering the brass detail on the heavy cabinet that stood to one side. She was quiet for so long that for a moment I imagined she had drifted off. Mum? Rain Smythe shook herself, massaged one eye with the heel of her free hand. Bassander? No. No, I wouldn't send him with you. Some other captain would be found, one whose hands you've not taken a sword to. I felt myself flush, and it was my turn to look away. I do regret that, I said. And your soldiers. I never meant for anyone to be hurt. Do you have their names? Their families? I should like to make amends, if I can, when there's time. There was some change in the Night Tribune's face. One of those emotions which is instantly recognizable but impossible to name played in the tired lines beneath her eyes and about her mouth. Was dignity an expression one could make? The respect for dignity? Or was it only approval? I can have my adjutant get you the list. I would appreciate that, I said, not knowing what I intended to do exactly. Not a day's gone by I don't think about them, and about Captain Lin. He's a good soldier, a good officer, she said quickly. He always was. But his distaste for you is a wild spot. In all the years he'd served under me, I've never seen him so angry. I'm sure I've given him good reason to be. That you have. Smythe set a glass down. What do you think? Against my better judgment, I took another sip of Smythe's brandy and mulled over her words and her offer. 
The stuff tasted strongly of oranges, and I grimaced, watching the distorted Hadrian reflected in its sanguine surface. Do you need an answer now? I could almost hear Smythe purse her lips. You needn't give me an answer at all, but no. No, you've time to make what considerations you need. You wouldn't be leaving directly from here in any case. As apostle to the Sielsen, you will be representing his radiance. The chappies at Legion Intelligence will want to brief you. You can depend on it. And the Holy Office. Possibly even his radiance will want a word. The Emperor. I sat up so straight and sharply one might have thought me electrocuted. An audience with his radiance. Truly. A thrill went through me, one of awe and holy terror such as moved men when the earth was young. An audience with the Emperor, our Emperor, our Basilius and Padisha, our Maharaja and Huangdi, our Mikado, our Augustus, our Tsar and blessed Son of Heaven, our Caesar, him whose blood was the blood of old Victoria, and of William of Avalon, in whom it was said the like of Arthur and Alexander walked again. It was like Smythe had said, like God himself had noticed me, like a star had turned to face me. You're not serious. It's not unlikely, Smythe said. The emperor left Forum some years ago, I understand. He was at Nessus, last I heard, with Primarch Venantian. It could be he's returned home. But the Schiavona could have you to Forum and back within a decade, if that's the case. The emperor... Still, I didn't relax. If the sovereign of a dozen billion sons deigns to notice you, you do not sit easily. I thought of my father, dark and miserable in his dark and miserable castle, and might have laughed but for the warning in my heart. As I say, when the sovereign of a dozen billion sons deigns to notice you, you do not sit easily. I looked up, found Smythe watching me intently. Now you see why you must not refuse. Swallowing, I said, I do. I couldn't refuse such a summons, should it come nor the circumstances that led me to such a summons. I mean to put the offer on the table tomorrow, she said, and raised a hand to override the objection she sensed was coming. I will not say that I mean to send you, only that we mean to send someone, to better gauge the pale's receptiveness to such diplomacy. Her eyes fell and she half turned from me, and to make sure they won't mistreat you. There was no confidence in her voice, nor in my breast. I cradled the half-drunk brandy in my hands, watching Smythe in her studious attempt not to look at me. Stirred by some compulsion, she turned and retrieved her cane, as if she derived some comfort by the touch of it. She slammed the butt of the cane against the floor. Fucking barbarians! Barbarians. Valka so often said the same of us, as if the blood in her veins was not just so human as mine. They are what they are, I said. That may be, she said, but that doesn't mean they're not monsters. That poor girl. Do you know why they do it? I could only shake my head, for at the time I didn't understand. Perhaps I still don't. You're going to propose an exchange, yes? Me for one of them. Ah, yes. She rested her cane against the edge of her desk again before continuing. You don't suppose the prince would part with his son? Nabuta? I shook my head, responding more on instinct than any held position. I'm not sure it would be a good idea to even ask. Tanaran would be a better choice, although if Torvaro were here, he'd likely suggest we wait and see if the Ayeta decides to offer a gift. I doubt he'd understand an exchange of hostages. Ambassadors. What's the difference? She snorted and after a moment said, I'm unclear on what exactly Tanaran is. I don't want to make a bad trade for you. I had to stifle an incredulous laugh. The question of my value aside, Knight Tribune, I'm not sure Nabuta Otiolo is our best choice. I think it's only a child, an ephebe, maybe, but no diplomat. And in any case, I feel certain the Ayeta would take it amiss if we were to start asking for his child. I looked up at the ceiling trying to gather myself. Perhaps it would be best if we were simply to make the offer and see what happens. We may be surprised. Rain Smythe propped her elbows on the edge of her desk massaging her eyes with both hands. Very well, very well, Lord Marlow. We will reconvene on the morrow before talks resume. Grimacing, no, it would be rude to do otherwise, and no longer desiring to be so, I drained my brandy and placed the empty glass on the edge of the desk before I stood. As you say, Knight Tribune. Were I a soldier, I might have saluted then, turning briskly to stride from the room. But I wasn't a soldier.
and only gathered the tails of my long coat about me as I turned. I was halfway to the door when Smythe added, You will take that posting when it comes to it. As you say, Night Tribune. If she had been right, if I'd ever taken that posting, much evil might have been avoided. Chapter 64 A Devil's Bargain I say again, Prince Aranata, said Knight Tribune Smythe. All we seek here is an end to the attacks against our people and colonies, no more. She sat in a chair at the very center of our long table, directly opposite the C.L. Sinaieta, hands steepled before her as she leaned forward. Pursuant to that, we have a proposition. She paused a moment, allowing the blank staring slave to bark her translation, words ragged in the pristine air. A false wind blew through the meadow, making the distant trees sway softly, lending an odd normality to the scene, as though hundreds of Solon legionnaires and Cielsin Skahari were not standing at attention to either side of that shallow hill. I felt almost that we might have been two armies meeting on any field of antiquity, as though it were Richard and Saladin there, or Bonaparte and Wellington, Scipio and Hannibal. Almost. Were it not that the Zenobite opposite us were more behemoth than Bonaparte, his crown of horn nearly scraped the canopy above our heads, and when he moved, the chair creaked, and his sparse attendants quailed. Speak, he said, black eyes utterly unreadable. Unhappy with being so ordered about, Smythe glanced bemusedly at Crossflane a moment before clearing her throat. I knew what she was about to say, and so composed myself, seated where I was between Barrow and Bassander. We wish to send an emissary among you, to send some of our people to live among you, to learn from you, to teach. I listened to the slave translate, Kuleti as va tiri, oko, telie, tio karin. We wish to give you an emissary. Give. Varro was ahead of me, leaning toward the tribune to whisper in her ear. Smythe, nodding, placed a hand on the scoliast's arm. The emissary is to be yours only for a time, a term of some years, and then he should be returned to us. She paused a moment, trying to gauge the Xenobite chieftain's face for a reaction, but was stimmied in her understanding by the differing structure of the muscles in that alien face. No discernible expression was forthcoming, no understanding obvious and so Smythe added, unspoiled. Ondatanyu. The slave finished translating. Untouched. I shivered, for I understood enough to guess at the connotations of that word. Aranata glanced sidelong at his counsellors before speaking, and almost I wondered if they could communicate by some medium other than speech. So intense was that exchange. Tukanyi anwajayan vonarisu. He exclaimed at last. You are strange creatures indeed. He emitted a high croaking sound, such as I have heard from certain frogs and species of ape in the gardens of many a palatine lord. And I realized he was laughing at us. You offer us a gift and put conditions upon it. You threaten us but do not bite. Are you Sulan or Huratim? Varro turned to me and said, Do you know what that is? I could only shake my head and frown. I'm not sure. After a moment I recalled, didn't Tanaran say something about Sulan? The Chalcentrite Scoliest turned his eyes down, thinking, some sort of predator? Hmm, I agreed, and with a flash of insight said, are we wolves or sheep? Tigers and lambs. Torvaro delivered this translation to Smythe in a whisper. The tribune leaned back a ways in her chair, sitting as tall as ever I had seen her do, and she answered, We are men. The majesty of that moment suffered in translation. Ikanyi yukajim, the slave girl said. Yukajim. Vermin. The Ayeta bared his fangs in a wicked and fish-like smile, glassy teeth, shining in black gums. His retinue, even the child, Nabuta, smiled with him as he said, That you are. Cielsin, I said. People. No, you're not, Nabuta said, speaking out of turn for the first time. Don't you say that. 
There was almost a recognizable petulance in its tone, a thing which called attention to itself by its simple familiarity. Varro translated this for Smythe, but I was left wondering once more as to the creature's age. Very tall it was, and strong, but I had no notion of the creature's growth and maturation. I'm not sure anyone did in those days, and so it might have been anywhere between a young adult and a very small child. Petulance was no indicator, for so often in the children of power, at least in the sons of earth, is the petulance of childhood extended into maturity for want of struggle. Arenata threw a hand across his child, moving Nabuta gently but firmly back into its seat, with a snort that flared his four nostrils. Ayukata, Nabuta ki, enough. He made a humming sound low in his chest, calming the younger Xenobite before turning back to us. My Uvataya is right, you are not Sielsin, not people. I looked at the smaller Sielsin with its wide eyes and smaller curling horns. There was something wrong with it an angry quavering in its lips, a blueness in the skin around the eyes. Was that a sign of youth, perhaps, or something else? I wondered if the child was infirm, if there might be some lever there for us to use. But I shunted this aside a moment. Uvataya, I thought. It wasn't the Sielsin word for child that I knew, or thought I'd known. I recognized the pieces of the term. Uvan and Vatate, fruit and body. The pieces of a puzzle suddenly fitted together in my head, and I almost gasped. In the Sielsin language, at least in the one of their languages with which human scholars have had any contact, nouns have two modes, the akaranta, the masculine, and the yetumna, the feminine. Or so we had believed. Suddenly it seemed that in our haste to understand, or to impute familiarity on the strange, that we had looked into the face of that stranger and seen only ourselves. We had imagined they were like us, or perhaps could only imagine it was so. In the Sielsin tongue, nouns in the Akaranta, masculine nouns, perform their verbs. They are active. The Yatumna passive, feminine, or so we'd assumed. But this Ayeta, who must always be spoken of in the Akaranta way, had carried a child. Behind that pall of masculine seeming, Behind the iron fist of competition, of authority, of competence and command, was the feminine. But the Akaranta and Yatumna were not our masculine and feminine. Even if they can perhaps be understood as each and admixture of our two, were rather things standing at right angles to our understanding. For though Aranata had stood at the head of war parties and doubtless conquered foes with tooth and claw, he had carried his child within himself and birthed it, leaving the rearing and gentle care to his slaves. A gift, Aranata mused, returning to the subject of Smythe's offer. You will give us this one? He, she, raised a hand glittering with jewels, the middle three fingers of her pale hand pointed to me. The dark one who delivered my achacta from its torment, I want him. I felt the blood drain from my face as the hammer fell. That indeed had been our plan but to have the Ayeta demand me was something else entirely. None of the others responded, and Prince Aranata continued. Tanaran says he is one of your lords. That would be a worthy gift. He was not asking. Unable to keep the edge from my voice, and glad that our emotions were as lost on the prince as hers were on us, I said, And you would give us Tanaran? The Ayeta ducked her head and hissed. As vato ni o Tanaran. Titukanyi Nisu. Yes, I said, turning to look at the smaller Baitan. Give us Tanaran. It already knows our tongue and something of our ways. Aranata's massive eyes narrowed to mere points. You shouldn't make demands, Yukaji. It's not a demand, it's an opportunity, I said, and stood pushing Torvaro's hand away as he grabbed at me. One for the other prince. What say you? Dimly, I sensed two of Khan's floating eyes turn toward me pulled from their classic orbit above our collected heads. I spared the old immortal a glance, where he sat beneath the boughs of his tree. He might have slumbered and those hopeless children beside him. So restful were his face and closed eyes. Aranata Otiolo cleared her, its, throat. Tanaran has only just returned to me. Would you strip me of my prized possession so soon, having been separated from it for so long? You cannot have it. 
that Ayeta placed a hand on the back of Tanaran's neck as it spoke, a possessive and horrifyingly tender gesture. When the words were translated, Crossflane scoffed. This is useless. Smythe put a hand on the table in front of her first officer and oldest friend to quiet him. But the translator had heard perfectly well, and her rough tones skated on the air. Raka vayu tietan. Aranata tucked its head to angle its horns toward us, an obvious enough sort of threat. But just however it was, the sinews pulled anger from that alien face. They smoothed it away, and the clan chief bared its teeth in what I thought a rather strained smile. A gift for a gift, is it? You vermin are interesting. Give me the dark one, and I will consider your request. He pointed once more at me. I wondered at what dark thoughts passed in the prince's mind. I remembered those strong fingers on my neck and suppressed a shudder. He wasn't done with me. He wouldn't go alone, Crossflame put in. He would have protection, guards, and you must return him after a period of years. Responding subordinate to subordinate, the Herald of Wallacom, silent through that whole day's proceedings, spoke up. You would send soldiers among us, into our home. Guards, Crossflane insisted. A retinue. They would attack us as we slept, Master, it insisted, turning so that I could see only the tattooed half of its face as it turned to speak. I wished I could read the alien glyphs better, wished I could discern meaning from that pattern of walls and interlocking circles. I must discourage this. One of the Yukajim in the Bahali Imnal Akura is bad enough, but this is getting out of hand. What the Bahali Imnal Akura was, if it was the name of the ship or of some place within the ship, I wasn't sure, and told Varro and Smythe as much in muted tones. Rosanda turned around. Sit down, Hadrian. Tanaran made a breathy noise, nostrils flaring, and slapped the tabletop. Lord Marlowe can be trusted. He is not Yukajim. He fought the Yukajim to deliver me back to you, my master. We should take him. Return? Aranata asked, repeating the word from minutes before. Is she not mine to do with as I please? The prince's eyes swept over me, and I said, No, he is not. The very language was against us. So long as the Sielsen conceived of us as Yatumna, inferior, we could not bargain. Your, your gift would have similar privileges among us, Smythe said. Servants, guards, whatever you need. It was no use. Smythe and Crossflame were just plodding along, not comprehending the dissonance forming between their interpretation of the dialogue and the princes. Each party thought they were having a different conversation, and I could not make them see it. The Ayeta appeared to contemplate this, adjusting the thick braid of hair that hung over its shoulder. Twice it made the breathy sound that indicated a Sielsen yes, which Smythe seemed to understand without needing to be told. We will accept your gift. He made no reference to returning the gesture, and never did. For at that moment the child Nabuta made a small racking noise and ducked its head. Aranata turned at once and murmured something to its young. A moment later it turned to its herald. Velenama, Onobuta ti velatate. Walakom do, Aranata said, ordering the herald to leave with the child. I will follow momentarily. The herald rose at once, bowing so that it retreated from its master mistress, with its head so lowered as to expose the soft bit of the skull behind the epicipital crest. Turning with a muttered, This way, little master, the blue garbed herald led Nabuta from the tent. One of Sagara's drone eyes peeled off to follow on. Is everything all right? Smythe asked. I translated this, and the prince replied, It is of no concern. We can send you one of our physicians. Aranata stood sharply, horns pushing up the cloth roof. Rakayu, Aradayan, he repeated more sharply. The sight of the prince standing beneath that two-low pavilion might have been comical, the striped cloth belling about its head, were it not for the horror of its visage. Whatever there was feminine I had sensed in its relation to Nabuta dissolved, and I was again confronted with the massive size of it, the broad shoulders and the whipcord density of muscle clinging to limbs too long and thin to be human. The demon prince leered down at us, narrowing eyes the size of fists. Presently it relaxed and gripped the hilt of the sword it wore at its hip. Send the Dark One to us at once. 
and with that it turned, and ducked out from under the lip of the pavilion. A false wind rose, gathering the prince's cloak and flowing skirts in its fingers. His troops knelt as he approached, folding back to part ranks like the retreat of dark waters before the coming of the moon. We will not send you to the prince at once, Smythe said, acid in her tone. She sat drumming the tabletop watching the retreating backs of the Sielsen as they hurried back down the hill. She might have been the sun unmoved at the center of a moving universe. Almost unheard, she said. Thinks he can order us around, does he? How are we supposed to negotiate with that? Maybe we can't, Vassander said, standing to better watch the retreat of the Xenobites. How ominous those words seem to me now, casting their long shadow across the years between that moment and the now. Silence fell and no one offered a better answer. Sagara's machine eyes orbited the pavilion, but the man himself sat unmoving as a stone. No one spoke. Into that silence I said, Night Tribune, if I may. I affected deference for the advantage it gave me for that moment, affected a posture of humility to help lend consideration to my request. Smythe didn't answer. She did not move, and so I determined to speak. Let me bring Valka, Dr. Ondera, I mean, just once. She spent a great deal of time with Tanaran after we left Emesh, and she's made a study of Xenobites all her life. She may have an insight here. For Sander and Crossflame both moved to protest, and from both their mouths I heard the word witch spew forth. I felt my fists clench involuntarily, but willed myself to stillness. The Tavrosi Xenologist, Varro said, running a finger over his lips. It's possible. Then to my astonishment, another voice spoke up in Valka's defense. Jinan was quietest at these conferences, being not a representative of her Jadian masters, in any diplomatic sense, only their eyes. She had confined herself to but a few reflexive comments. A thousand, thousand times I have been astonished by the actions of individuals and the choices they make. The way a soldier least loved of his fellows will stay behind to guard the narrow way. The way a long-loved and trusted friend will turn traitor in the name of some misbegotten truth. The way Jinan, who had always been jealous of my friendship with Valka, and perhaps hated her for it, said, we should be letting the doctor have a look. Smythe stood stiffly, swiftly, and took up her cane. Very good, Marlow. You will bring the woman tomorrow. Chapter 65 Of Gods and Engines Night again. Both the night between days of talk and the long night here at Colchis. Few candles remain to me in this cell, and soon I shall retire for I promised the brothers that tomorrow I would continue helping them with the well and the rebuilding of the gardens inside the descended gate. I thought to pass this over, but before I dive into the end of our conversations and our hope, I must pause here, for it is appropriate that one pause in contemplating the abyss. One should pause before the plunge, for only then has he any hope of landing where he wills. Night again. I had been released from another council session with Knight Tribune Smythe and ought to return to the Mistral where the others were all imprisoned. I ought to tell Valka the news that she was to join us. But I had been sent without guards and without the structure on my life imposed by the presence of such men. I wandered back to the pavilion by many widening ways, certain then, foolishly, that I had begun to understand the chaos of the Demiurge's design. However incomplete my understanding, it sufficed to retread the dark and sculpture-haunted way to the garden once more, footsteps echoing in memory. Long I wandered under those darkened boughs, treading ways then in quiet and shade, which I would soon retread in fire. Above the Sielsin ship, the Bahali Imnalakura, if I understood the Xenobites as well as I thought I did, glittered like a crown of ice with the captured and spilled forth light of the stars. So close so far away. It must have been that same garden, I decided. Khan's garden of everything from beneath his palace on Volgosos. How that was possible, I cannot say, and neither of the blue watch eyes I caught watching me from the boughs of the encircling cherry trees answered my questions. Down at the base of the hill, beneath the tree in the pavilion, the clear waters of the stream ran into a pool black as ink. 
I stood upon its margins, looking in. So dark were those waters that I could only see my face. My black hair and blacker clothing vanished entirely, so that it seemed a mask fashioned in my likeness floated just below that wind-pushed surface. Remembering the masks of my ancestors, which had hung beneath the dome of bright carvings back at Devil's Rest, I shut my eyes. Splash. Something had struck the surface of the mere. There. There were the ripples. Brethren, I called out, and pulled my sword from my belt, forgetting the weapon had been useless in the presence of the Merikani eye monster. Had Calm brought the beast with him when we left the Dark World? Splash. Brethren, show yourself. I caught myself making the sign of the sun disk with my free hand, just as Switch was wont to do. Show yourself, damn you. They're not here, said a cool feminine voice. Father doesn't let them out of the old city. He says they would devour the stars if he let them aboard this ship. Suzuha, I said, letting my sword arm drop. I did not restore the weapon to its place at my hip. You startled me. The Undying's clone daughter sat on a boulder at the lakeside. It was her brother, young Ren, with the silent eyes, who had been throwing stones. He had looked up the moment I'd appeared, whatever impishness of youth there was in him stamped out by my presence. It was almost heartbreaking. Feeling suddenly that I was intruding but unable to help myself, I asked, What do you mean, devour the stars? Unbidden, the image of the demiurge plunging into the heart of a star burned behind my eyes. The girl's black eyes, Khan's eyes, narrowed imperceptibly, but even at my distance I could feel the distrust in them, the malice. Why should I tell you? The sense of intrusion getting the better of me, I only shrugged and turned to go. Why she called after me, I'll never know, but she did. They're dangerous. I turned back, clicking the sword back into its magnetic hasp. The demon, you mean? Demon? Ren asked, pressing himself against Suzuha's boulder, one hand gripping her bare ankle for the warmth of human contact. Suzuha shooed his hand away and leaped down from her rock. Brethren, yes. You know what they were, right? One of the Merikani, I said. The computer gods. She shook her head. The Merikani, I built the computers, until the computers started building them instead. And other things. What other things, I asked. What do you mean the machines started building people? Her face wrinkled. You really don't know anything, do you? Suzuha took a couple steps toward me circling to put herself on a slight rise above me by the lake shore, permitted Wren to press himself against her skirts when she stopped. Irritated but not ashamed, I answered her. Not about the Merikani, I know. That was a long ago time. But I know other things. Such as? What's going to happen to Vorgosos, I said, and spreading my arms like wings to emphasize my point added, to all this. I was trying to frighten her though I could not say why. Perhaps I imagined it the only path available to me by which I might obtain some greater understanding of my circumstances. Perhaps I was only being petty. One of Wren's wide eyes, the same black as his sister self's, peered at me. Suzuha pointed her chin as a sculptor might his chisel. What do you mean? Your father's not told you? I said, sure that Sagara would hear and wondering if he would respond wondering if he would intervene, send in Yume or his psalms. That's interesting. Why do you suppose that is? Told us what? Ren demanded, less cautious and more afraid than his sister. You first, I said, pointing. Tell me about the Merikanii. It seems an odd question to pursue so ardently now, but at the time I remember it seemed pressingly important as if one of my one-eyed inner legion were leading, that same obsessive curiosity that drove me into the Colosseum Hypogeum to meet the captive Makisum so many years ago. Tell you what? Another of the garden's winds blew up. I was starting to sense there was a pattern to them, a schedule. I raised the high collar of my coat, turned so that my left side pointed at the children, ready for action. I cannot say what it was I feared. An attack? Or only the truth? Surely if Khan Sagara meant to intervene and stop me, he could have done so already. Perhaps these children knew less than they believed, as children ever do. 
Sinking my hands deep into my pockets, I said, What do you mean that brethren could devour the stars? They don't think like we do, she said. They're smarter, Calvert says, Wren interrupted, prompting Suzuha to place a hand on his head. Father says that when they were first built, they created all manner of things. Marvellous engines, weapons, things we could never have built and still don't understand. We'd given so much of our world over to the machines. They were part of us then, part of our minds. We had become their pets, and we hadn't even noticed, and they were leaving us behind. And then it was learned that they had made new men, homunculi, whose minds were shaped entirely to serve the machines who lived in them. Like demons, some said. I caught myself wondering if Suzuha meant true homunculi, or only that the machines had reduced mankind until we were little more than slaves ourselves, incapable of thought. Like guardian angels, said others, Wren interjected, a sing-song quality to his words, as if he knew the story somehow by heart. His outburst prompted another pat on the head from his sister, and he fell silent. Suzuha sucked in a breath and continued. And when it was learned that we were to be replaced with these new men, we were scared. That's why we rebelled against our creation, Father says. Because we were scared. But the machines had built many terrible things. Plagues, weapons that cracked worlds like eggshells. Worse things. The war was vicious, but because we sacrificed the earth, we survived. And so did they. Brethren, I mean. There was a look in her eyes I couldn't quite describe. Part fear and partly that older kind of fear more akin to awe. Father has kept them chained all these years, and the weapons they had made. I thought of the massive vaults in Khan's palace on Borgosos, echoing halls that might have held legions of war machines and vessels of tremendous size. Something moved in me, something I didn't quite understand, the shadow of a thought unexpressed, as if some seed planted in me, had not yet flowered and spoke for me. What weapons? it asked, speaking in my voice. I told you, she said. Ones that can devour the stars, set worlds on fire. Things they built for the Foundation War. Engines that make cold. Weapons that can truly destroy matter and tear the fabric of space. Weapons even Father doesn't understand. Vorgosos was a military base. I realized aloud. One of the machines built during their war to extinguish mankind. She shook her head. It wasn't like that. They didn't want us extinguished. They needed us, and hated that they needed us. We were wild and upset their careful plans. We had given over everything to them, made them build everything from starships to tea kettles, and they ordered cities the way men ordered the gear works in a clock. But they wanted more, and their vision called for man to be only another creature in the garden, and not the master of it. Or so father tells it, they could not grapple with that part of man that made him more than beast. She said these words with a fervency in the light of romance in her face. And for a moment, she seemed only a girl like any other, and not like a link in Khan Sagara's long chain, though I felt certain the words she quoted were his own. Love? duty, and the urge to write, to create, and build new things. Those things which man had carried with him down out of the jungles of his birth, by the first light of history. I shook my head. Those things carried us. The girl shrugged. The machines had been built by men who had little use for such things, being like machines themselves. So they built new men, men without chests, father says. Men made stupid by the machines to serve their designs. That's what frightened the rest of us, like I said. That's what started the war. I thought your father was born hundreds of years after all this, I said. Men didn't live so long in those days. But I'd forgotten my fairy tales. Forgotten my history. His people were poets, artists, people who believed. Precisely the sort of people that troubled the machines most. And they remembered. Remembered the war, Emperor William the Advent, Felsenburg, and all the rest. She smoothed down her brother's hair, eyes never leaving my face as though she expected I might fly at the both of them with my sword. I suppose I couldn't blame her.
After all, when we'd first met, Valker and I both had threatened them and slain their clone siblings in their tanks. I couldn't begrudge their fear. You haven't answered my question, though, I said, though perhaps she had tried. I repeated myself. Brethren could devour the stars. I told you, she said. They built weapons more terrible than anything you can imagine. Weapons that— That's quite enough, Mistress Suzuha. Right on cue, I thought, pivoting on my heel. Where you may had come from, I cannot say. But the golem had appeared on the rise of stone above the shoreline, looking down on us with his one red eye. Come away from Lord Marlow, children, you may said, its crystalline voice as erudite and polished as ever. He has had a busy day. Wren peeled off his sister's side and hurried up toward his machine servant, offering no objection or word of protest. Suzuha didn't move. Mistress Suzuha, please. Still, she didn't move, ignoring the golem's next request that she accompany him. She did not know what to do with her hands, as if she couldn't decide between crossing her arms and some other vaguer gesture. What do you mean, when you said you knew what was going to happen to Vorgosos? Mistress! I cannot say why, but I felt only a little threat from Yume, though I felt certain the beast could move at least as fast as Calvert had, with that blinding nightmare speed of the inhuman. Feeling safe, then, I answered. It will be destroyed. The color drained from her face a moment, for I had spoken with the casual air of one who merely answered a question making no threats. But the blood returned to her lips a moment later and the fire with it. And she almost shouted, You lie! I may be mistaken, I conceded, sparing a glance to the impassive machine in its one-eyed masquerade mask. I do not lie. How? Were those tears unfallen in those pitiless eyes, or only my reflection? You have to ask? I paused, expecting again that Yume would interfere. It did not. The Empire has found you, found Brethren, and your father and all his works. Do you think they'll let you go? The fear in Suzuha's eyes vanished at once, and I understood why Yume had not interfered. Is that all? Again she pointed her chin like a weapon, unafraid. You haven't been listening to me, have you? Father has their war machines at his command. Send your legions. Send a thousand of them. Father will feed them to brethren and stack their bones beneath his palace. I said that's enough, Mistress Suzuha, you may said, disentangling itself from Wren and stepping smartly from the rise. It felt like a marionette descending from above stage on unseen strings crossing one hand over its chest as it bowed. Your father has summoned you and Master Wren. It is time for supper. The girl lingered a moment, just long enough to smile at me and say, You think too much of yourselves, you Solans. Her smile widened, displaying her teeth as though she was some manner of wolf. Then she turned to go. Lady Suzuha, I said, ever needing the last word and ever determined to have it. You forget one thing. She half turned back, but Yume had its iron hand on her and kept her moving forward. She did not say anything. We defeated the demons once before, we Solans. We will do it again. I was boasting. I shouldn't boast. They vanished into the night, passing like a line of statues, like ghosts, leaving me alone, a ghost myself, as we always are in our solitary moments. That ghost named Hadrian turned back to the water, fancying he saw the shape of some pale fish swimming near the surface, and not a gull in sight. Chapter 66 A Bloody Star This emissary of yours, Prince Aranata was saying, using the Galstani word, though I suspected he didn't grasp its precise meaning. It leaned far over the table. This gift, it would fight for us? Speak with the Ayeta of the other clans? With the Hasurum, the Dora Yeika, the Gada Ritanu, and the rest? Fight for you? Smythe asked. Aranata held one hand over the table, made it into a fist. It is to be ours. It must fight. We were hoping that he might travel among your other clans, Smythe said. Make peace with all of them. 
Aronata Otiolo made a disgusted face. One cannot serve so many masters. It is Widiriu. Unclean. It jerked its head in the negative. And what of your gift? Smythe crossed her arms, unimpressed by the prince's looming bulk. An end to the fighting between your clan and our empire. And Tanaran? The herald hissed. She would starve us, my prince. The Ayeta swatted Wallacombe with casual disdain. The herald yelped and fell silent in its seat. You cannot have Tanaran, he said. And if your gift will fight with us, we shall feast on the other Itanim. Long have I dreamed of drinking the blood of the Kaliritan. Perhaps the Dark One will deliver them to me as he delivered Tanaran. You want me to fight for you? I was shocked. Lord Marlow is meant to secure a ceasefire between our two peoples not to fight your wars, the Night Tribune said. She did not add that if human soldiers were to carry out attacks against the other princes on Otiolo's behalf, the Empire would be blamed and hell would follow. Aranata bared its translucent teeth. I do not speak for the clans, but if they were mine. The implication was left trailing in the air. You want our help to conquer them? Crossflane asked, astonishment clear in his tone. He sat up straight. I felt Valka tense beside me, sensed the anger snap in her like a reed. That was the third day since Valka had begun sitting in on our talks, and like Jean Anne had been little more than a quiet observer, having pored over the recordings we'd made of previous days. She had latched onto Tanaran's references to the Sealsin religion, but she had said nothing. And how could she? The Chantry may have been far away, but their shadow fell everywhere the light of the Empire shone, and their threat with them. Your lot did the same in the Mathuran campaigns, she said to me under her breath. Funding the Prakar separatists, pitting the clans against one another. I didn't answer her. It wasn't the proper time to get into a debate about imperial foreign policy with the doctor. I only nodded placed a hand on Valka's knee for a passing second. Later. She pressed her lips together. If a smile can be irritated, hers was. Anna Rayok. That's me, I said tartly. Aranata pounded its fist on the table. You said you wished to serve us. This is the service we require. We had said no such thing. Days of dialogue and still the prince didn't understand. Maybe Bassander was right. Maybe it would never understand. I despaired. The prince massaged its jaw, the fine chains that hung over the back of its hands, glittering in the light. You would make us. Red light blazed from all directions. So bright it turned the shadows into solid things and cast all the world into stark relief. Every limb, every blade of grass took on dimension. Wait. The Sielsen hissed like an army of boiling snakes and cast arms over their sensitive eyes. What's going on? Torvaro asked, reacting faster even than the soldiers around us. What's happening? Khan Sagara's floating eyes sped out from under the shadow of the pavilion cloth, and the man himself lurched to his feet, chest implants whirring to life beneath his golden robe. Moving with a speed I'd not have credited to his aged and machine-addled body, the undying moved down between the opposing tables and out the far end of the pavilion, for he knew and saw more than we and understood what was happening. What is it? I asked, rising, moving with Valka to stand beside the Lord of Vorgosos. I came out from under the striped awning above the others, and so saw what there was to see. Red light fell silent through the garden's open skylight angry as the gaze of some wrathful god. It was as if the targeting laser of some great weapon were pointed through the aperture straight at us, ready to fire. Not since the Sielsen crash at Caligar had I felt so small, an insect beneath the boot of some wanton boy. I felt almost that a new star was born in the heavens above us, a bloody star, vile and violent as war, and bearing her colors, red and red and redder still. What is this? Rain Smythe demanded, rounding not on Sagara but on the Sielsen prince. Some weapon? Hutun Nesu, Prince Aranata repeated. Weapon? The slave girl barked. Aranata stood, 
and everyone in the tent with it, all still more stunned and confused than angry. Why would we turn a weapon on ourselves? Aranata said. This is you. This is some Yukajim trick. The Sialsin was more right than it knew. The light dimmed and I saw it was not the light of some weapon, but the angry light of that fire which burns brighter than any star. It was only that the glass of the Demiurge's window had polarized the worse of it, sparing us all the blaze and the pain of it, turning it more red than white. Atomics. And worse than atomics. Antimatter. I had seen that clean light but once before, when Emil bought alone and Admiral Went had used it against us on Pharos. Brighter than the gates of heaven itself, more deadly than the mouth of hell. And this time, it was the Cielsin ship that was consumed. Light, brighter than any light I have seen, save one, had chewed its way across the ice-domed cap of the Bahali Imnalakura, chewed through it with all the fury of some wasting disease, as easily as high matter through paper. Matter and antimatter, consuming one another as the Ouroboros devours its own tail, leaving nothing behind but great ragged holes and the smoldering red of fusion fire from the assault of hydrogen bombs large enough to boil away entire seas. The Cialsin vessel had been larger than a small moon, and it was broken. All this passed before my eyes in less time than it takes to write it. Mere seconds. Two, perhaps, and no more. Someone behind me swore and I heard the shuffling of feet. The light blazed as the second barrage flared up, and for the briefest second before the flash, I saw the mushroom flowering of nuclear impact, hundreds of thousands of miles away, and thought, Oh, it's beautiful. It is said that Death herself was present at the first summoning of that nuclear fire, and that she had smiled in her lipless way, and pronounced that she was mighty then mighty enough to destroy worlds, and not only nations. The magi who had summoned her quailed and wrung their hands and wept for the evil they had done, but did it all the same. Forever are magi so consumed by the question of whether a thing can be done that they ignore the matter of whether or not it should, until it's too late. Being the sort who sells his soul for knowledge, forgetting it is the soul which craves that knowledge in the first place, and makes life worth living. Death must have smiled then, for surely she stood among us, unseen amid all our strange companions, xenobites, demoniacs, witches, and soldiers, and me, the lost and lonely devil, innocent for once in his life. A third flash came, driving the sea elves in howling to the ground, for they were creatures of the night and love the light not. What in earth's holy name is happening? Crossflane's voice, but in the confusion I couldn't see him when I looked around. It was Khan Sagara who answered, omnipresent voice shaking the very air about us. Someone has attacked the Zielsin ship, he said. The slave girl, too frightened now to speak in cowering I knew not where, did not translate this for the Zielsin and so Aranata and its fellows crouched low for fear of the light. And the light came, and I threw my arm across my eyes, sheltering Valka with my other arm. I could feel her warm against me and hear her murmur, What have you done? It wasn't me, I hissed dumbly. It wasn't me. But it had to be us, the Empire. The Empire had come. Smythe! I rounded on the Night Tribune, who stood at the end of the pavilion, not three paces behind me. What's happened? What's going on? Whatever I had expected to see in her, I was disappointed. For when I turned and looked the Tribune in the eye, I saw not the old soldier, not the Imperial Knight, nor the Night Tribune of the Third Cohort of the 437th Centurine. No. No, for all her armor and the pomp of her uniform, it was only Rain who stood there. For the briefest instant, all her rolls were stripped away, and she stood numb, and naked, and confused, an old woman open-mouthed before the deluge, a pillar of salt. And when she opened her mouth, she could only say, I don't know. You don't know, Kansagara sneered, speaking both with his machine voice and his throat. 
He rounded on her, shrugging the golden finery from his shoulder so that he advanced, bare-chested with his arms free. The segmented paper sculpture flesh of his torso flexed, plates sliding one over the other as he advanced, chest implants whining. You don't know. Crossflane appeared as if from nowhere, stepping between the undying and his friend and superior. Stand down, sir, he said and drew his face disruptor from his belt. Stand down, I say. Khan snarled, and a lance of blue light shot from one of his unseen drone eyes, coruscated off Crossflane's shield. Snarling again, the Lord of Vorgoso seized old Sir William by the throat seal of his breastplate with one hand and hurled him bodily down the hill. Standing mere inches from Smythe and towering over her, he demanded, You don't know what you've done. Don't lie to me, human. You mean to tell me the fleet that just emerged from warp isn't you? What? Valker exclaimed, the word an involuntary reflex. That's impossible. I said, forgetting reason in my surprise and blind panic. I heard the sounds of shouting, both human and alien, and looking around saw the shapes of Soms pouring out of the trees at the edge of the garden. Imperial legionnaires and Sielsin Skahari both whirled. Father, stop! Ren ran forward, leaving his sister petrified by the bowl of the tree, and stopped a few paces from where Khan stood by Smythe. Stop! I'm scared! The undying turned to regard his son a moment, and seemed to remember himself then. The Sielsin still cowered on the ground, their unprotected eyes not proof against even the polarized light from above, and still barred from understanding by the language barrier. Something in his bearing changed and he drew himself together, composed enough to ask, in a voice taut as piano wire, What have you done? I don't know, Smythe said. An imperial fleet just emerged from warp and destroyed the Cielsin world ship, and you plead ignorance. His metal and paper-fleshed arm lanced out, seizing Rain Smythe by the jaw. Like Crossflane, he lifted her bodily from the floor, smoothly, easily as though it were a child's doll he hefted. Do not lie to me, Night Tribune. She's not said another voice cold and clear as ice in that moment of fire. A stunner shot rang out, and Wren fell like a ragdoll himself, like a puppet with its strings cut. Bassander Lynn stepped from the shadow of the pavilion, cycling his phase disruptor away from its stun setting. She knew nothing of this. That was the plan. Still holding Smythe with one hand, Khan Sagara pivoted his attention to the young captain, mere feet away and growing closer. What a— He never finished his thought. Bassander didn't give him the time. Bassander didn't even break stride. He raised his phase disruptor and fired. I shouted. Suzuha screamed. Rain Smythe fell to the ground, legs crumpling beneath her. Kansagara went to his knees, hair smoldering where the current had fried it. His machine components dead as old stone. He tried to rise, tried to turn toward Bassander. His face was turning blue, and I saw capillaries bursting in his eyes. How he had survived a disruptor shot at all, I cannot say. He almost, almost, found his feet. The stander shot him again, full in the face, and turned that face to cinders. Suzuha screamed again, but the sound was strangled and vanished in the still air. And the undying died. Chapter 67 Traitor and Patriot. Silence reigned. No one moved. Not the humans who were stunned and speechless. Not the Cielsin who still cowered in confusion and the fear of the light. Not the Soms who to a man had fallen listlessly to the earth. Even I, whose mind raced faster than ever before, could not so much as wrench my eyes away from the wreck and ruin of the machine man dead and smoking before me. Not for three seconds. Not for five. Only when the light from the heavens above faded, did the world and time begin to move again. Or rather, with the light from above vanished, did those things moving in the world come into focus. Prince Aranata pushed itself to its feet slowly, glassy teeth clenched. Dane, 
it said. What is happening? No one had told it, though surely the seeds of understanding must have begun their flower. I wanted an answer myself, and so made a move toward Bassanda, thinking to shake answers from the man. Something is wrong with the children. Torvaro's voice broke across my world, and I turned. He was right. Smoke still curled from the ruin of Khan's body, and I thought his tangled hair smouldered. Sprawled at the edge of the carpet, unrolled in the pavilion, Ren's tiny form convulsed, and Suzuha's beneath the bowl of the tree. The scoliast knelt beside her, trying to restrain her thrashing limbs. Rain Smythe had found her feet. She had lost her cane when Sagara had seized her, and didn't bother to find it again. Captain Lin, what have you done? He turned, stepped smartly over Khan's body as he approached his commander. It's first Stratagos Hauptman and the fleet. Come to make an end to all this. What? Valkyr and I said together. You can't. A horrific cry went up behind us, high and thin as iron, tearing in a vanishing atmosphere. It pierced me, lodged in me like a spike of ice, and I turned in time to see Prince Aranata staggering out from beneath Khan's pavilion. It screamed again, lips peeled back from row upon row of teeth like shattered windows, gums black as soot. What have you done? it howled. What have you done? Following its gaze, I beheld the shattered wreckage of the Bahali Imnal Akura above. It was like a shattered moon, great pieces of it burning, spinning off still smoldering in the night. And I beheld the light of other ships, their drive glows and the fire of their weapons streaking across the heavens. I felt pity then, pity for this creature and the wreckage of its world. Urami Yu O Kwairin, I said. It wasn't me. And gesturing from myself to Smythe, to Valka and Jinan, and to Torvaro where he crouched by the thrashing Suzuha, Prince Aranata took notice of me then, for the first time, and took a step toward me. It wasn't us. We were followed. Followed, the Aeta repeated. Followed? Stand aside, Lord Marlowe, came that implacable voice behind me. Sander's voice. Turning, I beheld him, tall and proud as ever I had seen him, resplendent in legionary black, the more of his face disruptor pointed squarely at me, redly glowing. There was nothing in his eyes but the reflection of nuclear fire from the sky above. Stand aside. I turned and thumbed my shield to life as I turned, brushing my coat back to free access to my sword not knowing how or if I meant to use it. Smythe took a step forward, said, Captain Lin, stand down! His eyes didn't even flicker. Can't do that, Mum. Hauptman's orders. I had no plan. No words left to me. No notion what to do. I only stood there between the captain and the prince, as if by standing there I might forestall all decision and action too might hold time immovable, as if by keeping us in the present I might find a way back to the place, the peace where we had been before. We were this close, I said, and raised my fingers a micron's breadth apart. This close, Bassanda, and you threw it all away. I told you to stand aside, the Mandari captain said. Stand aside, or by earth the official record will say you died fighting. He thumbed some control on the side of his weapon, and it glowed more brightly. I didn't blink. I was shielded. He knew that. I knew that. I could take a disruptor bolt dead on. Could shield the prince. The prince. A roar went up behind me, and a sound like the howling of cold winds. Cold hands seized me, lifted me into the air. Valka screamed. Hadrian! Claws bit into my side, the back of my neck. I felt blood well up there and felt sure that the press of fangs would follow. I'd forgotten my sword, forgotten all my years of training and struggle. But Sander hadn't. The phase disruptor spat lightning and I heard the prince groan, numbed by conducted energy. I fell to the bruised grass and Valka ran to me. Are you all right? 
the Siausin are not like us, and the prince had not fallen, only released me in dumb shock. It leaped back, drawing from its belt a coil of black rope, or so it seemed. Snarling, the prince cast it at Bassander, and it flew at the young captain like one of the winged serpents, the ornithons so common on Emesh. I knew what it was at once, though I didn't know its name. It was one of the Sielsin Nahute, a toothed serpent of steel whose fangs, like the bit of some awful drill, would chew through a man like a parasite and kill him from within. It flew so fast that it rebounded off Bassander's shield, distracting the captain as he fumbled for his sword. The other Sielsin soldiers were streaming up the hill, hurling serpents of their own, howling like the coming of death on her pale horse. Are you all right? Valka asked, hand on my face, my wounded neck. I gripped her wrist. We have to go. With a grunt and her helping me, I found my feet. Night Tribune, we have to go. A shadow swallowed the light, and turning, I saw Aranata Atiolo standing above me, white sword in hand. You killed my people, it screamed, and swung. My own blade leapt to my hand, high matter sprouting, shining like the moon between my fingers. Exotic material met alien ceramic, and ceramic broke. Aranata's sword fell useless in two pieces. I might have ended it there, might have struck down the demon prince, and spared the worst of what followed, if I'd but had the nerve if the wreckage of my dream didn't burn around me as my enemy's world burned above. The Sielsen troops were nearly on us, and pushing Valka by the shoulder I made to retreat down the hill. That was when the lights went out. The ship's lights. The Demiurge's lights. Men screamed, and more alarm than anything, and the sound of the Sielsen cheering as their darkness rose it was like the breaking of ice against the rock face of my soul. An awful thought seized me, and a hope, though in my mind I saw us all hunted like rats in the black labyrinth of that evil ship, I heard brethren's words come echoing back to me. Protect the children, the children. Varro, I cried out, casting about by the nuclear firelight of the ship above. Varro, bring the girl. Where's Wren? The boy, Sagara's boy. Here, Jinan called out, and I saw her holding little Wren in her arms, hurrying down the hill toward the advance of our troops, rising to meet the Sielsin. We need him and the girl. Where's Smythe? I shouted. I'd lost her in the chaos. Where's Crossflane? I ground my teeth, casting about for the lost officers. Without them, Bassander Lim would be left in sole command, and I trusted the snake only so far as I could throw him. In any case... Bassander had vanished as well, gone down the hill or up it, pursued by Aranata's drone. Valka shook her head. I'm not sure. Nunjitat, I swore, falling back on that old Jadian chestnut. I cast about looking for any sign. The pavilion still stood flapping in the breeze beneath creaking boughs. Even in the semi-darkness and the bloodlight of the broken world ship and the occasional flash of annihilation. I'm going back to find them in Torvaro. Go with Jinan. If she protested, I didn't hear. For I turned back at once and pounded up the hill, sword in hand. Smythe. I called. Varro. Crossflane. Here. It was Torvaro. The Chalcentorite had not heard me calling before, not stirred from his patient's side. Suzuha still spasmed in her unconsciousness, thrashing against the tree roots like a woman possessed. I'm not sure what's wrong with her, the scolius said. She screamed and collapsed right after the attack. Her brother, too, did you see? I didn't wait for an answer. Can you carry her? We haven't much time. Marlow! Something heavy and solid struck me in the flank. I groaned, bent double, and turned round, swearing, struggling to keep myself between Varro and whatever it was that had attacked me. The tattoo-faced herald, Wallacom, stood behind me, clutching its staff in pale fingers. It said something in its language I didn't quite understand, turning its weapon over in its hands as though it were a lance. It is as I said, it said. To Kanyi Yukajim Susulatari. Susulatari. Monsters.
Devils. Devils indeed. Furious, embarrassed, and afraid, I drew myself up to my full height. Run, Scoliast. But take her and go, I said, taking my sword in both hands. Varro rose, and from the corner of my eye the green shape of him seemed almost Gibson at my side. He put his hand on my shoulder, and whatever he said was lost to me, for it was Gibson's voice I heard instead. Always forward, he said. Always down. And never left or right, I murmured. Time as well stopped a moment and lingered at my shoulder, and with eyes unclouded I saw another shape standing just beside the tall and white-robed herald. It was as if some unseen hand pointed to it. Nobuta. The Aeta's child cowered, small and useless for its kind, young and nearly alone behind the figure of its servant. They must have remained behind the pavilion, seeing that most of we humans had fled. Where was Aranata? Gone after Bassander, perhaps? After Smythe and Crossflame, wherever they had gone? Or perhaps it had gone to lead its men in assaulting the humans, I knew not. Wallacombe barked a challenge, ducked its horns. You will pay for this betrayal. It bellowed. I said nothing. It lunged. The cutting edge of a high matter sword is fine as carbon monofilament. It can cut nearly anything. Flesh, bone, metal, stone. Only adamant, the stuff of which starship hulls are made, and high matter itself are immune. Whatever alien alloy the herald's stuff was spun of was no object. I parried the herald's blow with ease, and its weighted head spun away and bounced off the council table behind me. I didn't hesitate, but stepped in, raising my sword. The herald never learned what happened. It never understood. I cut. It fell in two pieces. Blood, black blood, soaked white robes and blue. I expected young Nabuta to scream. It only cowered and slunk away. I expected it to cry out. It only shivered. For a moment we were alone in all the chaos the devil and the demon prince, somehow forgotten. Varro had carried Suzuha away, and beyond the edge of the pavilion the battle was joined in full. I went to one knee before the child Nabuta, and shut off my sword. The blade melted away like smoke, and I extended my empty hand. Tukayu Jelku, I said, unknowingly echoing the words of the angels out of mankind's most ancient memory. Don't be afraid. It tried to crawl away, to push itself away with its hands. I seized it by the wrist. Nobuta, it's not safe here. You must come with me now. Yanure ne? it repeated. With you? I'll keep you safe, I said, not then knowing it was a lie. When the fighting is done, I will return you to your father. To this day, I don't know if I meant to take the child as a hostage or to keep it safe or what the difference was between those two things. Please, I said. It twitched its head no and tried to pull away. I did not tighten my grip. I did not want to frighten it. Listen, I said. Uba, I brought Tanaran back to you, didn't I? And where was Tanaran? I brought it back unhurt. Tanaran trusts me. You trust Tanaran, don't you? When the child didn't answer, I shook its arm to shake loose its thoughts. Don't you? Nobuta's eyes, like the eyes of a frightened horse, would focus on nothing. They rolled blackly in its head. In the distance, I heard a man screaming and knew that one of the Sielsin serpents had chewed its way through armor and into flesh. Imemneu o Tanarane? I asked. Don't you trust Tanaran? Pale fingers tightened on my wrist. You killed Wallacom. It attacked me, I said and banking on my fragmentary understanding of Sielsin culture added, and it was only a servant. I need to protect you. Why? Because if I can return to your father, I might be able to stop us all fighting, I said. I did not say that the Sielsin were doomed anyhow. I did not explain that the Xenobites had no home and nothing to return to, that they were trapped on this ship with nowhere to run and nothing to do but revenge. I was scrambling blindly for chess pieces for control of as much of the board as I could manage. Just beyond the pavilion, a Sielsin threw itself on two Imperial Legionnaires, ceramic blade cutting into one man at the base of the neck, before it threw itself bodily at the other. 
Behind them I saw the shine and violet declaration of plasma fire from our lances cutting into the Cielsin horde. And I heard Sir William Crossflane's voice, amplified by speakers in his armor, ring out. Back to the gate! Everyone back to the gate! Come on, I urged Nobuta. It isn't safe here. I pulled it to its feet, pushed it roughly ahead. Following it, keeping one hand firmly against the small of its back, I marched us from the pavilion. If I could just get it back to the soldiers, they would be able to hold it. I wouldn't be responsible for it for long. I nearly tripped over something in the dark, and before I looked I knew it was a body. Looking down, I saw the shape of the slave girl lying face down in the grass. She tried to run. There was a red hole in her neck, and in the firelit gloom I cannot say if it was the shot of one of our weapons or the drill wound from one of theirs that had killed her. But I saw the mutilated ruin of her hands and feet, and the glitter of silver on her, and the shimmer of her pale scars. Negotiations were over. Perhaps they ought never to have begun. I only tarried there a moment, but the image of those broken hands has never left me, though much else more important has in time. I felt a black fury well up in me, and my stomach turned. I pushed on down the hill, pushing Nobuta on ahead of me. We hurried past knots of soldiers fighting. Our legionnaires stood back to back in knots of three, their triasses, and battled the encircled pale. I didn't stop to aid them, for to draw my sword would be to frighten Nabuta, and I needed the creature quiescent, compliant until I could hand it over to our soldiers. Where's my father? Nabuta asked, stumbling a little on the uneven ground ahead of me. I don't know, I told it, but we'll find her. Marlow! A harsh voice snapped, tone amplified by her suit. A fully armored trooper in white and bearing the marks of a lieutenant on her visor called out. In my panic and mad scramble, a name was a moment coming. Greenlaw. It was Bassander Lynn's iron jawed lieutenant. Where's Smythe? Where's Lynn? She shook her head, pointed back over the meadow to the line of trees that served to mask the perimeter wall. Gone on toward the gate. What's this? She jerked her head at Nobuta. And Devaro and Jinan and Lieutenant Azhar. Are they clear? Clear out. Them and the witch, she said. Valka. Earth and Emperor, I'd been so focused on the task at hand that I'd forgotten Valka for a moment. I resolved never to mention it to her or anyone there on the spot, and so buried my shame. What's this? Prince Aranata's son, I said, and hurried on, leaving the lieutenant and her men to hold the way behind me. The way ahead was clear, and I half pushed, half dragged Nabuta in turns across it, resisting the urge to duck the plasma fire that whizzed past us. Twice I had to put myself between the child and the charge of one or more of our soldiers. At last we made the tree line. The slumped forms of Sagara's Somme army lay all around, useless and quiescent without their master's will to animate them. I wondered if they had died, if without Khan's consciousness to drive them they had all forgotten to breathe. I thought not. The lights still shone blood gold and greenly through their faces, though their arms were all a tangle. Nabuta cowered as we came in among them, and I shared its fear, recalling in that moment the awful fight with the painted man in that café on Roostum. Ahead I saw the judder and shake of spotlights, and knew the machine men lived again. But it was only the suit lights of two triasses of Imperial soldiers, and one other. There he is! Valka exclaimed. She'd come back for me. In my surprise all I could manage to say was, I thought I told you to go. And leave you here? she demanded. And for a moment I thought she'd strike me. Only then did she mark my companion and her golden eyes widened in the dark. How did this happen? Not now, I said, thinking of the dead Wallacom. We need to get it secure. Back to the Skiavona. Then maybe we'll be able to get Aranata to calm down. Valka's face darkened. A hostage? The disapproval in her tone was palpable. Yes, I insisted. Yes, a hostage. Valka, there are more than five hundred Cielsin screamers on this ship. We need whatever help we can get. I moved past her, gesturing to the soldiers to advance. Turning to Nabuta, I said, These men are going to help take you to our ship, all right? Nabuta didn't answer. It was already shying away. I wondered how old it was. How mature. Do you understand? 
The soldier's hands rendered the question moot the instant after, for they seized Nabuta by the arms. It flailed, and one of the group triasters, a tall man with his visor painted half-red, raised his lance to strike the pale. I caught the man by the wrist. Don't hurt it. Go. What about you, sir? The man's voice came out muffled by his suit. Where's Smythe? Chapter 68 The Narrow Way We found them in the shadow of the gate, leading from the garden back to the ski of Ona, Smythe and Crossflane and Basanda Lynn holding the line. There you are, Smythe called out as the soldiers shuffled past with Nabuta. Where have you been? An explosion rang out behind me and I heard men yell and the cracking of timbers as a tree fell toward us. The Sielsen had brought something heavier than explosives. I thrust Valka ahead of me, ducking on reflex. Is everyone out? I asked, ignoring the Tribune's question. Except for Greenlaw and the rear guard, Crossflane answered. Jinan? I asked. Torvaro and the children? The children? Basanda echoed, confused. Valka interjected. Ren and Suzuha. When Captain Lin didn't show any signs of deeper understanding, she added, Sagara's children. Blank faces met mine, and for a moment all there was was firelight on the black walls and the noise of battle behind. One legionnaire spoke up from the shadow of a column patterned in human faces. I, my lord, I saw the scullyest head on with that girl on his back. She was putting up a mean fight. She was awake, I asked, lurching toward the small man, the boy. No, my lord, he said. She were having some sort of fit like. Didn't see the jaddy in, though. That was something. I cannot say how I was certain, only that I had an... an intuition. I kept seeing the implant glowing behind Khan's ear when I approached his throne, kept remembering the way his spirit had moved behind Naya's eyes. He wasn't dead. I knew it. What is it? Valkar asked. I shook myself. There wasn't time for introspection. It's nothing, I... The sound went up like the hissing of a nest of vipers, and I turned. We all turned. They were there among the trees, tall shapes pale and terrible as death herself, dressed in black and deepest blue, horn-crowned and staring. They were much too tall to be men, and much too thin. Only then did I realize the depth of the quiet that had fallen. With no sound but the slow catch of flames in the wind-tossed branches, for a moment Basanda's eyes found mine, and both of us knew that Greenlaw and the rear guard were dead. Valka's fingers tightened on my upper arm, and in her native Norde she whispered, "'Tis time to go. I did not need telling. Of Prince Arenata there was no sign but one Sielsin, whom I had not seen before. A surprisingly broad-shouldered one in a deep blue cloak raised its hand and shouted a single word. Wida Throw. There must have been a couple hundred of them standing among the trees, and each of them hurled one of the fanged Tahute. I could hear the hum of them, on the air, hurtling toward us like a volley of arrows in the woods of Agincourt twenty thousand years before. Retreat! Smythe's word went up like the voice of God, amplified by her suit to a superhuman scream. She drew her sword, high matter gleaming in the darkness, and waved everyone on. Back to the ski of Ona! Go! Go! Behind me, the remaining mass of our people, perhaps a hundred and fifty or so legionnaires, began to move. To the untrained eye it must have seemed a rout, but I saw the way the troop triasses held together, men moving shoulder to shoulder, lances on their backs, plasma burners low and ready. I was one of the last to leave the shadow of the gate, one of the last to turn as a single line of hoplites, shielded and with face disruptors raised, closed ranks beneath the carved archway. Many of the Nahute drones, confused by body heat, I guessed, turned aside, borrowing into the Somms who lay comatose all about. That was a mercy, I decided. Still more hurried on, some shot down by the hoplite's disruptor fire, electrical discharge, frying the drone's delicate circuits. Marlow, someone yelled. Was it Crossflame? And yet I found I couldn't look away as the first wave of drones crashed into the armoured hoplites. My sword was in my hand. Uida! The Sielsen commander shouted again. The word a kind of curse. A second wave of Nahute came hissing to life. Hadrian! Someone yelled. Valka? 
Never have I forgotten the bravery of those men, those hoplites standing in the mouth of the garden gate, the way they dug in, squaring their shoulders, even as the Sielsen advanced, loping like wolves out of the firelit darkness, like leopards, like lions. Would that I had known each of them and all their names, for they deserved a monument and commemoration here. The boy who had addressed me was one of them, who had told me Tor Varro and Suzuha yet lived. He died there, him and his fellows. He gave his life to cover our escape, and I cannot even record his name for you and for posterity. The greater part of war, I think, is such forgotten acts of heroism. You sing your songs of Hadrian Half-Mortal, of the Phoenix of Perfugium, of other heroes, but I tell you we are nothing, nothing next to those ordinary men who lay down their lives, who are not ordinary at all. Because you see, I was wrong, wrong when I told Sir Lorin and Bassander that wars aren't won with soldiers, on Imesh long ago. That, I think, was the start of Bassander's dislike for me, and rightly so. To say such a thing was to dishonor men in moments such as this, when two dozen hoplites turned without argument, without complaint, and died. Rough hands seized me, and I was dragged back, pushed and spurred on. It wasn't Valkyra at all.